Metamorphoses by Ovid Book Chapter 1 Creation of the World The formation of the world from the confusion of chaos by the wisdom and power of the deity is here described. Together with a delineation of the harmonious system of the universe, and the mutual dependences and operations of powers of nature, birds, beasts, and fishes. Brought into existence, the creation of man, his superiority to other animals evinced in the structure of his body and the faculties of his mind. Of bodies changed to various forms I sing. Ye gods, from whom these miracles did spring. Inspire my numbers with celestial heat. Till I my long laborious work complete. And add perpetual tenor to my rhymes. Deduced from nature's birth to Caesar's times. Before the seas, and this terrestrial ball. And heaven's high canopy that covers all. One was the face of nature. If a face. Rather a rude and indigested mass. A lifeless lump, unfashioned and unframed. Of jarring seeds, and justly chaos named. No sun was lighted up the world to view. No moon did yet her blunted horns renew. Nor yet was earth suspended in the sky. Nor poised, did on her own foundations lie. Nor seas about the shores their arms had thrown. But earth, and air, and water were in one. Thus air was void of light, and earth unstable. And water's dark abyss unnavigable. No certain form on any was impressed. All were confused, and each disturbed the rest. For hot and cold were in one body fixed. And soft with hard, and light with heavy, mixed. But God, or nature, while they thus contend. To these intestine discords put an end. Then earth from air, and seas from earth, were driven. And grosser air sunk from ethereal heaven. Thus disembroiled, they take their proper place. The next of kin contiguously embrace. And foes are sundered by a larger space. The force of fire ascended first on high. And took its dwelling in the vaulted sky. Then air succeeds, in lightness next to fire. Whose atoms from unactive earth retire. Earth sinks beneath, and draws a numerous throng. Of ponderous, thick, unwieldy, seeds along. About her coasts unruly waters roar. And, rising on a ridge, insult the shore. Thus when the god, whatever god was he. Had formed the whole, and made the parts agree. That no unequal portions might be found. He molded earth into a spacious round. Then. With a breath, he gave the winds to blow. And bade the congregated waters flow. He adds the running springs, and standing lakes. And bounding banks for winding rivers makes. Some part, in earth are swallowed up, the most. In ample oceans disembogued, are lost. He shades the woods, the valleys he restrains. With rocky mountains, and extends the plains. And as five zones the ethereal regions bind. Five, correspondent, are to earth assigned. The sun, with rays directly darting down. Fires all beneath, and fries the middle zone. The two beneath the distant poles complain. Of endless winter, and perpetual rain. Betwixt the extremes, two happier climates hold. The temper that partakes of hot and cold. The fields of liquid air, enclosing all. Surround the compass of this earthly ball. The lighter parts lie next the fires above. The grosser near the watery surface move. Thick clouds are spread, and storms engender there. And thunders voice, which wretched mortals fear. And winds. That on their wings cold winter bear. Nor were those blustering brethren left at large. On seas and shores their fury to discharge. Bound as they are, and circumscribed in place. They rend the world, resistless. Where they pass. And mighty marks of mischief leave behind. Such is the rage of their tempestuous kind. First Eurus to the rising morn is sent. 
the regions of the Bami continent, and eastern realms, where, early, Persians run to greet the blessed appearance of the sun. Westward, the wanton zephyr wings his flight, pleased with the remnants of departing light. Fierce Boreas, with his offspring issues forth, to invade the frozen wagon of the north. While frowning Oster seeks the southern sphere, and rots, with endless rain, the unwholesome year. High o'er the clouds, and empty realms of wind. The god a clearer space for heaven designed. Where fields of light, and liquid ether flow. Purged from the ponderous dregs of earth below. Scarce had the power distinguished these, when straight. The stars, no longer overlaid with weight. Exert their heads from underneath the mass. And upward shoot. And kindle as they pass. And with diffusive light adorn their heavenly place. Then, every void of nature to supply. With forms of gods he fills the vacant sky. New herds of beasts he sends the plains to share. New colonies of birds to people air. And to their oozy beds the finny fish repair. A creature of a more exalted kind. Was wanting yet, and then was man designed. Conscious of thought, of more capacious breast. For empire formed, and fit to rule the rest. Whether with particles of heavenly fire. The God of nature did his soul inspire. Or earth, but new divided from the sky. And pliant, still retained the ethereal energy. Which wise Prometheus tempered into paste. And, mixed with living streams. The godlike image cast. Thus, while the mute creation downward bend. Their sight, and to their earthly mother tend. Man looks aloft, and with erected eyes. Beholds his own hereditary skies. From such rude principles our form began. And earth was metamorphosed into man. Golden Age. During the reign of Saturn the inhabitants of the earth enjoy a state of primeval happiness, secure from the intrusion of evil passions. The Golden Age was first, when man, yet knew. No rule but uncorrupted reason knew. And, with a native bent did good pursue. Unforced by punishment, unawed by fear. His words were simple, and his soul sincere. Needless was written law where none oppressed. The law of man was written in his breast. No suppliant crowds before the judge appeared. No court erected yet, nor cause was heard. But all was safe, for conscience was their guard. The mountain trees in distant prospect please. Ere yet the pine descended to the seas. Ere sails were spread new oceans to explore. And happy mortals, unconcerned for more. Confined their wishes to their native shore. No walls were yet, nor fence, nor moat, nor mound. Nor drum was heard, nor trumpet's angry sound. Nor swords were forged. But, void of care and crime. The soft creation slept away their time. The teeming earth, yet guiltless of the plough. And unprovoked, did fruitful stores allow. Content with food which nature freely bred. On wildings and on strawberries they fed. Cornells and brambleberries gave the rest. And falling acorns furnished out a feast. The flowers unsown, in fields and meadows reigned. And western winds immortal spring maintained. In following years the bearded corn ensued. From earth unasked, nor was that earth renewed. From veins of valleys milk and nectar broke. And honey sweating through the pores of oak. Silver Age. The earth, no longer under the dominion of Saturn, begins to exhibit marks of degeneracy. But when good Saturn, banished from above, was driven to hell, the world was under Jove. Succeeding times a silver age behold. Excelling brass, but more excelled by gold. Then summer, autumn, winter, did appear. And spring was but a season of the year. The sun his annual course obliquely made. Good days contracted, and enlarged the bad. 
then air with sultry heats began to glow. The wings of winds were clogged with ice and snow. And shivering mortals, into houses driven, sought shelter from the inclemency of heaven. Those houses, then, were caves or homely sheds, with twining osiers fenced, and moss their beds. Then plows, for seed, the fruitful furrows broke, and oxen labored first beneath the yoke. Brazen Age Origin of War To this came next in course the Brazen Age. A warlike offspring, prompt to bloody rage. Not impious yet. Iron Age The virtues, in despair, quit the earth, and the depravity of man becomes universal and complete. Hard steel succeeded then. And stubborn as the metal were the men. Truth, modesty, and shame, the world forsook. Fraud, avarice, and force, their places took. Then sails were spread to every wind that blew. Raw were the sailors and the depths were new. Trees, rudely hollowed did the waves sustain. Air ships in triumph plowed the watery plain. Then landmarks limited to each his right. For all before was common as the light. Nor was the ground alone required to bear. Her annual income to the crooked share. But greedy mortals, rummaging her store. Digged from her entrails first the precious ore. Which next to hell the prudent gods had laid. And that alluring ill to sight displayed. Thus cursed steel, and more accursed gold. Gave mischief birth, and made that mischief bold. And double death did wretched man invade. By steel assaulted, and by gold betrayed. Now, brandished weapons glittering in their hands. Mankind is broken loose from moral bands. No rights of hospitality remain. The guest, by him who harbored him, is slain. The son-in-law pursues the father's life. The wife her husband murders, he the wife. The stepdame poison for the son prepares. The son inquires into his father's years. Faith flies, and piety in exile mourns. And justice, here oppressed, to heaven returns. Giants war. Men of enormous stature, sons of Coelus and Terra, affect to scale the walls of heaven, but are overthrown by the thunder of Jupiter, the earth. Becoming impregnated by the blood of these monsters, begets men of similar disposition to their fathers, among whom Lycaon, tyrant of Arcadia, signalizes himself by putting to death all strangers who seek his protection, Jupiter transforms him into the shape of a wolf, and destroys the whole human race by a universal deluge. With the exception of Deucalion and Pyrrha, who people the earth with a new race by the conversion of stones into men, a huge serpent, named Pytho, makes its appearance, and excites universal terror. Till he is at length destroyed by the shafts of Apollo, the Pythian games are instituted in honor of this exploit. Nor were the gods themselves more safe above. Against beleaguered heaven the giants move. Hills piled on hills, on mountains mountains lie. To make their mad approaches to the sky. Till Jove, no longer patient, took his time. To avenge with thunder their audacious crime. Red lightning played along the firmament. And their demolished works to pieces rent. Singed with the flames, and with the bolts transfixed. With native earth their blood the monsters mixed. The blood, endued with animating heat. Did, in the impregnant earth, new sons beget. They, like the seed from which they sprung, accursed. Against the gods immortal hatred nursed. An impious, arrogant, and cruel brood. Expressing their original from blood. Which, when the king of gods beheld from high. With all revolving in his memory. What he himself had found on earth of late. Lycaon's guilt, and his inhuman treat. He sight. Nor longer with his pity strove. But kindled to a wrath becoming Jove. Then called a general council of the gods. Who, summoned, issue from their blessed abodes. And fill the assembly with a shining train. A way there is in heaven's expanded plain. Which, when the skies are clear, 
is seen below. And mortals by the name of Milky know. The groundwork is of stars. Through which the road. Lies open to the thunderer's abode. The gods of greater nations dwell around. And, on the right and left, the palace bound. The commons where they can. The nobler sort. With winding doors wide open, front the court. This place, as far as earth with heaven may vie. I dare to call the Louvre of the sky. When all were placed in seats distinctly known. And he, their father, had assumed the throne. Upon his ivory scepter first he leaned. Then shook his head. That shook the firmament. Air, earth, and seas, obeyed the almighty nod. And, with a general fear, confessed the God. At length, with indignation, thus he broke. His awful silence, and the powers bespoke. I was not more concerned in that debate. Of empire. When our universal state. Was put to hazard, and the giant race. Our captive skies were ready to embrace. For though the foe was fierce, the seeds of all. Rebellion sprung from one original. Now, wheresoever ambient waters glide. All are corrupt, and all must be destroyed. Let me this holy protestation make. By hell, and hell's inviolable lake. I tried whatever in the Godhead lay. But gangrene members must be lopped away. Before the nobler parts are tainted to decay. There dwells below a race of demigods. Of nymphs in waters, and of fauns in woods. Who though not worthy yet in heaven to live. Let them, at least, enjoy that earth we give. Can these be thought securely lodged below? When I myself, who no superior know. I, who have heaven and earth at my command. Have been attempted by Lycaon's hand? At this a murmur through the synod went. And, with one voice, they vote his punishment. Thus, when conspiring traitors dared to doom. The fall of Caesar, and in him of Rome. The nations trembled with a pious fear. Ail anxious for their earthly thunderer. Nor was their care, O Caesar, less esteemed. By thee, than that of heaven for Jove was deemed. Who, with his hand and voice, did first restrain. Their murmurs. Then resumed his speech again. The gods to silence were composed, and sate. With reverence, due to his superior state. Cancel your pious cares, already he. Has paid his debt to justice and to me. Yet what his crimes, and what my judgments were. Remains for me thus briefly to declare. The clamors of this vile degenerate age. The cries of orphans, and the oppressor's rage. Had reached the stars, I will descend, said I. In hope to prove this loud complaint a lie. Disguised in human shape I traveled round. The world, and more than what I heard I found. O'er Mienalus I took my steepy way. By caverns infamous for beasts of prey. Then crossed Cyllene, and the piney shade. More infamous, by cursed Lycaean maid. Dark night had covered heaven and earth before. I entered his inhospitable door. Just at my entrance, I displayed the sign. That somewhat was approaching of divine. The prostrate people pray, the tyrant grins. And adding profanation to his sins. I'll try. Said he, and if a god appear. To prove his deity shall cost him dear. Twas late, the graceless wretch my death prepares. When I should soundly sleep, oppressed with cares. This dire experiment he chose to prove. If I were mortal. Or undoubted Jove. But first he had resolved to taste my power. Not long before, but in a luckless hour. Some legates, sent from the Molossian state. Were on a peaceful errand come to treat. Of these he murders one, he boils the flesh. And lays the mangled morsels in a dish. Some part he roasts, then serves it up, so dressed. And bids me welcome to this human feast. Moved with disdain, the table I o'erturned. 
and with avenging flames the palace burned. The tyrant, in a fright, for shelter gains. The neighboring fields, and scours along the plains. Howling he fled, and fain he would have spoke. But human voice his brutal tongue forsook. About his lips the gathered foam he churns. And, breathing slaughters, still with rage he burns. But on the bleeding flock his fury turns. His mantle, now his hide, with rugged hairs. Cleaves to his back, a famished face he bears. His arms descend, his shoulders sink away. To multiply his legs for chase of prey. He grows a wolf, his hoariness remains. And the same rage in other members reigns. His eyes still sparkle in a narrower space. His jaws retain the grin and violence of his face. This was a single ruin, but not one. Deserve so just a punishment alone. Mankind's a monster, and the ungodly times. Confederate into guilt are sworn to crimes. All are alike involved in ill, and all. Must by the same relentless fury fall. Thus ended he. The greater God's assent. By clamors urging his severe intent. The less fill up the cry for punishment. Yet still with pity they remember man. And mourn as much as heavenly spirits can. They ask, when those were lost of human birth. What he would do with all this waste of earth. If his dispeopled world he would resign. To beasts, a mute and more ignoble line. Neglected altars must no longer smoke. If none were left to worship and invoke. To whom the father of the gods replied. Lay that unnecessary fear aside. Mine be the care new people to provide. A race unlike the first, and try my skill again. Already had he tossed the flaming brand. And rolled the thunder in his spacious hand. Preparing to discharge on seas and land. But stopped, for fear, thus violently driven. The sparks should catch his axle tree of heaven. Remembering in the fates, a time when fire. Should to the battlements of heaven aspire. And all his blazing worlds above should burn. And all the inferior globe to cinders turn. His dire artillery thus dismissed, he bent. His thoughts to some securer punishment. Concludes to pour a watery deluge down. And what he durst not burn, resolves to drown. The northern breath, that freezes floods, he binds. With all the race of cloud-dispelling winds. The south he loosed, who night and horror brings. And fogs are shaken from his flaggy wings. From his divided herd two streams he pours. His head and roomy eyes distill in showers. With rain his robe and heavy mantle flow. And lazy mists are lowering on his brow. Still as he swept along with his clenched fist. He squeezed the clouds, the imprisoned clouds resist. The skies, from pole to pole, with peals resound. And showers enlarged, come pouring on the ground. Then, clad in colors of a various dye. Junonian iris breeds a new supply. To feed the clouds. Impetuous rain descends. The bearded corn beneath the burden bends. Defrauded clowns deplore their perished grain. And the long labors of the year are vain. Nor from his patrimonial heaven alone. Is Jove content to pour his vengeance down. Aid from his brother of the seas he craves. To help him with auxiliary waves. The watery tyrant calls his brooks and floods. Who roll from mossy caves, their moist abodes. And with perpetual urns his palace fill. To whom, in brief. He thus imparts his will. Small exhortation needs. Your powers employ. And this bad world, so Jove requires, destroy. Let loose the reins to all your watery store. Bear down the dams, and open every door. The floods, by nature enemies to land. And proudly swelling with their new command. Remove the living stones that stop their way. And, gushing from their source, augment the sea. Then, with his mace, 
their monarch struck the ground. With inward trembling earth received the wound. And rising streams a ready passage found. The expanded waters gather on the plain. They float the fields, and overtop the grain. Then rushing onwards, with a sweepy sway. Bear flocks, and folds, and laboring hinds, away. Nor safe their dwellings were, for, sapped by floods. Their houses fell upon their household gods. The solid piles, too strongly built to fall. High o'er their heads behold a watery wall. Now seas and earth were in confusion lost. A world of waters, and without a coast. One climbs a cliff, one in his boat is born. And plows above where late he sowed his corn. Others o'er chimney tops and turrets row. And drop their anchors on the meads below. Or downward driven, they bruise the tender vine. Or tossed aloft, are knocked against a pine. And where, of late, the kids had cropped the grass. The monsters of the deep now take their place. Insulting nereids on the city's ride. And wandering dolphins o'er the palace glide. On leaves and masts of mighty oaks they browse. And their broad fins entangle in the boughs. The fright wolf now swims among the sheep. The yellow lion wanders in the deep. His rapid force no longer helps the boar. The stag swims faster than he ran before. The fowls, long beating on their wings in vain. Despair of land, and drop into the main. Now hills and valleys no more distinction know. And leveled nature lies oppressed below. The most of mortals perish in the flood. The small remainder dies for want of food. A mountain of stupendous height there stands. Betwixt the Athenian and Boeotian lands. The bound of fruitful fields, while fields they were. But then a field of waters did appear. Parnassus is its name, whose forky rise. Mounts through the clouds and mates the lofty skies. High on the summit of this dubious cliff. Deucalion wafting, moored his little skiff. He with his wife were only left behind. Of perished man, they too were humankind. The mountain nymphs and Themis they adore. And from her oracles relief implore. The most upright of mortal men was he. The most sincere and holy woman, she. When Jupiter, surveying earth from high. Beheld it in a lake of water lie. That where so many millions lately lived. But two, the best of either sex, survived. He loosed the northern wind, fierce boreas flies. To puff away the clouds and purge the skies. Serenely while he blows, the vapors driven. Discover heaven to earth, and earth to heaven. The billows fall, while Neptune lays his mace. On the rough sea, and smooths its furrowed face. Already Triton, at his call, appears. Above the waves, a Tyrian robe he wears. And in his hand a crooked trumpet bears. The sovereign bids him peaceful sounds inspire. And give the waves the signal to retire. His writ hen shell he takes, whose narrow vent. Grows by degrees into a large extent. Then gives it breath, the blast with doubling sound. Runs the wide circuit of the world around. The sun first heard it, in his early east. And met the rattling echoes in the west. The waters, listening to the trumpet's roar. Obey the summons, and forsake the shore. A thin circumference of land appears. And earth, but not at once, her visage rears. And peeps upon the seas from upper grounds. The streams, but just contained within their bounds. By slow degrees into their channels crawl. And earth increases as the waters fall. In longer time the tops of trees appear. Which mud on their dishonored branches bear. At length the world was all restored to view. But desolate, and of a sickly hue. Nature beheld herself, and stood aghast. A dismal desert and a silent waste. Which when Deucalion, with a piteous look. Beheld, he wept, and thus to Pyrrha spoke. O wife! 
O oh sister! O oh, of all thy kind! The best, and only creature left behind! By kindred, love, and now by dangers joined! Of multitudes, who breathe the common air! We two remain! A species in a pair! The rest the seas have swallowed, nor have we! Evan of this wretched life a certainty! The clouds are still above! And while I speak, a second deluge o'er our heads may break. Should I be snatched from hence, and thou remain, without relief, or partner of thy pain, how couldst thou such a wretched life sustain? Should I be left, and thou be lost, the sea, that buried her I loved, should bury me. Oh, could our father his old arts inspire, and make me heir of his informing fire, that so I might abolished man retrieve, and perished people in new souls might live. But heaven is pleased, nor ought we to complain, that we, the examples of mankind, remain. He said, the careful couple join their tears, and then invoke the gods, with pious prayers. Thus, in devotion having eased their grief, from sacred oracles they seek relief, and to Cephasus brook their way pursue. The stream was troubled, but the ford they knew. With living waters, in the fountain bread. They sprinkle first their garments and their head. Then took the way which to the temple led. The roofs were all defiled with moss and mire. The desert altars void of solemn fire. Before the gradual prostrate they adored. The pavement kissed. And thus the saint implored. O, oh, righteous Themis, if the powers above. By prayers are bent to pity, and to love. If human miseries can move their mind. If yet they can forgive, and yet be kind. Tell how we may restore, by second birth. Mankind, and people desolated earth. Then thus the gracious goddess, nodding, said. Depart, and with your vestments veil your head and stooping lowly down, with loosened zones. Throw each behind your backs your mighty mother's bones. Amaze the pair, and mute with wonder, stand. Till Pira first refused the dire command. Forbid it heaven, said she, that I should tear. Those holy relics from the sepulchre. They pondered the mysterious words again. For some new sense. And long they sought in vain. At length Deucalion cleared his cloudy brow. And said, The dark enigma will allow. A meaning, which, if well I understand. From sacrilege will free the gods' command. This earth our mighty mother is, the stones. In her capacious body are her bones. These we must cast behind. With hope and fear. The woman did the new solution here. The man diffides in his own augury. And doubts the gods, yet both resolve to try. Descending from the mount, they first unbind. Their vests, and veiled, they cast the stones behind. The stones, a miracle to mortal view. But long tradition makes it pass for true. Did first the rigor of their kind expel. And suppled into softness as they fell. Then swelled, and swelling by degrees, grew warm. And took the rudiments of human form. Imperfect shapes, in marble such are seen. When the rude chisel does the man begin. While yet the roughness of the stone remains. Without the rising muscles and the veins. The sappy parts, and next resembling juice. Were turned to moisture, for the body's use. Supplying humors, blood, and nourishment. The rest, too solid to receive a bent, converts to bones, and what was once a vein, its former name and nature did retain, by help of power divine, in little space. What the man through assumed a manly face, and what the wife, renewed the female race. Hence we derive our nature, born to bear, laborious life, and hardened into care. The rest of animals, from teeming earth. Produced, in various forms received their birth. 
the native moisture, in its close retreat. Digested by the sun's ethereal heat. As in a kindly womb, began to breed. Then swelled, and quickened by the vital seed. And some in less, and some in longer space. Were ripened into form, and took a several face. Thus when the Nile from Farian fields is fled. And seeks, with ebbing tides, his ancient bed. The fat manure with heavenly fire is warmed. And crusted creatures, as in wombs, are formed. These, when they turn the glebe, the peasants find. Some rude, and yet unfinished in their kind. Short of their limbs, a lame imperfect birth. One half alive, and one of lifeless earth. For heat and moisture, when in bodies joined. The temper that results from either kind. Conception makes, and fighting till they mix. Their mingled atoms in each other fix. Thus nature's hand the genial bed prepares. With friendly discord and with fruitful wars. From hence the surface of the ground, with mud. And slime besmeared, the feces of the flood. Receive the rays of heaven, and sucking in. The seeds of heat. New creatures did begin. Some were of several sorts produced before. But of new monsters earth created more. Unwillingly, but yet she brought to light. The, Python too, the wandering world to fright. And the new nations, with so dire a sight. So monstrous was his bulk. So large a space. Did his vast body and long train embrace. Whom Phoebus, basking on a bank, espied. Ere now the god his arrows had not tried. But on the trembling deer, or mountain goat. At this new quarry he prepares to shoot. Though every shaft took place, he spent the store. Of his full quiver, and, t'was long before. The expiring serpent wallowed in his gore. Then, to preserve the fame of such a deed. For Python slain, he Pythian games decreed. Where noble youths for mastership should strive. To quoit, to run, and steeds and chariots drive. The prize was fame, in witness of renown. An oaken garland did the victor crown. The laurel was not yet for triumphs born. But every green, alike by Phoebus worn. Did, with promiscuous grace, his flowing locks adorn. Transformation of Daphne into a laurel. Daphne, a daughter of the river Peneus. Is beloved by Apollo and endeavors to remove herself from his importunities by flight, fearful of being overtaken, the maiden invokes thy assistance of her father, who, by the aid of the gods, changes her into a laurel. The first and fairest of his loves was she, whom not blind fortune, but the dire decree of angry Cupid forced him to desire. Daphne her name, and Peneus was her sire. Swelled with the pride that new success attends. He sees the stripling, while his bow he bends. And thus insults him, thou lascivious boy. Are arms like these for children to employ? No, such achievements are my proper claim. Due to my vigor and unerring aim. Resistless are my shafts, and python late. In such a feathered death, has found his fate. Take up thy torch, and lay my weapons by. With that the feeble souls of lovers fry. To whom the son of Venus thus replied. Phoebus, thy shafts are sure on all beside. But mine on Phoebus, mine the fame shall be. Of all thy conquests, when I conquer thee. He said, and soaring, swiftly winged his flight. Nor stopped, but on Parnassus' airy height. Two different shafts he from his quiver draws. One to repel desire, and one to cause. One shaft is pointed with refulgent gold. To bribe the love, and make the lover bold. One blunt, and tipped with lead, whose base allay. Provokes disdain, and drives desire away. The blunted bolt against the nymph he dressed. But with the sharp transfixed Apollo's breast. The enamored deity pursues the chase. The scornful damsel shuns his loathed embrace. 
In hunting beasts of prey her youth employs. And Phoebe rivals in her rural joys. With naked neck she goes, and shoulders bare. And with a fillet binds her flowing hair. By many suitors sought, she mocks their pains. And still her vowed virginity maintains. On wilds and woods she fixes her desire. Nor knows what youth and kindly love inspire. Her father chides her oft, Thou owest, says he. A husband to thyself, a son to me. She, like a crime, abhors the nuptial bed. She glows with blushes, and she hangs her head. Then, casting round his neck her tender arms. Soothes him with blandishments and filial charms. Give me, my lord, she said, to live and die. A spotless maid, without the marriage tie. Tis but a small request, I beg no more. Than what Diana's father gave before. The good old sire was softened to consent. But said her wish would prove her punishment. For so much youth and so much beauty joined. Opposed the state which her desires designed. The god of light, aspiring to her bed. Hopes what he seeks, with flattering fancies fed. And is, by his own oracles, misled. And as in empty fields the stubble burns. Or nightly travellers, when day returns. Their useless torches on dry hedges throw. That catch the flames, and kindle all the row. So burns the god, consuming in desire. And feeding in his breast a fruitless fire. Her well-turned neck he viewed, her neck was bare. And on her shoulders her dishevelled hair. Oh were it combed, said he, with what a gaze. Would every waving curl become her face. He viewed her eyes, like heavenly lamps that shone. He viewed her lips, too sweet to view alone. Swift as the wind the damsel fled away. Nor did for these alluring speeches stay. Stay, nymph, he cried, I follow, not a foe. Thus from the lion trips the trembling doe. Thus from the wolf the frightened lamb removes. And from pursuing falcons fearful doves. Thou shunst a god, and shunst a god that loves. Ah, lest some thorn should pierce thy tender foot. Or thou shouldst fall in flying my pursuit. To sharp uneven ways thy steps decline. Abate thy speed, and I will hate of mine. Yet think from whom thou dost so rashly fly. Nor basely born, nor shepherd swain am I. Perhaps thou know'st not my superior state. And from that ignorance proceeds thy hate. Me Claros, Delphos, Tenidos, obey. These hands the Paterian scepter sway. The king of gods begot me, what shall be? Or is, or ever was, in fate, I see. Mine is the invention of the charming lyre. Sweet notes. And heavenly numbers, I inspire. Sure is my bow, unerring is my dart. But ah! More deadly is who pierced my heart. Medicine is mine, what herbs and simples grow. In fields and forests, all their powers I know. And am the great physician called below. Alas! That fields and forests can afford. No remedies to heal their lovesick lord. To cure the pains of love no plant avails. And his own physic the physician fails. She heard not half, so furiously she flies. And on her ear the imperfect accent dies. Fear gave her wings, and, as she fled, the wind. Increasing, spread her flowing hair behind. As when the impatient greyhound, slipped from far. Bounds o'er the glebe, to course the fearful hare. She in her speed does all her safety lay. And he with double speed pursues the prey. O'erruns her at the sitting turn, and licks. His chaps in vain, and blows upon the flicks. She scapes, and for the neighboring covert strives. And, gaining shelter. Doubts if yet she lives. If little things with great we may compare. Such was the god, and such the flying fair. She, urged by fear, her feet did swiftly move. 
but he more swiftly, who was urged by love. He gathers ground upon her in the chase. Now breathes upon her hair, with nearer pace. And just as fastening on the wished embrace. The nymph grew pale, and, in a mortal fright. Spent with the labor of so long a flight. And now despairing, cast a mournful look. Upon the streams of her paternal brook. Oh help! She cried, in this extremest need. If water gods are deities indeed. Gape earth, and this unhappy wretch in tomb. Or change my form, whence all my sorrows come. Scarce had she finished, when her feet she found. Benumbed with cold, and fastened to the ground. A filmy rind about her body grows. Her hair to leaves, her arms extend to boughs. The nymph is all into a laurel gone. The smoothness of her skin remains alone. Yet Phoebus loves her still, and casting round. Her bowl his arms, some little warmth he found. The tree still panted in the unfinished part. Not wholly vegetative, and heaved her heart. He fixed his lips upon the trembling rind. It swerved aside, and his embrace declined. To whom the god, because thou canst not be. My mistress, I espouse thee for my tree. Be thou the prize of honor and renown. The deathless poet, and the poem, crown. Thou shalt the Roman festivals adorn. And, after poets, be by victors worn. Thou shalt returning Caesar's triumph grace. When pomps shall in a long procession pass. Wreathed on the post before his palace wait. And be the sacred guardian of the gate. Secure from thunder, and unharmed by Jove. Unfading as the immortal powers above. And as the locks of Phoebus are unshorn. So shall perpetual green thy boughs adorn. The grateful tree was pleased with what he said. And shook the shady honors of her head. Transformation of Io into a heifer, and the eyes of Argus into a peacock's train. Io, the daughter of Anacus, becomes the favorite mistress of Jupiter. Who transforms her into the shape of a beautiful heifer, in order that she may escape the jealousy of Juno, the goddess, suspecting the fraud, obtains from her husband the animal. Whose beauty she commends. And commits her to the custody of the hundred-eyed Argus, Mercury, at the command of Jupiter, destroys Argus, whose eyes are placed by Juno on the tail of the peacock, a bird sacred to her divinity. While Io, exposed to the persecutions of the enraged goddess and wandering over the greatest part of the earth, at length arrives in Egypt, where she is restored to her former shape. And worshipped as a deity under the name of Iris. An ancient forest in Thessalia grows. Which Tempe's pleasing valley does enclose. Through this the rapid Peneus takes his course. From Pindus rolling with impetuous force. Mists from the river's mighty fall arise. And deadly damps enclose the cloudy skies. Perpetual fogs are hanging o'er the wood. And sounds of waters deaf the neighborhood. Deep in a rocky cave he makes abode. A mansion proper for a mourning god. Here he gives audience, issuing out decrees. To rivers, his dependent deities. On this occasion hither they resort. To pay their homage, and to make their court. All doubtful whether to congratulate. His daughter's honor, or lament her fate. Spercius, crowned with poplar, first appears. Then old Apidanus came crowned with years. Enopeus turbulent, Amphrisos tame. And Aea's last, with lagging waters came. Then of his kindred brooks a numerous throng. Condole his loss, and bring their urns along. Not one was wanting of the watery train. That filled his flood, or mingled with the main. But, Inachus, who, in his cave alone, wept not another's losses, but his own. For his dear Io, whether strayed or dead. To him uncertain, doubtful tears he shed. He sought her through the world, but sought in vain. And nowhere finding, rather feared her slain. Her, just returning from her father's brook. Jove had beheld, with a desiring look. 
And, O oh, fair daughter of the flood, he said. Worthy alone of Jove's imperial bed. Happy whoever shall those charms possess. The king of gods, nor is thy lover less. Invites thee to yon cooler shades, to shun. The scorching rays of the meridian sun. Nor shalt thou tempt the dangers of the grove. Alone. Without a guide. Thy guide is Jove. No puny power, but he whose high command is unconfined, who rules the seas and land, and tempers thunder in his awful hand. O oh, fly not, for she fled from his embrace. O'er oh, Lerna's pastures, he pursued the chase. Along the shades of the Lurkean plain. At length the god, who never asks in vain, involved with vapors, imitating night both air and earth, and then suppressed her flight. Meantime the jealous Juno, from on high, surveyed the fruitful fields of Arcady, and wondered that the mist should overrun the face of daylight, and obscure the sun. No natural cause she found, from brooks, or bogs, or marshy lowlands, to produce the fogs. Then round the skies she sought for Jupiter, her faithless husband, but no Jove was there. Suspecting now the worst, or I, she said. I am much mistaken, or am much betrayed. With fury she precipitates her flight. Dispels the shadows of dissembled night. And to the day restores his native light. The almighty culprit, careful to prevent. The consequence, foreseeing her descent. Transforms his mistress in a trice, and now. In Io's place appears a lovely cow. So sleek her skin, so faultless was her make. Even Juno did unwilling pleasure take. To see so fair a rival of her love. And what she was, and whence, inquired of Jove. Of what fair herd, and from what pedigree. The god, half caught, was forced upon a lie. And said she sprung from earth. She took the word and begged the beauteous heifer of her lord. What should he do? T'was equal shame to Jove. Or to relinquish or betray his love. Yet to refuse so slight a gift would be. But more to increase his consort's jealousy. Thus fear and love, by turns, his heart assailed. And stronger love had sure, at length, prevailed. But some faint hope remained, his jealous queen. Had not the mistress through the heifer seen the cautious goddess of her gift possessed, yet harbored anxious thoughts within her breast, as she who knew the falsehood of her Jove and justly feared some new relapse of love, which to prevent and to secure her care to trusty Argus she commits the fair, the head of Argus, as with stars the skies was compassed round and wore a hundred eyes but two by turns their lids in slumber steep. The rest on duty still their station keep. Nor could the total constellation sleep. Thus, ever present to his eyes and mind. His charge was still before him, though behind. In fields he suffered her to feed by day. But when the setting sun to night gave way, the captive cow he summoned with a call, and drove her back, and tied her to the stall. On leaves of trees and bitter herbs she fed. Heaven was her canopy, bare earth her bed. So hardly lodged, and to digest her food. She drank from troubled streams, defiled with mud. Her woeful story feigned she would have told. With hands upheld, but had no hands to hold. Her head to her ungentle keeper bowed. She strove to speak, she spoke not, but she lowed. Affrighted with the noise, she looked around. And seemed to inquire the author of the sound. Once on the banks where often she had played. Her father's banks, she came, and there surveyed. Her altered visage, and her branching head. And, starting, from herself she would have fled. Her fellow nymphs, familiar to her eyes. Beheld, but knew her not in this disguise. Even Inachus himself was ignorant. And in his daughter did his daughter want. 
she followed where her fellows went, as she were still a partner of the company. They stroke her neck, the gentle heifer stands, and her neck offers to their stroking hands. Her father gave her grass, the grass she took, and licked his palms, and cast a piteous look. And in the language of her eyes she spoke. She would have told her name, and asked relief. But wanting words, in tears she tells her grief. Which, with her foot she makes him understand. And prints the name of Io in the sand. Ah wretched me, her mournful father cried. She with a sigh to wretched me replied. About her milk-white neck his arms he threw. And wept, and then these tender words ensue. And art thou she whom I have sought around. The world, and have at length so sadly found? So found, is worse than lost, with mutual words. Thou answerest not. No voice thy tongue affords. But sighs are deeply drawn from out thy breast. And speech denied by lowing is expressed. Unknowing, I prepared thy bridal bed. With empty hopes of happy issue fed. But now the husband of a herd must be. Thy mate, and bellowing sons thy progeny. Oh, were I mortal, death might bring relief. But now my Godhead but extends my grief. Prolongs my woes, of which no end I see. And makes me curse my immortality. More had he said, but fearful of her stay. The starry guardian drove his charge away. To some fresh pasture, on a hilly height. He sat himself, and kept her still in sight. Now Jove no longer could her sufferings bear. But called in haste his airy messenger. The son of Maya, with severe decree. To kill the keeper, and to set her free. With all his harness soon the god was sped. His flying hat was fastened on his head. Wings on his heels were hung, and in his hand. He holds the virtue of the snaky wand. The liquid air his moving pinions wound. And, in the moment, shoot him on the ground. Before he came in sight, the crafty god. His wings dismissed, but still retained his rod. That sleep procuring wand wise Hermes took. But made it seem to sight a shepherd's hook. With this he did a herd of goats control. Which by the way he met. And slyly stole. Clad like a country swain, he piped and sung. And, playing, drove his jolly troop along. With pleasure Argus the musician heeds. But wonders much at those new vocal reeds. And whosoer thou art, my friend, said he. Up hither drive thy goats, and play by me. This hill has brows for them and shade for thee. The god, who was with ease induced to climb, began discourse to pass away the time. And still, betwixt, his tuneful pipe he plies. And watched his hour, to close the keeper's eyes. With much ado, he partly kept awake. Not suffering all his eyes repose to take. And asked the stranger who did reeds invent. And whence began so rare an instrument. Transformation of Syrinx into reeds. Syrinx, a nymph of Arcadia, escapes from the solicitations of the god Pan, and is changed into a reed, called Syrinx. With which the god makes himself a pipe. Then Hermes thus, a nymph of late there was. Whose heavenly form her fellows did surpass. The pride and joy of fair Arcadia's plains. Beloved by deities, adored by swains. Syrinx her name, by Sylvans oft pursued. As oft she did the lustful gods delude. The rural and the woodland powers disdained. With Cynthia hunted, and her rights maintained. Like Phoebe clad, even Phoebe's self she seems. So tall, so straight, such well-proportioned limbs. The nicest I did no distinction know. But that the goddess bore a golden bow. Distinguished thus, the sight she cheated too. Descending from Lycaeus, Pan admires. The matchless nymph, and burns with new desires. A crown of pine upon his head he wore. And thus began her pity to implore. But ere he thus began, 
she took her flight. So swift, she was already out of sight. Nor stayed to hear the courtship of the god. But bent her course to Leyden's gentle flood. Thereby the river stopped, and, tired before. Relief from water nymphs her prayers implore. Now while the amorous god, with speedy pace. Just thought to strain her in a strict embrace. He fills his arms with reeds, new rising on the place. And while he sighs. His ill success to find. The tender canes were shaken by the wind. And breathed a mournful air, unheard before. That, much surprising Pan, yet pleased him more. Admiring this new music, thou, he said. Who canst not be the partner of my bed? At least shall be the consort of my mind. And often, often to my lips be joined. He formed the reeds, proportioned as they are. Unequal in their length, and waxed with care. They still retain the name of his ungrateful fair. While Hermes piped, and sung, and told his tale. The keeper's winking eyes began to fail. And drowsy slumber on the lids to creep. Till all the watchman was at length asleep. Then soon the god his voice and song suppressed. And with his powerful rod confirmed his rest. Without delay his crooked falchion drew. And at one fatal stroke the keeper slew. Down from the rock fell the dissevered head. Opening its eyes in death, and falling, bled. And marked the passage with a crimson trail. Thus Argus lies in pieces, cold and pale. And all his hundred eyes, with all their light, are closed at once in one perpetual night. These Juno takes, that they no more way fail, and spreads them in her peacock's gaudy tail. Impatient to revenge her injured bed, she wreaks her anger on her rival's head, with furies frights her from her native home, and drives her, gaddying, round the world to roam. Nor ceased her madness, and her flight, before. She touched the limits of the Farian shore. At length, arriving on the banks of Nile. Wearied with length of ways, and worn with toil. She laid her down, and, leaning on her knees. Invoked the cause of all her miseries. And cast her languishing regards above. For help from heaven and her ungrateful Jove. She sighed, she wept, she lowed, t'was all she could and with unkindness seemed to tax the god. Last, with an humble prayer, she begged repose. Or death, at least, to finish all her woes. Jove heard her vows, and, with a flattering look, in her behalf to jealous Juno spoke. He cast his arms about her neck, and said, Dame, rest secure. No more thy nuptial bed. This nymph shall violate, by sticks I swear and every oath that binds the thunderer. The goddess was appeased. And at the word. Was Io to her former shape restored. The rugged hair began to fall away. The sweetness of her eyes did only stay. Though not so large, her crooked horns decrease. The wideness of her jaws and nostrils cease. Her hoofs to hands return, in little space. The five long taper fingers take their place. And nothing of the heifer now is seen. Beside the native whiteness of the skin. Erected on her feet she walks again. And to the duty of the four sustain. She tries her tongue. Her silence softly breaks. And fears her former lowings when she speaks. A goddess now, through all the Egyptian state. And served by priests who in white linen wait. Her son was Epiphus, at length believed. The son of Jove, and as a god received. With sacrifice adored, and public prayers. He common temples with his mother shares. Equal in years, and rival in renown. With Epiphus, the youthful Phaeton. Like honor claims, and boasts his sire the son. His haughty looks, and his assuming air. The son of Isis could no longer bear. Thou takest thy mother's word too far, said he. And hast usurped thy boasted pedigree. Go, 
base pretender to a borrowed name. Thus taxed, he blushed with anger and with shame. But shame repressed his rage, the daunted youth. Soon seeks his mother, and inquires the truth. Mother, said he, this infamy was thrown. By Epiphus on you, and me your son. He spoke in public, told it to my face. Nor durst I vindicate the dire disgrace. Even I, the bold, the sensible of wrong. Restrained by shame, was forced to hold my tongue. To hear an open slander is a curse. But not to find an answer is a worse. If I am heaven begot, assert your son. By some sure sign, and make my father known. To right my honour, and redeem your own. He said, and saying, cast his arms about. Her neck, and begged her to resolve the doubt. Tis hard to judge if Clymene were moved. More by his prayer, whom she so dearly loved. Or more with fury fired, to find her name. Traduced, and made the sport of common fame. She stretched her arms to heaven, and fixed her eyes. On that fair planet that adorns the skies. Now by those beams, said she, whose holy fires. Consume my breast, and kindle my desires. By him who sees us both, and cheers our sight. By him, the public minister of light. I swear that son begot thee, if I lie. Let him his cheerful influence deny. Let him no more this perjured creature see. And shine on all the world but only me. If still you doubt your mother's innocence. His eastern mansion is not far from hence. With little pains you to his levy go. And from himself your parentage may know. With joy the ambitious youth his mother heard. And, eager for his journey, soon prepared. He longs the world beneath him to survey. To guide the chariot, and to give the day. From Marrow's burning sands he bends his course. Nor less in India feels his father's force. His travel urging, till he came in sight. And saw the palace by the purple light. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Book Chapter 2 Story of Phaeton Phaeton, the son of Apollo and Clymene, obtains from his fond father an oath that he will grant him whatever he requires. Which is no sooner uttered than the rash youth demands the guidance of his chariot for one day, Phoebus represents the impropriety of such a request, and the dangers to which it will expose him. But in vain. And, as the oath is inviolable, the youth is instructed how to proceed through the regions of the air, the advice, however, is disregarded. And the flying horses, becoming sensible of the incapacity of their driver, depart from their usual track. And the heavens and earth are threatened with a universal conflagration, when Jupiter strikes the charioteer with a thunderbolt, and hurls him headlong from heaven into the river Pa. The sun's bright palace, on high columns raised. With burnished gold and flaming jewels blazed. The folding gates diffused a silver light. And with a milder gleam refreshed the sight. Of polished ivory was the covering wrought. The matter vied not with the sculptor's thought. For in the portal was displayed on high. The work of Vulcan, a fictitious sky. Ah waving sea the inferior earth embraced. And gods and goddesses the waters graced. Aegean here a mighty whale best rode. Triton, and Proteus, the deceiving god. With Doris here were carved, and all her train. Some loosely swimming in the figured mane. While some on rocks their dropping hair divide. And some on fishes through the waters glide. Though various features did the sisters grace. A sister's likeness was in every face. On earth a different landscape courts the eyes. Men, towns, and beasts, in distant prospects rise. And nymphs, and streams, and woods, and rural deities. O'er all, 
the heaven's refulgent image shines. On either gate were six engraven signs. Here Phaeton, still gaining on the ascent. To his suspected father's palace went. Till, pressing forward through the bright abode. He saw at distance the illustrious god. He saw at distance, or the dazzling light. Had flashed too strongly on his aching sight. The god sits high, exalted on a throne. Of blazing gems, with purple garments on. The hours in order ranged on either hand. And days, and months, and years, and ages, stand. Here spring appears, with flowery chaplets bound. Here summer, in her wheaten garland crowned. Here autumn the rich trodden grapes besmear. And hoary winter shivers in the rear. Phoebus beheld the youth from off his throne. That eye which looks on all was fixed on one. He saw the boy's confusion in his face. Surprised at all the wonders of the place. And cries aloud, What wants my son? For no. My son thou art, and I must call thee so. Light of the world, the trembling youth replies. Illustrious parent. Since you don't despise. The parent's name, some certain token give. That I may climbing's proud boast believe. Nor longer under false reproaches grieve. The tender sire was touched with what he said. And flung the blaze of glories from his head. And bade the youth advance. My son, said he. Come to thy father's arms. For climbing. Has told thee true, a parent's name I own. And deem thee worthy to be called my son. As a sure proof, make some request, and I. Whatever it be, with that request comply. By sticks I swear, whose waves are hid in night. And roll impervious to my piercing sight. The youth, transported, asks, without delay. To guide the sun's bright chariot for a day. The god repented of the oath he took. For anguish thrice lease radiant head he shook. My son, said he, some other proof require. Rash was my promise, rash is thy desire. I'd fain deny this wish which thou hast made. Or, what I can't deny, would fain dissuade. Too vast and hazardous the task appears. Nor suited to thy strength, nor to thy years. Thy lot is mortal, but thy wishes fly. Beyond the province of mortality. There is not one of all the gods that dares. However skilled in other great affairs. To mount the burning axle tree, but I. Not Jove himself, the ruler of the sky. That hurls the three forked thunder from above. Dares try his strength, yet who so strong as Jove? The steeds climb up the first ascent with pain. And when the middle firmament they gain. If downwards from the heavens my head I bow. And see the earth and ocean hang below. Even I am seized with horror and affright. And my own heart misgives me at the sight. A mighty downfall steeps the evening stage. And steady rains must curb the horse's rage. Tethys herself has feared to see me driven. Down headlong from the precipice of heaven. Besides, consider what impetuous force. Turns stars and planets in a different course. I steer against their motions, nor am I. Borne back by all the current of the sky. But how could you resist the orbs that roll? In adverse worlds, and stem the rapid pole? But you, perhaps, may hope for pleasing woods. And stately domes, and cities filled with gods. While through a thousand snares your progress lies. Where forms of starry monsters stalk the skies. For, should you hit the doubtful way aright. The bull, with stooping horns. Stands opposite. Next him, the bright Haemonian bow is strung. And next, the lion's grinning visage hung. The scorpion's claws here clasp a wide extent. And here the crabs in lesser clasps are bent. Nor would you find it easy to compose. The meddled steeds, when from their nostrils flows. The scorching fire that in their entrails glows. 
Evan I their headstrong fury scarce restrain. When they grow warm and restive to the rain. Let not my son a fatal gift require. But, oh! In time, recall your rash desire. You ask a gift that may your parent tell. Let these my fears your parentage reveal. And learn a father from a father's care. Look on my face. Or if my heart lay bare. Could you but look, you'd read the father there. Choose out a gift, from seas, or earth, or skies. For open to your wish all nature lies. Only decline this one unequal task. For, tis a mischief, not a gift, you ask. You ask a real mischief, Phaeton. Nay, hang not thus about my neck, my son. I grant your wish, and Styx has heard my voice. Choose what you will, but make a wiser choice. Thus did the god the unwary youth advise. But he still longs to travel through the skies. When the fond father, for in vain he pleads. At length to the Vulcanian chariot leads. A golden axle did the work uphold. Gold was the beam, the wheels were orbed with gold. The spokes in rows of silver pleased the sight. The seat with party-colored gems was bright. Apollo shined amid the glare of light. The youth with secret joy the work surveys. When now the moon disclosed her purple rays. The stars were fled, for Lucifer had chased. The stars away, and fled himself at last. Soon as the father saw the rosy morn. And the moon shining with a blunter horn. He bid the nimble hours, without delay. Bring forth the steeds, the nimble hours obey. From their full racks the generous steeds retire. Dropping ambrosial foams, and snorting fire. Still anxious for his son, the god of day. To make him proof against the burning ray. His temples with celestial ointment wet. Of sovereign virtue, to repel the heat. Then fixed the beamy circle on his head. And fetched a deep foreboding sigh, and said. Take this at least, this last advice, my son. Keep a stiff rein. And move but gently on. The coursers of themselves will run too fast. Your art must be to moderate their haste. Drive them not on directly through the skies. But where the zodiac's winding circle lies. Along the midmost zone. But sally forth. Nor to the distant south, nor stormy north. The horse's hoofs a beaten track will show. But neither mount too high, nor sink too low. That no new fires or heaven or earth infest. Keep the midway, the middle way is best. Nor where, in radiant folds, the serpent twines. Direct your course. Nor where the altar shines. Shun both extremes, the rest let fortune guide. And better for thee than thyself provide. See, while I speak, the shades disperse away. Aurora gives the promise of a day. I'm called, nor can I make a longer stay. Snatch up the reins, or still the attempt forsake. And not my chariot, but my counsel, take. While yet securely on the earth you stand. Nor touch the horses with too rash a hand. Let me alone to light the world, while you. Enjoy those beams which you may safely view. He spoke in vain, the youth, with active heat. And sprightly vigor, vaults into the seat. And joys to hold the reins, and fondly gives. Those thanks his father with remorse receives. Meanwhile the restless horses neighed aloud. Breathing out fire, and pawing where they stood. Tethys, not knowing what had passed, gave way and all the waste of heaven before them lay. They spring together out, and swiftly bear. The flying youth through clouds and yielding air. With wingy speed outstrip the eastern wind. And leave the breezes of the morn behind. The youth was light, nor could he fill the seat. Or poise the chariot with its wonted weight. But as at sea the unballasted vessel rides. Cast to and fro the sport of winds and tides. 
so in the bounding chariot, tossed on high. The youth is hurried headlong through the sky. Soon as the steeds perceive it, they forsake their stated course, and leave the beaten track. The youth was in a maze, nor did he know which way to turn the reins, or where to go. Nor would the horses, had he known, obey. Then the seven stars first felt Apollo's ray, and wished to dip in the forbidden sea. The folded serpent, next the frozen pole, stiff and benumbed before, began to roll, and raged with inward heat, and threatened war, and shot a redder light from every star. Nay, and tis said, Boötes, too, that fain. Thou wouldst have fled, though cumbered with thy wain. The unhappy youth then, bending down his head, saw earth and ocean far beneath him spread. His color changed, he startled at the sight, and his eyes darkened by too great a light. Now could he wish the fiery steeds untried, his birth obscure, and his request denied. Now would he Merops for his father own, and quit his boasted kindred to the sun. So fares the pilot, when his ship is tossed, in troubled seas, and all its steerage lost. He gives her to the winds, and, in despair, seeks his last refuge in the gods and prayer. What could he do? His eyes, if backward cast, find a long path he had already passed. If forward, still a longer path they find. Both he compares, and measures in his mind. And sometimes casts an eye upon the east. And sometimes looks on the forbidden west. The horse's names he knew not in the fright. Nor would he loose the reins, nor could he hold them right. Now all the horrors of the heavens he spies. And monstrous shadows of prodigious size. That, decked with stars, lie scattered o'er the skies. There is a place above, where Scorpio bent. In tail and arms surrounds a vast extent. In a wide circuit of the heavens he shines. And fills the space of two celestial signs. Soon as the youth beheld him, vexed with heat. Brandish his sting, and in his poison sweat. Half dead with sudden fear, he dropped the reins. The horses felt them loose upon their manes. And, flying out through all the plains above. Ran, uncontrolled, where'er their fury drove. Rushed on the stars, and, through a pathless way. Of unknown regions, hurried on the day. And now above and now below they flew. And near the earth the burning chariot drew. The clouds disperse in fumes, the wandering moon. Beholds her brother's steeds beneath her own. The high land's smoke, cleft by the piercing rays. Or, clad with woods. In their own fuel blaze. Next o'er the plains, where ripened harvests grow. The running conflagration spreads below. But these are trivial ills, whole cities burn and peopled kingdoms into ashes turn. The mountains kindle as the car draws near. Athos and Molus red with fires appear. Oiagrian Hemus, then a single name. And virgin Helican increase the flame. Taurus and Eat glare amid the sky. And Ida, spite of all her fountains, dry. Eryx, and Othres, and Scytherin, glow. And Rodope, no longer clothed in snow. High Pindus, Mimas, and Parnassus, sweat. And Etna rages with redoubled heat. Even Scythia, through her hoary regions warmed. In vain with all her native frost was armed. Covered with flames, the towering Apennine. And Caucasus, and proud Olympus, shine. And where the long-extended Alps aspire. Now stands a huge continued range of fire. The astonished youth, where'er his eyes could turn, beheld the universe around him burn. The world was in a blaze. Nor could he bear the sultry vapors and the scorching air, which from below, as from a furnace, flowed. And now the axle tree beneath him glowed, lost in the whirling clouds that round him broke. 
and white with ashes, hovering in the smoke. He flew where'er the horses drove, nor knew whither the horses drove, or where he flew. Twas then, they say, the swarthy moor begun to change his hue, and blacken in the sun. Then Libya first, of all her moisture drained, became a barren waste, a wild of sand. The water nymphs lament their empty urns. Boeotia, robbed of silver dursy, mourns. Corinth Pyrene's wasted spring bewails. And Argos grieves while a mimony fails. The foods are drained from every distant coast. Evan Tanais, though fixed in ice, was lost. Enraged Caicus and Lycorma's roar. And Xanthus, fated to be burnt once more. The famed meander. That unwearied strays. Through many windings, smokes in every maze. From his loved Babylon Euphrates flies. The big swollen Ganges and the Danube rise. In thickening fumes. And darken half the skies. In flames is Minos and the faces rolled. And Tagus, floating in his melted gold. The swans, that on Caster often tried. Their tuneful songs. Now sung their last, and died. The fright Nile ran off, and underground. Concealed his head, nor can it yet be found. His seven divided currents all are dry. And, where they rolled, seven gaping trenches lie. No more the Rhine or Rhone their course maintain. Nor Tiber, of his promised empire vain. The ground, deep cleft, admits the dazzling ray and startles Pluto with the flash of day. The seas shrink in, and to the sight disclose. Wide naked plains. Where once their billows rose. Their rocks are all discovered, and increase. The number of the scattered Cyclades. The fish in shoals about the bottom creep. Nor longer dares the crooked dolphin leap. Gasping for breath, the unshapen folky die and on the boiling wave extended lie. Nereus, and Doris, with her virgin train. Seek out the last recesses of the main. Beneath unfathomable depths they faint. And secret in their gloomy caverns pant. Stern Neptune thrice above the waves upheld. His face. And thrice was by the flames repelled. The earth at length, on every side embraced. With scalding seas, that floated round her waist. When now she felt the springs and rivers come. And crowd within the hollow of her womb. Uplifted to the heavens her blasted head. And clapped her hand upon her brows, and said. But first, impatient of the sultry heat. Sunk deeper down. And sought a cooler seat. If you, great king of gods, my death approve. And I deserve it, let me die by Jove. If I must perish by the force of fire. Let me transfixed with thunderbolts expire. See, while I speak, my breath the vapors choke. For now her face lay wrapped in clouds of smoke. See my singed hair, behold my faded eye. And withered face. Where heaps of cinders lie. And does the plow for this my body tear? This the reward for all the fruits I bear. Tortured with rakes, and harassed all the year. That herbs for cattle daily I renew. And food for man, and frankincense for you. But, grant me guilty, what has Neptune done? Why are his waters boiling in the sun? The wavy empire, which by lot was given. Why does it waste, and farther shrink from heaven? If I nor he your pity can provoke. See your own heavens, the heavens begin to smoke. Should once the sparkles catch those bright abodes. Destruction seizes on the heavens and gods. Atlas becomes unequal to his freight. And almost faints beneath the glowing weight. If heaven, and earth, and sea, together burn. All must again into their chaos turn. Apply some speedy cure, prevent our fate and succor nature ere it be too late. She ceased, for choked with vapors round her spread. Down to the deepest shades she sunk her head. 
Jove called to witness every power above. And even the god whose son the chariot drove. That what he acts he is compelled to do. Or universal ruin must ensue. Straight he ascends the high ethereal throne. From whence he used to dart his thunder down. From whence his showers and storms he used to pour. But now could meet with neither storm nor shower. Then, aiming at the youth, with lifted hand. Full at his head he hurled the forky brand. In dreadful thunderings. Thus the Almighty Sire. Suppressed the raging of the fires with fire. At once from life and from the chariot driven. The ambitious boy fell thunderstruck from heaven. The horses started with a sudden bound. And flung the reins and chariot to the ground. The studded harness from their necks they broke. Here fell a wheel, and here a silver spoke. Here were the beam and axle torn away. And scattered o'er the earth the shining fragments lay. The breathless Phaeton with flaming hair. Shot from the chariot like a falling star. That in a summer's evening from the top. Of heaven drops down, or seems, at least, to drop. Till on the pah his blasted corpse was hurled. Far from his country, in the western world. Phaeton's sisters transformed into trees. The nymphs of Latium erect a monument to the memory of Phaeton. Whose sisters are changed into poplars while bewailing their brother's untimely fate. The Latian nymphs came round him, and amazed. On the dead youth, transfixed with thunder, gazed. And, while yet smoking from the bolt he lay. His shattered body to a tomb convey. And o'er the tomb an epitaph devise. Here he who drove the sun's bright chariot lies. His father's fiery steeds he could not guide. But in the glorious enterprise he died. Apollo hid his face, and pined for grief. And, if the story may deserve belief, the space of one whole day is said to run. From morn to wanted Evan, without a sun. The burning ruins, with a faint array. Supply the sun, and counterfeit a day. A day that still did nature's face disclose. This comfort from the mighty mischief rose. But climbing, enraged with grief, laments. And as her grief inspires her passion vents. Wild for her son, and frantic in her woes. With hair disheveled, round the world she goes. To seek where'er his body might be cast. Till, on the borders of the Pa. At last. The name inscribed on the new tomb appears. The dear, dear name she bathes in flowing tears. Hangs o'er the tomb, unable to depart. And hugs the marble to her throbbing heart. Her daughters too lament, and sigh, and mourn. A fruitless tribute to their brother's urn. And beat their naked bosoms, and complain. And call aloud for Phaeton in vain. All the long night their mournful watch they keep. And all the day stand round the tomb and weep. For times, revolving, the full moon returned. So long the mother and the daughters mourned. When now the eldest, Phethusa, strove. To rest her weary limbs, but could not move. Lampetia would have helped her, but she found. Herself withheld and rooted to the ground. A third, in wild affliction as she grieves. Would rend her hair, but fills her hands with leaves. One sees her thighs transformed. Another views. Her arms slot out and branching into boughs. And now their legs, and breasts, and bodies, stood. Crusted with bark, and hardened into wood. But still above were female heads displayed. And mouths, that called the mother to their aid. What could, alas, the weeping mother do? From this to that with eager haste she flew. And kissed her sprouting daughters as they grew. She tears the bark that to each body cleaves. And from their verdant fingers strips the leaves. The blood came trickling where she tore away. The leaves and bark. The maids were heard to say. Forbear, mistaken parent, O oh forbear. A wounded daughter in each tree you tear. 
farewell forever. Here the bark increased. Closed on their faces, and their words suppressed. The new-made trees in tears of amber run. Which, hardened into value by the sun. Distill forever on the stream below. The limpid streams their radiant treasure show. Mixed in the sand, whence the rich drops conveyed. Shine in the dress of the bright Latian maid. Transformation of sickness into a swan. Sickness, the son of Sthenelus, is deeply affected at the death of his friend and relation, Phaeton. And, in the midst of his lamentations, is metamorphosed into a swan. Sickness beheld the nymphs transformed, allied. To their dead brother on the mortal side. In friendship and affection nearer bound. He left the cities and the realms he owned. Through pathless fields and lonely shores to range. And woods made thicker by the sisters' change. While here within the dismal gloom alone. The melancholy monarch made his moan. His voice was lessened as he tried to speak. And issued through a long extended neck. His hair transforms to down, his fingers meet. In skinny films and shape his oary feet. From both his sides the wings and feathers break. And from his mouth proceeds a blunted beak. All sickness now into a swan was turned. Who, still remembering how his kinsmen burned. To solitary pools and lakes retires. And loves the waters as opposed to fires. Meanwhile Apollo, in the gloomy shade. The native luster of his brows decayed. Indulging sorrow, sickens at the sight. Of his own sunshine, and abhors the light. The hidden griefs that in his bosom rise. Sadden his looks and overcast his eyes. As when some dusky orb obstructs his ray. And sullies, in a dim eclipse, the day. Now secretly with inward griefs he pined. Now warm resentments to his grief he joined. And now renounced his office to mankind. Ere since the birth of time, said he, I've borne. A long ungrateful toil without return. Let now some other manage, if he dare. The fiery steeds, and mount the burning car. Or, if none else, let Jove his fortune try. And learn to lay his murdering thunder by. Then will he own, perhaps, but own too late. My son deserved not so severe a fate. The gods stand round him, as he mourns, and pray. He would resume the conduct of the day. Nor let the world be lost in endless night. Jove to himself, descending from his height. Excuses what had happened, and entreats. Majestically mixing prayers and threats. Prevailed upon at length, again he took. The harnessed steeds, that still with horror shook. And plies them with the lash, and whips them on. And, as he whips. Upbraids them with his son. Story of Callisto. Callisto, a nymph in the train of Diana, is seduced by Jupiter, under the form of that goddess, and is delivered of a son. Named Arcus Juno transforms Callisto into the shape of a bear. But Jupiter removes both mother and child to the celestial mansions, where they are converted into a constellation called the Bear. The day was settled in its course, and Jove walked the wide circuit of the heavens above to search if any cracks or flaws were made. But all was safe, the earth he then surveyed and cast an eye on every different coast and every land, but on Arcadia most. Her fields he clothed, and cheered her blasted face. With running fountains and with springing grass. No tracks of heaven's destructive fire remain. The fields and woods revive, and nature smiles again. But as the god walked to and fro the earth. And raised the plants, and gave the spring its birth. By chance a fair Arcadian nymph he viewed. And felt the lovely charmer in his blood. The nymph nor spun nor dressed with artful pride. Her vest was gathered up, her hair was tied. Now in her hand a slender spear she bore. Now a light quiver on her shoulders wore. To chaste Diana from her youth inclined. 
the sprightly warriors of the wood she joined. Diana too the gentle huntress loved. Nor was there one of all the nymphs that roved. O'er Mienalus, amid the maiden throng. More favored once, but favor lasts not long. The sun now shone in all its strength, and drove. The heated virgin panting to the grove. The grove around a grateful shadow cast. She dropped her arrows, and her bow unbraced. She flung herself on the cool grassy bed. And on the painted quiver raised her head. Jove saw the charming huntress unprepared. Stretched on the verdant turf, without a guard. Here I am safe, he cries, from Juno's eye. Or should my jealous queen the theft descry? Yet I would venture on a theft like this. And stand her rage, for such, for such a bliss. Diana's shape and habit straight he took. Softened his brows, and smoothed his awful look. And mildly in a female accent spoke. How fares my girl? How went the morning chase? To whom the virgin, starting from the grass? All hail! Bright deity, whom I prefer. To Jove himself, though Jove himself were here. The god was nearer than she thought, and heard. Well pleased, himself before himself preferred. He then salutes her with a warm embrace. And, ere she half had told the morning chase. With love inflamed, and eager on his bliss. Smothered her words, and stopped her with a kiss. His kisses with unwanted ardor glowed. Nor could Diana's shape conceal the god. Possessed at length of what his heart desired. Back to his heavens the exulting god retired. But now Diana, with a sprightly train. Of quivered virgins, bounding o'er the plain. Called to the nymph, the nymph began to fear. A second fraud, a Jove disguised in her. But when she saw the sister nymphs, suppressed. Her rising fears, and mingled with the rest. How in the look does conscious guilt appear? Slowly she moved, and loitered in the rear. Nor lightly tripped, nor by the goddess ran. As once she used, the foremost of the train. Her looks were fushed, and sullen was her mien. That sure the virgin goddess, had she been. Aught but a virgin, must the guilt have seen. Tis said the nymph saw all, and guessed aright. And now the moon had nine times lost her light. When Dien, fainting in the midday beams, found a cool covert and refreshing streams, that in soft murmurs through the forest flowed, and a smooth bed of shining gravel showed, a covert so obscure and streams so clear. The goddess praised, and now no spies are near. Let's strip, my gentle maids, and wash, she cries. Pleased with the motion, every maid complies. Only the blushing huntress stood confused. And form delays, and her delays excused. In vain excused. Her fellows round her pressed. And the reluctant nymph by force undressed. The naked huntress all her shame revealed. In vain her hands her pregnancy concealed. Begone! The goddess cries, with stern disdain. Be gone. Nor dare the hallowed stream to stain. She fled, forever banished from the train. This Juno heard, who long had watched her time. To punish the detested rival's crime. The time was come, for, to enrage her more. A lovely boy the teeming rival bore. The goddess cast a furious look, and cried. It is enough. I'm fully satisfied. This boy shall stand a living mark, to prove my husband's baseness and the harlot's love. But vengeance shall awake, those guilty charms that drew the thunderer from Juno's arms. No longer shall their wanted force retain, nor please the god, nor make the mortal vain. This said, her hand within her hair she wound, swung her to earth, and dragged her on the ground. The prostrate wretch lifts up her arms in prayer. Her arms grow shaggy and deformed with hair. Her nails are sharpened into pointed claws. 
Her hands bare baff her weight and turn to pause. Her lips, that once could tempt a god. Begin. To grow distorted in an ugly grin. And, lest the supplicating brute might reach. The cars of Jove, she was deprived of speech. Her surly voice through a hoarse passage came. In savage sounds, her mind was still the same. The furry monster fixed her eyes above. And heaved her new unwieldy paws to Jove. And begged his aid with inward groans, and though. She could not call him false she thought him so. How did she fear to lodge in woods alone? And haunt the fields and meadows once her own? How often would the deep-mouthed dogs pursue? While from her hounds the fright huntress flew? How did she fear her fellow brutes, and shun? The shaggy bear, though now herself was one. How from the sight of rugged wolves retire? Although the grim Lycaon was her sire. But now her son had fifteen summers told. Fierce at the chase, and in the forest bold. When, as he beat the woods in quest of prey, he chanced to rouse his mother where she lay. She knew her son, and kept him in her sight. And fondly gazed. The boy was in a fright. And aimed a pointed arrow at her breast. And would have slain his mother in the beast. But Jove forbade, and snatched them through the air in whirlwinds up to heaven, and fixed them there, where the new constellations nightly rise, and add a luster to the northern skies. When Juno saw the rival in her height, spangled with stars and circled round with light, she sought old ocean in his deep abodes, and Tethys, both revered among the gods. They ask what brings her there. Ne'er ask, says she. What brings me here? heaven is no place for me. You'll see, when all things are obscured by night. Jove's starry mistress with resplendent light. Usurp the heavens. You'll see her proudly roll. In her new orb, and brighten all the pole. And who shall now on Juno's altars wait? When those she hates grow greater by her hate? I on the nymph a brutal form impressed. Jove to a goddess has transformed the beast. This, this was all my weak revenge could do. But let the god his chaste amours pursue. And, as he acted after Io's rape, restore the adulteress to her former shape. Then may he cast his Juno off, and lead the great Lycaon's offspring to his bed. But you, ye venerable powers, be kind. And, if my wrongs a due resentment find, Receive not in your waves their setting beams. Nor let the glaring harlot taint your streams. The goddess ended, and her wish was given. Back she returned in triumph up to heaven. Her gaudy peacocks drew her through the skies. Their tails were spotted with a thousand eyes. The eyes of Argus on their tails were ranged. At the same time the raven's color changed. Story of Caronus and birth of Aesculapius. Apollo is informed by the raven, whose plumage was originally white, of the infidelity of Caronus, his favorite mistress, whom he destroys. While he delivers her newborn son, Aesculapius, to the custody of Chiron, a dark color is bestowed on the raven as a punishment of his garrulity. The raven once in snowy plumes was dressed. White as the whitest dove's unsullied breast. Fair as the guardian of the capital. Soft as the swan, a large and lovely fowl. His tongue, his prating tongue, had changed him quite. To sooty blackness from the purest white. The story of his change shall here be told. In Thessaly there lived a nymph of old. Caronus named, a peerless maid she shined. Confessed the fairest of the fairer kind. Apollo loved her till her guilt he knew while true she was, or while he thought her true. But his own bird, the raven, chanced to find. The false one with a secret rival joined. Caronus begged him to suppress the tale. But could not with repeated prayers prevail. His milk-white pinions to the god he plied. The busy daw flew with him side by side. 
and, by a thousand teasing questions, drew the important secret from him as they flew. The daw gave honest counsel, though despised. And, tedious in her tattle, thus advised. Stay, silly bird, the ill-natured task refuse. Nor be the bearer of unwelcome news. Be warned by my example. You discern. What now I am, and what I was shall learn. My foolish honesty was all my crime. Then hear my story. Once upon a time. The two-shaped Erichthonius had his birth. Without a mother, from the teeming earth. Minerva nursed him, and the infant laid. Within a chest of twining osiers made. The daughters of King Cecrops undertook. To guard the chest, commanded not to look. On what was hid within. I stood to see. The charge obeyed, perched on a neighboring tree. The sisters, Pandrosos and Herse, keep. The strict command. Agloro's needs would peep. And saw the monstrous infant, in a fright. And called her sisters to the hideous sight. A boy's soft shape did to the waist prevail. But the boy ended in a dragon's tail. I told the stern Minerva all that passed. But for my pains discarded and disgraced. The frowning goddess drove me from her sight. And for her favorite chose the bird of night. Be then no telltale, for I think my wrong. Enough to teach a bird to hold her tongue. But you, perhaps, may think I was removed. As never by the heavenly maid beloved. But I was loved, ask Pallas if I lie. Though Pallas hates me now, she won't deny. For I, whom in a feathered shape you view, was once a maid, by heaven the story's true. A blooming maid, and a king's daughter too. A crowd of lovers owned my beauty's charms. My beauty was the cause of all my harms. Neptune, as on his shores I want to rove. Observed me in my walks, and fell in love. He made his courtship, he confessed his pain. And offered force when all his arts were vain. Swift he pursued. I ran along the strand. Till spent and wearied on the sinking sand. I shrieked aloud, with cries I filled the air. To gods and men. Nor god nor man was there. A virgin goddess heard a virgin's prayer. For, as my arms I lifted to the skies. I saw black feathers from my fingers rise. I strove to fling my garment on the ground. My garment turned to plumes, and girt me round. My hands to beat my naked bosom try. Nor naked bosom now nor hands had I. Lightly I tripped, nor weary as before. Sunk in the sand, but schemed along the shore. Till, rising on my wings, I was preferred. To be the chaste Minerva's virgin bird. Preferred in vain. I now am in disgrace. Nictimani, the owl, enjoys my place. On her incestuous life I need not dwell. In Lesbo still the horrid tale they tell. And of her dire amours you must have heard. For which she now does penance in a bird. That, conscious of her shame, avoids the light. And loves the gloomy covering of the night. The birds, where'er she flutters, scare away. The hooting wretch, and drive her from the day. The raven, urged by such impertinence, grew passionate, it seems, and took offense. And cursed the harmless daw, the daw withdrew. The raven to her injured patron flew. And found him out, and told the fatal truth. Of false Caronus, and the favored youth. The god was wroth, the color left his look. The wreath his head, the harp his hand, forsook. His silver bow and feathered shafts he took. And lodged an arrow in the tender breast. That had so often to his own been pressed. Down fell the wounded nymph, and sadly groaned. And pulled his arrow reeking from the wound. And, weltering in her blood, thus faintly cried. Ah, cruel God! Though I have justly died. What has, alas! My unborn infant done. 
that he should fall, and two expire in one. This said, in agonies she fetched her breath. The god dissolves in pity at her death. He hates the bird that made her falsehood known. And hates himself for what himself had done. The feathered shaft that sent her to the fates. And his own hand that sent the shaft, he hates. Fain would he heal the wound and ease her pain. And tries the compass of his art in vain. Soon as he saw the lovely nymph expire. The pile made ready, and the kindling fire. With sighs and groans her obsequies he kept. And, if a god could weep, the god had wept. Her corpse he kissed, and heavenly incense brought. And solemnized the death himself had wrought. But lest his offspring should her fate partake. Spite of the immortal mixture in his make. He ripped her womb and set the child at large. And gave him to the centaur Chiron's charge. Then in his fury blacked the raven o'er. And bade him prate in his white plumes no more. Osiro transformed to a mare. Osiro, the daughter of Chiron, is transformed into a mare, for abusing her gift of prophecy. Old Chiron took the babe with secret joy. Proud of the charge of the celestial boy. His daughter too, whom on the sandy shore. The nymph Curiclo to the centaur bore. With hair disheveled on her shoulders, came. To see the child, Osiro was her name. She knew her father's arts, and could rehearse. The depths of prophecy in sounding verse. Once as the sacred infant she surveyed. The god was kindled in the raving maid. And thus she uttered her prophetic tale. Hail! Great physician of the world, all hail! Hail! Mighty infant! Who in years to come Shalt heal the nations and defraud the tomb. Swift be thy growth. Thy triumphs unconfined. Make kingdoms thicker, and increase mankind. Thy daring art shall animate the dead. And draw the thunder on thy guilty head. Then shalt thou die, but from the dark abode. Rise up victorious, and be twice a god. And thou, my sire, not destined by thy birth to turn to dust, and mix with common earth. How wilt thou toss, and rave, and long to die? And quit thy claim to immortality. When thou shalt feel, enraged with inward pains. The hydra's venom rankling in thy veins. The gods, in pity, shall contract thy date. And give thee over to the power of fate. Thus, entering into destiny, the maid. The secrets of offended Jove betrayed. More had she still to say. But now appears. Pressed with sobs and sighs, and drowned in tears. My voice, says she, is gone, my language fails. Through every limb my kindred shape prevails. Why did the god this fatal gift impart? And with prophetic raptures swell my heart? What new desires are these? I long to pace. O'er flowery meadows, and to feed on grass. I hasten to a brute, a maid no more. But why, alas? Am I transformed all o'er? My sire does half a human shape retain. And in his upper parts preserves the man. Her tongue no more distinct complaints affords. But in shrill accents and misshapen words. Pours forth such hideous wailings, as declare. The human form confounded in the mare. Till by degrees accomplished in the beast. She neighed outright, and all the steed expressed. Her stooping body on her hands is borne. Her hands are turned to hoofs and shod in horn. Her yellow tresses ruffle in a mane. And in a flowing tail she frisks her train. The mare was finished in her voice and look. And a new name from the new figure took. Transformation of Battus to a touchstone. Battus, a shepherd of Pylus, promises Mercury that he will not reveal his theft of the flocks of Admetus. Which Apollo tended, the promise is violated, and Battus turned into a pumice stone. Sore wept the centaur, and to Phoebus prayed. But how could Phoebus give the centaur aid? 
degraded of his power by angry Jove. In Ellis then a herd of bees he drove, and wielded in his hand a staff of oak, and o'er his shoulders threw the shepherd's cloak. On seven compacted reeds he used to play, and on his rural pipe to waste the day. As once attentive to his pipe he played, the crafty Hermes from the god conveyed. A drove, that separate from their fellows strayed. The theft an old insidious peasant viewed. They called him Battus in the neighborhood. Hired by a wealthy Pillian prince to feed. His favorite Mares, and watch the generous breed. The thievish god suspected him, and took. The hind aside, and thus in whispers spoke. Discover not the theft, who are thou be? And take that milk-white heifer for thy fee. Go, stranger, cries the clown, securely on. That stone shall sooner tell, and showed a stone. The god withdrew, but straight returned again. In speech and habit like a country swain. And cries out, Neighbor, hast thou seen a stray? Of bullocks and of heifers pass this way? In the recovery of my cattle join. A bullock and a heifer shall be thine. The peasant quick replies, You'll find them there. In yon dark vale, and in the vale they were. The double bribe had his false heart beguiled. The god, successful in the trial, smiled. And dost thou thus betray myself to me? Me to myself dost thou betray, says he. Then to a touchstone turns the faithless spy. And in his name records his infamy. Story of Agloros transformed into a statue. Herse, a daughter of Cecrops, is beloved by Mercury, who discloses his passion to Agloros, her sister. Who exacts large sums of money as the price of her connivance at the intrigue, Minerva, offended at the rapacity of the maiden, commands envy to torment her continually. And Mercury at length changes her into a stone. This done, the god flew up on high, and passed. O'er lofty Athens, by Minerva graced. And wide Munichia, while his eyes survey. All the vast region that beneath him lay. T'was now the feast, when each Athenian made. Her yearly homage to Minerva paid. In canisters with garlands covered o'er. High on their heads their mystic gifts they bore. And now, returning in a solemn train. The troop of shining virgins filled the plain. The god, well pleased, beheld the pompous show. And saw the bright procession pass below. Then veered about and took a wheeling flight. And hovered o'er them. As the spreading kite. That smells the slaughtered victims from on high. Flies at a distance, if the priests are nigh. And sails around and keeps it in her eye. So kept the god the virgin choir in view. And in slow winding circles round them flew. As Lucifer excels the meanest star. Or as the full-orbed Phoebe Lucifer. So much did hearse all the rest out vie. And gave a grace to the solemnity. Hermes was fired as in the clouds he hung. So the cold bullet, that with fury slung. From Balearic engines, mounts on high. Glows in the whirl, and burns along the sky. At length he pitched upon the ground, and showed. The form divine, the features of a god. He knew their virtue o'er a female heart. And yet he strives to better them by art. He hangs his mantle loose, and sets to show. The golden edging on the seam below. Adjusts his flowing curls, and in his hand. Waves with an air the sleep procuring wand. The glittering sandals to his feet applies. And to each heel the well-trimmed pinion ties. His ornaments with nicest art displayed. He seeks the apartment of the royal maid. The roof was all with polished ivory lined. That richly mixed, in clouds of tortoise shined. Three rooms, contiguous, in a range were placed. The midmost by the beauteous hearse graced. Her virgin sisters lodged on either side. Agloros first the approaching god descried. And as he crossed her chamber asked his name. And what his busness was, and whence he came. 
I come, replied the god, from heaven, to woo your sister, and to make an ant of you. I am the son and messenger of Jove. My name is Mercury, my busness love. Do you, kind damsel, take a lover's part? And gain admittance to your sister's heart. She stared him in the face with looks amassed. As when she on Minerva's secret gassed. And asks a mighty treasure for her hire. And till he brings it makes the god retire. Minerva grieved to see the nymph succeed. And now remembering the late impious deed. When, disobedient to her strict command. She touched the chest with an unhallowed hand. In big swollen sighs her inward rage expressed. That heaved the rising aegis on her breast. Then sought out envy in her dark abode. Defilled with ropey gore and clots of blood. Shut from the winds and from the wholesome skies. In a deep vale the gloomy dungeon lies. Dismal and cold, where not a beam of light. Invades the winter or disturbs the night. Directly to the cave her course she steered. Against the gates her martial lance she reared. The gates flew open, and the fiend appeared. A poisonous morsel in her teeth she chewed. And gorged the flesh of vipers for her food. Minerva, loathing, turned away her eye. The hideous monster, rising heavily. Came stalking forward with a sullen pace. And left her mangled offals on the place. Soon as she saw the goddess gay and bright. She fetched a groan at such a cheerful sight. Livid and meager were her looks, her eye. In foul distorted glances turned awry. A horde of gall her inward parts possessed. And spread a greenness o'er her cankered breast. Her teeth were brown with rust, and from her tongue. In dangling drops, the stringy poison hung. She never smiles but when the wretched weep. Nor lulls her malice with a moment's sleep. Restless in spite, while watchful to destroy. She pines and sickens at another's joy. Foe to herself, distressing and distressed. She bears her own tormentor in her breast. The goddess gave, for she abhorred her sight. A short command, to Athens speed thy flight. On cursed agloros try thy utmost art and fix thy rancorous venoms in her heart. This said, her spear she pushed against the ground, and mounting from it with an active bound, flew off to heaven. The hag with eyes askew, looked up, and muttered curses as she flew. For sore she fretted, and began to grieve, at the success which she herself must give. Then takes her staff, hung round with wreaths of thorn, and sails along, in a black whirlwind born, o'er fields and flowery meadows, where she steers, her baneful course a mighty blast appears, mildews and blights, the meadows are defaced, the fields, the flowers, and the whole year, laid waste, on mortals next and peopled towns she falls, and breathes a burning plague among their walls, when Athens she beheld, for arts renowned. With peace made happy, and with plenty crowned. Scarce could the hideous fiend from tears forbear. To find out nothing that deserved a tear. The apartment now she entered where at rest. Agloros lay, with gentle sleep oppressed. To execute Minerva's dire command. She stroked the virgin with her cankered hand. Then prickly thorns into her breast conveyed. That stung to madness the devoted maid. Her subtle venom still improves the smart. Frets in the blood, and festers in the heart. To make the work more sure, a scene she drew. And placed before the dreaming virgin's view. Her sister's marriage, and her glorious fate. The imaginary bride appears in state. The bridegroom with unwanted beauty glows. For envy magnifies whatever she shows. Full of the dream, a gloros pinned away. In tears all night, in darkness all the day. Consumed like ice, that just begins to run. When feebly smitten by the distant sun. Or like unwholesome weeds, that, set on fire. 
are slowly wasted, and in smoke expire. Given up to envy, for in every thought. The thorns, the venom, and the vision wrought. Oft did she call on death, as oft decreed. Rather than see her sister's wish succeed. To tell her awful father what had passed. At length before the door herself she cast. And, sitting on the ground with Swaylen pride. A passage to the lovesick God denied. The God caressed and for admission prayed. And soothed in softest words the envenomed maid. In vain he soothed. Begone, the maid replies. Or here I keep my seat and never rise. Then keep thy seat forever, cries the God. And touched the door, wide opening to his rod. Fain would she rise and stop him, but she found. Her trunk too heavy to forsake the ground. Her joints are all benumbed, her hands are pale. And marble now appears in every nail. As when a cancer in the body feeds. And gradual death from limb to limb proceeds. So does the chillness to each vital part. Spread by degrees, and creeps into her heart. Till hardening everywhere, and speechless grown. She sits unmoved, and freezes to a stone. But still her envious hue and sullen mien. Are in, he sedentary figure seen. Europa's rape. Europa, the daughter of Agenor, is beloved by Jupiter, who assumes the shape of a bull, and mingles with the herd, the maiden caresses the beautiful animal. And at length ventures to sit on his back. When the god immediately hastens to the shore, and crosses the sea, he arrives safe at Crete with his mistress, where he resumes his original shape. When now the god his fury had allayed. And taken vengeance of the stubborn maid. From where the bright Athenian turrets rise. He mounts aloft, and reascends the skies. Jove saw him enter the sublime abodes. And, as he mixed among the crowd of gods. Beckoned him out, and drew him from the rest. And in soft whispers thus his will expressed. My trusty Hermes, by whose ready aid. Thy sire's commands are through the world conveyed. Resume thy wings, exert their utmost force. And to the walls of Sidon speed thy course. There find a herd of heifers wandering o'er. The neighboring hill, and drive them to the shore. Thus spoke the god, concealing his intent. The trusty Hermes on his message went. And found the herd of heifers wandering o'er. A neighboring hill, and drove them to the shore. Where the king's daughter. With a lovely train. Of fellow nymphs, was sporting on the plain. The dignity of empire laid aside. For love but ill agrees with kingly pride. The ruler of the skies, the thundering god. Who shakes the world's foundations with a nod. Among a herd of lowing heifers ran. Frisked in a bull, and bellowed o'er the plain. Large rolls of fat about his shoulders clung. And from his neck the double dewlap hung. His skin was whiter than the snow that lies. Unsullied by the breath of southern skies. Small shining horns on his curled forehead stand. As turned and polished by the workman's hand. His eyeballs rolled, not formidably bright. But gazed and languished with a gentle light. His every look was peaceful, and expressed. The softness of the lover in the beast. Aegenor's royal daughter, as she played. Among the fields, the milk-white bull surveyed. And viewed his spotless body with delight. And at a distance kept him in her sight. At length she plucked the rising flowers, and fed. The gentle beast, and fondly stroked his head. He stood, well pleased to touch the charming fair. But hardly could confine his pleasures there. And now he wantons o'er the neighboring strand. Now rolls his body on the yellow sand. And, now perceiving all her fears decayed. Comes tossing forward to the royal maid. Gives her his breast to stroke, and downward turns. His grisly brow, and gently stoops his horns. In flowery wreaths the royal virgin dressed. His bending horns, and kindly clapped his breast. 
till now grown wanton and devoid of fear. Not knowing that she pressed the thunderer. She placed herself upon his back, and rode. O'er fields and meadows, seated on the god. He gently marched along, and by degrees. Left the dry meadow, and approached the seas. Where now he dips his hoofs and wets his thighs. Now plunges in, and carries off the prize. The fright nymph looks backward on the shore. And hears the tumbling billows round her roar. But still she holds him fast, one hand is borne. Upon his back, the other grasps a horn. Her train of ruffling garments flies behind. Swells in the air, and hovers in the wind. Through storms and tempests he the virgin bore. And lands her safe on the Dictian shore. Where now, in his divinest form arrayed. In his true shape he captivates the maid. Who gazes on him, and with wondering eyes. Beholds the new majestic figure rise. His glowing features, and celestial light. And all the god discovered to her sight. Book. Chapter 3. Story of Cadmus. The sons of Agenor are dispatched by their father in quest of their sister, with injunctions never to return until they find her, Cadmus consults the oracle of Apollo. And is directed to build a city where he shall see a young heifer stop in the grass, and to call the country Boeotia, he finds the heifer according to the instructions of the oracle. And sends his companions in search of water, all of whom are devoured by a dragon. Which is destroyed by Cadmus with the assistance of Minerva, the goddess commands the hero to sow the monster's teeth in the plain which is no sooner performed than armed men instantly spring from the ground, who direct their rage against each other, till all perish except five, who assist Cadmus in building the city. When now Agenor had his daughter lost, he sent his son to search on every coast, and sternly bid him to his arms restore the darling maid, or see his face no more, but live in exile in a foreign clime. Thus was the father pious to a crime. The restless youth searched all the world around. But how can Jove in his amours be found? When, tired at length with unsuccessful toil, to shun his angry sire and native soil, he goes a suppliant to the Delphic dame. There asks the god what new appointed home should end his wanderings and his toil relieve. The Delphic oracles this answer give. Behold among the fields a lonely cow. Unworn with yokes, unbroken to the plough. Mark well the place where first she lays her down. There measure out thy walls, and build thy town. And from the guide Boeotia call the land. In which the destined walls and town shall stand. No sooner had he left the dark abode. Big with the promise of the Delphic god. When in the fields the fatal cow he viewed nor galled with yokes, nor worn with servitude. Her gently at a distance he pursued. And, as he walked aloof, in silence prayed. To the great power whose counsels he obeyed. Her way through flowery panope she took. And now, Cephasus, cross thy silver brook. When to the heavens her spacious front she raised. And bellowed thrice. Then backward turning gazed on those behind, till on the destined place. She stooped, and couched amid the rising grass. Cadmus salutes the soil, and gladly hails. The new-found mountains and the nameless valleys. And thanks the gods, and turns about his eye. To see his new dominions round him lie. Then sends his servants to a neighboring grove. For living streams, a sacrifice to Jove. O'er the wide plain there rose a shady wood. Of aged trees. In its dark bosom stood. A bushy thicket, pathless and unworn. O'errun with brambles, and perplexed with thorn. Amid the brake a hollow den was found. With rocks and shelving arches vaulted round. Deep in the dreary den, concealed from day. Sacred to Mars, a mighty dragon lay. Bloated with poison to a monstrous size. Fire broke in flashes when he glanced his eyes. 
his towering crest was glorious to behold. His shoulders and his sides were scaled with gold. Three tongues he brandished when he charged his foes. His teeth stood jaggy in three dreadful rows. The Tyrians in the den for water sought. And with their urns explored the hollow vault. From side to side their empty urns rebound. And rouse the sleeping serpent with the sound. Straight he bestirs him, and is seen to rise. And now with dreadful hissings fills the skies. And darts his forky tongues, and rolls his glaring eyes. The Tyrians drop their vessels in the fright. All pale and trembling at the hideous sight. Spire above spire upreared in air he stood. And gazing round him overlooked the wood. Then floating on the ground in circles rolled. Then leaped upon them in a mighty fold. Of such a bulk and such a monstrous size. The serpent in the polar circle lies. That stretches over half the northern skies. In vain the Tyrians on their arms rely. In vain attempt to fight, in vain to fly. All their endeavors and their hopes are vain. Some die entangled in the winding train. Some are devoured, or feel a loathsome death. Swollen up with blasts of pestilential breath. And now the scorching sun was mounted high. In all its luster, to the noonday sky. When, anxious for his friends, and filled with cares. To search the woods the impatient chief prepares. A lion's hide around his loins he wore. The well-poised javelin to the field he bore. Inured to blood, the far-destroying dart. And, the best weapon, an undaunted heart. Soon as the youth approached the fatal place. He saw his servants breathless on the grass. The scaly foe amid their corpse he viewed. Basking at ease and feasting in their blood. Such friends, he cries, deserved a longer date. But Cadmus will revenge, or share their fate. Then heaved a stone, and rising to the throw. He sent it in a whirlwind at the foe. A lower, assaulted by so rude a stroke. With all its lofty battlements had shook. But nothing here the unwieldy rock avails. Rebounding harmless from the plated scales. That, firmly joined, preserved him from a wound. With native armor crusted all around. With more success the dart unerring flew. Which at his back the raging warrior threw. Amid the plated scales it took its course. And in the spinal marrow spent its force. The monster hissed aloud, and raged in vain. And writhed his body to and fro with pain. He bit the dart, and wrenched the wood away. The point still buried in the marrow lay. And now his rage, increasing with his pain. Reddens his eyes and beats in every vein. Churned in his teeth the foamy venom flows. While from his mouth a blast of vapors rose. Such as the infernal Stygian waters cast. The plants around him wither in the blast. Now in a maze of rings he lies enrolled. Now all unraveled and without a fold. Now, like a torrent, with a mighty force. Bears down the forest in his boisterous course. Cadmus gave back, and on the lion spoil. Sustained the shock, then forced him to recoil. The pointed javelin warded off his rage. Mad with his pains, and furious to engage. The serpent champs the steel, and bites the spear. Till blood and venom all the point besmear. But still the hurt he yet received was slight. For, while the champion with redoubled might. Strikes home the javelin, his retiring foe. Shrinks from the wound, and disappoints the blow. The dauntless hero still pursues his stroke. And presses forward, till a knotty oak. Retards his foe, and stops him in the rear. Full in his throat he plunged the fatal spear. That in the extended neck a passage found. And pierced the solid timber through the wound. Fixed to the reeling trunk, with many a stroke. Of his huge tail he lashed the sturdy oak. Till spent with toil, and laboring hard for breath. He now lay twisting in the pangs of death. Cadmus beheld him wallow in a flood. 
of swimming poison intermixed with blood. When suddenly a speech was heard from high. The speech was heard, nor was the speaker nigh. Why dost thou thus with secret pleasure see? Insulting man! What thou thyself shalt be? Astonished at the voice, he stood amazed. And all around, with inward horror, gazed. When Pallas, swift descending from the skies. Pallas, the guardian of the bold and wise. Bids him plough up the field, and scatter round. The dragon's teeth o'er all the furrowed ground. Then tells the youth how to his wondering eyes. Embattled armies from the field shall rise. He sows the teeth at Pallas's command. And flings the future people from his hand. The clods grow warm, and crumble where he sows. And now the pointed spears advance in rows. Now nodding plumes appear, and shining crests. Now the broad shoulders and the rising breasts. O'er all the field the breathing harvest swarms. A growing host, a crop of men and arms. So through the parting stage a figure rears. Its body up, and limb by limb appears. By just degrees, till all the man arise. And in his full proportion strikes the eyes. Cadmus, surprised and startled at the sight. Of his new foes, prepared himself for fight. When one cried out, Forbear, fond man, forbear. To mingle in a blind promiscuous war. This said, he struck his brother to the ground. Himself expiring by another's wound. Nor did the third his conquest long survive. Dying ere scarce he had begun to live. The dire example ran through all the field. Till heaps of brothers were by brothers killed. The furrows swam in blood, and only five. Of all the vast increase were left alive. Echion won, at Pallas's command. Let fall the guiltless weapon from his hand. And with the rest a peaceful treaty makes. Whom Cadmus as his friends and partners takes. So founds a city on the promised earth. And gives his new Boeotian empire birth. Here Cadmus reigned. And now one would have guessed. The royal founder in his exile blessed. Long did he live within his new abodes. Allied by marriage to the deathless gods. And in a fruitful wife's embraces old. A long increase of children's children told. But no frail man, however great or high. Can be concluded blessed before he die. Actaeon was the first of all his race. Who grieved his grandsire in his borrowed face. Condemned by stern Diana to bemoan. The branching horns and visage not his own. To shun his once loved dogs, to bound away. And from their huntsmen to become their prey. And yet consider why the change was wrought. You'll find it his misfortune, not his fault. Or, if a fault, it was the fault of chance. For how can guilt proceed from ignorance? Transformation of Actaeon into a stag. Actaeon, in pursuing the amusements of the chase, sees Diana and her nymphs bathing near Gargaphia. For which he is changed into a stag by the angry goddess, and is devoured by his own dogs. In a fair chase a shady mountain stood. Well stored with game, and marked with trails of blood. Here did the huntsmen, till the heat of day. Pursue the stag, and load themselves with prey. When thus Actaeon calling to the rest. My friends, said he, our sport is at the best. The sun is high advanced, and downward sheds. His burning beams directly on our heads. Then by consent abstain from further spoils. Call off the dogs, and gather up the toils. And ere tomorrow's sun begins his race. Take the cool morning to renew the chase. They all consent, and in a cheerful train. The jolly huntsmen, laden with the slain. Return in triumph from the sultry plain. Down in a vale with pine and cypress clad. Refreshed with gentle winds, and brown with shade. The chaste Diana's private haunt there stood. Full in the center of the darksome wood. A spacious grotto, all around o'ergrown. 
with hoary moss, and arched with pumice stone. From out its rocky clefts the waters flow, and trickling swell into a lake below. Nature had everywhere so played her part, that everywhere she seemed to vie with art. Here the bright goddess, toiled and chafed with heat, was wont to bathe her in the cool retreat. Here did she now with all her train resort, panting with heat, and breathless from the sport. Her armor-bearer laid her bow aside. Some loosed her sandals, some her veil untied. Each busy nymph her proper part undressed. While Crocal, more handy than the rest, gathered her flowing hair, and in a noose, bound it together, while her own hung loose. Five of the more ignoble sort, by turns, fetch up the water, and unlaid the urns. Now all undressed the shining goddess stood, when young Actaeon wildered in the wood, to the cool grot by his hard fate betrayed, the fountains filled with naked nymphs surveyed. The fright virgins shrieked at the surprise. The forest echoed with their piercing cries. Then in a huddle round their goddess pressed. She, proudly eminent above the rest. With blushes glowed, such blushes as adorn. The ruddy welkin or the purple morn. And though the crowding nymphs her body hide. Half backward shrunk, and viewed him from aside. Surprised, at first she would have snatched her bow. But sees the circling waters round her flow. These in the hollow of her hand she took. And dashed them in his face, while thus she spoke. Tell, if thou canst, the wondrous sight disclosed. A goddess naked to thy view exposed. This said, the man began to disappear. By slow degrees, and ended in a deer. A rising horn on either brow he wears. And stretches out his neck, and pricks his ears. Rough is his skin, with sudden hairs o'ergrown. His bosom pants with fears before unknown. Transformed at length, he flies away in haste. And wonders why he flies away so fast. But, as by chance within a neighboring brook. He saw his branching horns and altered look. Wretched Actaeon in a doleful tone. He tried to speak, but only gave a groan. And as he wept, within the watery glass, he saw the big round drops, with silent pace, run trickling down a savage hairy face. What should he do? Or seek his old abodes? Or herd among the deer and skulk in woods? Here shame dissuades him, there his fear prevails and each by turns his aching heart assails. As he thus ponders, he behind him spies. His opening hounds, and now he hears their cries. A genrouse pack, or to maintain the chase. Or snuff the vapor from the scented grass. He bounded off with fear, and swiftly ran. O'er craggy mountains and the flowery plain. Through brakes and thickets forced his way. And flew through many a ring where once he did pursue. In vain he oft endeavored to proclaim his new misfortune, and to tell his name. Nor voice, nor words, the brutal tongue supplies. From shouting men, and horns, and dogs, he flies. Deafened and stunned with their promiscuous cries. When now the fleetest of the pack, that pressed, close at his heels and sprung before the rest, had fastened on him, straight another pair. Hung on his wounded haunch. And held him there. Till all the pack came up, and every hound. Tore the sad huntsman groveling on the ground. Who now appeared but one continued wound. With dropping tears his bitter fate he moans. And fills the mountain with his dying groans. His servants with a piteous look he spies and turns about his supplicating eyes. His servants, ignorant of what had chanced, with eager haste and joyful shouts advanced, and called their lord, Actaeon, to the game. He shook his head in answer to the name. He heard, but wished he had indeed been gone, or only to have stood a looker-on. But to his grief he finds himself too near, 
and feels his ravenous dogs with fury tear. Their wretched master panting in a deer. Birth of Bacchus. Semele, becoming pregnant by Jupiter, is persuaded by Juno, in the disguise of an old nurse, to prove the divinity of her lover. By exacting an exhibition of the same majesty as when he approached Juno, the god, having sworn by Styx to grant whatever she required, is unable to withstand her solicitations. And the unfortunate Semele is reduced to ashes, the infant Bacchus is rescued from destruction, and lodged in the thigh of Jupiter till the full period of his birth. Actaean's sufferings, and Diana's rage. Did all the thoughts of men and gods engage? Some called the evils which Diana wrought. Too great, and disproportioned to the fault. Others, again, esteemed Actaean's woes. Fit for a virgin goddess to impose. The hearers into different parts divide. And reasons are produced on either side. Juno alone, of all that heard the news. Nor would condemn the goddess, nor excuse. She heeded not the justice of the deed but joyed to see the race of Cadmus bleed. For still she kept Europa in her mind. And, for her sake, detested all her kind. Besides, to aggravate her hate, she heard. How Semele, to Jove's embrace preferred. Was now grown big with an immortal load. And carried in her womb a future god. Thus, terribly incensed, the goddess broke. To sudden fury, and abruptly spoke. Are my reproaches of so small a force? Tis time I then pursue another course. It is decreed the guilty wretch shall die. If I'm indeed the mistress of the sky. If rightly styled, among the powers above. The wife and sister of the thundering Jove. And none can sure a sister's right deny. It is decreed the guilty wretch shall die. She boasts an honor I can hardly claim. Pregnant she rises to a mother's name. While proud and vain she triumphs in her Jove. And shows the glorious tokens of his love. But if I'm still the mistress of the skies. By her own lover the fond beauty dies. This said, descending in a yellow cloud. Before the gates of Semele she stood. Old Barrow's decrepit shape she wears her wrinkled visage, and her hoary hairs. While in her trembling gait she totters on. And learns to tattle in the nurse's tone. The goddess thus disguised in age, beguiled. With pleasing stories her false foster child. Much did she talk of love, and when she came. To mention to the nymph her lover's name. Fetching a sigh, and holding down her head. Tis well, says she, if all be true that said. But trust me, child, I'm much inclined to fear. Some counterfeit in this your Jupiter. Many an honest, well-designing maid. Has been by these pretended gods betrayed. But if he be indeed the thundering Jove. Bid him, when next he courts the rites of love. Descend triumphant, from the ethereal sky. In all the pomp of his divinity encompassed round by those celestial charms, with which he fills the immortal Juno's arms. The unwary nymph, ensnared with what she said, desired of Jove, when next he sought her bed, to grant a certain gift which she would choose. Fear not, replied the god, that I'll refuse. Whatever you ask, may Styx confirm my voice. Choose what you will, and you shall have your choice. Then, says the nymph, when next you seek my arms. May you descend in those celestial charms. With which your Juno's bosom you inflame. And fill with transport heaven's immortal dame. The god, surprised, would fain have stopped her voice. But he had sworn, and she had made her choice. To keep his promise he ascends, and shrouds. His awful brow in whirlwinds and in clouds while all around, in terrible array, his thunders rattle and his lightnings play. And yet the dazzling luster to abate. He set not out in all his pomp and state, clad in the mildest lightning of the skies, and armed with thunder of the smallest size. 
not those huge bolts by which the giants slain lay overthrown on the Phlegrian plain. Twas of a lesser mould and lighter weight. They call it thunder of a second rate. For the rough Cyclops, who by Jove's command tempered the bolt, and turned it to his hand, worked up less flame and fury in its make, and quenched it sooner in the standing lake. Thus dreadfully adorned with horror bright, the illustrious god, descending from his height, came rushing on her in a storm of light. The mortal dame, too feeble to engage. The lightning's flashes and the thunder's rage. Consumed amid the glories she desired. And in the terrible embrace expired. But to preserve his offspring from the tomb. Jove took him smoking from his mother's womb. And, if on ancient tales we may rely. Enclosed the abortive infant in his thigh. Here when the babe had all his time fulfilled. Eno first took him for her foster child. Then the Nisians, in their dark abode. Nursed secretly with milk the thriving god. Transformation of Echo Juno punishes the loquacity of Echo, which frequently prevented her from discovering the intrigues of her husband. By restricting her tongue to the mere repetitions of sound, the nymph, after this, falls in love with Narcissus which, not being returned, she pines away, and is changed into a stone, which still retains the power of utterance. Famed far and near for knowing things to come. From him the inquiring nations sought their doom. The fair Liriope his answers tried. And first the unerring prophet justified. This nymph the god Cephasus had abused. With all his winding waters circumfused and by the Nereid had a lovely boy, whom the soft maids Evan then beheld with joy. The tender dame, solicitous to know whether her child should reach old age or no, consults the sage Tiresias, who replies, If e'er he knows himself he surely dies. Long lived the dubious mother in suspense, till time unriddled all the prophet's sense. Narcissus now his sixteenth year began. Just turned of boy, and on the verge of man. Many a friend the blooming youth caressed. Many a lovesick maid in vain her flame confessed. Such was his pride, in vain the friend caressed. The lovesick maid in vain her flame confessed. Once, in the woods, as he pursued the chase. The babbling echo had descried his face. She, who in other words her silence breaks. Nor speaks herself but when another speaks. Echo was then a maid of speech bereft. Of wanted speech, for though her voice was left. Juno a curse did on her tongue impose. To sport with every sentence in the close. Full often when the goddess might have caught. Jove and her rivals in the very fault. This nymph with subtle stories would delay. Her coming till the lovers slipped away. The goddess found out the deceit in time. And then she cried, That tongue, for this thy crime. Which could so many subtle tales produce. Shall be hereafter but of little use. Hence, tis she prattles in a fairer tone. With mimic sounds and accents not her own. This lovesick virgin, overjoyed to find. The boy alone, still followed him behind when glowing warmly at her near approach. As sulphur blazes at the taper's touch, she longed her hidden passion to reveal, and tell her pains, but had not words to tell. She can't begin, but waits for the rebound, to catch his voice, and to return the sound. The nymph, when nothing could Narcissus move, still dashed with blushes for her slighted love, lived in the shady covert of the woods, in solitary caves and dark abodes, where pining wandered the rejected fair, till harassed out and worn away with care, the sounding skeleton, of blood bereft, besides her bones and voice, had nothing left. Her bones are petrified, her voice is found, in vaults, where still it doubles every sound. Story of Narcissus A handsome youth, named Narcissus, beholding his face reflected in a fountain, 
becomes enamored with it. And wastes away with grief, after his death the naiads raise a funeral pile to burn his body, when they find nothing but a beautiful flower, which still bears his name. Thus did the nymphs in vain caress the boy. He still was lovely, but he still was coy. When one fair virgin of the slighted train. Thus prayed the gods. Provoked by his disdain. Oh! May he love like me, and love like me in vain. Ramnuja pitied the neglected fair. And with just vengeance answered to her prayer. There stands a fountain in a darksome wood. Nor stained with falling leaves, nor rising mud. Untroubled by the breath of winds it rests. Unsullied by the touch of men or beasts. High bowers of shady trees above it grow. And rising grass and cheerful greens below. Pleased with the form and coolness of the place. And overheated by the morning chase. Narcissus on the grassy verdure lies. But while within the crystal fount he tries. To quench his heat, he feels new heat arise. For, as his own bright image he surveyed. He fell in love with the fantastic shade. And o'er the fair resemblance hung unmoved. Nor knew, fond youth. It was himself he loved. The well-turned neck and shoulders he descries. The spacious forehead, and the sparkling eyes. The hands that Bacchus might not scorn to show. And hair that round Apollo's head might flow. With all the purple youthfulness of face. That gently blushes in the watery glass. By his own flames consumed the lover lies. And gives himself the wound by which he dies. To the cold water oft he joins his lips. Oft catching at the beauteous shade he dips. His arms, as often from himself he slips. Nor knows he who it is his arms pursue. With eager clasps, but loves he knows not who. What could, fond youth, this helpless passion move? What kindled in thee this unpitied love? Thy own warm blush within the water glows. With thee the colored shadow comes and goes. Its empty being on thyself relies. Step thou aside and the frail charmer dies. Still o'er the fountain's watery gleam he stood. Mindless of sleep, and negligent of food. Still viewed his face, and languished as he viewed. At length he raised his head, and thus began. To vent his griefs, and tell the woods his pain. You trees, says he, and thou surrounding grove. Who oft have been the kindly scenes of love. Tell me, if e'er within your shades did lie. A youth so tortured, so perplexed as I. I, who before me see the charming fair. While there he stands, and yet he stands not there. In such a maze of love my thoughts are lost. And yet no bulwark town nor distant coast. Preserves the beauteous youth from being seen. No mountains rise nor oceans flow between. A shallow water hinders my embrace. And yet the lovely mimic wears a face. That kindly smiles, and when I bend to join. My lips to his, he fondly bends to mine. Here, gentle youth, and pity my complaint. Come from thy well, thou fair inhabitant. My charms an easy conquest have obtained. O'er other hearts, by thee alone disdained. But why should I despair? I'm sure he burns. With equal flames, and languishes by turns. Weener I stoop, he offers at a kiss. And when my arms I stretch, he stretches his. His eyes with pleasure on my face he keeps. He smiles my smiles, and when I weep he weeps. Weener I speak his moving lips appear. To utter something, which I cannot hear. Ah, wretched me! I now begin too late. To find out all the long perplexed deceit. It is myself I love, myself I see. The gay delusion is a part of me. I kindle up the fires by which I burn. And my own beauties from the well return. Whom should I court? How utter my complaint? Enjoyment but produces my restraint. And too much plenty makes me die for want. 
how gladly would I from myself remove. And at a distance set the thing I love. My breast is warmed with such unusual fire. I wish him absent whom I most desire. And now I faint with grief, my fate draws nigh. In all the pride of blooming youth I die. Death will the sorrows of my heart relieve. Oh! Might the visionary youth survive. I should with joy my latest breath resign. But, oh! I see his fate involved in mine. This said, the weeping youth again returned. To the clear fountain, where again he burned. His tears defaced the surface of the well. With circle after circle as they fell. And now the lovely face but half appears. O'errun with wrinkles and deformed with tears. Ah! Whither, cries Narcissus, dost thou fly? Let me still feed the flame by which I die. Let me still see, though I'm no further blessed. Then rends his garment off and beats his breast. His naked bosom reddened with the blow. In such a blush as purple clusters show. Ere yet the sun's autumnal heats refine. Their sprightly juice, and mellow it to wine. The glowing beauties of his breast he spies. And with a new redoubled passion dies. As wax dissolves, as ice begins to run. And trickle into drops before the sun. So melts the youth, and languishes away. His beauty withers, and his limbs decay. And none of those attractive charms remain. To which the slighted echo sued in vain. She saw him in his present misery. Whom, spite of all her wrongs, she grieved to see. She answered sadly to the lover's moan. Sight back his sighs, and groaned to every groan. Ah youth! Beloved in vain, Narcissus cries. Ah youth! Beloved in vain, the nymph replies. Farewell, says he. The parting sound scarce fell. From his faint lips, but she replied, Farewell. Then on the unwholesome earth he gasping lies. Till death shuts up those self admiring eyes. To the cold shades his fitting ghost retires. And in the Stygian waves itself admires. For him the naiads and the dryads mourn. Whom the sad echo answers in her turn. And now the sister nymphs prepare his urn. When, looking for his corpse, they only found. A rising stalk with yellow blossoms crowned. Story of Pentheus Pentheus, king of Thebes, refuses to acknowledge the divinity of Bacchus, and forbids his subjects to pay adoration to the new god, who, under the disguise of Aestes, is led in captivity to the presence of the monarch. This sad event gave blind Tiresias fame. Through Greece established in a prophet's name. The unhallowed Pentheus only durst deride. The cheated people and their eyeless guide. To whom the prophet in his fury said. Shaking the hoary honors of his head. Twere well, presumptuous man, twere well for thee. If thou wert eyeless too. And blind like me. For the time comes, nay, tis already here. When the young god's solemnities appear. Which, if thou dost not with just rites adorn. Thy impious carcass. Into pieces torn. Shall strew the woods, and hang on every thorn. Then, then remember what I now foretell. And own the blind Tiresias saw too well. Still Pentheus scorns him, and derides his skill. But time did all the prophet's threats fulfill. For now through prostrate Greece young Bacchus rode. While howling matrons celebrate the god. All ranks and sexes to his orgies ran. To mingle in the pomps and fill the train. When Pentheus thus his wicked rage expressed. What madness, Thebans, has your souls possessed? Can hollow timbrels, can a drunken shout? And the lewd clamors of a beastly rout? Thus quell your courage? Can the weak alarm of women's yells those stubborn souls disarm, whom nor the sword nor trumpet e'er could fright, nor the loud din and horror of a fight? And you, our sires, who left your old abodes, 
and fixed in foreign earth your country gods. Will you without a stroke your city yield? And poorly quit an undisputed field? But you, whose youth and vigor should inspire heroic warmth, and kindle martial fire, whom burnished arms and crested helmets grace, not flowery garlands and a painted face. Remember him to whom you stand allied. The serpent for his well of waters died. He fought the strong, do you his courage show? And gain a conquest o'er a feeble foe. If Thebes must fall, O oh might the fates afford. A nobler doom from famine, fire, or sword. Then might the Thebans perish with renown. But now a beardless victor sacks the town. Whom nor the prancing steed, nor ponderous shield. Nor the hacked helmet, nor the dusty field. But the soft joys of luxury and ease. The purple vests, and flowery garlands, please. Stand then aside, I'll make the counterfeit. Renounce his godhead, and confess the cheat. Acrisius from the Grecian walls repelled. This boasted power, why then should Pentheus yield? Go quickly, drag the impostor boy to me. I'll try the force of his divinity. Thus did the audacious wretch those rites profane. His friends dissuade the audacious wretch in vain. In vain his grandsire urged him to give o'er. His impious threats, the wretch but raves the more. So have I seen a river gently glide. In a smooth course and inoffensive tide. But if with dams its current we restrain. It bears down all, and foams along the plain. But now his servants came, besmeared with blood. Sent by their haughty prince to seize the god. The god they found not in the frantic throng, but dragged a zealous votary along. Mariners transformed to dolphins. Bacchus here personates Acoetes, the pilot of a ship which carried away the infant Bacchus from the isle of Naxus, the crew were changed into sea monsters. But Acoetes was preserved. Him Pentheus viewed with fury in his look. And scarce withheld his hands while thus he spoke. Vile slave! Whom speedy vengeance shall pursue? And terrify thy base seditious crew? Thy country and thy parentage reveal. And why thou joinst in these mad orgies tell? The captive views him with undaunted eyes. And, armed with inward innocence, replies. From high Meonia's rocky shores I came. Of poor descent, Acoetes is my name. My sire was meanly born, no oxen plout. His fruitful fields, nor in his pastures load. His whole estate within the waters lay. With lines and hooks he caught the finny prey. His art was all his livelihood, which he. Thus with his dying lips bequeathed to me. In streams, my boy, and rivers, take thy chance. There swims, said he, thy whole inheritance. Long did I live on this poor legacy. Till, tired with rocks and my old native sky. To arts of navigation I inclined. Observe the turns and changes of the wind. Learned the fit havens, and began to note. The stormy Hyades, the rainy goat. The bright Teigidae, and the shining bears. With all the sailors' catalogue of stars. Once, as by chance for Delos I designed. My vessel, driven by a strong gust of wind. Moored in a Chian creek, ashore I went. And all the following night in Chios spent. When morning rose, I sent my mates to bring. Supplies of water from a neighboring spring. While I the motion of the winds explored. Then summoned in my crew and went aboard. Opheltes heard my summons, and with joy. Brought to the shore a soft and lovely boy with more than female sweetness in his look. Whom straggling in the neighboring fields he took. With fumes of wine the little captive glows. And nods with sleep, and staggers as he goes. I viewed him nicely, and began to trace. Each heavenly fracture, each immortal grace. And saw divinity in all his face. I know not who, said I, this God should be. 
but that he is a god I plainly see. And thou, who or thou art, excuse the force. These men have used, and O befriend our course. Pray not for us, the nimble Dictes cried. Dictes, that could the main topmast bestride. And down the ropes with active vigor slide. To the same purpose old Ippopius spoke. Who overlooked the oars, and timed the stroke. The same the pilot, and the same the rest. Such impious avarice their souls possessed. Nay, heaven forbid that I should bear away. Within my vessel so divine a prey. Said I. And stood to hinder their intent. When Lycabas, a wretch for murder sent. From Tuscany, to suffer banishment. With his clinched fist had struck me overboard. Had not my hands in falling grasped a cord. His base confederates the fact approve. When Bacchus, for, twas he, began to move. Waked by the noise and clamors which they raised. And shook his drowsy limbs. And round him gazed. What means this noise? He cries, Am I betrayed? Ah! Whither, whither must I be conveyed? Fear not, said Proteus, child, but tell us where. You wish to land, and trust our friendly care. To Naxus then direct your course, said he. Naxus a hospitable port shall be. To each of you, a joyful home to me. By every god that rules the sea or sky. The perjured villains promise to comply. And bid me hasten to unmoor the ship. With eager joy I launch into the deep. And, heedless of the fraud, for Naxus stand. They whisper oft, and beckon with the hand. And give me signs, all anxious for their prey. To tack about and steer another way. Then let some other to my post succeed. Said I, I'm guiltless of so foul a deed. What, says Athalian, must the ship's whole crew. Follow your humor, and depend on you. And straight himself he seated at the proar. And tacked about and sought another shore. The beauteous youth now found himself betrayed. And from the deck the rising wave surveyed. And seemed to weep, and as he wept he said. And do you thus my easy faith beguile? Thus do ye bear me to my native isle? Will such a multitude of men employ their strength against a weak, defenseless boy? In vain did I the godlike youth deplore. The more I begged, they thwarted me the more. And now by all the gods in heaven, that hear this solemn oath, by Bacchus' self I swear, the mighty miracle that did ensue, although it seems beyond belief, is true. The vessel, fixed and rooted in the flood, unmoved by all the beating billows, stood. In vain the mariners would plough the main, with sails unfurled, and strike their oars in vain. Around their oars a twining ivy cleaves, and climbs the mast, and hides the cords in leaves. The sails are covered with a cheerful green, and berries in the fruitful canvas seen. Amid the waves a sudden forest rears its verdant head, and a new spring appears. The god we now behold with opened eyes. A herd of spotted panthers round him lies. In glaring forms, the grapey clusters spread on his fair brows, and dangle on his head. And while he frowns and brandishes his spear, my mates, surprised with madness or with fear, leaped overboard. First perjured Madden found. Rough scales and fins his stiffening side surround. Ah! What, cries one, has thus transformed thy look? Straight his own mouth grew wider as he spoke. And now himself he views with like surprise. Still at his or the industrious Libby's plies. But, as he plies, each busy arm shrinks in. And by degrees is fashioned to a fin. Another, as he catches at a cord, misses his arms, and, tumbling overboard, with his broad fins and forky tail he laves the rising surge, and flounces in the waves. Thus all my crew transformed around the ship. 
or dive below, or on the surface leap, and spout the waves, and wanton in the deep. Full nineteen sailors did the ship convey. A shoal of nineteen dolphins round her play. I only in my proper shape appear. Speechless with wonder, and half dead with fear. Till Bacchus kindly bid me fear no more. With him I landed on the Chian shore. And him shall ever gratefully adore. This forging slave, says Pentheus, would prevail. O'er our just fury by a far-fetched tale. Go. Let him feel the whips, the swords, the fire. And in the tortures of the rack expire. The officious servants hurry him away. And the poor captive in a dungeon lay. But, while the whips and tortures are prepared, the gates fly open, of themselves unbarred. At liberty the unfettered captive stands, and flings the loosened shackles from his hands. Death of Pentheus. Pentheus is punished for his impiety by being torn in pieces by his mother and aunts, while under the influence of Bacchus. But Pentheus, grown more furious than before, resolved to send his messengers no more, but went himself to the distracted throng, where high Scytherin echoed with their song. And as the fiery warhorse paws the ground, and snorts and trembles at the trumpet's sound, transported thus he heard the frantic rout, and raved and maddened at the distant shout. A spacious circuit on the hill there stood, level and wide, and skirted round with wood. Here the rash Pentheus, with unhallowed eyes, the howling dames and mystic orgy spies, his mother sternly viewed him where he stood, and kindled into madness as she viewed. Her leafy javelin at her son she cast, and cries, The boar that lays our country waste. The boar, my sisters, aim the fatal dart, and strike the brindled monster to the heart. Pentheus astonished heard the dismal sound, and sees the yelling matrons gathering round. He sees, and weeps at his approaching fate, and begs for mercy, and repents too late. Help! Help! My aunt Autono, he cried. Remember how your own Actaean died. Deaf to his cries, the frantic matron crops. One stretched out arm, the other Eno lops. In vain does Pentheus to his mother sue. And the raw bleeding stumps present to view. His mother howled, and, heedless of his prayer, her trembling hand she twisted in his hair. And this, she cried, shall be Agave's share. When from his neck his struggling head she tore, and in her hands the ghastly visage bore, with pleasure all the hideous trunk survey, then pulled and tore the mangled limbs away, as starting in the pangs of death it lay, soon as the wood its leafy honors casts, Blown off and scattered by autumnal blasts. With such a sudden death lay Pentheus slain. And in a thousand pieces strode the plain. By so distinguishing a judgment odd. The Thebans tremble and confess the god. Book. Chapter 4. Story of Alcitho and her sisters. Undeterred by the punishment of Pentheus, Alcitho and her sisters dare to ridicule the orgies of Bacchus and to employ themselves in the labors of the loom during the festival of that god. Yet still Alcitho perverse remains. And Bacchus still and all his rights disdains. Too rash and madly bold, she bids him prove. Himself a god, nor owns the son of Jove. Her sisters too unanimous agree. Faithful associates in impiety. Be this a solemn feast, the priest had said. B. With each mistress, unemployed each maid. With skins of beasts your tender limbs enclose. And with an ivy crown adorn your brows. The leafy thyrsus high in triumph bear. And give your locks to wanton in the air. These rites profaned, the holy seer foreshowed. A mourning people, and a vengeful god. Matrons and pious wives obedience show. Distaffs, and wool half spun, away they throw. Then incense burn, and, 
Bacchus, the adore. Or lovest thou Nesius, or Laius, more? O, oh, doubly got! O, oh, doubly born! They sung. Thou mighty Bromius, hail! From lightning sprung. Hail! Thion, Elelius, each name is thine. Or, listen parent of the genial vine. Iacus. Evan. Loudly they repeat. And not one Grecian attribute forget. Which to thy praise, great deity, belong. Styled, justly, Liber in the Roman song. Eternity of youth is thine. Enjoy. Years rolled on years, yet still a blooming boy. In heaven thou shinest with a superior grace. Conceal thy horns, and tis a virgin's face. Thou taught'st the tawny Indian to obey. And Ganges, smoothly flowing, own thy sway. Lycurgus, Pentheus, equally profane. By thy just vengeance equally were slain. By thee the Tuscans, who conspired to keep. Thee captive, plunged and cut with fins the deep. With painted reins, all glittering from afar. The spotted lynxes proudly draw thy car. Around the Bacchae and the satyrs throng. Behind, Silenus, drunk, lags slow along. On his dull as he nods from side to side. Forbears to fall, yet half forgets to ride. Still at thy near approach applauses loud. Are heard, with yellings of the female crowd. Timbrels, and boxen pipes, with mingled cries. Swell up in sounds confused and rend the skies. Come, Bacchus, come propitious, all implore. And act thy secret orgies o'er and o'er. But Minius' daughters, while these rites were paid, at home impertinently busy stayed. Their wicked tasks they ply with various art. And through the loom the sliding shuttle dart. Or at the fire to comb the wool they stand. Or twirl the spindle with a dextrous hand. Guilty themselves, they force the guiltless in. Their maids, who share the labor, share the sin. At last one sister cries, who nimbly knew. To draw nice threads, and win the finest clue. While others idly rove, and gods revere. Their fancied gods. They know not who or where. Let us, whom Pallas taught her better arts. Still working, cheer with mirthful chat our hearts. And, to deceive the time, let me prevail. With each by turns to tell some antique tale. She said, her sisters liked the humor well. And, smiling, bade her the first story tell. But she a while profoundly seemed to muse. Perplexed amid variety to choose. And knew not whether she should first relate. The poor Dercetus, and her wondrous fate. The Palestines believe it to a man. And show the lake in which her scales began. Or if she rather should the daughter sing. Who in the hoary verge of life took wing. Who soared from earth, and dwelt in towers on high. And now a dove she flits along the sky. Or how the tree, which once white berries bore. Still crimson bears. Since stained with crimson gore. The tree was new, she likes it, and begins. To tell the tale, and as she tells she spins. Story of Pyramus and Thisbe. A Babylonian youth, named Pyramus, becomes enamored of Thisbe, a beautiful maiden, the flame is mutual. And the two lovers disregard the prohibition of their parents, and converse through the chink of wall which separates the houses, they now determine to elude the vigilance of their friends. And to meet in the neighborhood under a white mulberry tree, Thisbe first arrives at the appointed place, but the sudden appearance of a lioness affrights her. And, during her flight into a neighboring cave, she drops her veil, which the lioness finds and besmears with blood, Pyramus recognizes the garment, and, Concluding that she has been devoured by wild beasts, stabs himself, Thisbe, when her fears vanish, returns from the cave, and, at the sight of the dying Pyramus, falls on the sword still reeking with his blood, the mulberry tree, stained with the blood of the lovers, ever after hears fruit of that color. 
in Babylon, where first her queen, for state. Raised walls of brick magnificently great. Lived Pyramus and Thisbe, lovely pair. He found no eastern youth his equal there. And she beyond the fairest nymph was fair. A closer neighborhood was never known. Though two the houses, yet the roof was one. Acquaintance grew, the acquaintance they improve. To friendship, friendship ripened into love. Love had been crowned, but, impotently mad. What parents could not hinder? They forbade. For with fierce flames young Pyramus still burned. And grateful Thisbe flames as fierce returned. Aloud in words their thoughts they dare not break. But silent stand, and silent looks can speak. The fire of love, the more it is suppressed. The more it glows and rages in the breast. When the division wall was built, a chink. Was left, the cement unobserved to shrink. So slight the cranny, that it still had been. For centuries unclosed, because unseen. But, oh! What thing so small, so secret lies. Which, scapes, if formed for love, a lover's eyes. Evan in this narrow chink they quickly found. A friendly passage for a trackless sound. Safely they told their sorrows and their joys. In whispered murmurs and a dying noise. By turns to catch each other's breath they strove. And sucked in all the balmy breeze of love. Oft, as on different sides they stood, they cried. Malicious wall, thus lovers to divide. Suppose thou shouldst a while to us give place. To lock and fasten in a close embrace. But, if too much to grant so sweet a bliss. Indulge at least the pleasure of a kiss. We scorn ingratitude, to thee, we know. This safe conveyance of our minds we owe. Thus, they their vain petition did renew. Till night, and then they softly sighed adieu. But first they strove to kiss, and that was all. Their kisses died untasted on the wall. Soon as the morn had o'er the stars prevailed. And, warned by Phoebus, flowers their dews exhaled. The lovers to their well-known place return. Alike they suffer and alike they mourn. At last their parents they resolve to cheat. If to deceive in love he called deceit. To steal by night from home, and thence unknown. To seek the fields, and quit the unfaithful town. But, to prevent their wandering in the dark. They both agree to fix upon a mark. A mark, that could not their designs expose. The tomb of Ninus was the mark they chose. There they might rest secure beneath the shade. Which boughs, with snowy fruit encumbered, made. A widespread mulberry its rise had took. Just on the margin of a gurgling brook. Impatient for the friendly dusk they stay and chide the slowness of departing day. In western seas down sunk at last the light. From western seas uprose the shades of night. The loving Thisbe Evan prevents the hour. With cautious silence she unlocks the door. And veils her face, and marching through the gloom. Swiftly arrives at th assignation tomb. For still the fearful sex can fearless prove. Boldly they act, if spirited by love. When, lo! A lioness rushed o'er the plain. Grimly besmeared with blood of oxen slain. And what to the dire sight new horrors brought. To slake her thirst the neighboring spring she sought. Which, by the moon, when trembling Thisbe spies. Winged with her fear, swift as the wind, she flies. And in a cave recovers from her fright but dropped her veil. Confounded in her flight. When sated with repeated draughts, again. The queen of beasts scoured back along the plain. She found the veil, and, mouthing it all o'er. With bloody jaws the lifeless prey she tore. The youth, who could not cheat his guard so soon. Late came, and noted by the glimmering moon. Some savage feet new printed on the ground. His cheeks turned pale. His limbs no vigor found. 
But when, advancing on, the veil he spied. Disdained with blood, and ghastly torn, he cried. One night shall death to two young lovers give. But she deserved unnumbered years to live. Tis I am guilty, I have thee betrayed. Who came not early as my charming maid? Whatever slew thee, I the cause remain. I named and fixed the place where thou wast slain. Ye lions, from your neighboring dens repair. Pity the wretch, this impious body tear. But cowards thus for death can idly cry. The brave still have it in their power to die. Then to the appointed tree he hastes away. The veil first gathered, though all rent it lay. The veil all rent, yet still itself endears. He kissed, and kissing, washed it with his tears. Though rich, he cried, with many a precious stain. Still from my blood a deeper tincture gain. Then in his breast his shining sword he drowned. And fell supine extended on the ground. As out again the blade he dying drew. Out spun the blood, and streaming upwards flew. So, if a conduit pipe e'er burst you saw. Swift spring the gushing waters through the flaw. Then spouting in a bow they rise on high. And a new fountain plays amid the sky. The berries, stained with blood, began to show. A dark complexion, and forgot their snow. While, fattened with the flowing gore, the root. Was doomed for ever to a purple fruit. Meantime poor Thisbe feared, so long she stayed. Her lover might suspect a perjured maid. Her fright scarce o'er she strove the youth to find. With ardent eyes, which spoke an ardent mind. Already in his arms, she hears him sigh. At her destruction, which was once so nigh. The tomb, the tree, but not the fruit, she knew. The fruit she doubted for its altered hue. Still as she doubts, her eyes a body found. Quivering in death, and gasping on the ground. She started back, the red her cheeks forsook. And every nerve with thrilling horrors shook. So trembles the smooth surface of the seas. If brushed o'er gently with a rising breeze. But when her view her bleeding love confessed. She shrieked, she tore her hair, she beat her breast. She raised the body, and embraced it round. And bathed with tears unfeigned the gaping wound. Then her warm lips to the cold face applied. And is it thus, ah! Thus we meet? She cried. My Pyramus! Whence sprung thy cruel fate? My Pyramus, speak, ere tis too late. I, thy own Thisbe, but one word implore. One word thy Thisbe never asked before. At Thisbe's name, awaked, he opened wide. His dying eyes, with dying eyes he tried. On her to dwell, but closed them slow, and died. The fatal cause was now at last explored. Her veil she knew, and saw his sheathless sword. From thy own hand thy ruin thou hast found. She said. But love first taught that hand to wound. Evan I for thee as bold a hand can show. And love, which shall as true direct the blow. I will against the woman's weakness strive. And never thee, lamented youth, survive. The world may say I caused, alas! Thy death. But saw thee breathless, and resigned my breath. Fate, though it conquers, shall no triumph gain. Fate, that divides us, still divides in vain. Now, both our cruel parents, hear my prayer. My prayer to offer for us both I dare. Oh! See our ashes in one urn confined. Whom love at first, and fate at last, has joined. The bliss you envied is not our request. Lovers, when dead, may sure together rest. Thou, tree, where now one lifeless lump is laid. Ere long o'er two shall cast a friendly shade. Still let our loves from thee be understood. Still witness in thy purple fruit our blood. She spoke, and in her bosom plunged the sword. All warm and reeking from its slaughtered lord. 
the prayer which dying Thisbe had preferred. Both gods and parents with compassion heard. The whiteness of the mulberry soon fled. And, ripening, saddened in a dusky red. While both their parents their lost children mourn. And mix their ashes in one golden urn. Thus did the melancholy tale conclude. And a short silent interval ensued. The next in birth unloosed her artful tongue. And drew attentive all the sister throng. Story of Lukatho and the Sun Lukatho is beloved by Apollo, who introduces himself to her by assuming the shape of her mother, their affection is mutual. When Clyte, who tenderly loves the god, discovers the whole intrigue to the father of the maiden, who orders his daughter to be buried alive, her lover, unable to save her from death, sprinkles nectar and ambrosia on her tomb, which, penetrating to her body, change it into a beautiful tree which bears the frankincense. The sun, the source of light, by beauty's power. Once amorous grew, then here the sun's amour. Venus, and Mars, with his far-piercing eyes. This god first spied. This god first all things spies. Stung at the sight, and swift on mischief bent. To haughty Juno's shapeless son he went. To him his consort's shame to represent. Poor Vulcan soon desired to hear no more. He dropped his hammer, and he shook all o'er. Then courage takes, and full of vengeful ire. He heaves the bellows, and blows fierce the fire. From liquid brass, though sure, yet subtle snares. He forms, and next a wondrous net prepares. Drawn with such curious art, so nicely sly. Unseen the meshes cheat the searching eye. Not half so thin their webs the spiders weave. Which the most wary buzzing prey deceive. These chains, obedient to the touch, he spread. In secret foldings o'er the conscious bed. Through heaven the news of this surprisal run. But Venus did not thus forget the sun. He, whose stolen transports idly had betrayed. By a betrayer was in kind repaid. What now avails, great God, thy piercing blaze? That youth, and beauty, and those golden rays? Thou, who canst warm this universe alone. Feel'st now a warmth more powerful than thy own. And those bright eyes, which all things should survey. Know not from fair Lukatho to stray. The lamp of light, for human good designed. Is to one virgin niggardly confined. Sometimes too early rise thy eastern beams. Sometimes too late they set in western streams. Tis then her beauty thy swift course delays. And gives to winter skies long summer days. Now in thy face thy lovesick mind appears. And spreads through impious nations empty fears. For when thy beamless head is wrapped in night. Poor mortals tremble in despair of light. Tis not the moon that o'er thee casts a veil. Tis love alone which makes thy looks so pale. Lukatho is grown thy only care. Not Phaeton's fair mother now is fair. The youthful Rhodos moves no tender thought. And beauteous Persa is at last forgot. Fond Clyte, scorned, yet loved and sought thy bed. Even then thy heart for other virgins bled. Lukatho has all thy soul possessed. And chased each rival passion from thy breast. To this bright nymph Euronymy gave birth. In the blessed confines of the spicy earth. Excelling others, she herself beheld. By her own blooming daughter far excelled. The sire was Orchimus, whose vast command. The seventh from Belus, ruled the Persian land. Deep in cool valleys, beneath the Hesperian sky. For the sun's fiery steeds the pastures lie. Ambrosia there they eat, and thence they gain. New vigor, and their daily toil sustain. While thus on heavenly food the coursers fed. And night around her gloomy empire spread. The god assumed the mother's shape and air. And passed unheeded to his darling fair. Close by a lamp, with maids encompassed round. The royal spinster full employed he found. Then cried, a while from work, 
my daughter, rest. And, like a mother. Scarce her lips he pressed. Servants retire, nor secrets dare to hear. Entrusted only to a daughter's ear. They swift obeyed, not one, suspicious, thought. The secret which their mistress would be taught. Then he, since now no witnesses are near. Behold the God who guides the various year. The world's vast eye, of light the source serene. Who all things sees, by whom are all things seen. Believe me, nymph, for I the truth have showed. Thy charms have power to charm so great a God. Confused, she heard him his soft passion tell. And on the floor, untwirled, the spindle fell. Still from the sweet confusion some new grace. Blushed out by stealth. And languished in her face. The lover, now inflamed, himself put on. And out at once the god all radiant shone. The virgin startled at his altered form. Too weak to bear a god's impetuous storm. This Clitty knew, and knew she was undone. Whose soul was fixed, and doted on the sun. She raged to think on her neglected charms. And Phoebus panting in another's arms. With envious madness fired, she flies in haste. And tells the king his daughter was unchaste. The king, incensed to hear his honor stained. No more the father nor the man retained. In vain she stretched her arms, and turned her eyes. To her loved God, the enlightener of the skies. In vain she owned it was a crime, yet still. It was a crime not acted by her will. The brutal sire stood deaf to every prayer. And deep in earth entombed alive the fair. What Phoebus could do was by Phoebus done. Full on her grave with pointed beams he shone. To pointed beams the gaping earth gave way. Had the nymph eyes, her eyes had seen the day. But lifeless now, yet lovely still, she lay. Not more the god wept when the world was fired. And in the wreck his blooming boy expired. The vital flame he strives to light again. And warm the frozen blood in every vein. But since resistless fates denied that power. On the cold nymph he rained a nectar shower. Ah! Undeserving thus, he said, to die. Yet still in odors thou shalt reach the sky. The body soon dissolved, and all around. Perfumed with heavenly fragrances the ground. A sacrifice for God's uprose from thence. A sweet delightful tree of frankincense. Transformation of Clitty. Clitty, being deserted by Apollo, pines away, and is changed into a sunflower, which still turns its head towards the sun, in token of her love. Though guilty Clitty thus the sun betrayed. By too much passion she was guilty made. Excess of love begot excess of grief. Grief fondly bade her hence to hope relief. But angry Phoebus hears unmoved her sighs. And scornful from her loathed embraces flies. All day, all night, in trackless wilds alone. She pined, and taught the listening rocks her moan. On the bare earth she lies, her bosom bare. Loose her attire, disheveled is her hair. Nine times the morn unbarred the gates of light. As oft were spread the alternate shades of night. So long no sustenance the mourner knew. Unless she drank her tears. Or sucked the dew. She turned about, but rose not from the ground. Turned to the sun still as he rolled his round. On his bright face hung her desiring eyes. Till, fixed to earth, she strove in vain to rise. Her looks their paleness in a flower retained. But here and there some purple streaks they gained. Still the loved object the fond leaves pursue. Still move their root the moving sun to view. And in the heliotrope the nymph is true. The sisters heard these wonders with surprise. But part received them as romantic lies. And pertly rallied, that they could not see. In powers divine so vast an energy. Part own true God such miracles might do. But own not Bacchus one among the true. At last a common, just request they make. 
and beg Alsatho her turn to take. I will, said she, and please you if I can. Then shot her shuttle swift, and thus began. The fate of Daphnis is a fate too known. Whom an enamored nymph transformed to stone. Because she feared another nymph might see. The lovely youth, and love as much as she. So strange the madness is of jealousy. Nor shall I tell what changes Scython made. And how he walked a man, or tripped a maid. You too would peevish frown, and patience want. To hear, how Selmus grew an adamant. He once was dear to Jove, and saw of old. Jove when a child, but what he saw he told. Crocus and Smilax may be turned to flowers. And the Curides spring from bounteous showers. I pass a hundred legends stale as these. And with sweet novelty your taste will please. Story of Salmachus and Hermaphroditus A beautiful youth, named Hermaphroditus, is beloved by a river nymph, who surprises him while bathing, and entreats the gods to unite them in one body. A request which is granted by the indulgent deities. How Salmachus, with weak, enfeebling streams, softens the body, and unnerves the limbs. And what the secret cause, shall here be shown. The cause is secret, but the effect is known. The naiads nursed an infant heretofore. That Cytheria once to Hermes bore. From both the illustrious authors of his race. The child was named. Nor was it hard to trace. Both the bright parents through the infant's face. When fifteen years in Ida's cool retreat. The boy had told, he left his native seat. And sought fresh fountains in a foreign soil. The pleasure lessened the attending toil. With eager steps the Lycian fields he crossed. And fields that border on the Lycian coast. A river here he viewed, so lovely bright. It showed the bottom in a fairer light. Nor kept a sand concealed from human sight. The stream produced nor slimy ooze, nor weeds. Nor miry rushes, nor the spiky reeds. But dealt enriching moisture all around. The fruitful banks with cheerful verdure crowned. And kept the spring eternal on the ground. A nymph presides, not practiced in the chase. Nor skillful at the bow, nor at the race. Of all the blue-eyed daughters of the main. The only stranger to Diana's train. Her sisters often, as, tis said, would cry. F.Y., Salmachus, what? Always idle, F.Y. Or take thy quiver, or thy arrows seize. And mix the toils of hunting with they ease. Nor quivers she, nor arrows, e'er would seize. Nor mix the toils of hunting with her ease. But oft would bathe her in the crystal tide. Oft with a comb her dewy locks divide. Now in the limpid stream she views her face. And dressed her image in the floating glass. On beds of leaves she pow reposed her limbs. Now gathered flowers that grew about her streams. And then by chance was gathering, as she stood. To view the boy, and longed for what she viewed. Fain would she meet the youth with hasty feet. She fain would meet him, but refused to meet. Before her looks were set with nicest care. And well deserved to be reputed fair. Bright youth, she cries, whom all thy features prove. A god, and, if a god, the god of love. But if a mortal, bless thy nurse's breast. Blessed are thy parents, and thy sisters blessed. But oh! How blessed, how more than blessed thy bride! Allied in bliss, if any yet allied. If so, let mine the stolen enjoyments be. If not, behold a willing bride in me. The boy knew not of love, and, touched with shame. He strove, and blushed, but still the blush became. In rising blushes still fresh beauties rose. The sunny side of fruit such blushes shows. And such the moon, when all her silver white. Turns in eclipses to a ruddy light. The nymph still begs, if not a nobler bliss. A cold salute at least, a sister's kiss. 
and now prepares to take the lovely boy. Between her arms. He, innocently coy. Replies, or leave me to myself alone. You rude uncivil nymph, or I'll be gone. Fair stranger, then, says she, it shall be so. And, for she feared his threats, she feigned to go. But, hid within a covert's neighboring green. She kept him still in sight, herself unseen. The boy now fancies all the danger o'er. And innocently sports about the shore. Playful and wanton to the stream he trips. And dips his foot, and shivers as he dips. The coolness pleased him, and, with eager haste. His airy garments on the banks he cast. His godlike features, and his heavenly hue. And all his beauties, were exposed to view. Now all undressed upon the banks he stood. And clapped his sides, and leaped into the flood. His lovely limbs the silver waves divide. His limbs appear more lovely through the tide. As lilies, shut within a crystal case. Receive a glossy luster from the glass. He's mine, he's all my own, the naiad cries. And flings of all, and after him she flies. And now she fastens on him as he swims. And holds him close, and wraps about his limbs. And why, coy youth, she cries, why thus unkind? Oh, may the gods thus keep us overjoined. Oh, may we never, never part again. So prayed the nymph, nor did she pray in vain. For now she finds him, as his limbs she pressed. Grown nearer still, and nearer to her breast. Till, piercing each the other's flesh, they run. Together, and incorporate in one. Last, in one face are both their faces joined. As when the stock and grafted twig combined. Shoot up the same, and wear a common ring. Alsatho and her sisters transform to bats. The impiety of Alsatho and her sisters is punished by their transformation into the shape of bats by the power of Bacchus. But Minias daughters still their task pursue. To wickedness most obstinately true. At Bacchus still they laugh, when all around. Unseen, the timbrel's horse were heard to sound. Saffron and myrrh their fragrant odors shed. And now the present deity they dread. Strange to relate. Here ivy first was seen. Along the distaff crept the wondrous green. Then sudden, springing vines began to bloom. And the soft tendrils curled around the loom. While purple clusters, dangling from on high. Tinged the wrought purple with a second dye. Now from the skies was shot a doubtful light. The day declining to the bounds of night. The fabric's firm foundations shake all o'er. False tigers rage, and figured lions roar. Torches, aloft, seem blazing in the air. And angry flashes of red lightnings glare. To dark recesses, the dire sight to shun. Swift the pale sisters in confusion run. Their arms were lost in pinions as they fled and subtle films each slender limb o'erspread. Their altered forms their senses soon revealed. Their forms, how altered, darkness still concealed. Close to the roof each, wandering, upward springs. Born on unknown, transparent, plumeless wings. They strove for words. Their little bodies found. No words, but murmured in a fainting sound. In towns, not woods, the sooty bats delight. And never till the dusk begin their flight. Till Vesper rises with his evening flame. From whom the Romans have derived their name. Transformation of Eno and Melicerta to sea gods. Juno, jealous of the prosperity of Eno, the nurse of Bacchus, sends the fury to Siphone to the house of Athamas, her husband. Who is seized with such a sudden frenzy, that he mistakes his wife and children for a lioness with her whelps, and dashes his son Lurchus against a wall, Eno effects her escape. And from a high rock precipitates herself into the sea with Melicerta in her arms, she is promoted by Neptune to the dignity of a sea deity, afterward called Lucato. While Melicerta becomes a sea god, known by the name of Polemon. 
the power of Bacchus now o'er Thebes had flown. With awful reverence soon the god they own. Proud Eno all around the wonder tells. And on her nephew deity still dwells. Of numerous sisters, she alone yet knew. No grief, but grief which she from sisters drew. Imperial Juno saw her with disdain. Vain in her offspring, in her consort vain. Who ruled the trembling Thebans with a nod. But saw her vainest in her foster god. Could then, she cried, a bastard boy have power. To make a mother her own son devour? Could he the Tuscan crew to fishes change? And now three sisters damned to form so strange? Yet shall the wife of Jove find no relief? Shall she still unrevenged disclose her grief? Have I the mighty freedom to complain? Is that my power? Is that to ease my pain? A foe has taught me vengeance, and who ought? To scorn that vengeance which a foe has taught. What sure destruction frantic rage can throw? The gaping wounds of slaughtered Pentheus show. Why should not Eno, fired with madness, stray? Like her mad sisters her own kindred slay? Why she not follow where they lead the way? Down a steep yawning cave where use displayed. In arches meet, and lend a baleful shade. Through silent labyrinths a passage lies. To mournful regions and infernal skies. Here Styx exhales its noisome clouds, and here. The funeral rites once paid, all souls appear. Stiff, cold. And horror, with a ghastly face. And staring eyes, infests the dreary place. Ghosts, new arrived, and strangers to these plains. Know not the palace where grim Pluto reigns. They journey doubtful, nor the road can tell. Which leads to the metropolis of hell. A thousand avenues those towers command. A thousand gates forever open stand. As all the rivers, disembogued, find room. For all their waters in old ocean's womb. So this vast city worlds of shades receives. And space for millions still of worlds she leaves. The unbodied spectres freely rove, and show. Whatever they loved on earth they love below. The lawyers still, or right or wrong support. The courtiers smoothly glide to Pluto's court. Still airy heroes thoughts of glory fire. Still the dead poet strings his deathless lyre. And lovers still with fancied darts expire. The queen of heaven, to gratify her hate. And sooth immortal wrath, forgets her state. Down from the realms of day to realms of night. The goddess swift precipitates her flight. At hell arrived, the noise hell's porter heard. The enormous dog his triple head upreared. Thrice from three grisly throats he howled profound. Then suppliant couched. And stretched along the ground. The trembling threshold, which Satania pressed. The weight of such divinity confessed. Before a lofty adamantine gate. Which closed a tower of brass, the furies sate. Misshapen forms, tremendous to the sight. The implacable foul daughters of the night. A sounding whip each bloody sister shakes. Or from her tresses combs the curling snakes. But now great Juno's majesty was known. Through the thick gloom all heavenly bright she shone. The hideous monsters their obedience showed. And, rising from their seats, submissive bowed. This is the place of Wa, here grown the dead. Huge Titius o'er nine acres here is spread. Fruitful for pain the immortal liver breeds. Still grows. And still the insatiate vulture feeds. Poor Tantalus to taste the water tries. But from his lips the faithless water flies. Then thinks the bending tree he can command. The tree starts backwards, and eludes his hand. The labor too of Sisyphus is vain. Up the steep mount he heaves the stone with pain. Down from the summit rolls the stone again. The belides their leaky vessels still. Are ever filling, and yet never fill. Doomed to this punishment for blood they shed. 
For bridegrooms slaughtered in the bridal bed. Stretched on the rolling Willoxian lies. Himself he follows, and himself he flies. Ixion, tortured, Juno sternly eyed. Then turned, and toiling Sisyphus espied. And why, she said, so wretched is the fate. Of him, whose brother proudly reigns in state. Yet still my altars unadored have been. By Athamas and his presumptuous queen. What caused her hate, the goddess thus confessed. What caused her journey now was more than guessed. That hate, relentless, its revenge did want. And that revenge the fury soon could grant. They could the glory of proud Thebes efface. And hide and ruin the Cadmean race. For this she largely promises, entreats. And to entreaties adds imperial threats. Then fell to Siphony with rage was stung. And from her mouth the untwisted serpents flung. To gain this trifling boon, there is no need. She cried, in formal speeches to proceed. Whatever thou commands to do is done. Believe it finished, though not yet begun. But from these melancholy seats repair. To happier mansions, and to purer air. She spoke. The goddess, darting upwards, flies. And joyous reascends her native skies. Nor entered there, till round her iris threw. Ambrosial sweets, and poured celestial dew. The faithful fury, guiltless of delays. With cruel haste the dire command obeys. Girt in a bloody gown, a torch she shakes. And round her neck twine speckled wreaths of snakes. Fear, and dismay, and agonizing pain. With frantic rage, complete her loveless train. To Thebes her flight she sped, and hell forsook. At her approach the Theban turrets shook. The sun shrunk back, thick clouds the day o'ercast. And springing greens were withered as she passed. Now, dismal yellings heard, strange spectre seen. Confound as much the monarch as the queen. In vain to quit the palace they prepared. Tisiphone was there, and kept the ward. She wide extended her unfriendly arms. And all the fury lavished all her harms. Part of her tresses loudly hiss, and part. Spread poison. As their forky tongues they dart. Then from her middle locks two snakes she drew. Whose merit from superior mischief grew. The envenomed ruin, thrown with spiteful care. Clung to the bosoms of the hapless pair. The hapless pair soon with wild thoughts were fired. And madness by a thousand ways inspired. Tis true, the unwounded body still was sound. But, t'was the soul which felt the deadly wound. Nor did the unsated monster here give o'er. But dealt of plagues a fresh unnumbered store. Each baneful juice too well she understood. Foam churned by Cerberus, and Hydra's blood. Hot hemlock and cold aconite she chose. Delighted in variety of woes. Whatever can untune the harmonious soul. And its mild reasoning faculties control. Give false ideas, raise desires profane. And whirl in eddies the tumultuous brain. Mixed with cursed art, she direfully around. Through all their nerves diffused the sad compound. Then tossed her torch in circles still the same. Improved their rage, and added flame to flame. The grinning fury her own conquest spied. And to her rueful shades returned with pride. And threw the exhausted useless snakes aside. Now Athamas cries out, his reason fled. Here, fellow hunters, let the toils be spread. I saw a lioness, in quest of food. With her two young, run roaring in this wood. Again the fancied savages were seen. As through his palace still he chased his queen. Then tore Lurchus from her breast, the child. Stretched little arms, and on its father smiled. A father now no more, who now begun. Around his head to whirl his giddy son. And, quite insensible to nature's call, the helpless infant flung against the wall. 
the same mad poison in the mother wrought. Young Melicerta in her arms she caught. And with disordered tresses, howling, flies. Oh! Bacchus, Evo, Bacchus, loud she cries. The name of Bacchus Juno laughed to hear. And said, Thy foster god has cost thee dear. A rock there stood, whose side the beating waves had long consumed, and hollowed into caves. The head shot forwards in a bending steep, and cast a dreadful covert o'er the deep. The wretched Eno, on destruction bent, climbed up the cliff, such strength her fury lent. Thence with her guiltless boy, who wept in vain. At one bold spring she plunged into the main. Her niece's fate touched Cytherea's breast. And in soft sound she Neptune thus addressed. Great god of waters, whose extended sway is next to his whom heaven and earth obey. Let not the suit of Venus thee displease. Pity the floaters on the Ionian seas. Increase thy subject gods, nor yet disdain to add my kindred to that glorious train. If from the sea I may such honors claim, if tis desert that from the sea I came, as Grecian poets artfully have sung, and in the name confessed from whence I sprung. Please Neptune nodded his assent, and free. Both soon became from frail mortality. He gave them form, and majesty divine. And bade them glide along the foamy brine. For Melicerta is Polemon known. And Eno once, Lucato is grown. Transformation of the Theban matrons. The companions of Eno, lamenting the fate of their unhappy mistress, excite the displeasure of Juno, who transforms them into stones and birds. The Theban matrons their loved queen pursued. And tracing to the rock, her footsteps viewed. Too certain of her fate, they rend the skies with piteous shrieks, and lamentable cries. All beat their breasts, and Juno all upbraid. Who still remembered a deluded maid. Who, still revengeful for one stolen embrace. Thus wreaked her hate on the Cadmean race. This Juno heard, and shall such elves, she cried. Dispute my justice, or my power deride? You too shall feel my wrath not idly spent. A goddess never for insults was meant. She who loved most, and who most loved had been. Said, not the waves shall part me from my queen. She strove to plunge into the roaring flood. Fixed to the stone, a stone herself she stood. This, on her breast would fain her blows repeat. Her stiffened hands refused her breast to beat. That stretched her arms unto the seas, in vain. Her arms she labored to unstretch again. To tear her comely locks another tried. Both comely locks and fingers petrified. Part thus, but Juno, with a softer mind. Part doomed to mix among the feathered kind. Transformed, the name of Theban birds they keep. And skim the surface of that fatal deep. Cadmus and his queen transformed into serpents. Wearied with toil and infirm with age, Cadmus and his wife retire to Illyricum, and at their own request are changed into serpents. Meantime the wretched Cadmus mourns, nor knows. That they who mortal fell, immortal rose. With a long series of new ills oppressed. He droops, and all the man forsakes his breast. Strange prodigies confound his fright eyes. From the fair city, which he raised, he flies. As it misfortune not pursued his race. But only hung o'er that devoted place. Resolved by sea to seek some distant land. At last he safely gained the Illyrian strand. Cheerless himself, his consort still he cheers. Hoary, and laden both with woes and years. Then to recount past sorrows they begin. And trace them to the gloomy origin. That serpent sure was hallowed, Cadmus cried. Which once my spear transfixed with foolish pride. When the big teeth, a seed before unknown. By me along the wandering glebe were sown. And sprouting armies by themselves o'erthrown. If thence the wrath of heaven on me is bent. 
May heaven conclude it with one sad event. To an extended serpent changed the man. And, while he spoke, the wished-for change began. His skin with sea-green spots was varied round. And on his belly prone he pressed the ground. He glittered soon with many a golden scale. And his shrunk legs closed in a spiry tail. Arms yet remained, remaining arms he spread. To his loved wife, and human tears yet shed. Come, my harmonia, come, thy face recline. Down to my face, still touch what still is mine. Oh! Let these hands, while hands, be gently pressed. While yet the serpent has not all possessed. More he had spoke, but strove to speak in vain. The forky tongue refused to tell his pain. And learned in hissings only to complain. Then shrieked Harmonia, Stay, my Cadmus, stay. Glide not in such a monstrous shape away. Destruction, like impetuous waves, rolls on. Where are thy feet, thy legs, thy shoulders, gone? Changed is thy visage, changed is all thy frame. Cadmus is only Cadmus now in name. Ye gods, my Cadmus to himself restore. Or me like him transform, I ask no more. The husband serpent showed he still had thought. With wanted fondness and embrace he sought. Played round her neck in many a harmless twist. And licked that bosom which, a man. He kissed. The lookers-on, for lookers-on there were. Shocked at the sight, half died away with fear. The transformation was again renewed. And, like the husband, changed the wife they viewed. Both serpents now, with fold involved in fold. To the next covert amicably rolled. There curled they lie, or wave along the green. Fearless sea men, by men are fearless seen. Still mild, and conscious what they once have been. Story of Perseus Acrisius, the grandfather of Perseus, is at length compelled to acknowledge the divinity of Bacchus, and to commemorate the splendid achievements of his descendant. Yet though this harsh and glorious fate they found, each in the deathless grandson lived renowned. Through conquered India Bacchus nobly rode, and Greece with temples hailed the conquering god. In Argos only proud Acrisius reigned, who all the consecrated rites profaned. Audacious wretch! Thus Bacchus to deny, and the great thunderer's great son defy. Nor him alone, thy daughter vainly strove, brave Perseus of celestial stem to prove, and herself pregnant by a golden Jove. Yet this was true, and truth in time prevails. Acrisius now his unbelief bewails. His former thought and impious thought he found. And both the hero and the god were owned. He saw, already, one in heaven was placed. And one with more than mortal triumphs graced. The victor Perseus, with the gorgon head. O'er Libyan sands his airy journey sped. The gory drops distilled, as swift he flew. And from each drop envenomed serpents grew. The mischiefs brooded on the barren plains. And still the unhappy fruitfulness remains. Atlas transformed to a mountain. Perseus, after the conquest of the Gorgons, passes by the palace of Atlas, and solicits the rites of hospitality. Which are refused, Perseus exhibits the head of Medusa, and the monarch is instantly changed into a large mountain, on which the world is supposed to rest. Thence Perseus, like a cloud, by storms was driven. Through all the expanse beneath the cope of heaven. The jarring winds unable to control. He saw the southern and the northern pole. And eastward thrice, and westward thrice, was whirled. And from the skies surveyed the nether world. But when grey evening showed the verge of night. He feared in darkness to pursue his flight. He poised his pinions and forgot to soar. And, sinking, closed them on the Hesperian shore. Then begged to rest, till Lucifer begun. To wake the morn, the morn to wake the sun. Here Atlas reigned, of more than human size. And in his kingdom the world's limit lies. 
here Titan bids his wearied coursers sleep, and cools the burning axle in the deep. The mighty monarch, uncontrolled, alone. His scepter sways, no neighboring states are known. A thousand flocks on shady mountains fed. A thousand herds o'er grassy plains were spread. Here wondrous trees their shining stores unfold. Their shining stores too wondrous to be told. Their leaves, their branches. And their apples, gold. Then Perseus the gigantic prince addressed. Humbly implored a hospitable rest. If bold exploits thy admiration fire. He said, I fancy mine thou wilt admire. Or. If the glory of a race can move. Not mean my glory, for I spring from Jove. At this confession Atlas ghastly stared. Mindful of what an oracle declared. That the dark womb of time concealed a day. Which should, disclosed, the bloomy gold betray. All should at once be ravished from his eyes. And Jove's own progeny enjoy the prize. For this, the fruit he loftily immured. And a fierce dragon the straight pass secured. For this, all strangers he forbade to land. And drove them from the inhospitable strand. To Perseus then, fly, quickly fly, this coast. Nor falsely dare thy acts and race to boast. In vain the hero for one night entreats. Threatening he storms, and next adds force to threats. By strength not Perseus could himself defend. For who in strength with Atlas could contend? But since short rest to me thou wilt not give. A gift of endless rest from me receive. He said, and backward turned, no more concealed. The present, and Medusa's head revealed. Soon the high Atlas a high mountain stood. His locks and beard became a leafy wood. His hands and shoulders into ridges went. The summit head still crowned the steep ascent. His bones a solid, rocky hardness gained. He, thus immensely grown, as fate ordained. The stars, the heavens, and all the gods, sustained. Andromeda rescued from the sea monster. Perseus, returning in the air from the conquest of the Gorgons, beholds Andromeda chained to a rock. And exposed to a sea monster, the hero proposes to the father of the maiden to deliver her and destroy the monster. If he will consent to bestow her in marriage on him, the offer is joyfully accepted, and the promise speedily fulfilled. Now Aeolus had with strong chains confined. And deep imprisoned every blustering wind. The rising phosphor with a purple light. Did sluggish mortals to new toils invite. His feet again the valiant Perseus plumes. And his keen sabre in his hand resumes. Then nobly spurns the ground, and upward springs. And cuts the liquid air with sounding wings. O'er various seas, and various lands, he passed. Till Ethiopia's shore appeared at last. Andromeda was there, doomed to atone. By her own ruin follies not her own. And if injustice in a god can be. Such was the Libyan god's unjust decree. Chained to a rock she stood. Young Perseus stayed. His rapid flight, to view the beauteous maid. So sweet her frame, so exquisitely fine. She seemed a statue by a hand divine. Had not the wind her waving tresses showed. And down her cheeks the melting sorrows flowed. Her faultless form the hero's bosom fires. The more he looks, the more he still admires. The admirer almost had forgot to fly. And swift descended, fluttering from on high. O oh, virgin! Worthy no such chains to prove. But pleasing chains in the soft folds of love. Thy country, and thy name, he said, disclose and give a true rehearsal of thy woes. A quick reply her bashfulness refused. To the free converse of a man unused. Her rising blushes had concealment found. From her spread hands, but that her hands were bound. She acted to her full extent of power. And bathed her face with a fresh, silent shower. 
but by degrees in innocence grown bold. Her name, her country, and her birth she told. And how she suffered for her mother's pride. Who with the Nereids once in beauty vied. Part yet untold, the seas began to roar. And mounting billows tumbled to the shore. Above the waves a monster raised his head. His body o'er the deep was widely spread. Onward he flounced, aloud the virgin cries. Each parent to her shrieks in shrieks replies. But she had deepest cause to rend the skies. Weeping, to her they cling, no sign appears. Of help, they only lend their helpless tears. Too long you vent your sorrows, Perseus said. Short is the hour, and swift the time of aid. In me the son of thundering Jove behold. Got in a kindly shower of fruitful gold. Medusa's snaky head is now my prey. And through the clouds I boldly wing my way. If such desert be worthy of esteem. And if your daughter I from death redeem. Shall she be mine? Shall it not then be thought? A bride so lovely was too cheaply bought. For her my arms I willingly employ. If I may beauties, which I save, enjoy. The parents eagerly the terms embrace. For who would slight such terms in such a case? Nor her alone they promise, but, beside. The dowry of a kingdom with the bride. As well-rigged galleys, which slaves, sweating, row. With their sharp beaks the whitened ocean plough. So, when the monster moved, still at his back. The furrowed waters left a foamy track. Now to the rock he was advanced so nigh. Whirled from a sling, a stone the space would fly. Then, bounding upwards, the brave Perseus sprung. And in mid-air on hovering pinions hung. His shadow quickly floated on the main. The monster could not his wild rage restrain. But at the floating shadow leaped in vain. As when Jove's bird a speckled serpent spies. Which in the shine of Phoebus basking lies. Unseen, he souses down, and bears away. Trust from behind, the vainly hissing prey. To writhe his neck the labor not avails. Too deep the imperial talons pierce his scales. Thus the winged hero now descends, now soars. And at his pleasure the vast monster gores. Full in his back, swift stooping from above. The crooked saber to its hilt he drove. The monster raged, impatient of the pain. First bounded high, and then sunk low again. Now, like a savage boar, when chafed with wounds. And bayed with opening mouths of hungry hounds. He on the foe turns with collected might. Who still eludes him with an airy flight. And, wheeling round, the scaly armor tries. Of his thick sides, his thinner tail now plies. Till, from repeated strokes, out gushed a flood. And the waves reddened with the streaming blood. At last the dropping wings, befoamed all o'er. With flaggy heaviness their master bore. A rock he spied, whose humble head was low. Bare at an ebb, but covered at a flow. A ridgy hold, he, thither flying, gained. And with one hand his bending weight sustained. With the other, vigorous blows he dealt around. And the home thrusts the expiring monster owned. In deafening shouts the glad applauses rise. And peal on peal runs rattling through the skies. The savior youth the royal pair confess. And with heaved hands their daughter's bridegroom bless. The beauteous bride moves on, now loosed from chains. The cause, and sweet reward. Of all the hero's pains. Meantime on shore triumphant Perseus stood. And purged his hands, smeared with the monster's blood. Then in the windings of a sandy bed. Composed Medusa's execrable head. But to prevent the roughness, leaves he threw. And young green twigs, which soft in waters grew. They're soft, and full of sap. But here, when laid. Touched by the head, that softness soon decayed. The wanted flexibility quite gone. The tender science hardened into stone. 
Fresh juicy twigs, surprised, the nereids brought. Fresh juicy twigs the same contagion caught. The nymphs the petrifying seeds still keep. And propagate the wonder through the deep. The pliant sprays of coral yet declare. Their stiffening nature, when exposed to air. Those sprays, which did like bending osiers move. Snatched from their element obdurate prove. And shrubs beneath the waves grow stones above. The great immortals grateful Perseus praised. And to three powers three turfy altars raised. To Hermes this, and that he did assign. To Pallas. The mid-honors, Jove, were thine. He hastes for Pallas a white cow to cull. A calf for Hermes, but for Jove a bull. Then seized the prize of his victorious fight. Andromeda, and claimed the nuptial right. Andromeda alone he greatly sought. The dowry kingdom was not worth his thought. Pleased Hymen and now his golden torch displays. With rich oblations fragrant altars blaze. Sweet wreaths of choicest flowers are hung on high. And cloudless pleasure smiles in every eye. The melting music melting thoughts inspires. And warbling songsters aid the warbling lyres. The palace opens wide in pompous state. And, by his peers surrounded, Cephew sate. A feast was served, fit for a king to give. And fit for godlike heroes to receive. The banquet ended, the gay cheerful bowl. Moved round, and brightened, and enlarged each soul. Then Perseus asked what customs there obtained. And by what laws the people were restrained. Which told, the teller alike freedom takes. And to the warrior his petition makes. To know what arts had won Medusa's snakes. Story of Medusa's head. Medusa, one of the three gorgons, and celebrated for her personal beauty, is violated by Neptune in the temple of Minerva who changes the flowing ringlets. Which had attracted the admiration of the god, into hissing snakes, which are finally transferred to the aegis of Minerva. The hero with his just request complies. Shows how a veil beneath cold Atlas lies. Where, with aspiring mountains fenced around. He the two daughters of old Forcus found. Fate had one common eye to both assigned. Each saw by turns, and each by turns was blind. But while one strove to lend her sister sight. He stretched his hand, and stole their mutual light. And left both eyeless, both involved in night. Through devious wilds, and trackless woods, he passed. And at the gorgon seats arrived at last. But as he journeyed, pensive, he surveyed. What wasteful havoc dire Medusa made. Here, stood still breathing statues, men before. There, rampant lions seemed in stone to roar. Nor did he, yet affrighted, quit the field. But in the mirror of his polished shield. Reflected, saw Medusa slumbers take. And not one serpent, by good chance, awake. Then backward an unerring blow he sped. And from her body lopped at once her head. The gore prolific proved, with sudden force. Sprung Pegasus, and winged his airy course. The heaven-born warrior faithfully went on. And told the numerous dangers which he run. What subject sees, what lands he had in view. And nigh what stars the advent rouse hero flew. At last he silent sat, the listening throng. Sight at the pause of his delightful tongue. Some begged to know why this alone should wear. Of all the sisters, such destructive hair. Great Perseus then, with me you shall prevail. Worth the relation, to relate a tale. Medusa once had charms, to gain her love. A rival crowd of envious lovers strove. They who have seen her own, they ne'er did trace. More moving features in a sweeter face. Yet, above all, her length of hair, they own. In golden ringlets waved, and graceful shone. Her Neptune saw, and with such beauties fired. Resolved to compass what his soul desired. The bashful goddess turned her eyes away. 
nor durst such bold impurity survey. But on the lovely virgin vengeance takes. Her shining hair is changed to hissing snakes. These, in her aegis, palace joys to bear. The hissing snakes her foes more sure ensnare. Than they did lovers once, when shining hair. Book. Chapter 5. Story of Perseus Continued. Phineas, the brother of Cepheus, had been betrothed to his niece Andromeda before she had been exposed to the rage of a sea monster. And, in order to interrupt the marriage ceremony, he collects a considerable number of his adherents, who assault Perseus, the hero, after defending himself with courage. Is in danger of being overpowered, when the assailants are suddenly turned into stone by the head of Medusa. While Perseus entertained with this report. His father Cepheus, and the listening court. Within the palace walls was heard aloud. The roaring noise of some unruly crowd. Not like the songs which cheerful friends prepare. For nuptial days, but sounds that threatened war. And all the pleasures of this happy feast. To tumult turned, in wild disorder ceased. So, when the sea is calm, we often find. A storm raised sudden by some furious wind. Chief in the riot Phineas first appeared. The rash ringleader of this boisterous herd. And brandishing his brazen pointed lance. Behold, he said, an injured man advance. Stung with resentment for his ravished wife. Nor shall thy wings, O Perseus, save thy life. Nor Jove himself, though we've been often told. Who got thee in the form of tempting gold? His lance was aimed, when Cepheus ran and said. Hold. Brother, hold. What brutal rage has made. Your frantic mind so black a crime conceive. Are these the thanks that you to Perseus give? This the reward that to his worth you pay. Whose timely valor saved Andromeda. Nor was it he, if you would reason right. That forced her from you, but the jealous spite. Of envious Nereids, and Jove's high decree. And that devouring monster of the sea. That ready, with his jaws wide gaping, stood. To eat my child, the fairest of my blood. You lost her then, when she seemed past relief. And wished, perhaps, her death to ease your grief. With my afflictions, not content to view. Andromeda in chains, unhelped by you. Her spouse, and uncle. Will you grieve that he. Exposed his life the dying maid to free? And shall you claim his merit? Had you thought. Her charms so great, you should have bravely sought. That blessing on the rocks where fixed she lay. But now let Perseus bear his prize away. By service gained. By promised faith possessed. To him I owe it, that my age is blessed. Still with a child, nor think that I prefer. Perseus to thee, but to the loss of her. Phineas on him and Perseus rolled about. His eyes in silent rage, and seemed to doubt. Which to destroy, till, resolute at length. He threw his spear with the redoubled strength. His fury gave him, and at Perseus struck. But missing Perseus, in his seat it stuck. Who, springing nimbly up, returned the dart. And almost plunged it in his rival's heart. But he for safety to the altar ran. Unfit protection for so vile a man. Yet was the stroke not vain, as Rhetus found. Who in his brow received a mortal wound. Headlong he tumbled, when his skull was broke. From which his friends the fatal weapon took. While he lay trembling, and his gushing blood. In crimson streams around the table flowed. But this provoked the unruly rabble worse. They flung their darts, and some in loud discourse. To death young Perseus and the monarch doom. But Cepheus left before the guilty room. With grief appealing to the gods above. Who laws of hospitality approve? Who faith protect, and succor injured right? That he was guiltless of this barbrous fight. Pallas her brother Perseus close attends. And with her ample shield from harm defends. 
raising a sprightly courage in his heart. But Indian Athos took the weaker part. Born in the crystal grottoes of the sea. Limnate son, a fenny nymph. And she. Daughter of Ganges, graceful was his mien. His person lovely, and his age sixteen. His habit made his native beauty more. A purple mantle fringed with gold he wore. His neck, well turned, with golden chains was graced. His hair, with myrrh perfumed, was nicely dressed. Though with just aim he could the javelin throw. Yet with more skill he drew the bending bow. And now was drawing it with artful hand. When Perseus, snatching up a flaming brand, whirled sudden at his face the burning wood, crushed his eyes in, and quenched the fire with blood. Through the soft skin the splintered bones appear, and spoiled the face that lately was so fair. When Lycabas his Athos thus beheld, how was his heart with friendly horror filled? A youth so noble, to his soul so dear. To see his shapeless look, his dying groans to hear. He snatched the bow the boy was used to bend. And cried, with me, false traitor, dare contend. Boast not a conquest o'er a child, but try. Thy strength with me, who all thy powers defy. Nor think so mean an act of victory. While yet he spoke he flung the whizzing dart. Which pierced the plated robe, but missed his heart. Perseus defied, upon him fiercely pressed. With sword unsheathed, and plunged it in his breast. His eyes o'erwhelmed with night, he stumbling falls. And with his latest breath on Athos calls. Please that so near the lovely youth he lies. He sinks his head upon his friend, and dies. Next eager Forbus, old Methion's son, came rushing forward with Amphimedon. When the smooth pavement, slippery made with gore, tripped up their feet, and flung them on the floor. The sword of Perseus, who by chance was nigh, prevents their rise. And where they fall, they lie. Full in his ribs Amphimedon he smote, and then stuck fiery Forbus in the throat. Eurythus lifting up his axe, the blow, was thus prevented by his nimble foe. A golden cup he seizes, high embossed, and at his head the massy goblet tossed. It hits, and from his forehead bruised rebounds, and blood and brains he vomits from his wounds. With his slain fellows on the floor he lies, and death forever shuts his swimming eyes. Then Polydemon fell, a goddess born. Phlegias and Elyson, with locks unshorn. Next followed, next the stroke of death he gave. To Clytus, Abanis, and Lycidas brave. While o'er unnumbered heaps of ghastly dead. The Argive hero's feet triumphant tread. But Phineas stands aloof, and dreads to feel. His rival's force, and flies his pointed steel. Yet through a dart from far. By chance it lights. On Idas, who for neither party fights. But wounded, sternly thus to Phineas said. Since of a neuter thou a foe hast made. This I return thee. Drawing from his side. The dart, which, as he strove to fling, he died. Odites fell by Clymenus' sword. The Cephan court had not a greater lord. Hypsius his blade does in protener sheath. But brave Linside soon revenged his death. Here too was old Amathian, one that feared. The gods, and in the cause of heaven appeared. Who, only wishing the success of right. And by his age exempted from the fight. Both sides alike condemns, this impious war. Cease, cease, he cries. These bloody broils forbear. This scarce the sage, with high concern, had said. When Chromus, at a blow, struck off his head. Which, dropping, on the royal altar rolled. Still staring on the crowd with aspect bold. And still it seemed their horrid strife to blame. In life and death his pious zeal the same. While clinging to the horns the trunk expires. The severed head consumes amid the fires. 
Then Phineas, who from far his javelin threw. Brotes and Ammon, twins and brothers, slew. For knotted gauntlets matchless in the field. But gauntlets must a swords and javelins yield. Ampicus next, with hallowed fillets bound. As Ceres priest, and with a mitre crowned. His spear transfixed, and struck him to the ground. O oh, Iapetides, with pain I tell. How you, sweet lyrist, in the riot fell. What worse than brutal rage his breast could fill? Who did thy blood, O bard celestial? Spill? Kindly you pressed amid the princely throng. To crown the feast, and give the nuptial song. Discord abhorred the music of thy lyre. Whose notes did gentle peace so well inspire? Thee when fierce Petalus far off espied. Defenseless with thy harp, he scoffing cried. Go, to the ghosts thy soothing lessons play. We loathe thy lyre, and scorn thy peaceful lay. And, as again he fiercely bid him go, he pierced his temples with a mortal blow. His harp he held, though sinking on the ground. Whose strings in death his trembling fingers found. By chance, and tuned by chance a dying sound. With grief Lycormas saw him fall, from far. And resting from the door a massy bar. Full in his pole lays on a load of knocks. Which stun him, and he falls like a devoted ox. Another bar pellets would have snatched. But Cory thus his motions slyly watched. He darts his weapon from a private stand. And rivets to the post his veiny hand. When straight a missive spear transfixed his side. By Abbas' throne, and, as he hung, he died. Melanus on the prince's side was slain. And Dorilas, who owned a fertile plain. Of Nazamonia's fields the wealthy lord. Whose crowded barns could scarce contain their hoard. A whizzing spear obliquely gave a blow. Stuck in his groin. And pierced the nerves below. His foe beheld his eyes convulsive roll. His ebbing veins, and his departing soul. Then taunting said, of all thy spacious plains. This spot thy only property remains. He left him thus, but had no sooner left. Then Perseus in revenge his nostrils cleft. From his friend's breast the murdering dart he drew. And the same weapon at the murderer threw. His head and halves the darted javelin cut. And on each side the brain came issuing out. Fortune his friend, his deaths around he deals. And this his lance, and that his falchion feels. Now Clitius dies. And, by a different wound. The twin, his brother Clanus, bites the ground. In his rent jaw the bearded weapon sticks. And the steeled dart does Clitius thigh transfix. With these Mendesian Celadon he slew. And Astrius next, whose mother was a Jew. His sire uncertain, then by Perseus fell. Ethian, who could things to come foretell? But now he knows not whence the javelin flies. That wounds his breast, nor by whose arm he dies. The squire to Phineas next his valor tried. And fierce a jerdy stained with parricide. As these are slain, fresh numbers still appear. And wage with Perseus an unequal war. To rob him of his right, the maid he won. By honor, promise, and desert his own. With him the father of the beauteous bride. The mother, and the fright virgin, sighed. With shrieks and doleful cries they rend the air. Their shrieks confounded with the din of war. With clashing arms, and groanings of the slain. They grieve unpitied, and unheard complain. The floor with ruddy streams Bologna stains. And Phineas a new war with double rage maintains. Perseus begirt, from all around they pour. Their lances on him, a tempestuous shower. Aimed all at him, a cloud of darts and spears. Or blind his eyes, or whistle round his ears. Their numbers to resist, against the wall. He guards his back secure, and dares them all. Here from the left Malpius renews the fight. And bold Ethamon presses on the right. 
as when a hungry tiger near him hears. Two lowing herds, a while he both forbears. Nor can his hopes of this or that renounce. So strong he lusts to prey on both at once. Thus Perseus now with that or this is loath. To war distinct. But rain would fall on both. And first Chaunian Malpius felt his blow. And fled, and never after faced his foe. Then fierce Ethamon, as he turned his back. Hurried with fury. Aiming at his neck. His brandished sword against the marble struck. With all his might. The brittle weapon broke. And in his throat the point rebounding stuck. Too slight the wound for life to issue thence. And yet too great for battle or defense. His arms extended, in this piteous state. For mercy he would sue, but sues too late. Perseus has in his bosom plunged the sword. And ere he speaks, the wound prevents the word. The crowds increasing, and his friends distressed. Himself by warring multitudes oppressed. Since thus unequally you fight, tis time. He cried, to punish your presumptuous crime. Beware, my friends, his friends were soon prepared. Their sight averting, high the head he reared. And Gorgon on his foes severely stared. Vain shift. Says Thessalus, with aspect bold. Thee and thy bugbear monster I behold. With scorn, he lifts his arm, but ere he threw. The dart, the hero to a statue grew. In the same posture still the marble stands. And holds the warrior's weapons in its hands. Amphix, whom yet this wonder can't alarm. Heaves at Linside's breast his impious arm. But, while thus daringly he presses on. His weapon and his arm are turned to stone. Next Nilius, he who vainly said he owed. His origin to Nile's prolific flood. Who on his shield seven silver rivers bore. His birth to witness by the arms he wore. Full of his sevenfold father, thus expressed. His boast to Perseus, and his pride confessed. See whence we sprung, let this thy comfort be. In thy sure death. That thou didst die by me. While yet he spoke, the dying accents hung. In sounds imperfect on his marble tongue. Though changed to stone, his lips he seemed to stretch. And through the insensate rock would force a speech. This Eric saw, but seeing would not own. The mischief by yourselves, he cries, is done. Tis your cold courage turns your hearts to stone. Come, follow me. Fall on the stripling boy. Kill him, and you his magic arms destroy. Then rushing on, his arm to strike he reared. And marbled o'er his varied frame appeared. These for affronting Pallas were chastised. And justly met the death they had despised. But brave Acontius, Perseus' friend, by chance. Looked back, and met the Gorgon's fatal glance. A statue now become, he ghastly stares. And still the foe to mortal combat dares. Astyage the living likeness knew. On the dead stone with vengeful fury flew. But impotent his rage, the jarring blade. No print upon the solid marble made. Again, as with redoubled might he struck. Himself astonished in the quarry stuck. The vulgar deaths, t'were tedious to rehearse. And fates below the dignity of verse. Their safety in their flight two hundred found. Two hundred by Medusa's head were stoned. Fierce Phineas now repents the wrongful fight. And views his varied friends, a dreadful sight. He knows their faces, for their help he sues. And thinks, not hearing him, that they refuse. By name he begs their succor, one by one. Then doubts their life, and feels the friendly stone. Struck with remorse, and conscious of his pride. Convict of sin, he turned his eyes aside. With suppliant mien, to Perseus thus he prays. Hence with the head, as far as winds and seas. Can bear thee, hence, O oh quit the Cephan shore. And never curse us with Medusa more. That horrid head, which stiffens into stone. 
those impious men, who, daring death, look on. I ward not with thee out of hate or strife. My honest cause was to defend my wife. First pledged to me, what crime could I suppose? To arm my friends, and vindicate my spouse? But vain, too late, I see, was our design. Mine was the title, but the merit thine. Contending made me guilty, I confess. But penitence should make that guilt the less. Twas thine to conquer by Minerva's power. Favored by heaven, thy mercy I implore. For life I sue, the rest to thee I yield. In pity from my sight remove the shield. He suing said, nor durst revert his eyes. On the grim head, and Perseus thus replies. Coward, what is in me to grant I will? Nor blood, unworthy of my valor, spill. Fear not to perish by my vengeful sword. From that secure, tis all the fates afford. Where now I see thee, thou shalt still be seen. A lasting monument, to please our queen. There still shall thy betrothed behold her spouse. And find his image in her father's house. This said, where Phineas turned to shun the shield. Full in his face the staring head he held. As here and there he strove to turn aside. The wonder wrought. The man was petrified. All marble was his frame, his humid eyes. Dropped tears, which hung upon the stone like ice. In suppliant posture, with uplifted hands. And fearful look, the guilty statue stands. Hence Perseus to his native city hies. Victorious, and rewarded with his prize. Conquest. O'er Pretus the usurper, won. He reinstates his grandsire in the throne. Pretus his brother dispossessed by might. His realm enjoyed, and still detained his right. But Perseus pulled the haughty tyrant down. And to the rightful king restored the throne. Weak was the usurper, as his cause was wrong. Where Gorgon's head appears, what arms are strong? When Perseus to his host the monster held. They soon were statues, and their king expelled. Thence to Seraphis with the head he sails. Whose prince his story treats as idle tales. Lord of a little isle, he scorns to seem. Too credulous, but laughs at that in him. Yet did he not so much suspect the truth. As, out of pride or envy, hate the youth. The Argive prince, at his contempt enraged. To force his faith by fatal proof engaged. Friends, shut your eyes, he cries, his shield he takes. And to the king exposed Medusa's snakes. The monarch felt the power he would not own. And stood convict of folly in the stone. Minerva's interview with the Muses. Minerva visits Mount Helicon, the seat of the Muses, by whom she is hospitably entertained. Thus far Minerva was content to rove. With Perseus, offspring of her father Jove. Now hid in cloud Seraphis she forsook. And to the Theban towers her journey took. Sithnos and Gyros, lying to the right. She passed unheeded in her eager flight. And choosing first on Helicon to rest. The virgin muses in these words addressed. Me the strange tidings of a new-found spring. Ye learned sisters, to this mountain bring. If all the true that fame's wide rumors tell. Twas Pegasus discovered first your well. Whose piercing hoof gave the soft earth a blow. Which broke the surface where these waters flow. I saw that horse by miracle obtain. Life, from the blood of dire Medusa slain. And now this equal prodigy to view. From distant isles to famed Boeotia few. The muse Urania said, whatever cause. So great a goddess to this mansion draws. Our shades are happy with so bright a guest. You, queen, are welcome, and we muses blessed. What fame has published of our spring is true. Thanks for our spring to Pegasus are due. Then with becoming courtesy, she led. The curious stranger to their fountain's head. Who long surveyed, with wonder and delight. Their sacred water, charming to the sight. 
Their ancient groves, dark grottos, shady bowers. And smiling plains, adorned with various flowers. O oh, happy muses! She with rapture cried. Who, safe from cares, on this fair hill reside? Blessed in your seat, and free, yourselves to please. With joys of study, and with glorious ease. Fate of Pyrenius. The muses find shelter from the fury of the elements in the house of Pyrenius, king of Thrace. Who presumes to offer violence to his guests, the goddesses take to their wings, and are pursued by their perfidious host, who is killed by a fall from a lofty precipice. Then one replies, O goddess, fit to guide. Our humble works, and in our choir preside. Who sure would wisely to these fields repair? To taste our pleasures, and our labors share. Were not your virtue and superior mind. To higher arts and nobler deeds inclined. Justly you praise our works, and pleasing seat. Which all might envy in this soft retreat. Were we secured from dangers and from harms. But maids are frightened with the least alarms. And none are safe in this licentious time. Still fierce Pyrenius, and his daring crime. With lasting horror strikes my feeble sight. Nor is my mind recovered from the fright. With Thracian arms this bold usurper gained. Daulus and Phocis, where he proudly reigned. It happened once, as through his lands we went. For the bright temple of Parnassus bent. He met us there, and, in his artful mind, hiding the faithless action he designed, conferred on us, whom, oh too well he knew, all honors that to goddesses are due. Stop, stop, ye muses, tis your friend who calls. The tyrant said, Behold the rain that falls on every side, and that ill boding sky, whose lowering face portends more storms are nigh. Pray make my house your own, and, void of fear. While this bad weather lasts, take shelter here. Gods have made meaner places their resort. And for a cottage left their shining court. Obliged to stop, by the united force. Of pouring rains, and complacent discourse. His courteous invitation we obey. And in his hall resolve a while to stay. Soon it cleared up the clouds began to fly. The driving north refined the showery sky. Then to pursue our journey we began. But the false traitor to his portal ran. Stopped our escape, the door securely barred. And to our honor violence prepared. But we, transformed to birds, avoid his snare. On pinions rising in the yielding air. But he, by lust and indignation fired up to his highest tower with speed retired. And cries, in vain you from my arms withdrew. The way you go your lover will pursue. Then in a flying posture wildly placed. And daring from that height himself to cast. The wretch fell headlong, and the ground bestrewed. With broken bones, and stains of guilty blood. Story of the Pie Rides the daughters of Pyrrhus challenged the muses to a trial in music. The muse yet spoke, when they began to hear. A noise of wings that fluttered in the air. And straight a voice, from some high-spreading bough. Seemed to salute the company below. The goddess wondered, and inquired from whence. That tongue was heard, that spoke so plainly sense. It seemed to her a human voice to be. But proved a bird's. Four in a shady tree. Nine magpies perched, lament their altered state. And what they hear are skillful to repeat. The sister to the wandering goddess said. These, foiled by us, by us were thus repaid. These did a vip of Peonia bring. With nine hard labor pangs, to Pella's king. The foolish virgins, of their number proud. And puffed with praises of the senseless crowd through all Achaia and the Ammonian plains, defied us thus, to match their artless strains. No more, ye thespian girls, your notes repeat, nor with false harmony the vulgar cheat. 
In voice or skill if you with us will vie. As many we in voice or skill will try. Surrender you to us, if we excel. Famed Aganippe, and Medusa's well. The conquest yours. Your prize from us shall be. The Mathian plains to snowy pay one. The nymphs are judges. To dispute the field. We thought a shame, but greater shame to yield. On seats of living stone the sisters sit. And by the rivers swear to judge aright. Song of the Pie Rides. The challengers select the rebellion of the giants, and the various transformations of the gods to avoid their rage, as the subject of their song. Then rises one of the presumptuous throng. Steps rudely forth, and first begins the song. Equals with vain address describes the giants' wars. And to the gods their fabled acts prefers. She sings from earth's dark womb how Typhon rose and struck with mortal fear his heavenly foes. How the gods fled to Egypt's slimy soil, and hid their heads beneath the banks of Nile. How Typhon from the conquered skies pursued, their routed godheads to the seven-mouthed flood, forced every god, his fury to escape, some beastly form to take, or earthly shape. Jove, so she sung, was changed into a ram. From whence the horns of Libyan Ammon came. Bacchus a goat, Apollo was a crow. Phoebe a cat. The wife of Jove a cow. Whose hue was whiter than the falling snow. Mercury to a nasty ibis turned. The change obscene, afraid of Typhon mourned. While Venus from a fish protection craves. And once more plunges in her native waves. She sung and to her harp her voice applied. Then us again to match her they defied. But our poor song, perhaps, for you to hear. Nor leisure serves, nor is it worth your ear. That causeless doubt remove, O oh muse. Rehearse. The goddess cried, your ever grateful verse. Beneath a checkered shade she takes her seat. And bids the sister her whole song repeat. The sister thus, Calliope we chose. For the performance. The sweet virgin rose. With ivy crowned. She tunes her golden strings. And to her harp this composition sings. Song of the Muses. The Muses commence their song with describing the arts of Venus and Cupid to inflame the god Pluto with a passion for Proserpine. First series taught the laboring hind to plow. The pregnant earth, and quickening seed to sow. She first for man did wholesome food provide. And with just laws the wicked world supplied. All good from her derived, to her belong. The grateful tributes of the muse's song. Her more than worthy of our verse we deem. Oh! Were our verse more worthy of the theme. Jove on the giant fair Trinacria hurled. And with one bolt revenged his starry world. Beneath her burning hills Typhoeus lies. And, struggling always, strives in vain to rise. Down does Polaris his right hand suppress. Towards Latium. On the left Pasheen weighs. His legs are under Lilibium spread. And Etna presses hard his horrid head. On his broad back he there extended lies. And vomits clouds of ashes to the skies. Oft laboring with his load, at last he tires. And pours out in revenge a flood of fires. Mountains he struggles to o'erwhelm, and towns. Earth's inmost bowels quake, and nature groans. His terrors reach the direful king of hell. He fears his throes will to the day reveal. The realms of night, and fright his trembling ghosts. This to prevent, he quits the Stygian coasts. In his black car, by sooty horses drawn. Fair Sicily he seeks, and dreads the dawn. Around her plains he casts his eager eyes. And every mountain to the bottom tries. But when, in all the careful search, he saw. No cause of fear, no ill-suspected flaw. Secure from harm, and wandering on at will. Venus beheld him from her flowery bill. 
when straight the dame her little cupid pressed, with secret rapture, to her snowy breast. And in these words the fluttering boy addressed, O thou, my arms, my glory, and my power, my son, whom men and deathless gods adore, bend thy sure bow, whose arrows never missed. No longer let hell's king thy sway resist. Take him, while straggling from his dark abodes. He coasts the kingdoms of superior gods. If sovereign Jove, if gods who rule the waves. And Neptune, who rules them, have been thy slaves. Shall hell be free? The tyrant strike, my son. Enlarge thy mother's empire, and thy own. Let not our heaven be made the mock of hell. But Pluto to confess thy power compel. Our rule is slighted in our native skies. See Pallas, see Diana too, defies. Thy darts. Which Ceres' daughter would despise. She too our empire treats with awkward scorn. Such insolence no longer's to be borne. Revenge our slighted reign. And with thy dart. Transfix the virgins to the uncle's heart. She said, and from his quiver straight he drew. A dart that surely would the business do. She guides his hand. She makes her touch the test. And of a thousand arrows chose the best. No feather better poised, a sharper head. None had, and sooner none, and surer sped. He bends his how, he draws it to his ear. Through Pluto's heart it drives, and fixes there. Rape of Proserpine Pluto surprises Proserpine while gathering towers in the plains of Enna, and transports her to the internal regions. Near Enna's walls a spacious lake is spread. Famed for the sweetly singing swans it bred. Pergusa is its name, and nevermore. Were heard, or sweeter on Caster's shore. Woods crown the lake. And Phoebus ne'er invades. The tufted fences, or offends the shades. Fresh fragrant breezes fan the verdant bowers. And the moist ground smiles with enameled flowers. The cheerful birds their airy carols sing. And the whole year is one eternal spring. Here while young Proserpine, among the maids. Diverts herself in these delicious shades. While, like a child, with busy speed and care. She gathers lilies here, and violets there. While first to fill her little lap she strives. Hell's grisly monarch at the shade arrives. Sees her thus sporting on the flowery green. And loves the blooming maid as soon as seen. His urgent flame impatient of delay. Swift as his thought he seized the beauteous prey. And bore her in his sooty car away. The fright goddess to her mother cries. But all in vain, for now far off she flies. Far she behind her leaves her virgin train. To them too cries, and cries to them in vain. And while with passion she repeats her call. The violets from her lap and lilies fall. She misses them, poor heart. And makes new moan. Her lilies, ah! Are lost, her violets gone. O'er hills the ravisher and valley speeds. By name encouraging his foamy steeds. He rattles o'er their necks the rusty reins. And ruffles with the stroke their shaggy manies. O'er lakes he whirls his flying wheels, and comes. To the palace I, breathing sulfrous fumes. And thence to where the Bacchiads of renown. Between unequal havens, built their town. Where Arethusa, round the imprisoned sea. Extends her crooked coast to Syene. The nymph who gave the neighboring lake a name. Of all Sicilian nymphs the first in fame. She from the waves advanced her beauteous head. The goddess knew, and thus to Pluto said. Farther thou shalt not with the virgin run. Ceres unwilling, canst thou be her son? The maid should be by sweet persuasion won. For suits not with the softness of the fair. For, if great things with small I may compare. Me Anipus once loved. A milder course. He took, and won me by his words, not force. 
Then, stretching out her arms, she stopped his way. But he, impatient of the shortest stay, throws to his dreadful steeds the slackened rein, and strikes his iron scepter through the mane. The depths profound through yielding waves he cleaves, and to hell's center a free passage leaves. Down sinks his chariot, and his realms of night. The god soon reaches with a rapid flight. Cyane dissolves to a fountain. The nymph Cyane, bewailing the loss of Proserpine, is changed into a fountain. But still does Cyane the rape bemoan. And with the goddess wrongs laments her own. For the stolen maid, and for her injured spring. Time to her trouble no relief can bring. In her sad heart a heavy load she bears. Till the dumb sorrow turns her all to tears. Her mingling waters with that fountain pass. Of which she late immortal goddess was. Her varied members to a fluid melt. A pliant softness in her bones is felt. Her wavy locks first drop away in dew. And liquid next her slender fingers grew. The body's change soon seizes its extreme. Her legs dissolve, and feet flow off in stream. Her arms, her back, her shoulders, and her side. Her swelling breasts, in little currents glide. A silver liquor only now remains. Within the channel of her purple veins. Nothing to fill love's grasp, her husband chaste. Bathes in that bosom he before embraced. Boy transformed to an eft. Overcome with fatigue, while in pursuit of her daughter. Ceres requests an old woman to supply her with a draught of water, a more generous liquor is hospitably afforded by the matron. And the goddess, while eagerly allaying her thirst, is derided by a boy, who is immediately transformer into an eft. Thus while through all the earth and all the main, her daughter mournful Ceres sought in vain. Aurora, when with dewy looks she rose. Nor burnished Vesper found her in repose. At Etna's flaming mouth two pitchy pines. To light her in her search, at length she tines. Restless, with these, through frosty night she goes. Nor fears the cutting winds, nor heeds the snows. And when the morning star the day renews. From east to west her absent child pursues. Thirsty at last by long fatigue she grows. But meets no spring, no rivulet near her flows. Then looking round, a lowly cottage spies. Smoking among the trees, and thither hies. The goddess knocking at the little door. Twas opened by a woman old and poor. Who, when she begged for water, gave her ale. Brewed long, but well preserved from being stale. The goddess drank, a chuffy lad was by. Who saw the liquor with a grudging eye. And grinning cries, she's greedy more than dry. Ceres, offended at his foul grimace. Flung what she had not drunk into his face. The sprinkling speckle where they hit the skin. And a long tail does from his body spin. His arms are turned to legs, and, lest his size. Should make him mischievous, and he might rise. Against mankind, diminutives his frame. Less than a lizard, but in shape the same. Amazed the dame the wondrous sight beheld. And weeps, and fain would touch her quondam child. Yet her approach the affrighted vermin shuns. And fast into the greatest crevice runs. A name they gave him, which the spots expressed. That rose like stars and varied all his one breast. What lands, what seas, the goddess wandered o'er. Were long to tell, for there remained no more. Searching all round, her fruitless toil she mourns. And with regret to Sicily returns. At length, where Cyane now flows she came. Who could have told her, were she still the same? As when she saw her daughter sink to hell. But what she knows she wants a tongue to tell. Yet this plain signal manifestly gave. The virgin's girdle floating on a wave. As late she dropped it from her slender waist. When with her uncle through the deep she passed. Ceres the token by her grief confessed. And tore her golden hair, and beat her breast. 
she knows not on what land her curse should fall. But, as ingrate, alike upbraids them all. Unworthy of her gifts. Trinacria most. Were the last steps she found of what she lost. The plough for this the vengeful goddess broke. And with one death the ox and owner struck. In vain the fallow fields the peasant tills. The seed, corrupted air, tis sown, she kills. The fruitful soil, that once such harvests bore. Now mocks the farmer's care, and teems no more. And the rich grain, which fills the furrowed glade. Rots in the seed. Or shrivels in the blade. Or too much sun burns up, or too much rain. Drowns, or black blights destroy the blasted plain. Or greedy birds the new-sown seed devour. Or darnel, thistles, and a crop impure. Of knotted grass, along the acres stand. And spread their thriving roots through all the land. Then from the waves soft Arethusa rears. Her head, and back she flings her dropping hairs. O mother of the maid, whom thou so far hast sought, of whom thou canst no tidings hear. O thou, she cried, who art to life a friend. Cease here thy search, and let thy labor end. Thy faithful Sicily's a guiltless climb. And should not suffer for another's crime. She neither knew nor could prevent the deed. Nor think that for my country thus I plead. My country's Pisa, I'm an alien here. Yet these abodes to Ellis I prefer. No climb to me so sweet, no place so dear. These springs I, Arethusa, now possess. And this my seat, O gracious goddess, bless. This island why I love, and why I crossed. Such spacious seas to reach Ortigia's coast. To you I shall impart, when, void of care. Your heart's at ease, and you're more fit to hear. When on your brow no pressing sorrow sits. For gay content alone such tales admits. When through earth's caverns I a while have rolled. My waves, I rise, and here again behold. The long lost stars. And, as I late did glide. Near Styx, Proserpina there I espied. Fear still with grief might in her face be seen. She still her loss laments, yet, made a queen. Beneath those gloomy shades her scepter sways. And Evan the infernal king her will obeys. This heard, the goddess like a statue stood. Stupid with grief, and in that musing mood. Continued long, new cares a while suppressed. The reigning powers of her immortal breast. At last to Jove, her daughter's sire, she flies. And with her chariot cuts the crystal skies. She comes in clouds, and with disheveled hair. Standing before his throne. Prefers her prayer. King of the gods, defend my blood and thine. And use it not the worse for being mine. If I no more am gracious in thy sight. Be just, O Jove, and do thy daughter right. In vain I sought her the wide world around. And when I most despaired to find her, found. But how can I the fatal finding boast? By which I know she is for ever lost? Without her father's aid, what other power? Can to my arms the lovely maid restore? Let him restore her, I'll the crime forgive. My child, dishonored, I'd with joy receive. Pity your daughter with a thief should wed. Though mine, you think, deserves no better bed. Jove thus replies, it equally belongs. To both to guard our common pledge from wrongs. But if to things we proper names apply. This hardly can be called an injury. The theft is love. Nor need we blush to own. The thief, if I can judge, to be our son. Had you of his desert no other proof. To be Jove's brother is, methinks, enough. Nor was my throne by worth superior got. Heaven fell to me, as hell to him, by lot. If you are still resolved her loss to mourn. And nothing less will serve than her return. Upon these terms she may again be yours. The irrevocable terms of fate, 
not ours. Of Stygian food if she did never taste. Hell's bounds may then, and only then, be passed. Transformation of Ascalaphus into an Owl When Ceres has obtained from Jupiter her daughter's freedom and returned to Earth, provided she has eaten nothing in the kingdom of Pluto. The goddess hastens to the infernal regions, and finds that Proserpine has already partaken of the fruit of the pomegranate tree by the testimony of Ascalaphus, whose loquacity is punished by his transformation into an owl. The goddess now, resolving to succeed, down to the gloomy shades descends with speed. But adverse fate had otherwise decreed. For, long before, her giddy, thoughtless child had broke her fast, and all her projects spoiled. As in the garden's shady walk she strayed. A fair pomegranate charmed the simple maid. Hung in her way, and tempting her to taste. She plucked the fruit, and took a short repast. Seven times, a seed at once, she eat the food. The fact Ascalaphus had only viewed. Whom Acheron begot, in Stygian shades. On Orphne, famed among Avernal maids. He saw what passed, and, by discovering all, detained the ravished nymph in cruel thrall. But now a queen, she with resentment heard, and changed the vile informer to a bird. In Phlegathon's black stream her hand she dips, sprinkles his head, and wets his babbling lips. Soon on his face, bedropped with magic dew, a change appeared, and gaudy feathers grew. A crooked beak the place of nose supplies. Rounder his head, and larger are his eyes. His arms and body waste, but are supplied. With yellow pinions, flagging on each side. His nails grow crooked, and are turned to claws. And lazily along his heavy wings he draws. Illumined in his form, the unlucky fowl. Abhorred by men, and called a screeching owl. Daughters of Achilles transformed into sirens. The sirens, daughters of Achilles and the muse Melpomene, disconsolate at the abduction of Proserpine, entreat the gods to afford them wings. That they may seek her by sea as well as by land, Jupiter, to appease the resentment of Ceres and soothe her grief, decrees that Proserpine shall remain six months in each year with her husband. And the remainder with her mother on earth. Justly this punishment was due to him. And less had been too little for his crime. But, O oh ye nymphs! That from the flood descend. What fault of yours the gods could so offend? With wings and claws your beauteous forms to spoil. Yet save your maiden face and winning smile? Were you not with her in Pergusa's bowers? When Proserpine went forth to gather flowers? Since Pluto in his car the goddess caught. Have you not for her in each climate sought? And when on land you long had searched in vain. You wished for wings to cross the pathless main. The earth and sea might witness to your care. The gods were easy. And returned your prayer. With golden wing o'er foamy waves you fled. And to the sun your plumy glory spread. But lest the soft enchantment of your songs and the sweet music of your flat ring tongues, should quite be lost, as courteous fates ordain. Your voice and virgin beauty still remain. Jove, some amends for Ceres lost to make. Yet unwilling Pluto should the joy partake. Gives them of Proserpine an equal share. Who, claimed by both, with both divides the year. The goddess now in either empire sways. Six moons in hell and six with Ceres stays. Her peevish tempers changed, that sullen mind. Which made Evan hell uneasy, now is kind. Her voice refines, her mien more sweet appears. Her forehead free from frowns, her eyes from tears. As when, with golden light, the conquering day. Through dusky exhalations clears away. Ceres her daughters lost no longer mourned. But back to Arethusa's spring returned. And, sitting on the margin, bid her tell. From whence she came, and why a sacred well. Story of Arethusa. The god Alpheus, 
becoming enamored of Arethusa, a follower of Diana, pursues her for a considerable distance, when the nymph, ready to sink under fatigue, implores the aid of her protectress, who changes her into a fountain, with whose streams the river Alpheus mingles. Still were the purling waters, and the maid. From the smooth surface raised her beauteous head. Wipes off the drops that from her tresses ran. And thus to tell Alpheus loves began. In Ellis first I breathed the living air. The chase was all my pleasure, all my care. None loved like me the forest to explore. To pitch the toils, and drive the bristled boar. A fair, though masculine, I had the name. But gladly would to that have quitted claim. It less my pride than indignation raised. To hear the beauty I neglected praised. Such compliments I loathed, such charms as these. I scorned, and thought it infamy to please. Once, I remember, in the summer's heat. Tired with the chase, I sought a cool retreat. And walking on, a silent current found. Which gently glided o'er the gravelly ground. The crystal water was so smooth, so clear. My eye distinguished every pebble there. So soft its motion, that I scarce perceived. The running stream, or what I saw believed. The hoary willow and the poplar made. Along the shelving bank, a grateful shade. In the cool rivulet my feet I dipped. Then waded to the knee, and then I stripped. My robe I careless on an osier threw. That near the place commodiously grew. Nor long upon the border naked stood. But plunged with speed into the silver flood. My arms a thousand ways I moved, and tried. To quicken, if I could, the lazy tide. Where? While I played my swimming gambles o'er. I heard a murmuring voice, and fright sprung to shore. Oh! Whither, Arethusa, dost thou fly? From the brook's bottom did Alpheus cry. Again I heard him, in a hollow tone. Oh! Whither, Arethusa, dost thou run? Naked I flew, nor could I stay to hide. My limbs, my robe was on the other side. Alpheus followed fast. The inflaming sight. Quickened his speed, and made his labor light. He sees me ready for his eager arms. And with a greedy glance devours my charms. As trembling doves from pressing danger fly. When the fierce hawk comes sousing from the sky. And as fierce hawks the trembling doves pursue. From him I fled, and after me he flew. First by Orcomenus I took my flight. And soon had Sophus and Silene in sight. Behind me then high Mienelus I lost. And craggy Aramanthus, scaled with frost. Ellis was next, thus far the ground I trod. With nimble feet, before the distanced god. But here I lagged, unable to sustain. The labor longer, and my flight maintain. While he, more strong, more patient of the toil. And fired with hopes of beauty's speedy spoil. Gained my lost ground, and, by redoubled pace. Now left between us but a narrow space. Unwearied I till now o'er hills and plains. O'er rocks and rivers, ran, and felt no pains. The sun behind me and the god I kept. But when I fastest should have run, I stepped. Before my feet his shadow now appeared. As what I saw, or rather what I feared. Yet there I could not be deceived by fear. Who felt his breath pant on my braided hair. And heard his sounding tread, and knew him to be near. Tired and despairing, O celestial maid. I'm caught, I cried, without thy heavenly aid. Help me, Diana, help a nymph forlorn. Devoted to the woods, who long has worn. Thy livery, and long thy quiver born. The goddess heard, my pious prayer prevailed. In muffling clouds my virgin head was veiled. The Amraus god, deluded of his hopes. Searches the gloom, and through the darkness gropes. Twice where Diana did her servant hide. He came, and twice, O Arethusa, cried. 
How shaken was my soul, how sunk my heart! The terror seized on every trembling part. Thus when the wolf about the mountain prowls. For prey, the lambkin hears his horrid howls. The timrouse hare, the pack approaching nigh. Thus hearkens to the hounds. And trembles at the cry. Nor dares she stir, for fear her scented breath. Direct the dogs, and guide the threatened death. Alpheus in the cloud no traces found. To mark my way, yet stays to guard the ground. The god so near, a chilly sweat possessed. My fainting limbs, at every pore expressed. My strength distilled in drops, my hair in dew. My form was changed, and all my substance knew. Each motion was a stream, and my whole frame. Turned to a fount, which still preserves my name. Resolved I should not his embrace escape. Again the god resumes his fluid shape. To mix his streams with mine he fondly tries. But still Diana his attempt denies. She cleaves the ground, through caverns dark I run. A different current, while he keeps his own. To dear Ortigia she conducts my way. And here I first review the welcome day. Here Arethusa stopped, then Ceres takes. Her golden car, and yokes her fiery snakes. With a rein, along mid-heaven she flies. O'er earth and seas, and cuts the yielding skies. She hauls at Athens, dropping like a star. And to Triptolemus resigns her car. Parent of seed, she gave him fruitful grain. And bade him teach to till and plow the plain. The seed to sow, as well in fallow fields. As where the soil manured a richer harvest yields. Transformation of Lyncus. Triptolemus, whom Ceres commissions to teach mankind husbandry, arrives at the court of Lyncus, king of Scythia. Who determines to assassinate his guest during sleep, the fatal weapon is already raised, when the monarch is suddenly changed into a lynx. The youth o'er Europe and o'er Asia drives. Till at the court of Lyncus he arrives. The tyrant Scythia's Barbaros empire swayed. And when he saw Triptolemus, he said. How camest thou, stranger, to our court, and why? Thy country, and thy name? The youth did thus reply. Triptolemus my name. My country's known. O'er all the world, Minerva's favorite town. Athens, the first of cities in renown. By land I neither walked, nor sailed by sea. But hither through the ether made my way. By me the goddess who the fields befriends. These gifts, the greatest of all blessings, sends. The grain she gives if in your soil you sow. Thence wholesome food in golden crops shall grow. Soon as the secret to the king was known. He grudged the glory of the service done. And wickedly resolved to make it all his own. To hide his purpose, he invites his guest. The friend of Ceres, to a royal feast. And when sweet sleep his heavy eaves had seized. The tyrant with his steel attempts his breast. Him straight a lynx's shape the goddess gives. And home the youth her sacred dragons drives. The pyrides transform to magpies. The muses are unanimously pronounced victorious, and the daughters of Pyrrhus are punished for their presumption by their transformation into magpies. The chosen muse here ends her sacred lays. The nymphs, unanimous, decree the bays. And give the Heliconian goddesses the praise. Then, far from vain that we should thus prevail. But much provoked to hear the vanquished rail. Calliope resumes, too long we've borne. Your daring taunts, and your affronting scorn. Your challenge justly merited a curse. And this unmannered railing makes it worse. Since you refuse us calmly to enjoy. Our patience, next our passions will employ. The dictates of a mind enraged pursue. And what our just resentment bids us, do. The railers laugh, our threats and wrath despise. And clap their hands, and make a scolding noise. But in the fact they're seized, beneath their nails. Feathers they feel. 
and on their faces scales. Their horny beaks at once each other scare. Their arms are plumed, and on their backs they bear. Pied wings, and flutter in the fleeting air. Chattering, the scandal of the woods they fly. And there continue still their clamrouse cry. The same their eloquence as maids or birds. Now only noise, and nothing then but words. Book. Chapter 6. Transformation of Arachne into a Spider. Arachne presumes to challenge Minerva to a trial of skill in needlework, being defeated, she hangs herself in despair. And is changed into a spider by the goddess. Pallas, attending to the muse's song. Approve the just resentment of their wrong. And thus reflects, while tamely I commend. Those who their injured deities defend. My own divinity affronted stands. And calls aloud for justice at my hands. Then takes the hint, ashamed to lag behind. And on Arachne bends her vengeful mind. One at the loom so excellently skilled. That to the goddess she refused to yield. Low was her birth, and small her native town. She from her art alone obtained renown. Idman, her father, made it his employ. To give the spongy fleece a purple dye. A vulgar strain her, mother, lately dead. With her own rank had been content to wed. Yet she their daughter, though her time was spent. In a small hamlet, and of mean descent. Through the great towns of Lydia gained a name. And filled the neighboring countries with her fame. Oft, to admire the niceness of her skill. The nymphs would quit their fountain, shade, or hill. Thither, from green Timulus, they repair. And leave the vineyards, their peculiar care. Thither, from famed Partilus' golden stream. Drawn by her art. The curious naiads came. Nor would the work, when finished, please so much. As, while she wrought, to view each graceful touch. Whether the shapeless woolen balls she wound. Or with quick motion turned the spindle round. Or with her pencil drew the neat design. Pallas, her mistress, shone in every line. This the proud maid, with scornful air, denies. And Evan the goddess at her work defies. Disowns her heavenly mistress every hour. Nor asks her aid, nor deprecates her power. Let us, she cries, but to a trial come. And, if she conquers, let her fix my doom. The goddess then a beldam's form put on. With silver hairs her hoary temples shone. Propped high a staff, she hobbles in her walk. And, tottering, thus begins her old wives' talk. Young maid attend, nor stubbornly despise. The admonitions of the old and wise. For age, though scorned, a ripe experience bears. That golden fruit, unknown to blooming years. Still may remotest fame your labors crown. And mortals your superior genius own. But to the goddess yield, and, humbly meek. A pardon for your bold presumption seek. The goddess will forgive. At this the maid. With passion fired, her gliding shuttle stayed. And, darting vengeance, with an angry look. To Pallas in disguise thus fiercely spoke. Thou doting thing. Whose idle, babbling tongue. But too well shows the plague of living long. Hence, and reprove, with this your sage advice. Your giddy daughter. Or your awkward niece. No I despise your counsel, and instill. A woman, ever wedded to my will. And, if your skillful goddess better knows. Let her accept the trial I propose. She does, impatient Pallas straight replies. And, clothed with heavenly light, sprung from her odd disguise. The nymphs and virgins of the plain adore. The awful goddess, and confess her power. The maid alone stood unappalled, yet showed. A transient blush, that for a moment glowed. Then disappeared, as purple streaks adorn the opening beauties of the rosy morn. Till Phoebus, rising prevalently bright, 
allays the tincture with his silver light. Yet she persists, and, obstinately great. In hopes of conquest, hurries on her fate. The goddess now the challenge waves no more. Nor, kindly good, advises as before. Straight to their posts appointed both repair. And fix their threaded looms with equal care. Around the solid beam the web is tied. While hollow canes the parting warp divide. Through which, with nimble flight, the shuttles play. And for the wolf prepare a ready way. The wolf and warp unite, pressed by the toothy sleigh. Thus both, their mantles buttoned to their breast. Their skillful fingers play with willing haste. And work with pleasure. While they cheer the eye. With glowing purple of the Tyrian dye. Or, justly intermixing shades with light. Their colorings insensibly unite. As when a shower, transpierced with sunny rays. Its mighty arch along the heaven displays. From whence a thousand different colors rise. Whose fine transition cheats the clearest eyes. So like the intermingled shading seems. And only differs in the last extremes. Then threads of gold both artfully dispose. And, as each part in just proportion rose, some antique fable in their work disclose. Palace in figures wrought the heavenly powers. And Mars's hill among the Athenian towers. On lofty thrones twice six celestial sate. Jove in the midst, and held their warm debate. The subject weighty, and well known to fame from whom the city should receive its name. Each god by proper features was expressed. Jove, with majestic mien, excelled the rest. His three-forked mace the dewy sea-god shook. And, looking sternly, smote the ragged rock. When from the stone leaped forth a sprightly steed. And Neptune claims the city for the deed. Herself she blazons, with a glittering spear. And crested helm, that veiled her braided hair. With shields, and scaly breastplate, implements of war. Struck with her pointed lance, the teeming earth. Seemed to produce a new surprising birth. When, from the glebe, the pledge of conquest sprung. A tree pale green. With fairest olives hung. And then, to let her giddy rival learn. What just reward such boldness was to earn. For trials at each corner had their part. Designed in miniature, and touched with art. Hemus in one, and Rodope of Thrace. Transformed to mountains, filled the foremost place. Who claimed the titles of the gods above. And vainly used the epithets of Jove. Another showed where the Pygmean dame. Profaning Juno's venerable name. Turned to an airy crane, descends from far and with her pygmy subjects wages war. In a third part, the rage of heaven's great queen, displayed on proud Antigone, was seen, who, with presumptuous boldness, dared to vie for beauty with the empress of the sky. Ah! What avails her ancient princely race? Her sire a king, and Troy her native place. Now, to a noisy stork transformed, she flies and with her whitened pinions cleaves the skies. And in the last remaining part was drawn. Poor Cinerus, that seemed to weep in stone. Clasping the temple steps, and he sadly mourned. His lovely daughters, now to marble turned. With her own tree the finished piece is crowned. And wreaths of peaceful olive all the works around. Arachne drew the famed intrigues of Jove. Changed to a bull, to gratify his love. How through the briny tide, all foaming hoar. Lovely Europa on his back he bore. The sea seemed waving, and the trembling maid. Shrunk up her tender feet, as if afraid. And, looking back on the forsaken strand. To her companions wafts her distant hand. Next she designed Asteria's fabled rape. When Jove assumed a soaring eagle's shape and showed how Leda lay supinely pressed, while the soft snowy swan sat hovering o'er her breast. 
how in a satyr's form the god beguiled. When fair Antiope with twins he filled. Then, like Amphitryon, but a real Jove. In fair Alcmena's arms he cooled his love. In fluid gold to Danae's heart he came. Aegina felt him in a lambent flame. He took Mnemosyne in shepherd's make. And for Dioys was a speckled snake. She made thee, Neptune, like a wanton steer. Pacing the meads for love of Arn dear. Next, like a stream, thy burning flame to slake. And like a ram, for fair by Salta's sake. Then Ceres in a steed your vigor tried. Nor could the mare the yellow goddess hide. Next, to a fowl transformed, you won by force. The snake-haired mother of the winged horse. And, in a dolphin's fishy form, subdued. Milantho sweet, beneath the oozy flood. All these the maid with lively features drew. And opened proper landscapes to the view. Their Phobos, roving like a country swain. Attunes his jolly pipe along the plain. For lovely Isso's sake, in Stefford's weeds. O'er pastures green his bleeding flock he feeds. Their Bacchus, imaged like the clustering grape. Melting, bedrops Irigany's fair lap. And their old Saturn, stung with youthful heat. Formed like a stallion, rushes to the feet. Fresh flowers, which twists of ivy intertwine. Mingling a running foliage, close the neat design. This the bright goddess, passionately moved. With envy saw, yet inwardly approved. The scene of heavenly guilt with haste she tore. Nor longer the affront with patience bore. A box and shuttle in her hand she took. And more than once Arachne's forehead struck. The unhappy maid, impatient of the wrong. Down from a beam her injured person hung. When Pallas, pitying her wretched state, at once prevented and pronounced her fate. Live. But depend, vile wretch, the goddess cried. Doomed in suspense for ever to be tied. That all your race, to utmost date of time. May feel the vengeance, and detest the crime. Then, going off, she sprinkled her with juice. Which leaves of baneful aconite produced. Touched with the poisonous drug, her flowing hair fell to the ground, and left her temples bare. Her usual features vanished from their place. Her body lessened all, but most her face. Her slender fingers, hanging on each side. With many joints, the use of legs supplied. A spider's bag the rest, from which she gives. A thread, and still by constant weaving lives. Story of Niobe Niobe, the daughter of Tantalus, is united in marriage to Amphion, by whom she has seven sons and as many daughters, she has the imprudence to exalt herself above Latona. Who entreats her children to punish the arrogant Niobe, her prayers are heard, and all the sons expire by the shafts of, while the daughters are in like manner destroyed by Diana, Amphion. In despair, puts a period to his existence. Swift through the Phrygian towns the rumor flies and the strange news each female tongue employs. Niobe, who, before she married, knew. The famous nymph, now found the story true. Yet, unreclaimed by poor Arachne's fate. Vainly above the gods assumed a state. Her husband's fame, their family's descent. Their power, and rich dominion's wide extent. Might well have justified a decent pride but not on these alone the dame relied. Her lovely progeny, that far excelled. The mother's heart with vain ambition swelled. The happiest mother not unjustly styled. Had no conceited thoughts her touring fancy filled. For once a prophetess, with zeal inspired. Their slow neglect to warm devotion fired. Through every street of Thebes who ran possessed. And thus, in accents wild, her charge expressed. Haste, haste, ye Theban matrons, and adore. With hallowed rites. Latona's mighty power. And to the heavenly twins that from her spring. With laurel crowned, your smoking incense bring. 
straight the great summons every day obeyed. And due submission to the goddess paid. Graceful, with laurel chaplets dressed, they came. And offered incense in the sacred flame. Meanwhile, surrounded with a courtly guard. The royal Niobe in state appeared. Attired in robes embroidered o'er with gold. And mad with rage, yet lovely to behold. Her comely tresses, trembling as she stood. Down her fine neck with easy motion flowed. Then, darting round a proud, disdainful look. In haughty tone her hasty passion broke. And thus began, what madness this, to court. A goddess, founded merely on report. Dare ye a poor pretended power invoke. While yet no altars to my godhead smoke. Mine, whose immediate lineage stands confessed. From Tantalus, the only mortal guest. That e'er the gods admitted to their feast. A sister of the Pleiades gave me birth. And Atlas, mightiest mountain upon earth. Who bears the globe of all the stars above. My grandsire was, and Atlas sprung from Jove. The Theban towns my majesty adore. And neighboring Phrygia trembles at my power. Raised by my husband's lute, with turrets crowned. Our lofty city stands secured around. Within my court, where'er I turn my eyes. Unbounded treasures to my prospect rise. With these, my face I modestly may name. As not unworthy of so high a claim. Seven are my daughters, of a form divine. With seven fair sons, an indefective line. Go, fools! Consider this, and ask the cause. From which my pride its strong presumption draws. Consider this, and then prefer to me. Caius the Titan's vagrant progeny. To whom, in travail, the whole spacious earth. No room afforded for her spurious birth. Not the least part in earth, in heaven, or seas. Would grant your outlawed goddess any ease. Till, pitying hers, from his own wandering case. Delos, the floating island, gave a place. There she a mother was of two at most. Only the seventh part of what I boast. My joys all are beyond suspicion fixed. With no pollutions of misfortune mixed. Safe on the basis of my power I stand. Above the reach of fortune's fickle hand. Lessen she may my inexhausted store. And much destroy, yet still must leave me more. Suppose it possible that some may die. Of this my numerous, lovely progeny. Still with Latona I might safely vie. Who, by her scanty breed, scarce fit to name. But just escapes the childless woman's shame. Go then, with speed your laurelled heads uncrown. And leave the silly farce you have begun. The Timraus throng their sacred rites forbore. And from their heads the verdant laurel tore. Their haughty queen they with regret obeyed. And still in gentle murmurs softly prayed. High on the top of Synthus' shady mount. With grief the goddess saw the base affront. And, the abuse revolving in her breast. The mother her twin offspring thus addressed. Lo I, my children, who with comfort knew. Your godlike birth, and thence my glory drew. And thence have claimed precedency of place. From all but Juno of the heavenly race. Must now despair, and languish in disgrace. My Godhead questioned, and all rights divine. Unless you succor, banished from my shrine. Nay, more. The imp of Tantalus has flung. Reflections with her vile paternal tongue. Has dared prefer her mortal breed to mine. And called me childless, which, just fate, may she repine. When to urge more the goddess was prepared. Phoebus in haste replies, too much we've heard. And every moment's lost while vengeance is deferred. Diana spoke the same. Then both in shroud. Their heavenly bodies in a sable cloud. And to the Theban towers descending light. Through the soft yielding air direct their flight. Without the wall there lies a champagne ground. 
with even surface, far extending round. Beaten and leveled, while it daily feels. The trampling horse, and chariot's grinding wheels. Part of proud Niobe's young rival breed. Practicing there to ride the managed steed. Their bridles bossed with gold, were mounted high. On stately furniture of Tyrian dye. Of these, is Minos, who by birth had been. The first fair issue of the fruitful queen. Just as he drew the rein, to guide his horse. Around the compass of the circling course. Sight deeply, and the pangs of smart expressed. While the shaft stuck, injured within his breast. And, the reins dropping from his dying hand. He sunk quite down, and tumbled on the sand. Sipolis next the rattling quiver heard. And with full speed for his escape prepared. As when the pilot from the blackening skies. A gathering storm of wintry rain descries. His sails unfurled, and crowded all with wind. He strives to leave the threatening cloud behind. So fled the youth. But an unerring dart. Ertuk him, quick discharged, and sped with art. Fixed in his neck behind it trembling stood. And at his throat displayed the point besmeared with blood. Prone as his posture was, he tumbled o'er and bathed his courser's mane with steaming gore. Next at young Phetimus they took their aim. And Tantalus, who bore his grandsire's name. These, when their other exercise was done. To try the wrestler's oily sport begun. And, straining every nerve, their skill expressed. In closest grapple, joining breast to breast. When from the bending bow an arrow sent. Joined as they were, through both their bodies went. Both groaned, and writhing both their limbs with pain. They fell together, bleeding on the plain. Then both their languid eyeballs faintly roll. And thus together breathe away their soul. With grief Alphener saw their doleful plight. And smote his breast, and sickened at the sight. Then to their succor ran, with eager haste. And, fondly grieved, their stiffening limbs embraced. But in the action falls, a thrilling dart. By Phoebus guided, pierced him to the heart. This, as they drew forth, his midriff tore. Its barbed point the fleshy fragments bore. And let the soul gush out in streams of purple gore. But Damasichthon, by a double wound. Beardless and young, lay gasping on the ground. Fixed in his sinewy ham, the steely point. Stuck through his knee, and pierced the nervous joint. And as he stooped to tug the painful dart, another stuck him in a vital part. Shot through his windpipe, by the wing it hung. The lifeblood forced it out, and darting upward sprung. Ilionius, the last, with terror stands. Lifting in prayer his unavailing hands. And ignorant from whom his griefs arise. Spare me, O all ye heavenly powers, he cries. Phoebus was touched too late, the sounding bow. Had sent the shaft, and struck the fatal blow. Which yet but gently gored his tender side. So by a slight and easy wound he died. Swift to the mother's ears the rumor came. And doleful sighs the heavy news proclaim. With anger and surprise inflamed by turns. In furious rage her haughty stomach burns. First she disputes the effects of heavenly power. Then at their daring boldness wonders more. For poor Amphion, with sore grief distressed. Hoping to soothe his cares by endless rest. Had sheathed a dagger in his wretched breast. And she who tossed her high disdainful head. When through the streets, in solemn pomp, she led. The throng that from Latona's altar fled. Assuming state beyond the proudest queen. Was now the miserablest object seen. Prostrate among the clay-cold dead she fell. And kissed an undistinguished, last farewell. Then, her pale arms advancing to the skies. Cruel Latona. Triumph now, she cries. My grieving soul in bitter anguish drench and with my woes your thirsty passion quench. 
feast your black malice at a price thus dear. While the sore pangs of seven such deaths I bear. Triumph, too cruel rival, and display. Your conquering standard, for you've won the day. Yet I'll excel, for yet, though seven are slain. Superior still in number I remain. Scarce had she spoke, the bowstring's twanging sound. Was heard, and dealt fresh terrors all around. Which all, but Niobe alone, confound. Stunned and obdurate by her load of grief. Insensible she sits, nor hopes relief. Before the funeral beers, all weeping sad. Her daughters stood, in vests of sable clad. When one surprised, and stung with sudden smart. In vain attempts to draw the sticking dart. But to grim death her blooming youth resigns. And o'er her brother's corpse her dying head reclines. This, to assuage her mother's anguish tries. And, silenced in the pious action, dies. Shot by a secret arrow, winged with death. Her faltering lips but only gasped for breath. One, on her dying sister, breathes her last. Vainly in flight another's hopes are placed. This, hiding from her fate, a shelter seeks. That trembling stands, and fills the air with shrieks. And all in vain, for now all six had found. Their way to death, each by a different wound. The last, with eager care, the mother veiled. Behind her spreading mantle close concealed. And with her body guarded, as a shield. Only for this, this youngest, I implore. Grant me this one request, I ask no more. Oh grant me this, she passionately cries. But, while she speaks, the destined virgin dies. Transformation of Niobe Niobe, struck with horror at the magnitude of her calamities is changed into a stone. Widowed, and childless, lamentable state. A doleful sight, among the dead she sate. Hardened with woes, a statue of despair. To every breath of wind unmoved her hair. Her cheek still reddening, but its color dead. Faded her eyes, and set within her head. No more her pliant tongue its motion keeps. But stands congealed within her frozen lips. Stagnate and dull, within her purple veins. Its current stopped, the lifeless blood remains. Her feet their usual offices refuse. Her arms and neck their graceful gestures lose. Action and life from every part are gone. And even her entrails turn to solid stone. Yet still she weeps, and whirled by stormy winds. Born through the air, her native country finds. There, fixed, she stands upon a bleaky hill. There yet her marble cheeks eternal tears distill. Peasants of Lycia transform to frogs. The goddess Latona, while concealing herself from the rage of Juno, arrives in Lycia, where she is insulted and ridiculed high peasants. Of whom she begs a draught of water, while they are weeding a marsh, their refusal and insolence provoke her, and she implores Jupiter to punish their barbarity, the god consents. And transforms them into frogs. Then all, reclaimed by this example, showed. A due regard for each peculiar god. Both men and women their devoirs expressed. And great Latona's awful power confessed. Then, tracing instances of older time. To suit the nature of the present crime. Thus one begins his tale, where Lycia yields. A golden harvest from its fertile fields. Some churlish peasants, in the days of yore. Provoked the goddess to exert her power. The thing, indeed, the meanness of the place has made obscure, surprising as it was. But I myself once happened to behold this famous lake, of which the story's told. My father, then, worn out by length of days, nor able to sustain the tedious ways, me with a guide had sent the plains to roam, and drive his well-fed straggling heifers home. Here, as we sauntered through the verdant meads, we spied a lake o'ergrown with trembling reeds, whose wavy tops an opening seen disclose. 
from which an antique smoky altar rose. I, as my superstitious guide had done, stopped short, and blessed myself, and then went on. Yet I inquired to whom the altar stood. Faunus, the Naiads, or some native god? No sylvan deity, my friend replies. Enshrined within this hallowed altar lies. For this, O youth, to that famed goddess stands. Whom, at the imperial Juno's rough commands. Of every quarter of the earth bereaved. Delos, the floating isle, at length received. Who there, in spite of enemies, brought forth. Beneath an olive shade, her great twin birth. Hence too she fled the furious stepdame's power. And in her arms a double godhead bore. And now the borders of fair Lycia gained. Just when the summer solstice parched the land. With thirst the goddess languishing, no more. Her emptied breast would yield its milky store. When, from below, the smiling valley showed. A silver lake that in its bottom flowed. A sort of clowns were reaping, near the bank. The bending osier, and the bulrush dank. The cress, and water lily. Fragrant weed. Whose juicy stalk the liquid fountains feed. The goddess came, and kneeling on the brink. Stooped at the fresh repast, prepared to drink. Then thus, being hindered by the rabble race. In accents mild, expostulates the case. Water I only ask, and sure, tis hard. From nature's common rights to be debarred. This. As the genial sun, and vital air. Should flow alike to every creature's share. Yet still I ask, and as a favor crave. That which a public bounty nature gave. Nor do I seek my weary limbs to drench. Only, with one cool draught, my thirst I'd quench. Now from my throat the usual moisture dries. And even my voice in broken accents dies. One draught as dear as life I should esteem. And water, now I thirst, would nectar seem. Oh! Let my little babes your pity move. And melt your hearts to charitable love. They, as by chance they did, extend to you. Their little hands, and my request pursue. Whom would these soft persuasions not subdue? Though the most rustic and unmannered crew? Yet they the goddess's request refuse. And with rude words reproachfully abuse. Nay, more, with spiteful feet the villains trode. O'er the soft bottom of the marshy flood. And blackened all the lake with clouds of rising mud. Her thirst, by indignation, was suppressed. Bent on revenge, the goddess stood confessed. Her suppliant hands uplifting to the skies. For a redress to heaven she now applies. And may you live, she passionately cried. Doomed in that pool for ever to abide. The goddess has her wish, for now they choose. To plunge and dive among the watery ooze. Sometimes they show their head above the brim. And on the glassy surface spread to swim. Often upon the bank their station take. Then spring and leap into the coolie lake. Still, void of shame, they lead a clamrous life. And, croaking, still scold on in endless strife. Compelled to live beneath the liquid stream. Where still they quarrel, and attempt to scream. Now, from their bloated throat, their voice puts on. Imperfect murmurs in a hoarser tone. Their noisy jaws, with bawling now grown wide. An ugly sight. Extend on either side. Their motley back, streaked with a list of green. Joined to their head, without a neck, is seen. And, with a belly broad and white, they look. Mere frogs, and still frequent the muddy brook. Fate of Marcius. Marcius, a celebrated player on the flute, is hanged and flayed alive by Apollo. As a punishment for his imprudence in challenging the god to a trial of skill, the death of the musician is universally lamented by the fauns, satyrs, and dryads. And from their abundant tears arises a river of Phrygia, well known by the name of Marcius. 
scarce had the mar. This famous story told. Of vengeance on the Lycians shown of old. When, straight, another pictures to their view. The satyr's fate, whom angry Phoebus slew. Who, raised with high conceit, and puffed with pride. At his own pipe the skillful god defied. Why do you tear me from myself, he cries. Ah! Cruel, must my skin be made the prize? This for a silly pipe, he roaring said. Meanwhile the skin from off his limbs was flayed. All bare, and raw, one large continued wound. With streams of blood his body bathed the ground. The bluish veins their trembling pulse disclosed. The stringy nerves lay naked and exposed. His entrails too distinctly each expressed. With every shining fiber of his breast. The fawns and sylvans, with the nymphs that rove. Among the satyrs in the shady grove. Olympus, known of old, and every swain. That fed, or flock, or herd, upon the plain. Bewailed the loss, and with their tears, that flowed. A kindly moisture on the earth bestowed. That soon, conjoined and in a body ranged. Sprung from the ground. To limpid water changed. Which, down through Phrygia's rocks, a mighty stream. Comes tumbling to the sea, and Marcia is its name. Story of Pelops. Pelops, the son of Tantalus, is murdered by his father, and served up in an entertainment to the gods. To make trial of their divinity, Jupiter discovers the perfidious cruelty, and restores Pelops to life, part of the shoulder, which Ceres incautiously devoured. Is supplied by a substitute made of ivory. From these relations straight the people turn. To present truths, and lost Amphion mourn. The mother most was blamed, yet some relate. That Pelops pitted and bewailed her fate. And stripped his clothes, and laid his shoulder bare. And made the ivory miracle appear. This shoulder, from the first, was formed of flesh. As lively as the other, and as fresh. But, when the youth was by his father slain. The gods restored his mangled limbs again. Only that place which joins the neck and arm. The rest untouched, was found to suffer harm. The loss of which an ivory piece sustained. And thus the youth his limbs and life regained. Story of Tyrus, Procne, and Philomela. Procne, the wife of Tyrus, king of Thrace, revenges the injuries which her sister Philomela has sustained from her husband on her son Ides. Whom she sacrifices to her resentment, and serves as a dish at the table of his father, who partakes of the horrible repast without suspicion. Till Philomela appears with the head of the unfortunate youth, the monarch draws his sword, and pursues the two sisters, when he is transformed into a lapwing, Philomela into a nightingale. Procne into a swallow, and Ides into a pheasant. To Thebes the neighboring princes all repair. And with condolence the misfortune share. Each bordering state in solemn form addressed. And each, betimes, a friendly grief expressed. Argos, with Sparta's and Mycenae's towns. And Caledon, yet free from fierce Diana's frowns. Corinth for finest brass well famed of old. Orchomenos for men of courage bold. Cleone lying in the lowly dale. And rich Messini with its fertile vale. Pylos for Nestor's city after famed. And treason, not as yet from Pythius named. And those fair cities, which are hemmed around. By double seas within the Isthmian ground. And those which farther from the sea coast stand. Lodged in the bosom of the spacious land. Who can believe it? Athens was the last. Though for politeness famed for ages past. For a straight siege, which then their walls enclosed. Such acts of kind humanity opposed. And thick with ships. From foreign nations bound. Seaward their city lay invested round. These, with auxiliar forces led from far. Tyrus of Thrace, brave, and inured to war. Had quite defeated, and obtained a name. The warriors do, 
among the sons of fame. This, with his wealth, and power, an ancient line. From Mars derived, Pandion's thoughts incline. His daughter Procne with the prince to join. Nor Hymen, nor the Graces, here preside. Nor Juno, to befriend the blooming bride. But fiends with funeral brands the process led. And furies waited at the genial bed. And, all night long, the screeching owl aloof. With baleful notes, sat brooding o'er the roof. With such ill omens was the match begun. That made them parents of a hopeful son. Now Thrace congratulates their seeming joy. And they, in thankful rites, their minds employ. If the fair queen's espousals pleased before. Itis, the newborn prince, now pleases more. And each bright day the birth and bridal feast were kept with hallowed pomp above the rest. So far true happiness may lie concealed. When, by false lights, we fancy, tis revealed. Now, since their nuptials, had the golden sun. Five courses round his ample zodiac run. When gentle Procne thus her lord addressed. And spoke the secret wishes of her breast. If I, she said, have ever favor found. Let my petition with success be crowned. Let me at Athens my dear sister see. Or, let her come to Thrace and visit me. And, lest my father should her absence mourn. Promise that she shall make a quick return. With thanks I'd own the obligation due. Only, O Tyrus, to the gods and you. Now, plied with oar and sail at his command. The nimble galleys reached the Athenian land and anchored in the famed Pyrian Bay. While Tyros to the palace takes his way. The king salutes, and, ceremonies past. Begins the fatal embassy at last. The occasion of his voyage he declares. And, with his own, his wife's request prefers. Asks leave that, only for a little space. Their lovely sister might embark for Thrace. Thus, while he spoke, appeared the royal maid. Bright Philomela, splendidly arrayed. But most attractive in her charming face. And comely person, turned with every grace. Like those fair nymphs that are described to rove. Across the glades and openings of the grove. Only that these are dressed for sylvan sports. And less become the finery of courts. Tyrus beheld the virgin, and admired and with the coals of burning love was fired. Like crackling stubble, or the summer hay. When forked lightnings o'er the meadows play. Such charms in any breast might kindle love. But him the heats of inbred passion move. To which, though Thrace is naturally prone. Yet his is still superior, and his own. Straight her attendants he designs to buy. And with large bribes her governess would try. Herself with ample gifts resolves to bend. And his whole kingdom in the attempt expend. Or, snatched away, by force of arms to bear. And justify the act with open war. The boundless passion boils within his breast. And his projecting soul admits no rest. And now, impatient of the least delay. By pleading Procne's cause, he speeds his way. The eloquence of love his tongue inspires. And, in his wife's, he speaks his own desires. Hence all his importunities arise. And tears unmanly trickle from his eyes. Ye gods! What thick involving darkness blinds! The stupid faculties of mortal minds! Tyrus the credit of good nature gains. From these his crimes, so well the villain feigns. And, unsuspecting of his base designs. In the request fair Philomela joins. Her snowy arms her aged sire embrace. And clasp his neck with an endearing grace. Only to see her sister she entreats. A seeming blessing, which a curse completes. Tira surveys her with a luscious eye. And in his mind forestalls the blissful joy. Her circling arms a scene of love inspire and every kiss foments the raging fire. 
fondly he wishes for the father's place. To feel, and to return, the warm embrace. Since not the nearest ties of filial blood. Would damp his flame, and force him to be good. At length, for both their sakes, the king agrees. And Philomela, on her bended knees. Thanks him for what her fancy calls success. When cruel fate intends her nothing less. Now Phoebus, hastening to ambrosial rest. His fiery steeds drove sloping down the west. The sculptured gold with sparkling wines was filled. And, with rich meats, each cheerful table smiled. Plenty and mirth the royal banquet close. Then all retire to sleep and sweet repose. But the amorous monarch, though withdrawn apart, still feels love's poison rankling in his heart. Her face divine is stamped within his breast. Fancy imagines. And improves the rest. And thus, kept waking by intense desire. He nourishes his own prevailing fire. Next day the good old king for Tiro sends. And to his charge the virgin recommends. His hand with tears the indulgent father pressed. Then spoke. And thus with tenderness addressed. Since the kind instances of pious love. Do all pretense of obstacle remove. Since Procnes, and her own, with your request. O Aurol, the fears of a paternal breast. With you, dear son, my daughter I entrust. And, by the gods, adjure you to be just. By truth, and every consanguineal tie. To watch and guard her with a father's eye. And, since the least delay will tedious prove. In keeping from my sight the child I love. With speed return her, kindly to assuage. The tedious troubles of my lingering age. And you, my Philomel, let it suffice. To know your sisters banished from my eyes. If any sense of duty sways your mind. Let me from you the shortest absence find. He wept. Then kissed his child, and while he speaks. The tears fall gently down his aged cheeks. Next, as a pledge of fealty, he demands. And, with a solemn charge, conjoins their hands. Then to his daughter and his grandson sends. And by their mouth a blessing recommends. While, in a voice with dire forebodings broke. Sobbing and faint, the last farewell was spoke. Now Philomela, scarce received on board. And in the royal gilded bark secured. Beheld the dashes of the bending oar. The ruffled sea, and the receding shore. When straight, his joy impatient of disguise. We've gained our point, the rough barbarian cries. Now I possess the dear, the blissful hour. And every wish subjected to my power. As when the bold rapacious bird of Jove. With crooked talons, stooping from above. Has snatched, and carried to his lofty nest. A captive hare, with cruel gripes oppressed. Secure. With fixed and unrelenting eyes. He sits, and views the helpless, trembling prize. Their vessels now had made the intended land. And all with joy descend upon the strand. When the false tyrant seized the princely maid. And to a lodge in distant woods conveyed. Pale, sinking, and distressed with jealous fears. And, asking for her sister, all in tears. The monster, on his purpose fully bent. No longer now delayed his base intent. Her piercing accents to her sire complain. And to her absent sister, but in vain. In vain she importunes, with doleful cries. Each unattentive godhead of the skies. She pants and trembles like the bleeding prey. From some close hunted wolf just snatched away. That still with fearful horror looks around. And on its flank regards the bleeding wound. Or, as the Timrouse dove, the danger o'er. Beholds her shining plumes besmeared with gore. And though delivered from the falcon's claw. Yet shivers, and retains a secret awe. But when her mind a calm reflection shared. And all her scattered spirits were repaired. 
torn and disordered while her tresses hung. Her livid hands, like one that mourned. She wrung. Then thus, with grief o'erwhelmed her languid eyes. Savage, inhuman, cruel wretch. She cries. Whom nor a parent's strict commands could move. Though charged and uttered with the tears of love. Nor virgin innocence. Nor all that's due. To the strong contract of the nuptial vow. Virtue, by this, in wild confusions laid. And I compelled to wrong my sister's bed. While you, regardless of your marriage oath. With stains of incest have defiled us both. Though I deserved some punishment to find. This was, ye gods. Too cruel and unkind. Yet, villain, to complete your horrid guilt. Stab here, and let my tainted blood be spilt. Oh! Happy, had it come before I knew. The cursed embrace of vile perfidious you. Then, my pale ghost, pure from incestuous love. Had wandered spotless through the Elysian grove. But, if the gods above have power to know. And judge those actions that are done below. Unless the dreaded thunders of the sky. Like me, subdued, and violated lie. Still my revenge shall take its proper time. And suit the baseness of your hellish crime. Myself abandoned, and devoid of shame. Through the wide world your actions will proclaim. Or, though I'm prisoned in this lonely den. Obscured and buried from the sight of men. My mournful voice the pitying rocks shall move. And my complainings echo through the grove. Hear me, O heaven. And, if a god be there. Let him regard me, and accept my prayer. Struck with these words, the tyrant's guilty breast. With fear and anger was by turns possessed. Now, with remorse his conscience deeply stung. He drew the falchion that beside him hung. And first her tender arms behind her bound. Then dragged her by the hair along the ground. The princess willingly her throat reclined. And viewed the steel with a contented mind. But soon her tongue the girding pincers strain. With anguish, soon she feels the piercing pain. O oh, father, father! She would fain have spoke. But the sharp torture her intention broke. In vain she tries, for now the blade has cut. Her tongue shear off, close to the trembling root. The mangled part still quivered on the ground. Murmuring with a faint, imperfect sound. And, as a serpent writhes his wounded train. Uneasy, panting, and possessed with pain. The peace, while life remained, still trembled fast. And to its mistress pointed to the last. The monarch ventures to his procne's sight. Loaded with guilt, and cloyed with long delight. There, with feigned grief, and false dissembled sighs. Begins a formal narrative of lies. Her sister's death he artfully declares. Then weeps, and raises credit from his tears. Her vest with flowers of gold embroidered o'er. With grief distressed, the mournful matron tore. And a beseeming suit of gloomy sable wore. With cost, an honorary tomb she raised. And thus the imaginary ghost appeased. Deluded queen. The fate of her you love. Nor grief, nor pity, but revenge, should move. Through the twelve signs had passed the circling sun. And round the compass of the zodiac run. What must unhappy Philomela do? Forever subject to her keeper's view? Huge walls of massy stone the lodge surround. From her own mouth no way of speaking's found. But all our wants by wit may be supplied. And art makes up what fortune has denied. With skill exact a Phrygian web she strung. Fixed to a loom that in her chamber hung. Where inwrought letters, upon white displayed. In purple notes, her wretched case betrayed. The piece, when finished, secretly she gave. Into the charge of one poor menial slave. And then, with gestures, made him understand. It must be safe conveyed to Procne's hand. 
The slave, with speed, the queen's apartment sought. And rendered up his charge, unknowing what he brought. But when the ciphers, figured in each fold. Her sister's melancholy story told. Strange that she could. With silence she surveyed. The tragic piece, and without weeping read. In such tumultuous haste her passion sprung. They choked her voice, and quite disarmed her tongue. No room for female tears, the furies rise. Darting vindictive glances from her eyes. And, stung with rage, she bounds from place to place. While stern revenge sits lowering in her face. Now the triennial celebration came. Observed to Bacchus by each Thracian dame. When, in the privacies of night retired. They act his rites, with sacred rapture fired. By night, the tinkling cymbals ring around. While the shrill notes from Rodope resound. By night, the queen, disguised, forsakes the court. To mingle in the festival resort. Leaves of the curling vine her temple's shade. And, with a circling wreath, adorn her head. Adown her back the stag's rough spoils appear. Light on her shoulder leans a cornel spear. Thus, in the fury of the god concealed. Procne her own mad headstrong passion veiled. Now, with her gang, to the thick wood she flies. And with religious yellings fills the skies. The fatal lodge, as, twere by chance, she seeks. And through the bolted doors an entrance breaks. From thence, her sister snatching by the hand. Masked like the ranting Bacchanalian band. Within the limits of the court she drew. Shading, with ivy green, her outward hue. But Philomela, conscious of the place. Felt new reviving pangs of her disgrace. A shivering cold prevailed in every part. And the chilled blood ran trembling to her heart. Soon as the queen a fit retirement found. Stripped of the garlands that her temples crowned. She straight unveiled her blushing sister's face. And fondly clasped her with a close embrace. But, in confusion lost, the unhappy maid. With shame dejected, hung her drooping head. As guilty of a crime that stained her sister's bed. That speech, that should her injured virtue clear. And make her spotless innocence appear. Is now no more, only her hands and eyes. Appeal, in signals, to the conscious skies. In Procne's breast the rising passions boil. And burst in anger with a mad recoil. Her sister's ill-timed grief with scorn she blames. Then, in these furious words, her rage proclaims. Tears, unavailing, but defer our time. The stabbing sword must expiate the crime. Or worse, if wit, on bloody vengeance bent. A weapon more tormenting can invent. O oh, sister! I've prepared my stubborn heart. To act some hellish and unheard of part. Either the palace to surround with fire. And see the villain in the flames expire. Or, with a knife, dig out his cursed eyes. Or his false tongue with racking engine seize. Tortures enough my passion has designed. But the variety distracts my mind. A while thus wavering stood the furious dame. When Ides fondling to his mother came. From him the cruel, fatal hint she took. She viewed him with a stern, remorseless look. Ah! But too like thy wicked sire, she said. Forming the direful purpose in her head. At this a sullen grief her voice suppressed. While silent passion struggle in her breast. Now, at her lap arrived, the flat ring boy. Salutes his parent with a smiling joy. About her neck his little arms are thrown. And he accosts her in a prattling tone. Then her tempestuous anger was allayed. And in its full career her vengeance stayed. While tender thoughts, in spite of passion, rise. And melting tears disarm her threatening eyes. But, when she found the mother's easy heart. Too fondly swerving from the intended part. Her injured sister's face again she viewed. 
and, as by turns, surveying both she stood. While this fond boy, she said, can thus express the moving accents of his fond address. Why stands my sister of her tongue bereft? Forlorn and sad, in speechless silence left? O oh, Procne! See the fortune of your house. Such is your fate when matched to such a spouse. Conjugal duty, if observed to him, would change from virtue, and become a crime. For all respect to Tyrus must debase the noble blood of great Pandian's race. Straight, at these words, with big resentment filled. Furious her look, she flew and seized her child. Like a fell tigress of the savage kind. That drags the tender suckling of the hind. Through India's gloomy groves, where Ganges laves. The shady scene, and rolls his streamy waves. Now to a close apartment they were come. Far off retired within the spacious dome. When Procne, on revengeful mischief bent. Home to his heart a piercing poniard sent. Itis, with rueful cries, but all too late. Holds out his hands, and deprecates his fate. Still at his mother's neck he fondly aims. And strives to melt her with endearing names. Yet still the cruel mother perseveres nor with concern his bitter anguish hears. This might suffice, but Philomela too. Across his throat a shining cutlass drew. Then both, with knives, dissect each quivering part. And carve the butchered limbs with cruel art. Which, whelmed in boiling cauldrons o'er the fire. Or, turned on spits. In steamy smoke aspire. While the long entries, with their slippery floor run down in purple streams of clotted gore. Asked by his wife to this inhuman feast, Tyrus, unknowingly, is made a guest. While she, her plot the better to disguise, styles it some unknown mystic sacrifice. And such the nature of the hallowed rite. The wife her husband only could invite. The slaves must all withdraw, and be debarred the sight. Tyrus, upon a throne of antique state, loftily raised, before the banquet sate, and, glutton-like, luxuriously pleased, with his own flesh his hungry maw appeased. Nay, such a blindness o'er his senses falls, that he for Ides to the table calls, when Procne, now impatient to disclose, the joy that from her full revenge arose, cries out, in transports of a cruel mind. Within yourself your Ides you may find. Still at this puzzling answer, with surprise. Around the room he sends his curious eyes. And, as he still inquired, and called aloud. Fierce Philomela, all besmeared with blood. Her hands with murder stained, her spreading hair. Hanging disheveled. With a ghastly air. Stepped forth, and flung, full in the tyrant's face. The head of Ides, gory as it was. Nor ever longed so much to use her tongue. And with a just reproach to vindicate her wrong. The Thracian monarch from the table flings. While with his cries the vaulted parlor rings. His imprecations echo down to hell. And rouse the snaky furies from their Stygian cell. One while he labors to disgorge his breast and free his stomach from the cursed feast. Then, weeping o'er his lamentable doom, he styles himself his son's sepulchral tomb. Now, with drawn saber and impetuous speed, in close pursuit he drives Pandian's breed, whose nimble feet spring with so swift a force. Across the fields, they seem to wing their course. And now on real wings themselves they raise and steer their airy flight by different ways. One to the woodland's shady covert highs. Around the smoky roof the other flies. Whose feathers yet the marks of murder stain. Where, stamped upon her breast, the crimson spots remain. Tyrus, through grief, and haste to be revenged. Shares the like fate, and to a bird is changed. Fixed on his head the crested plumes appear. 
long as his beak, and sharpened like a spear. Thus armed, his looks his inward mind display. And, to a lapwing turned, he fans his way. Exceeding trouble for his children's fate. Shortened Pandian's days, and changed his date. Down to the shades below, with sorrow spent. An earlier, unexpected ghost he went. Boreas in love. Boreas is enamored of the beautiful Orithia, whom he carries off against her inclination, she afterward becomes the mother of Zeths and Calais. Who accompany the Argonautic expedition. Erechtheus next the Athenian scepter swayed. Whose rule the state with joint consent obeyed. So mixed his justice with his valor flowed. His reign one scene of princely goodness showed. For hopeful youths, as many females bright. Sprung from his loins, and soothed him with delight. Two of these sisters, of a lovelier air. Excelled the rest, though all the rest were fair. Procris to Cephalus in wedlock tied. Blessed the young Sylvan with a blooming bride. For Orithia Boreas suffered pain. For the coy maid sued long, but sued in vain. Tyrus, his neighbor, and his Thracian blood. Against the match a main objection stood. Which made his vows, and all his suppliant love. Empty as air, and ineffectual, prove. But when he found his soothing flatteries fail. Nor saw his soft addresses could avail. Blustering with ire, he quickly has recourse. To rougher arts, and his own native force. Tis well, he said, such usage is my due. When thus disguised by foreign ways I sue. When my stern airs and fierceness I disclaim. And sigh for love, ridiculously tame. When soft addresses foolishly I try. Nor my own stronger remedies apply. By force and violence I chiefly live. By them the lowering stormy tempests drive. In foaming billows raise the hoary deep. Writhe knotted oaks, and sandy desert sweep. Congeal the falling flakes of fleecy snow. And bruise with rattling hail the plain below. I and my brother winds, when joined above. Through the waste champagne of the skies we rove. With such a boisterous full career engage. That heaven's whole concave thunders at our rage. While, struck from nitrous clouds, fierce lightnings play. Dart through the storm, and gild the gloomy day. Or when, in subterraneous caverns pent. My breath against the hollow earth is bent. The quaking world above, and ghosts below. My mighty power, by dear experience, no. Tremble with fear, and dread the fatal blow. This is the only cure to be applied. Thus to Erechtheus I should be allied. And thus the scornful virgin should be wooed. Not by entreaty, but by force subdued. Boreas, in passion, spoke these huffing things. And, as he spoke, he shook his dreadful wings. At which, afar the shivering sea was fanned. And the wide surface of the distant land. His dusty mantle o'er the hills he drew. And swept the lowly valleys as he flew. Then, with his yellow wings, embraced the maid. And, wrapped in dusky clouds, far off conveyed. The sparkling blaze of love's prevailing fire. Shone brighter as he flew, and flamed the higher. And now the god, possessed of his delight. To northern Thrace pursued his airy flight. Two lovely twins, the effect of this embrace. Crown their soft labors, and their nuptials grace. Who, like their mother, beautiful and fair. Their father's strength. And feathered pinions, share. Yet these at first were wanting, as, tis said. And after, as they grew, their shoulders spread. Zeths and Calais, the pretty twins. Remained unfledged, while smooth their beardless chins. But when, in time, the budding silver down. Shaded their face. And on their cheeks was grown. Two sprouting wings upon their shoulders sprung. Like those in birds, that veil the callow young. Then, as their age advanced, and they began. 
from greener youth to ripen into man. With Jason's Argonauts they crossed the seas, embarked in quest of the famed Golden Fleece. There, with the rest, the first frail vessel tried, and boldly ventured on the swelling tide. Book. Chapter 7. Story of Medea and Jason. Jason, at the command of the usurper Peleus, who compasses his destruction, arrives at Colchos, accompanied by the princes of Greece. And resolved to effect the recovery of the Golden Fleece, Medea, the daughter of the king, is captivated with his beauty. And convinced by his professions of unalterable attachment, by her knowledge of magic, she enables him to overcome all opposition, and set sail with her lover for Greece. Where they arrive in safety. The Argonauts now stemmed the foaming tide. And to Arcadia's shore their course applied. Where sightless Phineas spent his age in grief. But Boreas sons engage in his relief. And those unwelcome guests, the odious race. Of harpies, from the monarch's table chase. With Jason, then, they greater toil sustain. And faces slimy banks at last they gain. Here boldly they demand the golden prize. Of Scythia's king, who sternly thus replies. That mighty labors they must first overcome. Or sail their Argo thence unfreighted home. Meanwhile Medea, seized with fierce desire. By reason strives to quench the raging fire. But strives in vain. Some god, she said, withstands. And reason's baffled counsel countermands. What unseen power does this disorder move? Tis love, at least tis like what men call love. Else wherefore should the king's commands appear? To me too hard, but so indeed they are. Why should I for a stranger fear, lest he should perish, whom I did but lately see? His death or safety, what are they to me? Wretch! From thy virgin breast this flame expel. And soon, oh! Could I, all would then be well. But love, resistless love, my soul invades. Discretion this, affection that, persuades. I see the right, and I approve it too. Condemn the wrong, and yet, the wrong pursue. Why, royal maid, shouldst thou desire to wed? A wanderer, and court a foreign bed? Thy native land, though Barbrous, can present. A bridegroom worth a royal bride's consent. And whether this adventurer lives or dies. In fate and fortune's fickle pleasure lies. Yet may he live. For to the powers above. A virgin, led by no impulse of love. So just a suit may, for the guiltless, move. Whom would not Jason's valor, youth, and blood? Invite? Or, could these merits be withstood? At least his charming person must incline. The hardest heart, I'm sure, tis so with mine. Yet, if I help him not, the flaming breath. Of bulls, and earth-born foes, must be his death. Or, should he through these dangers force his way. At last he must be made the dragon's prey. If no remorse for such distress I feel. I am a tigress, and my breast is steel. Why do I scruple then to see him slain? And with the tragic scene my eyes profane? My magic's art employ, not to assuage the savages, but to inflame their rage? His earth-born foes to fiercer fury move. An accessory to his nigher to prove? The gods forbid. But prayers are idle breath. When action only can prevent his death. Shall I betray my father, and the state? To intercept a rambling hero's fate? Who may sail off next hour, and, saved from harms? By my assistance, bless another's arms? While I, not only of my hopes bereft, but to unpitied punishment am left. If he is false, let the ingrateful bleed. But no such symptom in his looks I read. Nature would ne'er have lavished so much grace upon his person, if his soul were base. Besides, he first shall plight his faith, and swear by all the gods 
what therefore canst thou fear? Media haste, from danger set him free. Jason shall thy eternal debtor be. And thou, his queen, with sovereign state installed. By Grecian dames, the kind preserver called. Hence. Idle dreams, by lovesick fancy bred. Wilt thou, Medea, by vain wishes led? To sister, brother, father, bid adieu? Forsake thy country's gods, and country too? My father's harsh, my brother but a child. My sister rivals me, my country's wild. And, for its gods, the greatest of them all. Inspires my breast, and I obey his call. That great endearments I forsake, is true. But greater far the hopes that I pursue. The pride of having saved the youths of Greece. Each life more precious than our golden fleece. A nobler soil by me shall be possessed. I shall see towns with arts and manners blessed. And, what I prize above the world beside. Enjoy my Jason, and when once his bride. Be more than mortal, and to gods allied. They talk of hazards I must first sustain. Of floating islands justling in the main. Our tender bark exposed to dreadful shocks. Of fierce Charybdis gulf, and Scylla's rocks. Where breaking waves in whirling eddies roll. And ravenous dogs that in deep caverns howl. Amid these terrors, while I lie possessed. Of him I love, and lean on Jason's breast. In tempests unconcerned I will appear. Or only for my husband's safety fear. Didst thou say husband, canst thou so deceive? Thyself, fond maid, and thy own cheat believe? In vain thou strivest to varnish o'er thy shame. And grace thy guilt with wedlock's sacred name. Pull off the cousining mask, and, oh! In time. Discover and avoid the fatal crime. She ceased, the graces now, with kind surprise. And virtue's lovely train, before her eyes. Present themselves, and vanquished Cupid flies. She then retires to Hecate's shrine, that stood. Far in the covert of a shady wood. She finds the fury of her flames assuaged. But, seeing Jason there, again they raged. Blushes and paleness did by turns invade. Her tender cheeks, and secret grief betrayed. As fire, that sleeping under ashes lies. Fresh blown, and roused, does up in blazes rise. So flamed the virgin's breast. New kindled by her lover's sparkling eyes. For chance, that day, had, with uncommon grace. Adorned the lovely youth, and through his face. Displayed an air so pleasing, as might charm. A goddess, and a vestal's bosom warm. Her rayished eyes survey him o'er and o'er. As some gay wonder never seen before. Transported to the skies she seems to be. And thinks she gazes on a deity. But, when he spoke, and pressed her trembling hand. And did, with tender words, her aid demand. With vows, and oaths, to make her soon his bride. She wept a flood of tears. And thus replied. I see my error, yet to ruin move. Nor owe my fate to ignorance, but love. Your life I'll guard, and only crave of you. To swear once more. And, to your oath be true. He swears, by Hecate he would all fulfill. And by her grandfather's prophetic skill. By everything that doubting love could press. His present danger, and desired success. She credits him, and kindly does produce. Enchanted herbs, and teaches him their use. Their mystic names and virtues he admires. And with his booty joyfully retires. Impatient for the wonders of the day. Aurora drives the loitering stars away. Now Mars's mount the pressing people fill. The crowd below, the nobles crown the hill. The king himself high-throned above the rest. With four-ree scepter, and in purple dressed. Forth with the brass-hoofed bulls are set at large whose furious nostrils sulf-rouse flame discharge. 
the blasted herbage by their breath expires. As forges rumble with excessive fires. And furnaces with fiercer fury glow. When water on the panting mass ye throw. With such a noise, from their convulsive breast. Through bellowing throats the struggling vapor pressed. Yet Jason marches up without concern. While on the advent rouse youth the monsters turn. Their glaring eyes, and, eager to engage. Brandish their steel-tipped horns in threatening rage. With brazen hoofs they beat the ground, and choke. The ambient air with clouds of dust and smoke. Each gazing Grecian for his champion shakes. While bold advances he securely makes. Through singing blasts. Such wonders magic art. Can work, when love conspires, and plays his part. The passive savages like statues stand. While he their dewlap strokes with soothing hand. To unknown yokes their brawny necks they yield. And, like tame oxen, plough the wandering field. The Colchians stare. The Grecians shout, and raise. Their champion's courage with inspiring praise. Emboldened now, on fresh attempts he goes. With serpent's teeth the fertile furrows sows. The glebe fermenting, with enchanted juice. Makes the snake's teeth a human crop produce. For, as an infant, Prina to the womb. Contented sleeps, till to perfection come. Then does the cell's obscure confinement scorn. He tosses, throbs, and presses to be born. So, from the labyrinth earth, no single birth. But a whole troop of lusty youths, rush forth. And, what's more strange, with martial fury warmed. And for encounter all completely armed. In rank and file, as they were sowed, they stand. Impatient for the signal of command. No foe but the Emonian youth appears. At him they level their steel-pointed spears. His fright friends, who triumphed just before. With peals of sighs, his desperate case deplore. And where such hardy warriors are afraid. What must the tender and enamored maid? Her spirits sink the blood her cheek forsook. She fears, who for his safety undertook. She knew the virtue of the spells she gave. She knew the force, and knew her lover brave. But what's a single champion to a host? Yet, scorning thus to see him tamely lost. Her strong reserve of secret arts she brings. And last, her never-failing song she sings. Wonders ensue. Among his gazing foes. The massy fragment of a rock he throws. This charm in civil war engaged them all. By mutual wounds those earth-born brothers fall. The Greeks, transported with the strange success. Leap from their seats the conqueror to caress. Commend, and kiss, and clasp him in their arms. So would the kind contriver of the charms. But her, who felt the tenderest concern. Honor condemns in secret flames to burn. Committed to a double guard of fame. Awed by a virgin's and a princess name. But thoughts are free, and fancy unconfined. She kisses, courts, and hugs him in her mind. To favoring powers her silent thanks she gives. By whose indulgence her loved hero lives. One labor more remains, and, though the last. In danger far surmounting all the past. That enterprise, by fates, in store was kept. To make the dragon sleep, that never slept. Whose crest shoots dreadful luster. From his jaws. A triple tire of forked stings he draws. With fangs, and wings of a prodigious size. Such was the guardian of the golden prize. Yet him, besprinkled with Lethean dew. The fair enchantress into slumber threw. And then, to fix him, thrice she did repeat. The rhyme, that makes the raging winds retreat. In stormy seas can halcyon seasons make. Turn rapid streams into a standing lake. While the soft guest his drowsy eyelid seals. The unguarded golden fleece the stranger steals. Proud to possess the purchase of the toil. 
proud of his royal bride, the richer spoil. To see both prize and patroness he bore. And lands triumphant on his native shore. Old Ezen restored to youth. Medea, at the request of her husband, restores his aged father, Ezen, to the vigor and sprightliness of youth. Emonian matrons, who their absence mourned. Rejoice to see their prosperous sons re-earned. Rich curling fumes of incense feast the skies. A hecatomb of voted victims dies. With gilded horns, and garlands on their head. And all the pomp of death, to the altar led. Congratulating bowls go briskly round. Triumphant shouts in louder music drowned. Amid these revels, why that cloud of care? On Jason's brow? To whom the largest share? Of mirth was due, his father was not there. Ezen was absent, once the young and brave. Now crushed with years, and bending to the grave. At last withdrawn, and by the crowd unseen. Pressing her hand, with starting sighs between. He supplicates his kind and skillful queen. O patroness, preserver of my life! Dear when my mistress, and much dearer wife! Your favors to so vast a sum amount. Tis past the power of numbers to recount. Or, could they be to computation brought? The history would a romance be thought. And yet, unless you add one favor more, greater than all that you conferred before, but not too hard for love and magic skill, your past are thrown away, and Jason's wretched still. The morning of my life is just begun, but my declining father's race is run. From my large stock retrench the long arrears, and add them to expiring Ezen's years. Thus spake the generous youth, and wept the rest. Moved with the piety of his request. To his aged sire such filial duty shown. So different from her treatment of her own. But still endeavoring her remorse to hide. She checked her rising sighs, and thus replied. How could the thought of such inhuman wrong? Escape, said she, from pious Jason's tongue? Does the whole world another Jason bear? Whose life Medea can to yours prefer? Or could I with so dire a change dispense? Hecate will never join in that offense. Unjust is the request you make, and I. In kindness, your petition shall deny. Yet she, that grants not what you do implore. Shall yet essay to give her Jason more. Find means to increase the stock of Ezen's years. Without retrenchment of your life's arrears. Provided that the triple goddess join. A strong confederate in my bold design. Thus was her enterprise resolved, but still. Three tedious nights are wanting to fulfill. The circling crescents of the increasing moon. Then, in the height of her nocturnal noon. Medea steals from court, her ankles bare. Her garments closely girt, but loose her hair. Thus sallied, like a solitary sprite. She traverses the terrors of the night. Men, beasts, and birds, in soft repose lay charmed. No boisterous wind the mountain woods alarmed. Nor did those walks of love, the myrtle trees. Of Amraus Zephyr hear the whispering breeze. All elements chained in unactive rest. No sense but what the twinkling stars expressed. To them, that only waked, she rears her arms. And thus commences her mysterious charms. She turned her thrice about, as oft she threw. On her pale tresses the nocturnal dew. Then yelling thrice a most enormous sound. Her bare knee bended on the flinty ground. O knight, said she, thou confidant and guide. Of secrets, such as darkness ought to hide. Ye stars and moon, that, when the sun retires. Support his empire with succeeding fires. And thou, great Hecate, friend to New York design. Songs, muttering spells, your magic forces join. And thou, O earth, the magazine that yields. The midnight source rare drugs, skies, mountains, fields. Ye watery powers of fountain, 
stream, and lake. Ye sylvan gods, and gods of night, awake! And generously your parts in my adventure take. Oft, by your aid, swift currents I have led. Through wandering banks, back to their fountain head. Transformed the prospect of the briny deep. Made sleeping billows rave, and raving billows sleep. Made clouds or sunshine, tempests rise or fall. And stubborn, lawless winds obey my call. With muttered words disarmed the viper's jaw. Up by the roots vast oaks and rocks could draw. Make forests dance, and trembling mountains come. Like malefactors, to receive their doom. Earth groan, and fright ghosts forsake their tomb. Thee, Cynthia, my resistless rhymes drew down. When tinkling cymbals strove my voice to drown. Nor stronger titan could their force sustain. In full career. Compelled to stop his wane. Nor could Aurora's virgin blush avail. With poisonous herbs I turned their roses pale. The fury of the fiery bulls I broke. Their stubborn necks submitting to my yoke. And when the sons of earth with fury burned. Their hostile rage upon themselves I turned. The brothers made with mutual wounds to bleed. And by their fatal strife my lover freed. And, while the dragon slept, to distant Greece. Through cheated guards, conveyed the golden fleece. But now to bolder action I proceed. Of such prevailing juices now have need. That withered years back to their bloom can bring. And in dead winter raise a second spring. And you'll perform, T. You will, for lo. The stars, with sparkling fires. Presage as bright success to my desires. And, now, another happy omen see. A chariot drawn by dragons waits for me. With these last words she leaps into the wane. Strokes the snake's necks, and shakes the golden rain. That signal given, they mount up is the skies. And now beneath her fruitful tempe lies. Whose stores she ransacks, then to Crete she flies. Their Asa, Pelion, Othres, Pindus, all. To the fair ravisher a booty fall. The tribute of their verdure she collects. Nor proud Olympus height his plants protects. Some by the roots she plucks, the tender tops. Of others with her culling sickle crops. Nor could the plunder of the hills suffice. Down to the humble valas and meads she flies. Epidinus, Amphrasus, the next rape. Sustain, nor could Enopeus bank escape. Through Bibi's marsh, and through the border ranged. Whose pasture Glaucus to a triton changed. Now the ninth day, and ninth successive night. Had wondered at the restless rover's flight. Meanwhile her dragons, fed with no repast. But her exhaling simples Odirous blast. Their tarnished scales and wrinkled skins had cast. At last returned before her palace gate. Quitting her chariot, on the ground she sate. The sky her only canopy of state. All conversation with her sex she fled. Shunned the caresses of the nuptial bed. Two altars next of grassy turf she rears. This Hecate's name, that youth's inscription bears. With forest boughs and vervain these she crowned. Then delves a double trench in lower ground. And sticks a black fleeced ram, that ready stood. And drenched the ditches with devoted blood. New wine she pours, and milk from the udder warm. With mystic murmurs to complete the charm. And subterranean deities alarm. To the stern king of ghosts she next applied. And gentle Proserpine, his injured bride. That for old Ezin with the laws of fate. They would dispense, and lengthen his short date. Thus with repeated prayers she long assails. The infernal tyrant, and at last prevails. Then calls to have decrepit Ezin brought. And stupefies him with a sleeping draught. On earth his body, like a corpse, extends. Then charges Jason and his waiting friends. To quit the place, that no unhallowed eye. 
into her art's forbidden secrets pry. This done, the enchantress, with her locks unbound. About her altars trips a frantic round. Piecemeal the consecrated wood she splits. And dips the splinters in the bloody pits. Then hurls them on the piles, the sleeping sire. She lustrates thrice, with sulphur, water, fire. In a large cauldron now the medicine boils. Compounded of her late collected spoils. Blending into the mesh the various powers. Of wonder-working juices, roots, and flowers. With gems eyed the eastern ocean's cell refined. And such as ebbing tides had left behind. To them the midnight's pearly do she flings. A screech owl's carcass, and ill-boding wings. Nor could the wizard wolf's warm entrails escape. That wolf who counterfeits a human shape. Then, from the bottom of her so enduring bag. Snake skins, and liver of a long-lived stag. Last a crow's head, to such an age arrived. That he had now nine centuries survived. These, and with these a thousand more that grew. In sundry soils, into her pot she threw. Then with a withered olive bough she rakes. The bubbling broth, the bough fresh verdure takes. Green leaves at first the perished plant surround. Which the next minute with ripe fruit were crowned. The foaming juices now the brink o'er swell. The barren heath, where'er the liquor fell. Sprang out with vernal grass, and all the pride. Of blooming May. When this Medea spied. She cut her patient's throat. The exhausted blood. Recruiting with her new enchanted flood. While at his mouth, and through his opening wound. A double inlet her infusion found. His feeble frame resumes a youthful air. A glossy brown his hoary beard and hair. The meager paleness from his aspect fled. And in its room sprang up a florid red. Through all his limbs a youthful vigor flies. His emptied arteries swell with fresh supplies. Gazing spectators scarce believe their eyes. But Ezin is the most surprised to find. A happy change in body and in mind. In sense and constitution the same man. As when his fortieth active year began. Bacchus, who from the clouds this wonder viewed. Medea's method instantly pursued. And his indulgent nurse's youth renewed. Death of Peleus. The daughters of Peleus, desirous of restoring their father to youth, apply to Medea to enable them to effect their purpose, the enchantress. Desirous of revenging the injuries formerly sustained by her husband, directs the credulous maidens to cut their father to pieces. And place his limbs in a cauldron of boiling water, on the arrival of Medea at Corinth, she finds her husband united in marriage to Glossy. The daughter of Creon, this infidelity is severely punished by the injured wife, who contrives to destroy the bride and her father, whose palace she raises to the ground. And cruelly murders her own sons in the presence of Jason, who attempts to pursue her, but the princess makes her escape through the air, on a chariot drawn by winged dragons. Thus far obliging love employed her art. But now revenge must act a tragic part. Medea feigns a mortal quarrel bred. Betwixt her and the partner of her bed. On this pretense to Pelia's court she flies. Who languishing with age and sickness lies. His guiltless daughters, with inveigling wiles. And well dissembled friendship. She beguiles. The strange achievements of her art she tells. With Ezin's cure, and long on that she dwells. Till them to firm persuasion she has won. The same for their old father may be done. For him they court her to employ her skill. And put upon the cure what price she will. At first she's mute, and with a grave pretense. Of difficulty, holds them in suspense. Then promises, and bids them from the fold. Choose out a ram, the most infirm and old. That so by facts their doubts may be removed. And first on him the operation proved. A wreath-horned ram is brought, so far o'ergrown. With years, his age was to that age unknown. 
of sense too dull the piercing point to feel, and scarce sufficient blood to stain the steel. His carcass she into a cauldron threw, with drugs whose vital qualities she knew. His limbs grow less, he casts his horns and years, and tender bleeding strike their wondering ears. Then instantly leaps forth a frisking lamb, that seeks, too young to graze, a suckling dam. The sisters, thus confirmed with the success, her promise with renewed entreaty press, to countenance the cheat, three nights and days, before experiment the enchantress stays, then into limpid water, from the springs, woods and ingredients of no force she flings, with antique ceremonies for pretense, and rambling rhymes without a word of sense. Meanwhile the king, with all his guards, lay bound. In magic sleep, scarce that of death so sound. The daughters now are by the sorceress led. Into his chamber, and surround his bed. Your father's health's concerned, and can ye stay? Unnatural nymphs, why this unkind delay? Unsheath your swords, dismiss his lifeless blood. And I'll recruit it with a vital flood. Your father's life and health are in your hand. And can ye thus like idle gazers stand? Unless you are of common sense bereft. If yet one spark of piety is left. Dispatch a father's cure, and disengage. The monarch from his toilsome load of age. Come. Drench your weapons in his putrid gore. Tis charity to wound, when wounding will restore. Thus urged, the poor deluded maids proceed. Betrayed by zeal to an inhuman deed. And, in compassion, make a father bleed. Yes, she who had the kindest, tenderest heart. Is foremost to perform the bloody part. Yet, though to act the butchery betrayed. They could not bear to see the wounds they made. With looks averted, backward they advance. Then strike and stab, and leave the blows to chance. Waking in consternation, he essays. Weltering in blood, his feeble arms to raise. Environed with so many swords. From whence? This barbarous usage? What is my offense? What fatal fury, what infernal charm? Gainst a kind father does his daughter's arm? Hearing his voice, as thunderstruck, they stopped. Their resolution and their weapons dropped. Medea then the mortal blow bestows. And, that performed, the tragic scene to close. His corpse into the boiling cauldron throws. Then, dreading the revenge that must ensue. High mounted on her dragon coach she flew, And in her stately progress through the skies. Beneath her shady pelion first she spies. With Othries, that above the clouds did rise. With skillful Chiron's cave. And neighboring ground. For old Sarambas' strange escape renowned. By nymphs delivered when the world was drowned. Who him with unexpected wings supplied. When deluged hills a safe retreat denied. Aeolian Petane on her left hand. She saw, and there the statued dragon stand. With Ida's grove, where Bacchus, to disguise. His son's bold theft, and to secure the prize. Made the stolen steer a stag to represent. Cocytus' father's sandy monument. And fields that held the murdered sire's remains. Where howling Mora frights the startled plains. Eurypylus' high town, with towers defaced. By Hercules and matrons more disgraced. With sprouting horns, in signal punishment. From Juno or resenting Venus sent. Then Rhodes, which Phoebus did so dearly prize. And Jove no less severely did chastise. For he the wizard native's poisoning sight. That used the farmer's hopeful crops to blight. In rage o'erwhelmed with everlasting night. Carthia's ancient walls come next in view. Where once the sire almost a statue grew. With wonder, which a strange event did move. His daughter turned into a turtle dove. Then Hyres Lake and Tempe's field o'erin. Famed for the boy who there became a swan. 
for there enamored Phileas, like a slave, performed what tasks his paramour would crave. For presents he had mountain vultures caught, and from the desert a tame lion brought. Then a wild bull commanded to subdue the conquered savage by the horns he drew. But, mocked so oft, the treatment he disdains. And from the craving boy this prize detains. Then thus in collar the resenting lad. Won't you deliver him? You'll wish you had. No sooner said, but, in a peevish mood. Leaped from the precipice on which he stood. The standers by were struck with fresh surprise. Instead of falling, to behold him rise. A snowy swan, and soaring to the skies. But dearly the rash prank his mother cost. Who ignorantly gave her son for lost. For his misfortune wept, till she became. A lake, and still renowned with Hyrie's name. Thence to Latona's isle, where once was seen. Transformed to birds, a monarch and his queen. Far off she saw how old Cephasus mourned. His son, into a seal by Phoebus turned. And where, astonished at a stranger sight, Eumelus gazed on his winged daughter's flight. Aetolian Pluron she did next survey. Where sons a mother's murder did essay. But sudden plumes the matron bore away. On her right hand, Silene, a fair soil. Fair, till Menephron there the beauteous hill. Attempted with foul incest to defile. Her harnessed dragons now direct she drives. For Corinth, and at Corinth she arrives. Where, if what old tradition tells be true. In former ages men from mushrooms grew. But here Medea finds her bed supplied. During her absence, by another bride. And, hopeless to recover her lost game. She sets both bride and palace in a flame. Nor could a rival's death her wrath assuage. Nor stopped at Creon's family her rage. She murders her own infants. In despite. To faithless Jason, and in Jason's sight. Yet ere his sword could reach her, up she springs. Securely mounted on her dragon's wings. Story of Aegeus. From Corinth Medea proceeds to Athens, where she becomes the wife of Aegeus, and attempts to poison his son Theseus, the hero, however, is fortunately recognized by his father, who compels his cruel queen to quit the Athenian territories, in the meantime, Minos, king of Crete, threatens to invade Athens. In order to revenge the murder of his son Androgeus, for this purpose he forms treaties of alliance with the neighboring states, and endeavors to effect a league with Aeacus, the king of Aegina, who continues faithful to his compact with the Athenians, and entertains their ambassador Cephalus with hospitality and kindness. From hence to Athens she directs her flight, where Phineas, so renowned for doing right, where Periphus, and Polyphemon's niece, soaring with sudden plumes, Amazed the towns of Greece. Here Aegeus so engaging she addressed. That first he treats her like a royal guest. Then takes the sorceress for his wedded wife. The only blemish of his prudent life. Meanwhile his son, from actions of renown. Arrives at court, but to his sire unknown. Medea, to dispatch a dangerous heir. She knew him, did a poisonous draught prepare. Drawn from a drug, was long reserved in store. For desperate uses, from the Scythian shore. That from the Echidnean monster's jaws. Derived its origin, and this the cause. Through a dark cave a craggy passage lies. To ours ascending from the nether skies. Through which, by strength of hand, Alcides drew. Chained Cerberus, who lagged, and Restif grew. With his bleared eyes our brighter day to view. Thrice he repeated his enormous yell. With which he scares the ghosts and startles hell. At last outrageous, though compelled to yield. He sheds his foam in fury on the field. Which, with its own, and rankness of the ground. Produced a weed, by sorcerers renowned. The strongest constitution to confound. Called aconite 
because it can unlock all bars, and force its passage through a rock. The pious father, by her wheedles won, presents this deadly potion to his son, who with the same assurance takes the cup, and to the monarch's health had drunk it up. But in the very instant he applied the goblet to his lips, old Aegeus spied the four-re-hilted sword that graced his side. That certain signal of his son he knew and snatched the bowl away, the sword he drew. Resolved, for such a son's endangered life, to sacrifice the most perfidious wife. Revenge is swift, but her more active charms. A whirlwind raised, that snatched her from his arms. While conjured clouds their baffled sense surprise. She vanishes from their deluded eyes. And through the hurricane triumphant flies. The Genraus king, although o'erjoyed to find. His son was safe, yet, bearing still in mind. The mischief by his treach-rouse queen designed. The horror of the deed. And then how near. The danger drew, lie stands congealed with fear. But soon that fear into devotion turns. With grateful incense every altar burns. Proud victims, and unconscious of their fate. Stalk to the temple there to die in state. In Athens never had a day been found. For mirth, like that grand festival renowned. Promiscuously the peers and people dine. Promiscuously their thankful voices join. In songs of wit, sublimed by sprightly wine. To listening spheres their joint applause they raise. And thus resound their matchless Theseus praise. Great Theseus! Thee the Marathonian plain admires and wears with pride the noble stain of the dire monster's blood by valiant Theseus slain, that now Chromian swains in safety sow and reap their fertile field. To thee they owe, by thee the infested Epidorian coast was cleared, and now can a free commerce boast. The traveller his journey can pursue. With pleasure the late dreadful valley view. And cry, here Theseus the grand robber slew. Cephas's flood cries to his rescued shore. The merciless Procrustes is no more. In peace, Eleusis, Ceres rights renew. Since Theseus soared the fierce Circean slew. By him the torturer Cenes was destroyed. Of strength, but strength to Barbrous use employed. That tops of tallest pines to earth could bend. And thus in pieces wretched captives rend. Inhuman siren now has breathed his last. And now Alcatho's roads securely passed. By Theseus slain, and thrown into the deep. But earth nor sea his scattered bones would keep. Which, after floating long, a rock became. Still infamous with siren's hated name. When fame to count thy acts and years proceeds. Thy years appear but ciphers to thy deeds. For thee, brave youth, as for our commonwealth. We pray, and drink, in yours, the public health. Your praise the senate and plebeians sing. With your loved name the court and cottage ring. You make our shepherds and our sailors glad. And not a house in this vast city sad. But mortal bliss will never come sincere. Pleasure may lead, but grief brings up the rear. While, for his son's arrival, reveling joy. Aegeus and all his subjects does employ. While they for only costly feasts prepare. His neighboring monarch, Minus, threatens war. Weak in land forces, nor by sea more strong. But powerful in a deep resented wrong for a son's murder, armed with pious rage. Yet prudently, before he would engage, to raise auxiliaries resolved to sail, and with the powerful princes to prevail. First Anaphi, then proud Astipalia gains, by presence that, and this by threats, obtains. Low Mycon, Simulus, chalky soil. Tall Sithnos, Cyrus, flat Seriphos isle. Paros, with marble cliffs afar displayed. Impregnable Sithonia, 
yet betrayed. To a weak foe, by a gold-admiring maid. Who, changed into a daw of sable hue. Still hoards up gold, and hides it from the view. But as these islands cheerfully combine. Others refuse to embark in his design. Now leftward, with an easy, sail, he bore. And prosperous passage, to Enopia's shore. Enopia once, but now Aegina called. And with his royal mother's name installed. By Aeacus, under whose reign did spring. The Myrmidons, and now their reigning king. Down to the port, amid the rabble, run. The princes of the blood, with Telamon. Peleus, the next, and Phocus, the third son. Then Aeacus, although oppressed with years. To ask the cause of their approach appears. That question does the Nauscian's grief renew. And sighs from his afflicted bosom drew. Yet, after a short solemn respite made. The river of the hundred cities said. Assist our arms, raised for a murdered son. In this religious war no risk you'll run. Revenge the dead, for who refuse to give. Rest to their urns, unworthy are to live. What you request, thus Aeacus replies. Not I, but truth and common faith denies. Athens and we have long been sworn allies. Our leagues are fixed, confederate are our powers. And who declare themselves their foes, are ours. Minus rejoins, your league shall dearly cost. Yet, mindful how much safer, t'was to boast. Than there to waste his forces and his fame. Before in field with his grand foe he came. Parts without blows. Nor long had left the shore. Ere into port another navy bore. With Cephalus, and all his jolly crew. The Iacides their old acquaintance knew. The princes bid him welcome, and in state. Conduct the hero to their palace gate. Who, entering, seemed the charming mien to wear. As when in youth he paid his visit there. In his right hand an olive branch he holds. And, salutation passed, the chief unfolds. His embassy from the Athenian state. Their mutual friendship, leagues of ancient date. Their common danger. Everything could wake. Concern, and his address successful make. Strengthening his plea with all the charms of sense. And those, with all the charms of eloquence. Then thus the king, like suitors do you stand. For that assistance which you may command. Athenians, all our listed forces use. They're such as no bold service will refuse. And when ye ve drawn them off, the gods be praised. Fresh legions can within our isle be raised. So stocked with people, that we can prepare. Both for domestic and for distant war. Ours or our friends insulters to chastise. Long may he flourish thus, the prince replies. Strange transport seized me as I passed along. To meet so many troops and all so young. As if your army did of twins consist. Yet among them my late acquaintance missed. Evan all that to your palace did resort. When first you entertained me at your court. And cannot guess the cause from whence could spring. So vast a change. Then thus the sighing king. Illustrious guest, to my strange tale attend. Of sad beginning, but a joyful end. The whole to a vast history would swell. I shall but half, and that confusedly, tell. That race whom so deservedly you admired. Are all into their silent tombs retired. They fell, and falling, how they shook my state. Thought may conceive, but words can ne'er relate. Story of ants changed to men. King Aeacus relates to Cephalus that a pestilence having formerly depopulated his territories. He entreated Jupiter to repeople his kingdom, his request was granted, and, according to his desire, all the ants in an old oak were changed into men, and called by Aeacus Myrmidons. From a Greek word signifying an ant. A dreadful plague from angry Juno came. To scourge the land that bore her rival's name. 
before her fatal anger was revealed. And teeming malice lay as yet concealed. All remedies we try, all medicines use. Which nature could supply, or art produce. The unconquered foe derides the vain design. And art and nature foiled, declare the cause divine. At first we only felt the oppressive weight. Of gloomy clouds, then teeming with our fate. And labouring to discharge unactive heat. But ere four moons alternate changes new. With deadly blasts the fatal south wind blew. Infected all the air, and poisoned as it flew. Our fountains to a dire infection yield. For crowds of vipers creep along the field. And, with polluted gore, and baneful steams. Taint all the lakes, and venom all the streams. The young disease with milder force began. And raged on birds and beasts, excusing man. The labouring oxen fall before the plough. The unhappy pluffmen stare, and wonder how. The tabid sheep, with sickly bleedings, pines. Its wool decreasing as its strength declines. The warlike steed, by inward foes compelled. Neglects his honours, and deserts the field. Unnerved and languid, seeks a base retreat. And at the manger groans, but wished a nobler fate. The stags forget their speed. The boars their rage. Nor can the bears the stronger herds engage. A general faintness does invade them all. And in the woods and fields promiscuously they fall. The air receives the stench, and, strange to say, the ravenous birds and beasts avoid the prey. The offensive bodies rot upon the ground. And spread the dire contagion all around. But now the plague, grown to a larger size. Riots on man, and scorns a meaner prize. Intestine heats begin the civil war. And flushings first the latent flame declare. And breath inspired, which seemed like fiery air. Their black dry tongues are swelled, and scarce can move. And short thick sighs from panting lungs are drove. They gape for air, with flattering hopes to abate. Their raging flames, but that augments their heat. No bed, no covering, can the wretches bear. But on the ground, exposed to open air. They lie, and hope to find a pleasing coolness there. The suffering earth, with that oppression cursed returns the heat which they imparted first. In vain physicians would bestow their aid. Vain all their art, and useless all their trade. And they, even they, who fleeting life recall, feel the same powers, and undistinguished fall. If any prove so daring to attend, his sick companion, or his darling friend, the officious wretch sucks in contagious breath and with his friend does sympathize in death. And now the care and hopes of life are past. They please their fancies and indulge their taste. At brooks and streams, regardless of their shame, each sex, promiscuous, strives to quench their flame. Nor do they strive in vain to quench it there. For thirst and life at once extinguished are. Thus in the brooks the dying bodies sink but heedless still the rash survivors drink. So much uneasy down the wretches hate. They fly their beds, to struggle with their fate. But if decaying strength forbids to rise, the victim crawls and rolls. Till on the ground he lies. Each shuns his bed as each would shun his tomb. And thinks the infection only lodged at home. Here one, with fainting steps, does slowly creep. O'er heaps of dead, and straight augments the heap. Another, while his strength and tongue prevailed, bewails his friend, and falls himself, bewailed. This, with imploring looks, surveys the skies, the last dear office of his closing eyes, but finds the heavens implacable, and dies. What now, ah, what? Empioid my troubled mind but only hopes my subject's fate to find? What place soe'er my weeping eyes survey? Therein lamented heaps the vulgar lay. 
as acorns scatter when the winds prevail, or mellow fruit from shaken branches fall. You see that dome which rears its front so high. Tis sacred to the monarch of the sky. How many there, with unregarded tears, and fruitless vows, sent up successless prayers. Their fathers for expiring sons implored. And there the wife bewailed her gasping lord. With pious offerings they appease the skies. But they, ere yet the atoning vapors rise. Before the altars fall, themselves a sacrifice. They fall while yet their hands the gums contain. Their gums surviving, but their offerers slain. The destined ox, with holy garlands crowned, prevents the blow, and feels an unexpected wound. When I myself invoked the powers divine, to drive the fatal pest from me and mine, when now the priest with hands uplifted stood, prepared to strike, and shed the sacred blood, the gods themselves the mortal stroke bestow. The victim falls, but they impart the blow. Scarce was the knife with the pale purple stained, and no presages could be then obtained. From putrid entrails, where the infection reigned, death stalked around with such resistless sway. The temples of the gods his force obey, and suppliants feel his stroke while yet they pray. Go now, said he, your deities implore. For fruitless aid, for I defy their power. Then with a cursed, malicious joy surveyed. The very altars, stained with trophies of the dead. The rest grown mad, and frantic with despair. Urge their own fate, and so prevent the fear. Strange madness that, when death pursued so fast. To anticipate the blow with impious haste. No decent honors to their urns are paid. Nor could the graves receive the numerous dead. For, or they lay unburied on the ground. Or, unadorned, a needy funeral found. All reverence passed, the fainting wretches fight. For funeral piles which were another's right. Unmourned they fall, for who survived to mourn. And sires and mothers unlamented burn. Parents and sons sustain an equal fate. And wandering ghosts their kindred shadows meet. The dead a larger space of ground require. Nor are the trees sufficient for the fire. Despairing under grief's oppressive weight. And sunk by these tempestuous blasts of fate. O Jove, said I, if common fame says true. If e'er Regina gave those joys to you. If e'er you lay enclosed in her embrace. Fond of her charms, and eager to possess. O Father if you do not yet disclaim paternal care, nor yet disown the name. Grant my petitions, and with speed restore my subjects numerous as they were before, or make me partner of the fate they bore. I spoke, and glorious lightning shone around, and rattling thunder gave a prosperous sound. So let it be, and may these omens prove a pledge, said I, of your returning love. By chance a reverend oak was near the place. Sacred to Jove, and of Dodona's race. Where frugal ants laid up their winter meat. Whose little bodies bear a mighty weight. We saw them march along, and hide their store. And much admired their number and their power. Admired at first, but after envied more. Full of amazement, thus to Jove I prayed. O oh, grant, since thus my subjects are decayed. As many subjects to supply the dead. I prayed, and strange convulsions moved the oak. Which murmured, though by ambient winds unshook. My trembling hands and stiff erected hair. Expressed all tokens of uncommon fear. Yet both the earth and sacred oak I kissed. And scarce could hope, yet still I hoped the best. For wretches, Whatsoe'er the fates divine. Expound all omens to their own design. But now, t'was night, when even distraction wears. A pleasing look, and dreams beguile our cares. Lo! The same oak appears before my eyes. Nor altered in his shape nor former size. As many ants the numerous branches bear. 
the same their labor and their frugal care. The branches too a like commotion found. And shook the industrious creatures on the ground. Who by degrees, what scarce to be believed. A nobler form and larger bulk received. And on the earth walked an unusual pace. With manly strides and an erected face. Their numerous legs and former color lost. The insects could a human figure boast. I wake, and, waking, find my cares again. And to the unperforming gods complain. And call their promise and pretenses vain. Yet in my court I heard the murmuring voice. Of strangers, and a mixed, uncommon noise. But I suspected all was still a dream. Till Telamon to my apartment came. Opening the door with an impetuous haste. Oh come, said he, and see your faith and hope surpassed. I follow, and, confused with wonder, view. Those shapes which my presaging slumbers drew. I saw, and owned, and called them subjects, they. Confessed my power, submissive to my sway. To Jove, restorer of my race decayed. My vows were first with due oblations paid. I then divide, with an impartial hand. My empty city, and my ruined land. To give the newborn youth an equal share. And call them Myrmidons, from what they were. You saw their persons, and they still retain. The thrift of ants, though now transformed to men. A frugal people, and inured to sweat. Labouring to gain, and keeping what they get. These, equal both in strength and years, shall join. Their willing aid, and follow your design. With the first southern gale that shall present. To fill your sails. And favor your intent. With such discourse they entertain the day. The evening passed in banquets, sport, and play. Then, having crowned the night with sweet repose. Aurora, with the wind at east, arose. Now Pallas' sons to Cephalus resort. And Cephalus with Pallas' sons to court. To the king's levy, him sleeps silken chain. And pleasing dreams beyond his hour detain. But then the princes of the blood, in state. Expect and meet them at the palace gate. Story of Cephalus and Procris. Cephalus, in his turn, relates to Aeacus his adventures during his absence from his wife Procris whose constancy he overcomes by profuse presence in the disguise of a stranger, the matron flies from the presence of her husband. Who at length prevails on her to return with promises of forgiveness, her jealousy is in like manner excited, and her unfounded suspicions direct her to an adjoining wood, where Cephalus is hunting. And he, mistaking her for a wild beast, transfixes her with a dart, and she expires in the arms of her agonized husband. To the inmost courts the Grecian youths were led. And placed by Phocus on a Tyrian bed. Who, soon observing Cephalus to hold. A dart of unknown wood. But armed with gold. None better loves, said he, the huntsman's sport. Or does more often to the woods resort. Yet I that javelin stem with wonder view. Too brown for box. Too smooth a grain for you. I cannot guess the tree. But never art. Did form, or eyes behold, so fair a dart. The guest then interrupts him, t'would produce. Still greater wonder, if you knew its use. It never fails to strike the game, and then. Comes bloody back into your hand again. Then focus each particular desires. And the author of the wondrous gifts inquires. To which the owner thus, with weeping eyes. And sorrow for his wife's sad fate, replies. This weapon here, O oh prince. Can you believe? This dart the cause for which so much I grieve. And shall continue to grieve on, till fate. Afford such wretched life no longer date? Would I this fatal gift had ne'er enjoyed? This fatal gift my tender wife destroyed. Procris her name, allied in charms and blood. To fair Orithia, courted by a god. Her father sealed my hopes with rites divine. 
but firmer love before had made her mine. Men called me blessed, and blessed I was indeed. The second month our nuptials did succeed. When, as upon Hymettus dewy head. For mountain stags, my net betimes I spread. Aurora spied. And ravished me away. With reverence to the goddess, I must say. Against my will, for Procris had my heart. Nor would her image from my thoughts depart. At last, in rage, she cried, Ingrateful boy. Go to your Procris, take your fatal joy. And so dismissed me, musing, as I went. What those expressions of the goddess meant. A thousand jealous fears possess me now. Lest Procris had profaned her nuptial vow. Her youth and charms did to my fancy paint. A lewd adult dress. But her life a saint. Yet I was absent long. The goddess too. Taught me how far a woman could be true. Aurora's treatment much suspicion bred. Besides, who truly love Evan shadows dread. I straight impatient for the trial grew. What courtship backed with richest gifts could do. Aurora's envy aided my design. And lent me features far unlike to mine. In this disguise to my own house I came. But all was chaste, no conscious sign of blame. With thousand arts I scarce admittance found. And then beheld her weeping on the ground. For her lost husband, hardly I retained. My purpose, scarce the wished embrace refrained. How charming was her grief! Then, focus, guess. What killing beauties waited on her dress? Her constant answer, when my suit I pressed. Forbear, my lord's dear image guards this breast. Where'er he is, whatever cause detains. Who or has his, my heart unmoved remains. What greater proofs of truth than these could be? Yet I persist, and urge my destiny. At length she found, when my own form returned. Her jealous lover there, whose loss she mourned. Enraged with my suspicion, swift as wind. She fled at once from me and all mankind. And so became, her purpose to retain. A nymph, and huntress in Diana's train. Forsaken thus, I found my flames increase. I own my folly, and I sued for peace. It was a fault, but not of guilt, to move. Such punishment, a fault of too much love. Thus I retrieved her to my longing arms. And many happy days possessed her charms. But with herself she kindly did confer. What gifts the goddess had bestowed on her. The fleetest greyhound. With this lovely dart. And I of both have wonders to impart. Near Thebes a savage beast, of race unknown. Laid waste the field, and bore the vineyards down. The swains fled from him. And, with one consent. Our Grecian youth to chase the monster went. More swift than lightning he the toil surpassed. And in his coarse spears, men, and trees, o'ercast. We slipped our dogs, and last my lelops too. When none of all the mortal race would do. He long before was struggling from my hands. And, ere we could unloose him. Broke his bands. That minute where he was we could not find. And only saw the dust he left behind. I climbed a neighboring hill to view the chase. While in the plain they held an equal race. The savage now seems caught, and now, by force. To quit himself. Nor holds the same straight course. But, running counter, from the foe withdraws. And with short turning cheats his gaping jaws. Which he retrieves, and still so closely pressed. You'd fear at every stretch he were possessed. Yet for the gripe his fangs in vain prepare. The game shoots from him, and he chops the air. To cast my javelin then I took my stand. But as the thongs were fitting to my hand. While to the valley I o'erlooked the wood. Before my eyes two marble statues stood. That, as pursued appearing at full stretch. This, barking after, and at point to catch. 
some god their course did with this wonder grace. That neither might be conquered in the chase. A sudden silence here his tongue suppressed. He here stops short, and fain would wave the rest. The eager prince then urged him to impart. The fortune that attended on the dart. First then, said he, past joys let me relate. For bliss was the foundation of my fate. No language can those happy hours express. Did from our nuptials me and Procris bless. The kindest pair. What more could heaven confer? For she was all to me, and I to her. Had Jove made love, great Jove had been despised. And I my Procris more than Venus prized. Thus while no other joy we did aspire. We grew at last one soul and one desire. Forth to the woods I went at break of day. The constant practice of my youth, for prey. Nor yet for servant, horse, or dog, did call. I found this single dart to serve for all. With slaughter tired, I sought the cooler shade. And winds that from the mountains pierced the glade. Come, gentle air, so was I wont to say. Come, gentle air, sweet aura, come away. This always was the burden of my song. Come, sewage my flames, sweet aura, come along. Thou always art most welcome to my breast. I faint, approach, thou dearest, kindest guest. These blandishments, and more than these, I said. By fate to unsuspected ruin led. Thou art my joy, for thy dear sake I love. Each desert hill and solitary grove. When, faint with labor, I refreshment need. For cordials on thy fragrant breath I feed. At last a wandering swain in hearing came. And, cheated with the sound of Aura's name. He thought I had some assignation made. And to my Procris ear the news conveyed. Great love is soonest with suspicion fired. She swooned, and with the tale almost expired. Ah, wretched heart, she cried, ah, faithless man. And then to curse the imagined nymph began. Yet oft she doubts, oft hopes she is deceived. And chides herself, that ever she believed. Her lord to such injustice could proceed. Till she herself were witness of the deed. Next morn I to the woods again repair. And, weary with the chase, invoke the air. Approach, dear Aura, and my bosom cheer. At which a mournful sound did strike my ear. Yet I proceeded, till the thicket by. With rustling noise and motion, drew my eye. I thought some beast of prey was sheltered there. And to the covert threw my certain spear. From whence a tender sigh my soul did wound. Ah me, it cried, and did like Procris sound. Procris was there too well the voice I knew. And to the place with headlong horror flew. Where I beheld her gasping on the ground. In vain attempting from the deadly wound. To draw the dart, her love's dear fatal gift. My guilty arms had scarce the strength to lift. The beauteous load, my silks and hair I tore. If possible, to stanch the pressing gore. For pity begged her keep her flitting breath and not to leave me guilty of her death. While I entreat she fainted fast away. And these few words had only strength to say. By all the sacred bonds of plighted love. By all your reverence to the powers above. By all that made me charming once appear. By all the truth for which you held me dear. And last, by love, the cause through which I bleed. Let Aura never to my bed succeed. I then perceived the error of our fate. And told it her, but found and told too late. I felt her lower to my bosom fall. And while her eyes had any sight at all. On mine she fixed them, in her pang still pressed. My hand, and sight her soul into my breast. Yet, being undeceived, resigned her breath. Methought more cheerfully, and smiled in death. With such concern the weeping hero told. This tale, that none who heard him could withhold. From melting into sympathizing tears. Till Aeacus with his two sons appears. 
whom he commits, with their new levied bands, to fortunes, and so brave a general's, hands. Book. Chapter 8. Story of Nisus and Scylla. Scylla, the daughter of Nisus, king of Megara, becomes enamored of King Minos while besieging the walls of her father's capital. The safety of which is said by the oracle to depend on a purple lock of hair on the king's head, the maiden steals the fatal treasure from her sleeping parent, and the town is immediately captured. But Minos regards the crime with aversion, the gods convert Nisus into a hawk, and his daughter into a lark. Now shone the morning star in bright array. To vanquish night, and usher in the day. The wind veers southward, and moist clouds arise. That blot with shades the blue meridian skies. Cephalus feels with joy the kindly gales. His new allies unfurl the swelling sails. Steady their course, they cleave the yielding main. And, with a wish, the intended harbor gain. Meanwhile King Minos, on the attic strand, displays his martial skill, and wastes the land. His army lies encamped upon the plains. Before Alcatho's walls, where Nisus reigns, on whose gray head a lock of purple hue, the strength and fortune of his kingdom, grew. Six moons were gone and passed, when still from far. Victoria hovered o'er the doubtful war. So long, to both inclined, the impartial maid. Between them both her equal wings displayed. High on the walls, by Phoebus vocal made. A turret of the palace raised its head. And where the god his tuneful harp resigned. The sound within the stone still lay enshrined. Hither the daughter of the purple king. Ascended oft, to hear its music ring. And, striking with a pebble, would release the enchanted notes, in times of happy peace. But now from thence the curious maid beheld rough feats of arms, and combats of the field. And, since the siege was long, had learned the name of every chief, his character, and fame. Their arms, their horse, and quiver, she descried. Nor could the dress of war the warrior hide. Europa's son she knew above the rest. And more than well became a virgin breast. In vain the crested Morian veils his face. She thinks it adds a more peculiar grace. His ample shield, embossed with burnished gold. Still makes the bearer lovelier to behold. When the tough javelin, with a whirl, he sends. His strength and skill the sighing maid commends. Or, when he strains to draw the circling bow. And his fine limbs a manly posture show. Compared with Phoebus, he performs so well. Let her be judge, and Minos shall excel. But when, the helm put off, displayed to sight. And set his features in an open light. When, vaulting to his seat, his steed he pressed. Caparisoned in gold, and richly dressed himself in scarlet sumptuously arrayed. New passions rise, and fire the frantic maid. O oh, happy spear, she cries, that feels his touch. Nay, even the reins he holds are blessed too much. Oh! Were it lawful, she could wing her way. Through the stern hostile troops without dismay. Or throw her body to the distant ground. And in the Cretans happy camp be found. Would Minus but desire it, she'd expose her native country to her country's foes. Unbar the gates, the town with flames infest, or anything that Minus should request. And as she sat, and pleased her longing sight, viewing the king's pavilion, veiled with white, should joy or grief, she said, possess my breast, to see my country by a war oppressed? I'm in suspense. For, though, tis grief to know. I love a man that is declared my foe. Yet, in my own despite, I must approve. That lucky war. Which brought the man I love. Yet were I tendered as a pledge of peace. The cruelties of war might quickly cease. Oh! With what joy eyed were the chains he gave. 
a patient hostage, and a willing slave. Thou lovely object! If the nymph that bear thy charming person were but half so fair, well might a god her lovely bloom desire, and with a kiss indulge his youthful fire. Oh! Had I wings to glide along the air, to his dear tent I'd fly, and settle there. There tell my quality, confess my flame, and grant him any dowry that he'd name. All, all I'd give. Only my native land, my dearest country, should accept it stand. For, perish love, and all expected joys. Ere with so base a thought my soul complies. Yet oft the vanquished some advantage find. When conquered by a noble, generous mind. Brave Minus justly has the war begun. Fired with resentment for his murdered son. The righteous gods a righteous cause regard and will with victory his arms reward. We must be conquered. And the captive's fate will surely seize us, though it sees us late. Why then should love be idle, and neglect? What Mars, by arms and perils, will effect? O oh, Prince! I die, with anxious fear oppressed. Lest some rash hand should wound my charmer's breast. For, if they saw, no Barbrow's mind could dare Against that lovely form to raise a spear. But I'm resolved, and fixed in this decree. My father's country shall my dowry be. Thus I prevent the loss of life and blood. And, in effect, the action must be good. Vain resolution. For, at every gate. The trusty sentinel successive wait. The keys my father keeps, ah! There's my grief. Tis he obstructs all hopes of my relief. Gods! That this hated light I'd never seen. Or all my life without a father been. But gods we all may be. For those that dare. Are gods, and fortune's chiefest favors share. The ruling powers a lazy prayer detest. The bold adventurer succeeds the best. What other maid, inspired with such a flame? But would take courage, and abandon shame? But would, though ruin should ensue, remove? Whatever opposed, and clear the way to love? This shall another's feeble passion dare. While I sit tame, and languish in despair? No, for though fire and sword before me lay, Impatient love through both should force its way. Yet I have no such enemies to fear. My sole obstruction is my father's hair. His purple lock my sanguine hope destroys. And clouds the prospect of my rising joys. While thus she spoke, amid the thickening air. Night supervenes, the greatest nurse of care. And as the goddess spreads her sable wings. The virgin's fears decay, and courage springs. The hour was come, when man's o'erlabored breast surceased its care, by downy sleep possessed. All things now hushed, Scylla, with silent tread, urged her approach to Nisus' royal bed. There of the fatal lock, a cursed theft. She her unwitting father's head bereft. In safe possession of her impious prey, out at a postern gate she takes her way. Emboldened by the merit of the deed. She traverses the adverse camp with speed. Till Minus' tent she reached, the righteous king. She thus bespoke. Who shivered at the thing. Behold the effect of love's resistless sway. I, Nisus' royal seed, to thee betray. My country and my gods. For this strange task. Minus, no other boon but thee I ask. This purple lock, a pledge of love, receive. No worthless present, since in it I give. My father's head. Moved at a crime so new. And with abhorrence filled, back Minus drew. Nor touched the unhallowed gift, but thus exclaimed. With mien indignant. And with eyes inflamed. Perdition seize thee, thou, thy kind's disgrace. May thy devoted carcass find no place. In earth, or air, or sea, by all outcast. 
shall minus, with so foul a monster, blast. His Cretan world, where cradled Jove was nursed. Forbid it, heaven, away, thou most accursed. And now Alcatho, its lord exchanged, was under minus domination ranged. While the most equal king his care applies. To curb the conquered, and new laws devise. The fleet, by his command, with hoisted sails. And ready oars, invites the murmuring gales. At length the Cretan hero anchor wait. Repaying with neglect the abandoned maid. Deaf to her cries, he furrows up the main. In vain she prays, solicits him in vain. And now she furious grows, in wild despair. She wrings her hands and throws aloft her hair. Where runst thou? Thus she vents her deep distress. Why shunst thou her that crowned thee with success? Her whose fond love to thee could sacrifice. Her country and her parent, sacred ties. Can nor my love, nor proffered presence, find. A passage to thy heart, and make thee kind? Can nothing move thy pity? O oh, ingrate! Canst thou behold my lost, forlorn estate? And not be softened? Canst thou throw off one? Who has no refuge left but thee alone? Where shall I seek for comfort? Whither fly? My native country does in ashes lie. Or were, t not so, my treason bars me there. And bids me wander. Shall I next repair? To a wronged father, by my guilt undone? Me all mankind deservedly will shun. I out of all the world myself have thrown. To purchase an access to Crete alone. Which, since refused, ungenerous man, give o'er. To boast thy race. Europa never bore. A thing so savage, thee some tigress bred. On the bleak Syrt's inhospitable bed. Or where Charybdis pours its rapid tide. Tempestuous. Thou art not to Jove allied. Nor did the king of gods thy mother meet. Beneath a bull's forged shape, and bear to Crete. That fable of thy glorious birth is feigned. Some wild outrageous bull thy dam sustained. O, oh, Father Nisus, now my death behold. Exult, O city, by my baseness sold. Minus, obdurate, has avenged ye all. But, twas more just by those I wronged to fall. For why shouldst thou, who only didst subdue? By my offending, my offense pursue? Well art thou matched to one whose amorous flame. Too fiercely raged for humankind to tame. One who, within a wooden heifer thrust, courted a lowing bull's mistaken lust, and from whose monster teeming womb the earth, received, what much it mourned, a biform birth. But what avail my plaints? The whistling wind, which bears him far away, leaves them behind. Well wait Pasiphae, when she preferred, a bull to thee, more brutish than the herd. But ah! Time presses, and the labor doors. To distance drive the fleet, and lose the lessening shores. Think not, ungrateful man, the liquid way. And threatening billows shall enforce my stay. I'll follow thee in spite, my arms I'll throw. Around thy oars, or grasp thy crooked prow. And drag through drenching seas. Her eager tongue. Had hardly closed the speech, when forth she sprung. And proved the deep. Cupid, with added force. Recruits each nerve, and aids her watery course. Soon she the ship attains, unwelcome guest. And as with close embrace its sides she pressed. A hawk from upper air came pouring down. Twas Nisus cleft the sky with wings new grown. At Scylla's head his horny bill he aims. She, fearful of the blow, the ship disclaims. Quitting her hold, and yet she fell not far. But, wondering, finds herself sustained in air. Changed to a lark, she modeled pinions shook. And, from the ravished lock, the name of Ceres took. The Labyrinth Theseus destroys the Minotaur by the aid of Ariadne, 
who conducts the hero through the windings of the labyrinth, her kindness is ill requited by her lover. Who cruelly deserts her in the Isle of Dias, where she is discovered by Bacchus, who makes her his wife, and presents her with a splendid crown, which is afterward made a constellation. Now Minos, landed on the Cretan shore, performs his vows to Jove's protecting power. A hundred bullocks, of the largest breed, with flowerets crowned, before his altar bleed, while trophies of the vanquished, brought from far, adorn the palace with the spoils of war. Meanwhile the monster of a human beast, his family's reproach and stain increased. His double kind the rumor swiftly spread, and evidenced the mother's beastly deed. When Minos, willing to conceal the shame, that sprung from the reports of tattling fame, resolves a dark enclosure to provide, and far from sight the two-formed creature hide. Great Daedalus of Athens was the man that made the draft and formed the wondrous plan, where rooms within themselves encircled lie with various windings, to deceive the eye. As soft meanders wanton current plays, when through the Phrygian fields it loosely strays, backward and forward rolls the dimpled tide, seeming at once two different ways to glide, while circling streams their former bank survey, and waters past succeeding waters see, now floating to the sea with downward course, now pointing upward to its ancient source. Such was the work, so intricate the place, that scarce the workman all its turns could trace. And Daedalus was puzzled how to find the secret ways of what himself designed. These private walls the Minotaur include, who twice was glutted with Athenian blood. But the third tribute more successful proved, slew the foul monster, and the plague removed. When Theseus, aided by the virgin's art, had traced the guiding thread through every part. He took the gentle maid that set him free, and, bound for Dias, cut the briny sea. There, quickly cloyed, ungrateful, and unkind, left his fair consort in the isle behind. Whom Bacchus sees and loves, decrees the dame, shall shine for ever in the rolls of fame, and bids her crown among the stars be placed with an eternal constellation graced. The golden circle mounts, and, as it flies, its diamonds twinkle in the distant skies. There, in their pristine form, the gemmy rays, between Alcides and the dragon blaze. Story of Daedalus and Icarus Daedalus, accompanied by his son Icarus, affects his escape from the custody of Minos by the aid of wings compacted with wax, the heat of the sun melts tie pinions of the youth, who mounts too high, and he is precipitated into the sea. While the father arrives in Sicily, where he is kindly received by the king of that country. In tedious exile now too long detained. Daedalus languished for his native land. The sea foreclosed his flight, yet thus he said. Though earth and water in subjection laid. O cruel Minos, thy dominion be. We'll go through air, for sure the air is free. Then to new arts his cunning thought applies. And to improve the work of nature tries. A row of quills in gradual order placed. Rise by degrees in length from first to last. As on a cliff the ascending thicket grows. Or different reeds the rural pipe compose. Along the middle runs a twine of flax. The bottom stems are joined by pliant wax. Thus, well compact, a hollow bending brings the fine composure into real wings. His boy, young Icarus, that near him stood, unthinking of his fate, with smiles pursued the floating feathers which the moving air bore loosely from the ground and wafted here and there, or with the wax impertinently played. And, with his childish tricks, the great design delayed. The final masterstroke at last imposed. And now the neat machine completely closed. Fitting his pinions on, a flight he tries. And hung, self-balanced, in the beaten skies. 
then thus instructs his child, My boy, take care. To wing your course along the middle air. If low, the surges wet your flagging plumes. If high, the sun the melting wax consumes. Steer between both, nor to the northern skies. Nor south Orion, turn your giddy eyes. But follow me, let me before you lay. Rules for the flight, and mark the pathless way. Then, teaching, with a fond concern, his son. He took the untried wings and fixed them on. But fixed with trembling hands. And, as he speaks, the tears roll gently down his aged cheeks. Then kissed, and in his arms embraced him fast. But knew not this embrace must be the last. And, mounting upward, as he wings his flight, back on his charge he turns his aching sight. As parent birds, when first their callow care, leave the high nest to tempt the liquid air. Then cheers him on, and oft, with fatal art, reminds the stripling to perform his part. These, as the angler at the silent brook, or mountain shepherd leaning on his crook, or gaping plowman, from the veil descries. They stare and view them with religious eyes, and straight conclude them gods, since none but they, through their own azure skies could find a way. Now Delos, Paros, on the left are seen, and Samos, favored by Jove's haughty queen. Upon the right, the Isle Labynthos named, and fair Callum, for its honey famed. When now the boy, whose childish thoughts aspire, to loftier aims, and make him ramble higher, grown wild and wanton, more emboldened, flies, far from his guide, and soars among the skies. The softening wax, that felt a nearer sun, dissolved apace, and soon began to run. The youth in vain his melting pinions shakes. His feathers gone, no longer air he takes. Oh! Father, father! As he strove to cry, down to the sea he tumbled from on high, and found his fate, yet still subsists by fame. Among those waters that retain his name. The father, now no more a father, cries. Ho, Icarus! Where are you, as he flies? Where shall I seek my boy, he cries again. And saw his feathers scattered on the main. Then cursed his art, and funeral rites conferred. Naming the country from the youth interred. A partridge, from a neighboring stump, beheld. The sire his monumental marble build. Who, with peculiar call and fluttering wing, chirped joyful, and malicious seemed to sing. The only bird of all its kind, and late, transformed in pity to a feathered state. From whence, deadless, thy guilt we date. His sister's son, when not twelve years were past, was, with his uncle, as a scholar placed. The unsuspecting mother saw his parts. And genius fitted for the finest arts. This soon appeared, for when the spiny bone. In fish's backs was by the stripling known. A rare invention thence he learned to draw. Filed teeth in iron, and made the grating saw. He was the first, that from a knob of brass. Made two straight arms with widening stretch to pass. That, while one stood upon the center's place. The other rounded drew a circling space. Deadless envied this, and from the top. Of fair Minerva's temple let him drop. Feigning, that, as he leaned upon the tower. Careless he stooped too much, and tumbled o'er. The goddess, who the ingenious still befriends. On this occasion her assistance lends. His arms with feathers, as he fell, she veils. And in the air a new-made bird he sails. The quickness of his genius, once so fleet. Still in his wings remains, and in his feet. Still, though transformed, his ancient name he keeps. And with low flight the new-shorn stubble sweeps. Declines the lofty trees. And thinks it best. To brood in hedgerows o'er its humble nest. And, in remembrance of the former ill. 
avoids the heights and precipices still. At length, fatigued with long laborious flights. On fair Cecilia's plains the artist lights. Where Cocculus, the king, that gave him aid. Was, for his kindness, with esteem repaid. Athens no more her doleful tribute sent. That hardship gallant Theseus did prevent. Their temples hung with garlands, they adore. Each friendly god, but most Minerva's power. To her, to Jove, to all, their altars smoke. They each with victims and perfumes invoke. Now talking fame, through every Grecian town. Had spread, immortal Theseus, thy renown. From him, the neighboring nations, in distress. In suppliant terms implore a kind redress. Story of Meleager and Atlanta Meleager, the son of Enus, king of Aetolia, destroys a frightful boar, which desolates the whole country by the command of Diana. As a punishment for the neglect of her worship, the conqueror bestows the head and skin of the animal on Atlanta. Who first wounded it, this partiality inflames the resentment of the uncles of the youth, who endeavor to rob the heroine of her honorable present. And are killed by their nephew in the attempt, Althea, the mother of Meleager, no sooner hears this intelligence, than she snatches a brand, on which the life of her son is said to depend. Who expires as soon as it is consumed, the daughters of Althea, while bewailing the fate of their brother, are changed into birds. From him the Caledonians sought relief. Though valiant Meligris was their chief. The cause, a boar, which ravaged far and near. Of Cynthia's wrath the avenging minister. For Enus, with autumnal plenty blessed. By gifts to heaven his gratitude expressed. Culled sheafs to Ceres, to Laeus wine. To pan and pails offered sheep and kine. And fat of olives to Minerva's shrine. Beginning from the rural gods, his hand. Was liberal to the powers of high command. Each deity in every kind was blessed. Till at Diana's fane the invidious honor ceased. Wrath touches Evan the gods, the queen of night. Fired with disdain, and jealous of her right. Unhonored though I am, at least, said she. Not unrevenged that impious act shall be. Swift as the word, she sped the boar away. With charge on those devoted fields to pray. No larger bulls the Egyptian pastures feed. And none so large Sicilian meadows breed. His eyeballs glare with fire suffused with blood. His neck shoots up a thick-set thorny wood. His bristled back a trench impaled appears. And stands erected, like a field of spears. Froth fills his chaps, he sends a grunting sound. And part he churns, and part befoams the ground. For tusks with Indian elephants he strove. And Jove's own thunder from his mouth he drove. He burns the leaves, the scorching blast invades. The tender corn, and shrivels up the blades. Or suffering not their yellow beards to rear. He tramples down the spikes, and intercepts the year. In vain the barns expect their promised load. Nor barns at home, nor ricks are heaped abroad. In vain the hinds the thrashing floor prepare. And exercise their flails in empty air. With olives ever green the ground is strewed. And grapes ungathered shed their generous blood. Amid the fold he rages, nor the sheep. Their shepherds, nor the grooms their bulls can keep. From fields to walls the fright rabble run. Nor think themselves secure, within the town. Till Meligris, and his chosen crew. Contemn the danger, and the praise pursue. Fair Leda's twins, in time to stars decreed. One fought on foot, one curbed the fiery steed. Then issued forth famed Jason after these. Who manned the foremost ship that sailed the seas. Then Theseus joined with bold Pyrithoas came. A single concord in a double name. The Thestion sons, Idas, who swiftly ran. And Cenius, once a woman, now a man. Lynceus, with eagle's eyes and lion's heart. Lucipus, with his never-erring dart. 
Acastus, Phileus, Phoenix, Telamon. Echion, Lelix, and Eurition. Achilles' father, and great Phocus' son. Dryas the fierce, and Hippasus the strong. With twice old Iolas, and Nestor, then but young. Laertes active, and Anceus bold. Mopsus, the sage, who future things foretold. And the other seer, too yet by his wife unsold. A thousand others of immortal fame. Among the rest fair Atlanta came. Grace of the woods, a diamond buckle bound. Her vest behind, that else had flowed upon the ground. And showed her buskined legs. Her head was bare. But for her native ornament of hair. Which in a simple knot was tied above. Sweet negligence. Unheeded bait of love. Her sounding quiver on her shoulder tied. One hand a dart, and one a bow supplied. Such was her face, as in a nymph displayed. A fair fierce boy, or in a boy betrayed. The blushing beauties of a modest maid. The Caledonian chief at once the dame. Beheld, at once his heart received the flame. With heavens averse. Oh, happy youth, he cried. For whom thy fates reserve so fair a bride. He sighed, and had no leisure more to say. His honor called his eyes another way. And forced him to pursue the now neglected prey. There stood a forest on a mountain's brow. Which overlooked the shaded plains below. No sounding axe presumed those trees to bite. Coeval with the world, a venerable sight. The heroes there arrived, some spread around. The toils, some searched the footsteps on the ground. Some from the chains the faithful dogs unbound. Of action eager, and intent in thought. The chiefs their honorable danger sought. A valley stood below, the common drain. Of waters from above, and falling rain. The bottom was a moist and marshy ground. Whose edges were with bending osiers crowned. The knotty bulrush next in order stood. And all within of reeds a trembling wood. From hence the boar was roused, and sprung amain. Like lightning sudden on the warrior train. Beats down the trees before him, shakes the ground. The forest echoes to the crackling sound. Shout the fierce youth, and clamors ring around. All stood with their protended spears prepared. With broad steel heads the brandished weapons glared. The beast impetuous, with his tusks, aside. Deals glancing wounds, the fearful dogs divide. All spend their mouths aloof, but none abide. Echion threw the first, but missed his mark. And stuck his boar spear on a maple's bark. Then Jason, and his javelin seemed to take. But failed with overforce, and whizzed above his back. Mopsus was next, but, ere he threw, addressed. To Phoebus thus, O patron, help thy priest. If I adore, and ever have adored. Thy power divine, thy present aid afford. That I may reach the beast. The god allowed. His prayer, and, smiling, gave him what he could. He reached the savage, but no blood he drew. Dien unarmed the javelin as it flew. This chafed the boar, his nostrils flames expire. And his red eyeballs roll with living fire. Whirled from a sling, or from an engine thrown. Amid her foes, so flies a mighty stone. As flew the beast, the left wing put to flight. The chief's oerborn, he rushes on the right. Empalamos and Pelagon he laid. In dust, and next to death, but for their fellow's aid. One Zymus fared worse, prepared to fly. The fatal fong drove deep within his thigh. And cut the nerves, the nerves no more sustain. The bulk. The bulk, unpropped, falls headlong on the plain. Nestor had failed the fall of Troy to see. But, leaning on his lance, he vaulted on a tree. Then, gathering up his feet, looked down with fear. And thought his monstrous foe was still too near. Against a stump his tusk the monster grinds. 
and in the sharpened edge new vigor finds. Then, trusting to his arms, young Othries found. And ranched his hips with one continued wound. Now Leda's twins, the future stars, appear. White were their habits. White their horses were. Conspicuous both, and both in act to throw. Their trembling lances brandished at the foe. Nor had they missed, but he to thickets fled. Concealed from aiming spears. Not pervious to the steed. But Telamon rushed in, and happed to meet. A rising root, that held his fastened feet. So down he fell, whom, sprawling on the ground. His brother from the wooden jives unbound. Meantime the virgin huntress was not slow. To expel the shaft from her contracted bow. Beneath his car the fastened arrow stood. And from the wound appeared the trickling blood. She blushed for joy, but Maligris raised. His voice with loud applause, and the fair archer praised. He was the first to see, and first to show. His friends the mark of the successful blow. Nor shall thy valor want the praises due. He said, a virtuous envy seized the crew. They shout, the shouting animates their hearts. And all at once employ their thronging darts. But, out of order thrown, in air they join. And multitude makes frustrate the design. With both his hands, the proud Ancius takes. And flourishes his double-biting axe. Then, forward to his fate, he took a stride. Before the rest, and to his fellows cried. Give place, and mark the difference, if you can. Between a woman warrior and a man. The boar is doomed, nor, though Diana lend. Her aid, Diana can her beast defend. Thus boasted he, then, stretched on tiptoe stood. Secure, to make his promise good. But the more wary beast prevents the blow. And upward rips the groin of his audacious foe. And Seus falls, his bowels, from the wound. Rush out, and clotted blood disdains the ground. Perithous, no small portion of the war. Pressed on, and shook his lance, to whom, from far. Thus Theseus cried, O oh, stay! My better part. My more than mistress, of my heart the heart. The strong may fight aloof, and Seus tried. His force too near, and, by presuming, died. He said, and, while he spake, his javelin threw. Hissing in air the unerring weapon flew. But on an arm of oak, that stood betwixt. The marksman and the mark, his lance he fixed. Once more bold Jason threw, but failed to wound. The boar, and slew an undeserving hound. And through the dog the dart was nailed to ground. Two spears from Meliagor's hand were sent. With equal force, but various in the event. The first was fixed in earth, the second stood. On the boar's bristled back, and deeply drank his blood. Now, while the tortured savage turns around. And flings about his foam, impatient of the wound. The wound's great author, close at hand, provokes. His rage. And plies him with redoubled strokes. Wheels as he wheels, and, with his pointed dart. Explores the nearest passage to his heart. Quick, and more quick, he spins in giddy gyres. Then falls, and in much foam his soul expires. This act, with shouts heaven high, the friendly band. Applaud, and strain in there's the victor's hand. Then all approach the slain, with vast surprise. Admire on what a breadth of earth he lies. And, scarce secure, reach out their spears afar. And blood their points to prove their partnership of war. But he, the conquering chief, his foot impressed. On the strong neck of that destructive beast. And gazing on the nymph with ardent eyes. Accept, said he, fair Nonacrin, my prize. And, though inferior, suffer me to join. My labors, and my part of praise, with thine. At this, presents her with the tusky head. And chine, with rising bristles roughly spread. Glad she received the gift, 
and seem to take. With double pleasure, for the giver's sake. The rest were seized with sullen discontent. And a deep murmur through the squadron went. All envied, but the Thestion brethren showed. The least respect, and thus they vent their spleen aloud. Lay down those honored spoils, nor think to share. Weak woman as thou art. The prize of war. Ours is the title, thine a foreign claim. Since Meligris from our lineage came. Trust not thy beauty, but restore the prize. Which he, besotted on that face and eyes. Would rend from us. At this, inflamed with spite. From her they snatched the gift, from him the giver's right. But soon the impatient prince his falchion drew. And cried, Ye robbers of another's due. Now learn the difference, at your proper cost. Betwixt true valor and an empty boast. At this advanced, and, sudden as the word. In proud Plexippus' bosom plunged the sword. Toxius amazed, and with amazement slow. Or to revenge, or ward the coming blow. Stood doubting, and, while doubting thus he stood. Received the steel bathed in his brother's blood. Pleased with the first, unknown the second, news. Althea to the temples pays their dues. For her son's conquest, when, at length. Appear. Her grisly brethren stretched upon the bier. Pale at the sudden sight, she changed her cheer. And with her cheer her robes. But hearing tell. The cause, the manner, and by whom they fell. Twas grief no more, or grief and rage were one. Within her soul, at last, twas rage alone. Which, burning upwards in succession, dries. The tears, that stood considering in her eyes. There lay a log unlighted on the hearth. When she was labouring in the throes of birth. For the unborn chief, the fatal sisters came. And raised it up, and tossed it on the flame. Then on the rock a scanty measure place. A vital flax, and turned the wheel apace. And, turning, sung, to this red brand and thee. O, oh, newborn babe! We give an equal destiny. So vanished out of view. The fright dame. Sprung hasty from her bed, and quenched the flame. The log, in secret locked, she kept with care. And that, while thus preserved, preserved her air. This brand she now produced, and first she strows. The hearth with heaps of chips, and after blows. Thrice heaved her hand, and heaved, she thrice repressed. The sister and the mother long contest. Two doubtful titles in one tender breast. And now her eyes and cheeks with fury glow. Now pale her cheeks, her eyes with pity flow. Now lowering looks presage approaching storms. And now prevailing love her face reforms. Resolved, she doubts again, the tears she dried. With burning rage, are by new tears supplied. And, as a ship, which winds and waves assail. Now with the current drives, now with the gale. Both opposite, and neither long prevail. She feels a double force, by turns obeys. The imperious tempest, and the impetuous seas. So fares Althea's mind. She first relents. With pity, of that pity then repents. Sister and mother long the scales divide. But the beam nodded on the sister's side. Sometimes she softly sight. Then roared aloud. But sighs were stifled in the cries of blood. The pious impious wretch at length decreed. To please her brother's ghosts, her son should bleed. And when the funeral flames began to rise. Receive, she said, a sister's sacrifice. A mother's bowels burn high in her hand. Thus while she spoke, she held the fatal brand. Then thrice before the kindled pile she bowed. And the three furies thrice invoked aloud. Come, come, revenging sisters, come and view. A sister paying her dead brother's due. A crime I punish, and a crime commit. But blood for blood, and death for death, 
is fit. Great crimes must be with greater crimes repaid. And second funerals on the former laid. Let the whole household in one ruin fall. And may Diana's curse o'ertake us all. Shall fate to happy and you still allow. One son, while Thestia stands deprived of two. Better three lost than one unpunished go. Take then, dear ghosts, while yet admitted new. In hell you wait my duty, take your due. A costly offering on your tomb is laid. When, with my blood, the price of yours is paid. Ah! Whither am I hurried? Ah! Forgive! Ye shades, and let your sister's issue live. A mother cannot give him death, though he deserves it, he deserves it not from me. Then shall the unpunished wretch insult the slain. Triumphant live, nor only live, but reign. While you, thin shades, the sport of winds, are tossed. O'er dreary plains, or tread the burning coast. I cannot, cannot bear, tis past, tis done. Perish this impious, this detested son. Perish his sire, and perish I withal. And let the house's heir and the hoped kingdom fall. Where is the mother fled, her pious love? And where the pains, with which ten months I strove? Ah! Hadst thou died, my son, in infant years. Thy little hearse had been bedewed with tears. Thou livest by me, to me thy breath resign. Mine is the merit, the demerit thine. Thy life, by double title, I require. Once given at birth, and once preserved from fire. One murder pay, or add one murder more. And me to them, who fell by thee, restore. I would, but cannot, my son's image stands. Before my sight, and now their angry hands. My brothers hold, and vengeance these exact. This pleads compassion, and repents the fact. He pleads in vain, and I pronounce his doom. My brothers, though unjustly, shall o'ercome. But having paid their injured ghosts their due. My son requires my death, and mine shall his pursue. At this, for the last time, she lifts her hand. Averts her eyes, and, half unwilling, drops the brand. The brand, amid the flaming fuel thrown. Or drew, or seemed to draw, a dying groan. The fires themselves but faintly licked their prey. Then loathed their impious food, and would have shrunk away. Just then the hero cast a doleful cry. And in those absent flames began to fry. The blind contagion raged within his veins. But he with manly patience bore his pains. He feared not fate, but only grieved to die. Without an honest wound, and by a death so dry. Happy Anseus, thrice aloud he cried. With what becoming fate in arms he died. Then called his brothers, sisters, sire, around. And her to whom his nuptial vows were bound. Perhaps his mother, a long sigh he drew. And, his voice failing, took his last adieu. For as the flames augment, and as they stay. At their full height, then languish to decay. They rise and sink by fits, at last they soar. In one bright blaze, and then descend no more. Just so his inward heats, at height, impair. Till the last burning breath shoots out the soul in air. Now lofty Caledon in ruins lies. All ages, all degrees, unsluss their eyes. And heaven and earth resound with murmurs, groans, and cries. Matrons and maidens beat their breasts, and tear their habits, and root up their scattered hair. The wretched father, father now no more, with sorrow sunk, lies prostrate on the floor, deforms his hoary locks with dust obscene, and curses age, and loathes a life prolonged with pain. By steel her stubborn soul his mother freed, and punished on herself her impious deed. Had I a hundred tongues, a wit so large, as could their hundred offices discharge. Had Phoebus all his helicon bestowed, in all the streams, inspiring all the god, 
those tongues. That wit, those streams, that God in vain would offer to describe his sister's pain. They beat their breasts with many a bruising blow. Till they turn livid, and corrupt the snow. The corpse they cherish, while the corpse remains. And exercise and rub, with fruitless pains. And when to funeral flames, tis borne away. They kiss the bed on which the body lay. And when those funeral flames no longer burn. The dust composed within a pious urn. Evan in that urn their brother they confess. And hug it in their arms, and to their bosoms press. His tomb is raised, then, stretched along the ground. Those living monuments his tomb surround. Evan to his name, inscribed, their tears they pay. Till tears and kisses wear his name away. But Cynthia now had all her fury spent. Not with less ruin than a race content. Excepting Gorge, perished all the seed. And her three whom heaven for Hercules decreed. Satiate at last, no longer she pursued. The weeping sisters, but with wings endued. And horny beaks, and sent to flit in air. Who, yearly, round the tomb in feathered flocks repair. Transformation of the Naiads. The river Achilles, displeased at the neglect of the Naiads converts them into the islands called Echinides. Theseus, meanwhile, acquitting well his share. In the bold chase, confederate like a war. To Athens' lofty towers his march ordained. By Pallas loved, and where Erechtheus reigned. But Achilles stopped him on the way. By reigns a deluge, and constrained his stay. O oh, famed for glorious deeds, and great by blood. Rest here, says he, nor trust the rapid flood. Its solid oaks has from its margin tore. And rocky fragments down its current bore. The murmur hoarse, and terrible the roar. Oft have I seen herds, with their sheltering fold. Forced from the banks, and in the torrent rolled. Nor strength the bulky steer from ruin freed. Nor matchless swiftness saved the racing steed. In cataracts, when the dissolving snow Falls from the hills and floods the plains below. Tossed by the eddies, with a giddy round. Strong youths are in the sucking whirlpools drowned. Tis best with me in safety to abide. Till usual bounds restrain the ebbing tide. And the low waters in their channel glide. Theseus, persuaded, in compliance bowed. So kind an offer, and advice so good. O oh, Achilles! Cannot be refused. I'll use them both, said he. And both he used. The grot he entered, pumice built the hall. And Tophi made the rustic of the wall. The floor, soft moss a humid carpet spread. And various shells the checkered roof inlaid. Twas now the hour when the declining sun. Two-thirds had of his daily journey run. At the spread table Theseus took his place. Next his companions in the daring chase. Perithous here, their elder Lelix lay. His locks betraying age with sprinkled gray. Acarnia's river god disposed the rest. Graced with the equal honor of the feast. Elate with joy, and proud of such a guest. The nymphs were waiters, and, with naked feet. In order served the courses of the meat. The banquet done, delicious wine they brought. Of one transparent gem the cup was wrought. Then the great hero of this gallant train. Surveying far the prospect of the main. What is that land, says he, the waves embrace. And with his finger pointed at the place. Is it one parted isle, which stands alone? How named? And yet, methinks, it seems not one. To whom the watery god made this reply. Tis not one isle, but five. Distinct they lie. Tis distance which deceives the cheated eye. But, that Diana's act may seem less strange. These once proud naiads were, before their change. Twas on a day more solemn than the rest. Ten bullocks slain. A sacrificial feast. The rural gods of all the regions near. 
They bid to dance and taste the hallowed cheer. Me they forgot. Affronted with the slight. My rage and stream swelled to the greatest height. And with the torrent of my flooding store. Large woods from woods, and fields from fields, I tore. The guilty nymphs, oh, then remembering me. I, with their country. Washed into the sea. And joining waters with the social main. Rent the gross land, and split the firm champagne. Since, the Iconides, remote from shore, are viewed as many isles as nymphs before. Paramil turned into an island. The nymph Paramil suffers violence from the river god Achilles, and is cast into the sea by her enraged father, Neptune, in compassion. Converts her into a rock. But yonder far, lo! Yonder does appear. An isle, apart to me forever dear. From that, it sailors paramil name. I doting, forced, by strength, a virgin's fame. Hippotamus' passion grew so strong. Galled with the abuse, and fretted at the wrong. He cast his pregnant daughter from a rock. I spread my waves beneath and broke the shock. And, as her swimming weight my stream conveyed. I sued for help divine, and thus I prayed. O powerful thou! whose trident does command. The realm of waters, which surround the land. We sacred rivers, where so are begun. End in thy lot, and to thy empire run. With favor here, and help with present aid. Her whom I bear, t'was guilty I betrayed. Yet, if her father had been just or mild, he would have been less impious to his child. In her, have pitted force in the abuse. In me, admitted love for my excuse. Oh let relief for her hard case be found. Her, whom paternal rage expelled from ground. Her, whom paternal rage relentless drowned. Grant her some place, or change her to a place. Which I may ever clasp with my embrace. His nodding head the sea's great ruler bent. And all his waters shook with his ascent. The nymph still swam, though with the fright distressed. I felt her heart leap trembling in her breast. But, hardening soon, while I her pulse explore. A crust encased her stiff body o'er. And, as accretions of new cleaving soil. Enlarged the mass, the nymph became an isle. Story of Bossus and Philemon. Jupiter and Mercury, while traveling in disguise, arrive at the cottage of an aged pair, who entertain their guests with unaffected hospitality which is amply requited by the transformation of their humble dwelling into a magnificent temple, of which they are appointed the priests, after living to an extreme age. They expire at the same time, and their bodies are changed into trees. Thus Achilles ends. His audience here. With admiration, and, admiring, fear. The powers of heaven, except Ixion's son. Who laughed at all the gods, believed in none. He shook his impious head. And thus replies. These legends are no more than pious lies. You attribute too much to heavenly sway. To think they gave us forms, and take away. The rest, of better minds, their sense declared. Against this doctrine, and with horror heard. Then Lelix rose, an old experienced man. And thus, with sober gravity, began. Heaven's power is infinite, earth, air, and sea. The manufacture mass. The making power obey. By proof to clear your doubt. In Phrygian ground. Two neighboring trees, with walls encompassed round. Stand on a moderate rise, with wonder shown. One a hard oak, a softer linden one. I saw the place, and them. By Pythius sent to Phrygian realms. My grandsire's government. Not far from thence is seen a lake, the haunt. Of coots, and of the fishing cormorant. Here Jove with Hermes came. But in disguise. Of mortal men concealed their deities. One laid aside his thunder, one his rod. And many toilsome steps together trod. 
for harbor at a thousand doors they knocked. Not one of all the thousand but was locked. At last a hospitable house they found. A homely shed, the roof, not far from ground. Was thatched, with reeds and straw together bound. Their bosses and Philemon lived, and there. Had lived long married, and a happy pair. Now old in love, though little was their store. Inured to want, their poverty they bore. Nor aimed at wealth, professing to be poor. For master or for servant here to call. Were all alike, where only two were all. Command was none, where equal love was paid. Or rather both commanded, both obeyed. From lofty roofs the gods repulsed before. Now stooping, entered through the little door. The man, their hearty welcome first expressed. A common settle drew for either guest. Inviting each his weary limbs to rest. But ere they sat, officious bosses lays. Two cushions stuffed with straw, the seat to raise. Coarse, but the best she had. Then rakes the load. Of ashes from the hearth, and spreads abroad. The living coals, and, lest they should expire. With leaves and bark she feeds her infant fire. It smokes. And then with trembling breath she blows. Till in a cheerful blaze the flames arose. With brushwood and with chips she strengthens these. And adds at last the boughs of rotten trees. The fire thus formed, she sets the kettle on. Like burnished gold the little seether shone. Next took the colworts which her husband got. From his own ground, a small, well-watered spot. She stripped the stalks of all their leaves. The best. She culled, and them with handy care she dressed. High o'er the hearth a chine of bacon hung. Good old Philemon seized it with a prong. And from the sooty rafter drew it down. Then cut a slice, but scarce enough for one. Yet a large portion of a little store. Which for their sakes alone he wished were more. This in the pot he plunged without delay. To tame the flesh, and drain the salt away. The time between, before the fire they sat. And shortened the delay by pleasing chat. A beam there was, on which a beechen pale. Hung by the handle, on a driven nail. This filled with water, gently warmed, they set. Before their guests. In this they bathed their feet. And after with clean towels dried their sweat. This done, the host produced the genial bed. Sallow the feet, the borders, and the stead. Which with no costly coverlet they spread. But coarse old garments. Yet such robes as these. They laid alone at feasts on holy days. The good old housewife, tucking up her gown. The table sets, the invited gods lie down. The trivet table of a foot was lame. A blot which prudent bosses overcame. Who thrust beneath the limping leg assured. So was the mended board exactly reared. Then rubbed it o'er with newly gathered mint. A wholesome herb, that breathed a grateful scent. Palace began the feast, where first was seen. The party-colored olive, black and green. Autumnal cornels next in order served. In lees of wine well pickled and preserved. A garden salad was the third supply. Of endive, radishes, and succory. Then curds and cream, the flower of country fair. And new laid eggs. Which bosses busy care. Turned by a gentle fire, and roasted rare. All these in earthenware were served to board. And, next in place, an earthen pitcher stored. With liquor of the best the cottage could afford. This was the table's ornament and pride. With figures wrought, like pages at his side. Stood beechen bowls, and these were shining clean. Varnished with wax without, and lined within. By this the boiling kettle had prepared. And to the table sent the smoking lard. On which with eager appetite they dine. A savory bit, that served to relish wine. The wine itself was suiting to the rest. Still working in the must, 
and lately pressed. The second course succeeds like that before. Plums, apples, nuts. And of their wintry store. Dry figs, and grapes, and wrinkled dates were set. In canisters, to enlarge the little treat. All these a milk-white honeycomb surround. Which in the midst the country banquet crowned. But the kind hosts their entertainment grace. With hearty welcome, and an open face. In all they did. You might discern with ease. A willing mind, and a desire to please. Meantime the beech and bowls went round, and still. Though often emptied, were observed to fill. Filled without hands, and of their own accord. Ran without feet. And danced about the board. Devotion seized the pair, to see the feast. With wine, and of no common grape, increased. And up they held their hands, and fell to pray are. Excusing, as they could, their country fare. One goose they had, t'was all they could allow. A wakeful sentry, and on duty now. Whom to the gods for sacrifice they vow. Her with malicious zeal the couple viewed. She ran for life, and limping they pursued. Full well the fowl perceived their bad intent. And would not make her master's compliment. But persecuted, to the powers she flies. And close between the legs of Jove she lies. He with a gracious ear the suppliant heard. And saved her life. Then what he has declared. And owned the god. The neighborhood, said he. Shall justly perish for impiety. You stand alone exempted. But obey. With speed, and follow where we lead the way. Leave these accursed, and to the mountain's height. Ascend, nor once look backward in your flight. They haste, and what their tardy feet denied. The trusty staff, their better leg, supplied. An arrow's flight they wanted to the top. And they're secure, but spent with travel, stop. Then turn their now no more forbidden eyes. Lost in a lake the floated level lies. A watery desert covers all the plains. Their cot alone, as in an isle, remains. Wondering, with weeping eyes, while they deplore. Their neighbor's fate, and country now no more. Their little shed, scarce large enough for two. Seems, from the ground increased, in height and bulk to grow. A stately temple shoots within the skies. The crotches of their cot in columns rise. The pavement polished marble they behold. The gates with sculpture graced, the spires and tiles of gold. Then thus the sire of gods, with look serene. Speak thy desire, thou only just of men. And thou, O woman, only worthy found. To be with such a man in marriage bound. A hey, while they whisper. Then to Jove addressed. Philemon thus prefers their joint request. We crave to serve before your sacred shrine. And offer at your altar rites divine. And since not any action of our life. Has been polluted with domestic strife. We beg one hour of death. That neither she. With widow's tears may live to bury me. Nor weeping I, with withered arms, may bear. My breathless bosses to the sepulchre. The god had signed their suit. They run the race. In the same tenor all the appointed space. Then, when their hour was come, while they relate. These past adventures at the temple gate. Old bosses is by old Philemon seen. Sprouting with sudden leaves of sprightly green. Old bosses looked where old Philemon stood. And saw his lengthened arms a sprouting wood. New roots their fastened feet begin to bind. Their bodies stiffen in a rising rind. Then, ere the bark above their shoulders grew. They give and take at once their last adieu. At once farewell, O faithful spouse, they said. At once the encroaching rinds their closing lips invade. Even yet, an ancient Tyanean shows. A spreading oak, that near a linden grows. The neighborhood confirm the prodigy. Grave men, not vain of tongue, 
or like to lie. I saw myself the garlands on their boughs. And tablets hung for gifts of granted vows. And offering fresher up, with pious prayer. The good, said I, are God's peculiar care. And such as honor heaven shall heavenly honor share. Changes of Proteus Achilles relates to his guest the various transformations of Proteus. He ceased in his relation to proceed. While all admired the author and the deed. But Theseus most, inquisitive to know. From gods what wondrous alterations grow. Whom thus the Caledonian stream addressed. Raised high to speak, the couch his elbow pressed. Some, when transformed, fix in the lasting change. Some, with more right, through various figures range. Proteus, thus large thy privilege was found. Thou inmate of the seas, which earth surround. Sometimes a blooming youth you graced the shore. Oft a fierce lion or a furious boar. With glistering spires now seemed a hissing snake. The bold would tremble in his hands to take. With horns assumed a bull. Sometimes you proved. A tree by roots, a stone by weight unmoved. Sometimes two wavering contraries became. Flowed down in water, or aspired in flame. Story of Erisichthon Erisichthon impiously derides the worship of Ceres, whose groves he destroys. In various shapes thus to deceive the eyes. Without a settled stint of her disguise. Rash Erisichthon's daughter had the power. And brought it to Autolycus in dower. Her atheist sire the slighted gods defied. And ritual honors to their shrines denied. As fame reports, his hand and axe sustained. Which Ceres consecrated grove profaned. Which durst the venerable gloom invade. And violate with light the awful shade. An ancient oak in the dark center stood. The covert's glory, and itself a wood. Garlands embraced its shaft, and from the boughs. Hung tablets, monuments of prosperous vows. In the cool dusk its unpierced verdure spread. The dryads off their hallowed dances led. And oft, when round their gauging arms they cast. Full fifteen ells it measured in the waist. Its height all under standards did surpass. As they aspired above the humbler grass. These motives, which would gentler minds restrain. Could not make Triope's bold son abstain. He sternly charged his slaves with strict decree. To fell with gashing steel the sacred tree. But while they, lingering, his commands delayed. He snatched an axe, and thus blaspheming said. Was this no oak, nor Ceres' favorite care? But Ceres' self, this arm, Unawed. Should dare. Its leafy honors in the dust to spread. And level with the earth its airy head. He spoke, and as he poised a slanting stroke. Sighs heaved, and trembling shook the fright oak. Its leaves looked sickly, pale its acorns grew. And its long branches sweat a chilly dew. But when his impious hand a wound bestowed. Blood from the mangled bark in currents flowed. When a devoted bull of mighty size. A sinning nation's grand atonement, dies. With such a plenty from the spouting veins. A crimson stream the turfy altar stains. The wonder all amazed, yet one more bold. The fact dissuading, strove his axe to hold. But the Thessalian, obstinately bent. Too proud to change, too hardened to repent. On his kind monitor his eyes, which burned. With rage. And with his eyes his weapon turned. Take the reward, says he, of pious dread. Then with a blow lopped off his parted head. No longer checked, the wretch his crime pursued. Doubled his strokes, and sacrilege renewed. When from the groaning trunk a voice was heard. A dryad I, by Ceres love preferred. Within the circle of this clasping rind. Coeval grew. And now in ruin joined. But instant vengeance shall thy sin pursue. And death is cheered with this prophetic view. 
At last the oak with cords enforced to bow. Strained from the top, and sapped with wounds below. The humbler wood, partaker of its fate. Crushed with its fall. And shivered with its weight. The grove destroyed, the sister dryads moan. Grieved at its loss, and fright at their own. Straight suppliants for revenge to Ceres go. In sable weeds, expressive of their wa. The beauteous goddess with a graceful air. Bowed in consent, and nodded to their prayer. The awful motion shook the fruitful ground. And waved the fields with golden harvests crowned. Soon she contrived in her projecting mind. A plague severe, and piteous in its kind. If plagues for crimes of such presumptuous height. Could pity in the softest breast create. With pinching want, and hunger's keenest smart. To tear his vitals, and corrode his heart. But since her near approach by fates denied. To famine, and broad climes their powers divide. A nymph, the mountain's ranger, she addressed. And, thus resolved. Her high commands expressed. Description of famine. The goddess afflicts Erisichthon with continual hunger. Where frozen Scythia's utmost bound is placed. A desert lies, a melancholy waste. In yellow crops their nature never smiled. No fruitful tree to shade the barren wild. Their sluggish cold its icy station makes. Their paleness frights, and anguish trembling shakes. Of pining famine this the fated seat. To whom my orders in these words repeat. Bid her this miscreant with her sharpest pains. Chastise, and sheath herself into his veins. Be unsubdued by plenty's baffled store. Reject my empire, and defeat my power. And lest the distance, and the tedious way. Should with the toil and long fatigue dismay. Ascend my chariot, and, conveyed on high. Guide the rain dragons through the parting sky. The nymph, accepting of the granted car. Sprung to the seat, and posted through the air. Nor stopped till she to a bleak mountain came. Of wondrous height, and Caucasus its name. There in a stony field the fiend she found. Herbs gnawing, and roots scratching from the ground. Her elf-lock hair in matted tresses grew. Sunk were her eyes, and pale her ghastly hue. Wan were her lips, and foul with clammy glue. Her throat was furred, her entral seen within. With snaky crawlings through her parchment skin. Her jutting hips seemed starting from their place. And for a stomach's was a belly's space. Her joints protuberant by leanness grown. Consumption sunk the flesh, and raised the bone. Her knees large orbits bunched to monstrous size and ankles to undue proportion rise. This plague the nymph, not daring to draw near. At distance hailed, and greeted from afar. And though she told her charge without delay, though her arrival late, and short her stay, she felt keen famine, or she seemed to feel. Invade her blood, and on her vitals steal. She turned, from the infection to remove and back to Thessaly the serpents drove. The fiend obeyed the goddess's command. Though their effects in opposition stand. She cut her way, supported by the wind. And reached the mansion by the nymph assigned. Twas night, when, entering Erisichthon's room. Dissolved in sleep, and thoughtless of his doom. She clasped his limbs, by impious labor tired. With battish wings but her whole self inspired. Breathed on his throat and chest a tainting blast. And in his veins infused an endless fast. The task dispatched, away the fury flies. From plenteous regions, and from ripening skies. To her old barren north she wings her speed. And cottages distressed with pinching need. Still slumbers Erisichthon's senses drown and soothe his fancy with their softest down. He dreams of viands delicate to eat, and revels on imaginary meat. Chews with his working mouth, but chews in vain, and tires his grinding teeth with fruitless pain. 
deludes his throat with visionary fare. Feasts on the wind, and banquets on the air. The morning came, the night and slumbers passed. But still the furious pangs of hunger last. The cankrouse rage still gnaws with griping pains. Stings in his throat, and in his bowels reigns. Straight he requires, impatient in demand. Provisions from the air, the seas, the land. But though the land, air, seas, provisions grant. Starves at full tables, and complains of want. What to a people might in dole be paid? Or vital cities for a long blockade? Could not one wolfish appetite assuage? For glutting nourishment increased its rage. As rivers poured from every distant shore. The sea insatiate drinks, and thirsts for more. Or as the fire, which all materials burns. And wasted forests into ashes turns. Grows more voracious as the more it preys. Recruits dilate the flame, and spread the blaze. So impious Erisichthon's hunger raves. Receives refreshments, and refreshments craves. Food raises a desire for food, and meat. Is but a new provocative to eat. He grows more empty, as the more supplied. An endless cramming but extends the void. Transformations of Erisichthon's daughter. Metra, the daughter of Erisichthon, uses her powers of transformation for the support of her father. Who at last devours his own flesh for want of food. Now riches hoarded by paternal care. Were sunk, the glutton swallowing up the air. Yet the devouring flame no stores abate. Nor less the hunger grew with his estate. One daughter left, as left his keen desire. A daughter worthy of a better sire. Her too he sold, spent nature to sustain. She scorned a lord with generous disdain. And flying, spread her hands upon the main. The god was moved at what the fair had sued. When she so lately by her master viewed. In her known figure, on a sudden took. A fisher's habit, and a manly look. To whom her owner hasted to inquire. O thou, said he, whose baits hide treacherous wire. Whose art can manage, and experienced skill. The taper angle, and the bobbing quill. So may the sea be ruffled with no storm. But smooth with calms, as you the truth inform. So your deceit may no shy fishes feel. Till struck, and fastened on the bearded steel. Did not you standing view upon the strand? A wandering maid? I'm sure I saw her stand. Her hair disordered, and her homely dress. Betrayed her want, and witnessed her distress. Me heedless, she replied, who are you are? Excuse, attentive to another care. I settled on the deep my steady eye. Fixed on my float, and bent on my employ. And that you may not doubt what I impart. So may the ocean's God assist my art. If on the beach since I my sport pursued. Or man or woman, but myself, I viewed. Back o'er the sands, deluded, he withdrew. While she for her old form put off her new. Her sire her shifting power to change perceived. And various chapmen by her sail deceived. A fowl with spangled plumes, a brined steer. Sometimes a crested mare, or antlered deer. Sold for a price, she parted, to maintain. Her starving parent with dishonest gain. At last all means, as all provisions, failed. For the disease by remedies prevailed. His muscles with a furious bite he tore. Gorged his own tattered flesh, and gulfed his gore. Wounds were his feast, his life to life a prey. Supporting nature by its own decay. But foreign stories why should I relate? I too myself can to new forms translate. Though the varieties not unconfined. But fixed in number, and restrained in kind. For often I this present shape retain. Oft curl a snake the volumes of my train. Sometimes my strength into my horns transferred. A bull I march, the captain of the herd. But while I once those goring weapons wore. 
vast resting force won from my forehead tore. Lo, my maimed brows the injury still own. He ceased, his words concluding with a groan. Book. Chapter 9. Story of Achilles and Hercules. Achilles relates to Theseus the contest between himself and Hercules for the hand of Degenira, who becomes the wife of the latter. Theseus requests the god to tell his woes. Whence his maimed brow, and whence his groans arose. When thus the Caledonian stream replied. With twining reeds his careless tresses tied. Ungrateful is the tale, for who can bear. When conquered, to rehearse the shameful war. Yet all the melancholy story trace. So great a conqueror softens the disgrace. Nor was it still so mean the prize to yield. As great and glorious to dispute the field. Perhaps you've heard of Degenira's name. For all the country spoke her beauty's fame. Long was the nymph by numerous suitors wooed. Each with address his envied hopes pursued. I joined the loving band to gain the fair. Revealed my passion to her father's ear. Their vain pretensions, all the rest resign. Alcides only strove to equal mine. He boasts his birth from Jove, recounts his spoils. His stepdames hate subdued, and finished toils. Can mortals then, said I, with gods compare? Behold a god. Mine is the watery care. Through your wide realms I take my mazy way. Branch into streams, and o'er the region stray. No foreign guest your daughter's charms adores. But one who rises in your native shores. Let not his punishment your pity move. Is Juno's hate an argument for love? Though you your life from fair Alcmena drew. Jove's a feigned father, or by fraud a true. Choose then, confess thy mother's honor lost. Or thy descent from Jove no longer boast. While thus I spoke, he looked with stern disdain. Nor could the sallies of his wrath restrain. Which thus break forth, this arm decides our right. Vanquished in words. Be mine the prize in fight. Bold he rushed on. My honor to maintain. I fling my verdant garments on the plain. My arms stretch forth, my pliant limbs prepare. And with bent hands expect the furious war. O'er my sleek skin now gathered dust he throws. And yellow sand his mighty muscles strows. Oft he my neck and nimble legs assails. He seems to grasp me, but as often fails. Each part he now invades with eager hand. Safe in my bulk immovable I stand. So when loud storms break high, and foam and roar. Against some mole that stretches from the shore. The firm foundation lasting tempests braves. Defies the warring winds and driving waves. A while we breathe, then forward rush amain. Renew the combat, and our ground maintain. Foot strove with foot, I, prone, extend my breast. Hands war with hands, and forehead forehead pressed. Thus have I seen two furious bulls engage. Inflamed with equal love and equal rage. Each claims the fairest heifer of the grove. And conquest only can decide their love. The trembling herd survey the fight from far. Till victory decides the important war. Three times, in vain, he strove my joints to rest. To force my hold, and throw me from his breast. The fourth he broke my gripe, that clasped him round. Then with new force he stretched me on the ground. Close to my back the mighty burden clung. As if a mountain o'er my limbs were flung. Believe my tale, nor do I, boastful, aim. By feigned narration to extol my fame. No sooner from his arm I freedom get. Unlock my arms, that flowed with trickling sweat. But quick he seized me, and renewed the strife. As my exhausted bosom pants for life. My neck he gripes, my knee to earth he strains. I fall, and bite the sand with shame and pains. Ermatch D in strength, to wiles and arts I take. And slip his hold in form of speckled snake. 
who, when I writhed in spires my body round, or showed my forky tongue with hissing sound, smiles at my threats, such foes my cradle knew. He cries. Dire snakes my infant hand o'erthrow. A dragon's form might other conquests gain. To war with me you take that shape in vain. Art thou proportioned to the hydra's length? Who by his wounds received augmented strength? He raised a hundred hissing heads in air. When one I lopped, up sprung a dreadful pair. By his wounds fertile, and with slaughter strong. Singly I quelled him, and stretched dead along. What canst thou do, a form precarious, prone? To rouse my rage with terrors not thy own? He said, and round my neck his hands he cast. And with his straining fingers wrung me fast. My throat he tortured close as pincers clasp. In vain I strove to loose the forceful grasp. Thus vanquished too, a third form still remains. Changed to a bull, my lowing fills the plains. Straight on the left his nervous arms were thrown. Upon my brindled neck. And tugged it down. Then deep he struck my horn into the sand. And felled my bulk along the dusty land. Nor yet his fury cooled, twixt rage and scorn. From my maimed front he tore the stubborn horn. This, heaped with flowers and fruits, the naiads bear. Sacred to plenty, and the bounteous year. He spoke, when lo! A beauteous nymph appears. Girt, like Diana's train, with flowing hairs. The horn she brings, in which all autumn stored. And ruddy apples for the second board. Now morn begins to dawn, the sun's bright fire. Gilds the high mountains, and the youths retire. Nor stayed they till the troubled stream subsides. And in its bounds with peaceful current glides. But Achilles in his oozy bed. Deep hides his brow deformed, and rustic head. No real wound the victor's triumph showed. But his lost honors grieved the watery god. Yet Evan that lost the willows leaves o'er spread. And verdant reeds, in garlands, bind his head. Death of Nessus the centaur. The centaur Nessus, who offers violence to Digenaira, is killed by the shafts of Hercules, before he expires. He presents a poison tunic to the woman he has injured, assuring her of its efficacy to recall the affections of a faithless husband. This virgin too, thy love, O Nessus, found. To her alone you owe the fatal wound. As the strong son of Jove his bride conveys. Where his paternal lands their bulwarks raise. Where from her slopy urn Ivinus pours. Her rapid current, swelled by wintry showers. He came. The frequent eddies whirled the tide. And the deep rolling waves all past denied. As for himself, he stood unmoved by fears. For now his bridal charge employed his cares. The strong-limbed Nessus thus officious cried. For he the shallows of the stream had tried. Swim thou, I'll see this, all thy strength prepare. On yonder bank I'll lodge thy nuptial care. The Aeonian chief to Nessus trusts his wife. All pale and trembling for her hero's life. Clothed as he stood in the fierce lion's hide. The laden quiver o'er his shoulder tied. For cross the stream his bow and club were cast. Swift he plunged in, these billows shall be passed. He said, nor sought where smoother waters glide. But stemmed the rapid dangers of the tide. The bank he reached, again the bow he bears. When, hark! His bride's known voice alarms his ears. Nessus, to thee I call, aloud he cries. Vain is thy trust in flight, be timely wise. Thou monster double-shaped, my right set free. If thou no reverence owe my fame and me. Yet kindred should thy lawless lust deny. Think not, perfidious wretch, from me to fly. Though winged with horse's speed, wounds shall pursue. Swift as his words the fatal arrow flew. The centaur's back admits the feathered wood. And through his breast the barbed weapon stood. Which when, in anguish. 
through the flesh he tore. From both the wounds gushed forth the spumy gore, mixed with Lernaean venom. This he took. Nor dire revenge his dying breast forsook. His garment, in the reeking purple dyed. To rouse love's passion, he presents the bride. Death of Hercules. Degenira sends the poison tunic of Nessus, by the hands of Lycas to recall the hero from the attractions of a rival. Now a long interval of time succeeds. When the great son of Jove's immortal deeds and stepdame's hate had filled earth's utmost round. He from Echalia, with new laurels crowned. In triumph was returned, he writes prepares. And to the king of gods directs his prayers. When fame, whom falsehood clothes in truth's disguise. And swells her little bulk with growing lies. Thy tender ear, O Degenira, moved. That Hercules the fair Ioli loved. Her love believes the tale, the truth she fears. Of his new passion, and gives way to tears. The flowing tears diffused her wretched grief. Why seek I thus, from streaming eyes, relief? She cries. Indulge not thus these fruitless cares. The harlot will but triumph in thy tears. Let something be resolved, while yet there's time. My bed not conscious of a rival's crime. In silence shall I mourn, or loud complain? Shall I seek Caledon, or here remain? What though allied to Meliagor's fame? I boast the honours of a sister's name? My wrongs, perhaps, now urge me to pursue. Some desperate deed, by which the world shall view. How far revenge and woman's rage can rise. When weltering in her blood the harlot dies. Thus various passions ruled by turns her breast. She now resolves to send the fatal vest. Died with Lernaean gore, whose power might move. His soul anew, and rouse declining love. Nor knew she what her sudden rage bestows. When she to Lycas trusts her future woes. With soft endearments she the boy commands. To bear the garment to her husband's hands. The unwitting hero takes the gift in haste. And o'er his shoulders Lerna's poison cast. At first the fire with frankincense he strows. And utters to the gods his holy vows. And on the marble altar's polished frame. Pours forth the grapey stream. The rising flame. Sudden dissolves the subtle poisonous juice. Which taints his blood, and all his nerves bedews. With wanted fortitude he bore the smart. And not a groan confessed his burning heart. At length his patience was subdued by pain. He rends the sacred altar from the plain. Eats wide forests echo with his cries. Now to rip off the deathful robe he tries. Where'er he plucks the vest, the skin he tears. The mangled muscles and huge bones he bears. A ghastful sight, or raging with his pain. To rend the sticking plague he tugs in vain. As the red iron hisses in the flood. So boils the venom in his curdling blood. Now with the greedy flame his entrails glow. And livid sweats down all his body flow. The cracking nerves burnt up are burst in twain. The lurking venom melts his swimming brain. Then, lifting both his hands aloft, he cries. Glut thy revenge, dread Empress of the skies. Sate with my death the rancor of thy heart. Look down with pleasure, and enjoy my smart. Or, if e'er pity moved a hostile breast. For here I stand thy enemy professed. Take hence this hateful life, with tortures torn. Inured to trouble, and to labors born. Death is the gift most welcome to my wa. And such a gift a stepdame may bestow. Was it for this Busiris was subdued? Whose barbarous temples reeked with strangers' blood? Pressed in these arms his fate Antaeus found. Nor gained recruited vigor from the ground. Did I not triple form Gerian fell? Or did I fear the triple dog of hell? Did not these hands the bull's armed forehead hold? Are not our mighty toils in Ellis told? Do not Stymphalian lakes proclaim thy fame? 
and fair Parthenian woods resound thy name? Who sees the golden belt of Thermodon? And who the dragon guarded apples won? Could the fierce centaur's strength my force withstand? Or the fell boar that spoiled the Arcadian land? Did not these arms the Hydra's rage subdue? Who from his wounds to double fury grew? What if the Thracian horses, fat with gore? Who human bodies in their mangers tore? I saw, and with their barbrows lord o'erthrow. What if these hands and Nemea's lion slew? Did not this neck the heavenly globe sustain? The female partner of the thunderer's reign. Fatigued at length suspends her harsh commands. Yet no fatigue hath slacked these valiant hands. But now new plagues pursue me, neither force. Nor arms, nor darts, can stop their raging course. Devouring flame through my racked entrails strays. And on my lungs and shriveled muscles preys. Yet still Eurystheus breathes the vital air. What mortal now shall seek the gods with prayer? Transformation of Lycas into a rock. Lycas is thrown into the Euboean sea by his angry master, and is changed into a rock by the compassion of the gods. The hero said. And, with the torture stung. Furious o'er eats lofty hills he sprung. Stuck with the shaft, thus scours the tiger round. And seeks the flying author of his wound. Now might you see him trembling, now he vents. His anguished soul in groans, and loud laments. He strives to tear the clinging vest in vain. And with uprooted forests strows the plain. Now kindling into rage, his hands he rears. And to his kindred gods directs his prayers. When Lycas, lo, he spies. Who trembling flew. And in a hollow rock concealed from view. Had shunned his wrath. Now grief renewed his pain. His madness chafed, and thus he raves again. Lycas, to thee alone my fate I owe. Who bore the gift, the cause of all my woe. The youth all pale with shivering fear was stung. And vain excuses faltered on his tongue. Alcides snatched him, as with suppliant face. He strove to clasp his knees, and beg for grace. He tossed him o'er his head with airy course. And hurled with more than with an engine's force. Far o'er the Euboean main aloof he flies. And hardens by degrees amid the skies. So showery drops, when chilly tempests blow. Thicken at first, then whiten into snow. In balls congealed the rolling fleeces bound. In solid hail result upon the ground. Thus, whirled with nervous force through distant air. The purple tide forsook his veins with fear. All moisture left his limbs. Transformed to stone. In ancient days the craggy flint was known. Still in the Euboean waves his front he rears. Still the small rock in human form appears. And still the name of hapless Lycas bears. Apotheosis of Hercules. Hercules, finding his end approaching, bestows his bow and arrows on his friend Philoctetes, and expires on Mount Eta. After which the hero is enrolled in the number of the gods. But now the hero of immortal birth. Fells eats forests on the groaning earth. A pile he builds. To Philoctetes' care. He leaves his deathful instruments of war. To him commits those arrows, which again. Shall see the bulwarks of the Trojan reign. The son of Paean lights the lofty pyre. High round the structure climbs the greedy fire. Placed on the top, thy nervous shoulders spread. With the Nemean spoils, thy careless head. Raised on the knotty club, with look divine. Hear thou, dread hero of celestial line. Wert stretched at ease. As when a cheerful guest. Wine crown thy bowls, and flowers thy temples dressed. Now on all sides the potent flames aspire. And crackle round those limbs that mock the fire. A sudden terror seized the immortal host. Who thought the world's professed defender lost? This when the thunderer saw, with smiles he cries. Tis from your fears, ye gods, my pleasures rise. 
joy swells my breast, that my all-ruling hand. O'er such a grateful people boasts command. That you my suffering progeny would aid. Though to his deeds this just respect be paid. Me you've obliged. Be all your fears forborn. The Edian fires do thou, great hero, scorn. Who vanquished all things shall subdue the flame. That part alone of gross material frame. Fire shall devour. While what from me he drew. Shall live immortal, and its force subdue. That, when he's dead, I'll raise to realms above. May all the powers the righteous act approve. If any god dissent, and judge too great. The sacred honors of the heavenly seat. Even he shall own his deeds deserve the sky. Even he reluctant shall at length comply. The assembled powers assent. No frown till now. Had marked with passion vengeful Juno's brow. Meanwhile whatever was in the power of flame. Was all consumed. His body's nervous frame. No more was known, of human form bereft. The eternal part of Jove alone was left. As an old serpent casts his scaly vest. Writhes in the sun, in youthful glory dressed. So when I'll see this mortal mold resigned. His better part enlarged, and grew refined. August his visage shone, almighty Jove. In his swift car his honored offspring drove. High o'er the hollow clouds the coursers fly. And lodge the hero in the starry sky. Transformation of Galanthus. The delivery of Alcmena is effected by the sagacity of a servant maid, named Galanthus, whose fidelity excites the displeasure of Juno. Who converts her into a weasel. Atlas perceived the load of heaven's new guest. Revenge still rankled in Eurystheus' breast. Against Alcides' race. Alcmena goes. To Ioli, to vent maternal woes. Here she pours forth her grief, recounts the spoils. Her son had bravely reaped in glorious toils. This Ioli, by Hercules commands. Hillas had loved, and joined in nuptial bands. Her swelling sides the teeming birth confessed. To whom Alcmena thus her speech addressed. O oh, may the gods protect thee, in that hour. When, midst thy throes. Thou call'st the Alithian power. May no delays prolong thy racking pain. As when I sued for Juno's aid in vain. When now I'll see this mighty birth drew nigh. And the tenth sign rolled forward on the sky. My sides extend with such a mighty load. As Jove the parent of the burden showed. I could no more the increasing smart sustain. My horror kindles to recount the pain. Cold chills my limbs while I the tale pursue. And now methinks I feel my pangs anew. Seven days and nights amid incessant throes. Fatigued with ills I lay, nor knew repose. When lifting high my hands, in shrieks I prayed. Implored the gods, and called Lucina's aid. She came, but prejudiced, to give my fate. A sacrifice to vengeful Juno's hate. She hears the groaning anguish of my fits. And on the altar at my door she sits. O'er her left knee her crossing leg she cast. Then knits her fingers close, and wrings them fast. This stayed the birth, in muttering verse she prayed. The muttering verse the unfinished birth delayed. Now with fierce struggles, raging with my pain. At Jove's ingratitude I rage in vain. How did I wish for death? Such groans I sent. As might have made the flinty heart relent. Now the Cadmian matrons round me press. Offer their vows, and seek to bring redress. Among the Theban dames Galantha stands. Strong-limbed, red-haired, and just to my commands. She first perceived that all these racking woes. From the persisting hate of Juno rose. As here and there she passed, by chance she sees. The seated goddess, on her close-pressed knees. Her fast-knit hands she leans. With cheerful voice. Galanthus cries, Whoer thou art, rejoice. 
Congratulate the dame, she lies at rest. At length the gods Alcmena's prayers have blessed. Swift from her seat the startled goddess springs. No more concealed, her hands abroad she flings. The charm unloosed, the birth my pangs relieved. Galanthus' laughter vexed the power deceived. Fame says, the goddess dragged the laughing maid. Fast by the hair, in vain her force essayed. Her groveling body from the ground to rear. Changed to four feet her shrinking arms appear. Her hairy back her former hue retains. The form alone is lost, her strength remains. Who, since the lie did from her mouth proceed, shall from her pregnant mouth bring forth her breed. Nor shall she quit her long-frequented home, but haunt those houses where she loved to roam. Fable of Dryope Dryope, who incautiously plucks a branch of the lotus tree for the amusement of her infant son, is herself transformed by the angry sylvan deities into a tree of the same species. She said, and for her lost Galanthus sighs. When the fair consort of her son replies, Since you a servant's ravished form bemoan, And kindly sigh for sorrows not your own, Let me, tears and grief permit, relate. A nearer wa, a sister's stranger fate. No nymph of all Ecalia could compare. For beauteous form, with Dryope the fair. Her tender mother's only hope and pride myself the offspring of a second bride. This nymph, compressed by him who rules the day, whom Delphi and the Delian Isle obey, and dream and loved, and blessed in all those charms, that pleased a god, succeeded to her arms. A lake there was, with shelving banks around, whose verdant summit fragrant myrtles crowned. Those shades, unknowing of the fates, she sought and to the naiad's flowery garlands brought. Her smiling babe, a pleasing charge, she pressed. Between her arms, and nourished at her breast. Not distant far a watery lotus grows. The spring was new, and all the verdant boughs. Adorned with blossoms, promised fruits that vie. In glowing colors with the Tyrian dye. Of these she cropped, to please her infant son and I myself the same rash act had done. But, lo! I saw, as near her side I stood, the violated blossoms drop with blood. Upon the tree I cast a frightful look. The trembling tree with sudden horror shook. Lotus the nymph, if rural tales be true. As from Priapus lawless love she flew. Forsook her form. And fixing here became. A flowery plant, which still preserves her name. This change unknown, astonished at the sight. My trembling sister strove to urge the flight. Yet first the pardon of the nymphs implored. And those offended sylvan powers adored. But when she backward would have fled. She found. Her stiffening feet were rooted to the ground. In vain to free her fastened feet she strove and as she struggles only moves above. She feels the encroaching bark around her grow. By slow degrees, and cover all below. Surprised at this, her trembling hand she heaves. To rend her hair, her hand is filled with leaves. Where late was hair, the shooting leaves are seen. To rise, and shade her with a sudden green. The child emphasis, to her bosom pressed. Perceived a colder and a harder breast. And found the springs, that ne'er till then denied. Their milky moisture, on a sudden dried. I saw, unhappy, what I now relate. And stood the helpless witness of thy fate. Embraced thy boughs, the rising bark delayed. Their wish to grow, and mingle shade with shade. Behold Andreman and the unhappy sire. Appear, and for their Dryope inquire. A springing tree for Dryope they find. And print warm kisses on the panting rind. Prostrate, with tears their kindred plant bedew. And close embraced, as to the roots they grew. The face was all that now remained of thee. No more a woman, 
nor yet quite a tree. Thy branches hung with humid pearls appear. From every leaf distills a trickling tear. And straight a voice, while yet a voice remains. Thus through the trembling boughs in sighs calm plains. If to the wretched any faith be given. I swear by all the unpitying powers of heaven. No willful crime this heavy vengeance bred. In mutual innocence our lives we led. If this be false, let these new greens decay. Let sounding axes lop my limbs away. And crackling flames on all my honours prey. Now from my branching arms this infant bear. Let some kind nurse supply a mother's care. Yet to his mother let him oft be led. Sport in her shades, and in her shades be fed. Teach him, when first his infant voice shall frame. Imperfect words, and lisp his mother's name. To hail this tree, and say with weeping eyes. Within this plant my hapless parent lies. And when in youth he seeks the shady woods. Oh, let him fly the crystal lakes and floods. Nor touch the fatal flowers. But, warned by me. Believe a goddess shrined in every tree. My sire, my sister, and my spouse, farewell. If in your breasts or love or pity dwell. Protect your plant, nor let my branches feel. The browsing cattle, or the piercing steel. Farewell. And since I cannot bend to join. My lips to yours, advance at least to mine. My son, thy mother's parting kiss receive. While yet thy mother has a kiss to give. I can no more, the creeping rind invades. My closing lips, and hides my head in shades. Remove your hands, the bark shall soon suffice. Without their aid, to seal these dying eyes. She ceased at once to speak, and ceased to be. And all the nymph was lost within the tree. Yet latent life through her new branches reigned. And long the plant a human heat retained. Iolaus restored to youth. Hebe, at the request of Hercules, renews the youth of her son Iolaus. While Ioli the fatal change declares. Alcmena's pitying hand oft wiped her tears. Grief too streamed down her cheeks, soon sorrow flies. And rising joy the trickling moisture dries. Lo Iolaus stands before their eyes. A youth he stood, and the soft down began. O'er his smooth chin to spread, and promise man. He be submitted to her husband's prayers. Instilled new vigor, and restored his years. Prophecy of Themis. The events and consequences of the Theban war are foretold by Themis. Now from her lips a solemn oath had passed. That Iolaus this gift alone should taste. Had not just Themis thus maturely said. Which checked her vow. And awed the blooming maid. Thebes is embroiled in war. Capenu stands. Invincible, but by the thunderer's hands. Ambition shall the guilty brothers for fire. Both rush to mutual wounds, and both expire. The reeling earth shall ope her gloomy womb. Where the yet breathing bard shall find his five tomb. The sun six shall bathe his hands in parents' blood. And in one act be both unjust and good. Of home and sense deprived, where'er he flies. The Furies, and his mother's ghost, he spies. His wife the fatal bracelet shall implore. And Phegeus stain his sword in kindred gore. Calero shall then with suppliant prayer. Prevail on Jupiter's relenting ear. Jove shall with youth her infant sons inspire. And bid their bosoms glow with manly fire. Debate of the Gods the gods are forbidden by Jupiter to renew the youth of those mortals whom they favor. When Themis this with prescient voice had spoke. Among the gods a various murmur broke. Dissension rose in each immortal breast. That one should grant what was denied the rest. Aurora for her aged spouse complains. And Ceres grieves for Jason's freezing veins. Vulcan would Erichthonius years renew. Her future race the care of Venus drew. She would Anchises' blooming age restore. 
a different care employed each heavenly power. Thus various interests did their jars increase. Till Jove arose, he spoke, their tumult cease. Is any reverence to our presence given? Then why this discord mong the powers of heaven? Who can the settled will of fate subdue? Twas by the fates that Iolaus knew. A second youth. The fates determine doom. Shall give Calero's race a youthful bloom. Arms nor ambition can this power obtain. Quell your desires, even me the fates restrain. Could I there will control, no rolling years. Had Aeacus bent down with silver hairs. Then Radamanthus still had youth possessed. And Minus with eternal bloom been blessed. Jove's words the synod moved, the powers give o'er. And urge in vain unjust complaint no more. Since Radamanthus' veins now slowly flowed. And Aeacus and Minus bore the load. Minus, who in the flower of youth and fame. Made mighty nations tremble at his name. Infirm with age, the proud Miletus fears. Vain of his birth, and in the strength of years. And now regarding all his realms as lost. He durst not force him from his native coast. But you by choice, Miletus, fled his reign. And thy swift vessel plowed the Aegean main. On Asiatic shores a town you frame. Which still is honored with the founder's name. Here you Cyane knew, the beauteous maid. As on her father's seven winding banks she strayed. Conus and Byblus hence their lineage trace. The double offspring of your warm embrace. Passion of Byblus. Byblus falls passionately in love with her brother Conus, who rejects her advances with horror, the nymph becomes frantic with despair. And is converted into a fountain by the indulgent deities. Let the sad fate of wretched Byblus prove. A dismal warning to unlawful love. One birth gave being to the hapless pair. But more was Conus than a sister's care. Unknown she loved, for yet the gentle fire. Rose not in flames, nor kindled to desire. Twas thought no sin to wonder at his charms. Hang on his neck, and languish in his arms. Thus winged with joy fled the soft hours away. And all the fatal guilt on harmless nature lay. But love, too soon from piety declined. Insensibly depraved her yielding mind. Dressed she appears, with nicest art adorned. And every youth, but her loved brother, scorned. For him alone she labored to be fair. And cursed all charms that might with hers compare. Twas she, and only she, must Conus please. Sick at her heart, yet knew not her disease. She called him Lord, for brother was a name. Too cold and dull for her aspiring flame. And, when he spoke, if sister he replied. For Byblus changed that frozen word, she cried. Yet waking still she watched her struggling breast. And love's approaches were in vain addressed. Till gentle sleep an easy conquest made. And by her side the conqueror was laid. Ah me, she cried, how monstrous do I seem. Why these vile thoughts, and this Iloman dream? Envy herself, tis true, must own his charms. But what is beauty in a sister's arms? Oh! Were I not that despicable she? How blessed, how pleased, how happy, should I be! But unregarded now must bear my pain. And but in dreams my wishes can obtain. Oh! Gentle Conus, quit thy hated line. Or let thy parents be no longer mine. Oh! That in common all things were enjoyed. But those alone who have our hopes destroyed. Were I a princess, thou an humble swain. The proudest kings should rival thee in vain. It cannot be, alas. The dreadful ill. Is fixed by fate, and he's my brother still. Hear me, ye gods. I must have friends in heaven. For Jove himself was to a sister given. But what are their prerogatives above? To the short liberties of human love? Fantastic thoughts. Down, down, 
forbidden fires. Or instant death extinguish my desires. Strict virtue, then, with thy malicious leave. Without a crime, I may a kiss receive. But say, should I in spite of laws comply? Yet cruel Conus might himself deny. Yet why should youth, and charms like mine, despair? Such fears ne'er startled the Aetolian pair. No ties of blood could their full hopes destroy. They broke through all for the prevailing joy. And who can tell but Conus too may be? Racked and tormented in his breast for me? Like me, to the extremest anguish drove. Like me, just waking from a dream of love? But stay, oh whither would my fury run? What arguments I urge to be undone? Away! Fond Biblis, quench these guilty flames. Conus thy love but as a brother claims. Yet had he first been touched with love of me. The charming youth could I despairing see? Oppressed with grief, and dying by disdain? Ah! No, too sure I should have eased his pain. Since, then, if Conus asked me, it were done. Asking myself, what dangers can I run? But canst thou ask, and see that right betrayed? From Pyrrha down to thy whole sex conveyed? That self-denying gift we all enjoy. Of wishing to be one, yet seeming to be coy. Well, then, for once, let a fond mistress woo. The force of love no custom can subdue. This frantic passion he by words shall know. Soft as the melting heart from whence they flow. The pencil then in her fair hand she held. By fear discouraged, but by love compelled. She writes, then blots, writes on, and blots again. Likes it as fit, then raises it as vain. Shame and assurance in her face appear. And a faint hope just yielding to despair. Sister was wrote and blotted, as a word. Which she, and Conus too, she hoped, abhorred. But now resolved to be no more controlled. By Scruplau's virtue, thus her grief she told. Thy lover, gentle Conus, wishes thee. That health, which thou alone canst give to me. O charming youth! The gift I ask bestow. Ere thou the name of the fond writer know. To thee without a name I would be known. Since, knowing that, my frailty I must own. Yet why should I my wretched name conceal? When thousand instances my flames reveal? Wan looks and weeping eyes have spoke my pain. And sighs discharged from my heaved heart in vain. Had I not wished my passion might be seen? What could such fondness and embraces mean? Yet, though extremest rage has racked my soul, and raging fires in my parched bosom roll, be witness gods, how piously I strove to rid my thoughts of this enchanting love. But who could scape so fierce and sure a dart, aimed at a tender, a defenseless heart? Alas! What maid could suffer I have borne, ere the dire secret from my breast was torn? To thee, a helpless, vanquished wretch I come. Tis you alone can save, or give my doom. My life or death this moment you may choose. Yet think, O oh think, no hated stranger sues. No foe, but one, alas. Too near allied. And wishing still much nearer to be tied. The forms of decency let age debate. And virtue's rules by their cold moral state. Their ebbing joys give leisure to inquire. And blame those noble flights our youth inspire. O oh, pardon and oblige a blushing maid. Whose rage the pride of her vain sex betrayed. Nor let my tomb thus mournfully complain. Here Biblis lies, by her loved Conus slain. Forced here to end, she with a falling tear. Tempered the pliant wax which did the signet bear. The curious cipher was impressed by art. But love had stamped one deeper in her heart. Her page, a youth of confidence and skill. Secret as night, stood waiting on her will. Sighing, she cried, Bear this, thou faithful boy. 
to my sweet partner in eternal joy. Here a long pause her secret guilt confessed. And when, at length, she would have spoken the rest. Half the dear name lay buried in her breast. Thus, as he list Ned to her vain command. Down fell the letter from her trembling hand. The omen shocked her soul. Yet go, she cried. Can a request from Biblis be denied? To the meandrian youth this message is born. The half-read lines by his fierce rage were torn. Hence, he exclaimed, thou vile accomplice, hence. Enjoy the triumph of thy great offense. Thy instant death will but divulge her shame. Or thy life's blood should quench the guilty flame. Fright, from threatening Conus he withdrew. And with the dreadful news to his lost mistress flew. The sad repulse so struck the wounded fair. Her sense was buried in her wild despair. Pale was her visage, as the ghastly dead. And her scared soul from the sweet mansion fled. Yet with her life renewed, her love returns. And faintly thus her cruel fate she mourns. Tis just, ye gods. Was my false reason blind? To write a secret of this tender kind? With female craft, I should at first have strove. By dubious hints to sound his distant love. And tried those useful, though dissembled, arts. Which women practice on disdainful hearts. I should have watched whence the black storm might rise. Ere I had trusted the unfaithful skies. Now on the rolling billows I am tossed. And with extended sails on the blind shelves am lost. Did not indulgent heaven my deem foretell? When from my hand the fatal letter fell? What madness seized my soul, and urged me on? To take the only course to be undone? I could myself have told the moving tale. With such alluring grace as must prevail. Then had his eyes beheld my blushing fears. My rising sighs, and my descending tears. Round his dear neck these arms I then had spread. And, if rejected, at his feet been dead. If singly these had not his thoughts inclined. Yet all united would have shocked his mind. Perhaps my careless page might be in fault. And, in a luckless hour, the fatal message brought. Business and worldly thoughts might fill his breast. Sometimes even love itself may be an irksome guest. He could not else have treated me with scorn. For Conus was not of a tigress born. Nor steel, nor adamant, has fenced his heart. Like mine, tis naked to the burning dart. Away, false fears. He must, he shall be mine. In death alone I will my claim resign. Tis vain to wish my written crime unknown. And for my guilt much vainer to atone. Repulsed and baffled, fiercer still she burns. And Conus, with disdain, her impious love returns. He saw no end of her injurious flame. And fled his country to avoid the shame. Forsaken Byblis, who had hopes no more. Burst out in rage, and her loose robes she tore. With her fair hands she smote her tender breast. And to the wondering world her love confessed. O'er hills and dales, o'er rocks and streams she flew. But still in vain did her wild love pursue. Wearied, at length, on the cold earth she fell. And now in tears alone could her sad story tell. Relenting gods in pity fixed her there. And to a fountain turned the weeping fair. Fable of Iphis and Ianthe. A poor man named Ligdus directs his wife to destroy her newborn child should it prove a female, the tenderness of a mother induces her to conceal the sex of her daughter. And Ligdus, at a fit age, provides a suitable partner for his supposed son, whose sex is changed by the interposition of the goddess Isis. The fame of this, perhaps, through Crete had flown. But Crete had newer wonders of her own. In Iphis changed. For near the Nashan bounds. As loud report the miracle resounds. At Festus dwelt a man of honest blood. But meanly born, and not so rich as good. Esteemed and loved by all the neighborhood. 
who, to his wife, before the time assigned. For childbirth came, thus bluntly spoke his mind. If heaven, said Ligdis, will vouchsafe to hear. I have but two petitions to prefer. Short pains for thee, for me a son and heir. Girls cost as many throws in bringing forth. Besides, when born, they prove of little worth. Weak, puling things, unable to sustain. Their share of labor, and their bread to gain. If, therefore, thou a creature shalt produce. Of so great charges, and so little use. Bear witness, heaven, with what reluctancy. Her helpless innocence I doom to die. He said. And tears the common grief display. Of him who bade, and her who must obey. Yet Telethusa still persists, to find. Fit arguments to move a father's mind. To extend his wishes to a larger scope. And in one vessel not confine his hope. Ligdis continues hard, her time drew near. And she her heavy load could scarcely bear. When slumbering, in the latter shades of night. Before the approaches of returning light. She saw, or thought she saw, before her bed. A glorious train, and Isis at their head. Her moony horns were on her forehead placed. And yellow sheaves her shining temples graced. A mitre, for a crown, she wore on high. The dog and dappled bull were waiting by. Osiris, sought along the banks of Nile. The silent god, the sacred crocodile. And, last, a long procession moving on. With timbrels, that assist the laboring moon. Her slumbers seemed dispelled, and, broad awake. She heard a voice that thus distinctly spake. My votary, thy babe from death defend. Nor fear to save whatever the gods will send. Delude with art thy husband's dire decree. When danger calls, repose thy trust on me. And know thou hast not served a thankless deity. This promise made, with night the goddess fled. With joy the woman wakes and leaves her bed. Devoutly lifts her spotless hands on high. And prays the powers their gifts to ratify. Now grinding pains proceed to bearing throes. Till its own weight the burden did disclose. Twas of the beauteous kind, and brought to light. With secrecy, to shun the father's sight. The indulgent mother did her care employ. And passed it on her husband for a boy. The nurse was conscious of the fact alone. The father paid his vows as for a son. And called him Iphis, by a common name. Which either sex with equal right may claim. Iphis his grandsire was. The wife was pleased. Of half the fraud by fortune's favor eased. The doubtful name was used without deceit. And truth was covered with a pious cheat. The habit showed a boy, the beauteous face. With manly fierceness mingled female grace. Now thirteen years of age were swiftly run. When the fond father thought the time drew on. Of settling in the world his only son. Ionthe was his choice, so wondrous fair. Her form alone with Iphis could compare. A neighbor's daughter of his own degree. And not more blessed with fortune's goods than he. They soon espoused, for they with ease were joined. Who were before contracted in the mind. Their age the same, their inclinations too. And bred together, in one school they grew. Thus, fatally disposed to mutual fires. They felt, before they knew, the same desires. Equal their flame, unequal was their care. One loved with hope, one languished in despair. And, scarce refraining tears, alas, said she. What issue of my love remains for me? How wild a passion works within my breast! With what prodigious flames am I possessed? Could I the care of providence deserve? Heaven must destroy me, if it would preserve. And that's my fate, or sure it would have sent. Some usual evil for my punishment. Not this unkindly curse, to rage and burn. 
where nature shows no prospect of return. And yet no guards against our joys conspire. No jealous husband hinders our desire. My parents are propitious to my wish. And she herself consenting to the bliss. All things concur to prosper our design. All things to prosper any love but mine. Heaven has been kind, as far as heaven can be. Our parents with our own desires agree. But nature, stronger than the gods above, refuses her assistance to my love. She sets the bar that causes all my pain. One gift refused makes all their bounty vain. And now the happy day is just at hand. To bind our hearts in Hymen's holy band. Thus lovesick Iphis her vain passion mourns. With equal ardor fair Ionthe burns. Invoking Hymen's name, and Juno's power. To speed the work, and haste the happy hour. She hopes, while Telethusa fears the day. And strives to interpose some new delay. Now feigns a sickness, now is in a fright. For this bad omen, or that boding sight. But having done whatever she could devise. And emptied all her magazine of lies. The time approached, the next ensuing day. The fatal secret must to light betray. Then Telethusa had recourse to prayer. She, and her daughter, with disheveled hair. Trembling with fear, great Isis they adored. Embraced her altar, and her aid implored. Fair queen, who dost on fruitful Egypt smile. Who swaced the scepter of the Pharian isle. And sevenfold falls of disemboguing Nile. Relieve, in this our last distress, she said. A suppliant mother, and a mournful maid. Thou, goddess, thou wert present to my sight. Revealed I saw thee by thy own fair light. I saw thee, in my dream, as now I see. With all thy marks of awful majesty. The glorious train that compassed thee around. And heard the hollow timbrel's holy sound. Thy words I noted, which I still retain. Let not thy sacred oracles be vain. That Iphis lives, that I myself am free. From shame and punishment, I owe to thee. On thy protection all our hopes depend. Thy counsel saved us, let thy power defend. Her tears pursued her words, and, while she spoke, the goddess nodded, and her altar shook. The temple doors, as with a blast of wind, were heard to clap, the lunar horns, that bind. The brows of Isis, cast a blaze around. The trembling timbrel made a murmuring sound. Some hopes these happy omens did impart. Forth went the mother with a beating heart. Not much in fear, nor fully satisfied. But Iphis followed with a larger stride. The whiteness of her skin forsook her face. Her looks emboldened with an awful grace. Her features and her strength together grew. And her long hair to curling locks withdrew. Her sparkling eyes with manly vigor shone. Big with her voice, audacious was her tone. The maid becomes a youth. No more delay. Your vows, but look, and confidently pay. Their gifts the parents to the temple bear. The votive tables this inscription wear. Iphis, the man, has to the goddess paid. The vows that Iphis offered when a maid. Now, when the star of day had shown his face. Venus and Juno with their presence grace. The nuptial rites, and Hymen, from above. Descending to complete their happy love. The gods of marriage lend their mutual aid. And the fond youth obtains the lovely maid. Book. Chapter 10. Story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus, by his skill in music. Obtains from Pluto the restoration of his wife Eurydice on condition of not looking behind him till his arrival in the upper regions, his promises are forgotten. And he turns to gaze on his long-lost wife, who instantly vanishes from his eyes, her husband, in despair, totally separates himself from the society of mankind. Thence, in his saffron robe, for distant Thrace. Hymen departs, through air's unmeasured space. 
by Orpheus called, the nuptial power attends. But with illumined augury descends. Nor cheerful looked the god, nor prosperous spoke. Nor blazed his torch, but wept in hissing smoke. In vain they whirl it round, in vain they shake. No rapid motion can its flames awake. With dread these inauspicious signs were viewed. And soon a more disastrous end ensued. For as the bride, amid the naiad train, ran joyful, sporting o'er the flowery plain, a venomed viper bit her as she passed. Instant she fell, and sudden breathed her last. When long his loss the Thracian had deplored, not by superior powers to be restored, inflamed by love and urged by deep despair, he leaves the realms of light and upper air, daring to tread the dark Tenarian road and tempt the shades in their obscure abode, through gliding spectres of the interred to go, and phantom people of the world below. Persephone he seeks, and him who reigns. O'er ghosts, and hell's uncomfortable plains. Arrived, he, tuning to his voice his strings. Thus to the king and queen of shadow sings. Ye powers, who under earth your realms extend. To whom all mortals must one day descend. If here, tis granted sacred truth to tell. I come not curious to explore your hell. Nor come to boast, by vain ambition fired. How Cerberus at my approach retired. My wife alone I seek, for her loved sake. These terrors I support, this journey take. She, luckless wandering, or by fate misled. Chanced on a lurking viper's crest to tread. The vengeful beast, inflamed with fury, starts. And through her heel his deathful venom darts. Thus was she snatched untimely to her tomb. Her growing years cut short, and springing bloom. Long I my loss endeavored to sustain. And strongly strove, but strove, alas. In vain. At length I yielded, won by mighty love. Well known is that omnipotence above. But here, I doubt, his unfelt influence fails. And yet a hope within my heart prevails. That here, Evan here, he has been known of old. At least if truth be by tradition told. If fame of former love's belief may find. You both by love, and love alone, were joined. Now, by the horrors which these realms surround. By the vast chaos of these depths profound. By the sad silence. Which eternal reigns. O'er all the waste of these wide-stretching plains. Let me again Eurydice receive. Let fate her quick-spun thread of life reweave. All our possessions are but loans from you. And soon or late you must be paid your due. Hither we haste to humankind's last seat. Your endless empire, and our sure retreat. She too, when ripened years she shall attain. Must, of a voidless right, be yours again. I but the transient use of that require. Which soon, too soon, I must resign entire. But if the destinies refuse my vow. And no remission of her doom allow. No, I'm determined to return no more. So both retain, or both to life restore. Thus, while the bard melodiously complains. And to his lyre accords his vocal strains. The very bloodless shades attention keep. And silent seem compassionate to weep. Evan Tantalus his flood unthirsty views. Nor flies the stream, nor he the stream pursues. Ixion's wondering will its whirl suspends. And the voracious vulture, charmed, attends. No more the belides their toil bemoan. And Sisyphus, reclined, sits listening on his stone. Then first, tis said, by sacred verse subdued. The furies felt their cheeks with tears bedewed. Nor could the rigid king or queen of hell. The impulse of pity in their hearts repel. Now, from a troop of shades that last arrived. Eurydice was called, and stood revived. Slow she advanced, and halting, seemed to feel. The fatal wound yet painful in her heel. 
thus he obtains the suit so much desired. On strict observance of the terms required. For if, before he reached the realms of air, he backward cast his eyes to view the fair. The forfeit grant, that instant, void is made. And she forever left a lifeless shade. Now through the noiseless throng their way they bend. And both with pain the rugged road ascend. Dark was the path, and difficult, and steep. And thick with vapors from the smoky deep. They well nigh now had passed the bounds of night. And just approached the margin of the light. When he, mistrusting lest her steps might stray, and gladsome of the glimpse of dawning day, his longing eyes impatient backward cast, to catch a lover's look, but looked his last. For, instant dying, she again descends, while he to empty air his arm extends. Again she died, nor yet her lord reproved. What could she say but that too well he loved? One last farewell she spoke, which scarce he heard. So soon she dropped, so sudden disappeared. All stunned he stood when thus his wife he viewed. By second fate and double death subdued. Not more amazement by that wretch was shown. Whom Cerberus beholding turned to stone. Nor Alanus could more astonished look. When on himself Lethea's fault he took. His beauteous wife, who, too secure, had dared her face to vie with goddesses, compared. Once joined by love, they stand united still. Turn to contiguous rocks on Ida's hill. Now to repass the sticks in vain he tries. Sharon, averse, his pressing suit denies. Seven days entire, along the infernal shores. Disconsolate, the bard Eurydice deplores. Defiled with filth his robe, with tears his cheeks. No sustenance, but grief and cares he seeks. Of rigid fate incessant he complains. And hell's inexorable gods arraigns. This ended, to high Rodope he hastes. And Hemus mountain, bleak with northern blasts. And now his yearly race the circling sun. Had thrice complete through watery Pisces run. Since Orpheus fled the face of womankind and all soft union with the sex declined. Whether his ill success this change had bred, or binding vows made to his former bed, whatever the cause, in vain the nymph's contest, with rival eyes, to warm his frozen breast. For every nymph with love his lays inspired, but every nymph, repulsed, with grief retired. A hill there was, and on that hill a mead, with verdure thick, but destitute of shade. Where, now, the muse's son no sooner sings. No sooner strikes his sweet resounding strings. But distant groves the flying sounds receive. And listening trees their rooted stations leave. Themselves transplanting, all around they grow. And various shades their various kinds bestow. Here, tall chownian oaks their branches spread. While weeping poplars, there. Erect their head. The foodful Aeschylus here shoots his leaves. That turf, soft lime tree, this, fat beech, receives. Here, brittle hazels, laurels, here, advance. And there, tough ash, to form the hero's lance. Here, silver firs, with knotless trunks, ascend. There, scarlet oaks beneath their acorns bend. That spot admits the hospitable plain. On this, the maple grows with clouded grain. Here, watery willows are with lotus seen. There, tamarisk, and box, forever green. With double hue, here, myrtles grace the ground. And laurustines with purple berries crowned. With pliant feet, now, ivies this way wind. Vines yonder rise, and elms with vines entwined. Wild Ornus now, the pitch tree next, takes root. And Arbutus adorned with blushing fruit. Then easy bending palms, the victor's prize. And pines erect with bristly tops arise. For Rhea grateful still, the pine remains. For Aides still some favor she retains. 
he once in human shape her breast had warmed. And now is cherished, to a tree transformed. Fable of Cyparissus Cyparissus by accident kills a favorite stag, which affects him with so much grief, that he pines away, and is changed into a cypress tree by Apollo. Amid the throng of this promiscuous wood, with pointed top, the taper cypress stood. A tree, which once a youth, and heavenly fair, was of that deity the darling care, whose hand adapts, with equal skill, the strings, to bows with which he kills, and harps to which he sings. For heretofore, a mighty stag was bred, which on the fertile fields of Kia fed. In shape and size he all his kind excelled, and to Carthian nymphs was sacred held. His beamy head, with branches high displayed, afforded to itself an ample shade. His horns were gilt, and his smooth neck was graced, with silver collars thick with gems and chaste. A silver boss upon his forehead hung, and brazen pendants in his earrings rung. Frequenting houses he familiar grew, and learned, by custom, nature to subdue, till by degrees, of fear and wildness broke. Even stranger hands his proffered neck might stroke. Much was the beast by Kia's youth caressed. But thou, sweet Cyparissus, lovedst him best. By thee, to pastures fresh, he oft was led. By thee oft watered at the fountain's head. His horns with garlands, now, by thee were tied. And, now, thou on his back wouldst wanton ride. Now here, now there, wouldst bound along the plains. Ruling his tender mouth with purple reins. Twas when the summer sun, at noon of day, Through glowing cancer shot his burning ray. Twas then, the favorite stag, in cool retreat, Had sought a shelter from the scorching heat. Along the grass his weary limbs he laid, Inhaling freshness, from the breezy shade, when Cyparissus, with his pointed dart, unknowing, pierced him to the panting heart. But when the youth, surprised, his error found, and saw him dying of the cruel wound, himself he would have slain through desperate grief. What said not Phoebus, that might yield relief? To cease his mourning he the boy desired, or mourn no more than such a loss required. But ho incessant grieved, at length addressed. To the superior powers a last request. Praying, in expiation of his crime. Thenceforth to mourn to all succeeding time. And now of blood exhausted he appears. Drained by a torrent of continual tears. The fleshy color in his body fades. And a green tincture all his limbs invades. From his fair head, where curling locks late hung. A horrid bush with bristled branches sprung, which, stiffening by degrees, its stem extends, till to the starry skies the spire ascends. Apollo sad looked on, and sighing, cried. Then, be for ever what thy prayer implied. Bemoaned by me, in others' grief excite, and still preside at every funeral rite. Thus the sweet artist in a wondrous shade, of verdant trees, which harmony had made. Encircled sat, with his own triumphs crowned. Of listening birds and savages around. Again the trembling strings he dextrous tries. Again from discord makes soft music rise. Then tunes his voice, O muse, from whom I sprung. Jove be my theme, and thou inspire my song. To Jove ray grateful voice I oft have raised. Oft his almighty power with pleasure praised. I sung the giants in a solemn strain. Blasted and thunderstruck on Phlegra's plain. Now be my lyre in softer accents moved. To sing of blooming boys by God's beloved. And to relate what virgins, void of shame. Have suffered vengeance for a lawless flame. Hyacinthus transformed into a flower. A beautiful youth, named Hyacinthus is accidentally killed while playing at quoits with Apollo, who changes his blood into a flower hearing the name of his deceased friend. 
Phoebus for thee too, Hyacinth, designed. A place among the gods, had fate been kind. Yet this he gave, as oft as wintry rains. Are past, and vernal breezes soothe the plains. From the green turf a purple flower you rise. And with your fragrant breath perfume the skies. You, when alive, were Phoebus' darling boy. In you he placed his hopes and fixed his joy. Their god the Delphic priests consult in vain. Eurotus now he loves, and Sparta's plain. His hands the use of bow and harp forget. And hold the dogs, or bear the corded net. O'er hanging cliffs swift he pursues the game. Each hour his pleasure, each augments his flame. The midday sun now shone with equal light. Between the past and the succeeding light. They strip, then, smoothed with suppling oil, essay. To pitch the rounded quoit, their wanted play. A well-poised disc first hasty Phoebus threw. It cleft the air, and whistled as it flew. It reached the mark, a most surprising length. Which spoke an equal share of art and strength. Scarce was it fallen, when, with too eager hand. Young Hyacinth ran to snatch it from the sand. But the cursed orb, which met a stony soil, flew in his face with violent recoil. Both faint, both pale and breathless, now appear. The boy with pain, the anxious god with fear. He ran, and raised him bleeding from the ground. Chafes his cold limbs, and wipes the fatal wound. Then herbs of noblest juice in vain applies. The wound is mortal, and his skill defies. As in a watered garden's blooming walk. When some rude hand has bruised its tender stalk. A fading lily droops its languid head. And bends to earth, its life and beauty fled. So Hyacinth, with head reclined, decays. And, sickening, now no more his charms displays. Oh, thou art gone, my boy, Apollo cried. Defrauded of thy youth in all its pride. Thou, once my joy, art all my sorrow now. And to my guilty hand my grief I owe. Yet from myself I might the fault remove. Unless to sport and play a fault should prove. Oh could I for thee, or but with thee, die. But cruel fates to me that power deny. Yet on my tongue thou shalt for ever dwell. Thy name my lyre shall sound, my verse shall tell. And to a flower transformed, unheard of yet. Stamped on thy leaves, my cries thou shalt repeat. The time shall come, prophetic I foreknow. When, joined to thee, a mighty chief eight shall grow. And with my plaints his name thy leaf shall show. While Phoebus thus the laws of fate revealed. Behold, the blood which stained the verdant field. Is blood no longer. But a flower full blown. Far brighter than the Tyrian scarlet, shone. A lily's form it took. Its purple hue. Was all that made a difference to the view. Nor stopped he here, the god upon its leaves. The sad expression of his sorrow weaves. And to this hour the mournful purple wears. A.I., A.I., inscribed in funeral characters. Nor are the Spartans, who so much are famed. For virtue, of their hyacinth ashamed. But still, with pompous wa and solemn state. The hyacinthian feasts they yearly celebrate. Transformations of the Sarasti and Propoetides. The Sarasti are punished for their cruelty to strangers. By being changed into oxen by Venus, the angry goddess punishes the wantonness of the Propoetides by their transformation into stones. Inquire of Amathus, whose wealthy ground. With veins of every metal does abound. If she to her Propoetides would show. The honor Sparta does to him allow. No more, she'd say, such wretches would we grace. Than those whose crooked horns deformed their face. From thence Sarasti called, an impious race. Before whose gates a reverend altar stood. To Jove inscribed, the hospitable god. This had some stranger seen, with gore besmeared. The blood of lambs and bulls it had appeared. 
their slaughtered guests it was. Not flock nor herd. Venus these barbrow sacrifices viewed. With just abhorrence, and with wrath pursued. At first, to punish such nefarious crimes. Their towns she meant to leave, her once loved climes. But why, said she, for their offense should I? My dear delightful plains and cities fly? No, let the impious people, who have shinned. A punishment in death or exile find. If death or exile too severe be thought. Let them in some vile shape bemoan their fault. While next her mind a proper form employs. Admonished by their horns, she fixed her choice. Their former crest remains upon their heads. And their strong limbs an ox's shape invades. The blasphemous propoetides denied. Worship of Venus, and her power defied. Unknowing how to blush, and shameless groan. A small transition changes them to stone. Story of Pygmalion and the Statue Pygmalion, a celebrated artist, becomes enamored of a beautiful statue of ivory which he has made. And at his request Venus endues it with animation, and crowns their union by the birth of a son. Pygmalion, loathing their lascivious life. Abhorred all womankind, but most a wife. So single chose to live, and shunned to wed. Well pleased to want a consort of his bed. Yet fearing idleness, the nurse of ill. In sculpture exercised his happy skill. And carved in ivory such a maid, so fair. As nature could not with his art compare. Were she to work. But, in her own defense. Must take her pattern here, and copy hence. Pleased with his idol, he commends, admires. Adores, and last, the thing adored desires. A very virgin in her face was seen. And had she moved. A living maid had been. One would have thought she could have stirred, but strove. With modesty, and was ashamed to move. Art hid with art, so well performed the cheat. It caught the carver with his own deceit. He knows, tis madness, yet he must adore. And still the more he knows it, loves the more. The flesh, or what so seems, he touches oft. Which feels so smooth that he believes it soft. Fired with this thought, at once he strained the breast. And on the lips a loving kiss impressed. Tis true, the hardened breast resists the gripe. And the cold lips return a kiss unripe. But when, retiring back, he looked again. To think it ivory was a thought too mean. With flattery now he seeks her mind to move. And now with gifts, the powerful bribes of love. He furnishes her closet first, and fills. The crowded shelves with rarities of shells. Adds orient pearls, which from the conchs he drew. And all the sparkling stones of various hue. And parrots, imitating human tongue. And singing birds, in silver cages hung. And every fragrant flower and odorous green. Were sorted well, with lumps of amber laid between. Rich fashionable robes her person deck. Pendants her ears. And pearls adorn her neck. Her tapered fingers too with rings are graced. And an embroidered zone surrounds her slender waist. Thus like a queen arrayed, so richly dressed. Beauteous she showed, but unadorned the best. Then from the floor he raised a royal bed. With coverings of Sidonian purple spread. The feast of Venus came, a solemn day. To which the Cypriots do devotion pay. With gilded horns the milk-white heifers led. Slaughtered before the sacred altars bled. Pygmalion offering, first approached the shrine. And then with prayers implored the powers divine. Almighty gods, if all we mortals want. If all we can require, be yours to grant. Make this fair statue mine, he would have said. But changed his words for shame, and only prayed. Give me the likeness of my ivory maid. The golden goddess, present at the prayer. Well knew he meant th inanimate fair. And gave the sign of granting his desire. 
for thrice in cheerful flames ascends the fire. The youth, returning to his mistress highs. And, impudent in hope, with ardent eyes. And beating breast, by the dear statue lies. He kisses her white lips, renews the bliss. And looks, and thinks they redden at the kiss. He thought them warm before, nor longer stays. But next his hand on the hard substance lays. Hard as it was, beginning to relent. It seemed the block beneath his fingers bent. He felt again, his fingers made a print. Twas flesh, but flesh so firm. It rose against the dint. The pleasing task he fails not to renew. Soft, and more soft, at every touch it grew. Like pliant wax, when chafing hands reduce. The former mass to form, and frame for use. He would believe, but yet is still in pain. And tries his argument of sense again. Presses the pulse, and feels the leaping vein. Convinced, o'erjoyed, his studied thanks and praise. To her who made the miracle, he pays. Then lips to lips he joined. Now freed from fear. He found the savor of the kiss sincere. At this the wakened image oped her eyes. And viewed at once the light and lover with surprise. The goddess, present at the match she made. So blessed the bed, such fruitfulness conveyed. That ere ten months had sharpened either horn. To crown their bliss. A lovely boy was born. Paphos his name, who, grown to manhood, walled. The city Paphos, from the founder called. Story of Venus and Adonis Venus becomes enamored of young Adonis, whom she cautions against the pursuit of wild beasts. Lest he should meet a premature death, the youth disregards this advice, and receives a mortal bite from a wild boar which he has wounded. And Venus, after lamenting his fate, changes him into a flower called anemone. For Cytherea's lips while Cupid pressed. He with a heedless arrow raised her breast. The goddess felt it, and, with fury stung. The wanton mischief from her bosom flung. Yet thought at first the danger slight. But found. The dart too faithful, and too deep the wound. Fired with a mortal beauty, she disdains. To haunt the Idalian mount or Phrygian plains. She seeks not Nidus, nor her Paphian shrines. Nor Amathus. That teems with brazen minds. Evan heaven itself, with all its sweets unsought. Adonis far a sweeter heaven is thought. On him she hangs, and fawns with every art. And never. Never knows from him to part. She whose soft limbs had only been displayed. On rosy beds, beneath the myrtle shade. Whose pleasing care was to improve each grace. And add more charms to an unrivaled face. Now buskined, like the virgin huntress, goes. Through woods, and pathless wilds, and mountain snows. With her own tuneful voice she joys to cheer. The panting hounds. That chase the flying deer. She runs the labyrinth of fearful hares. But fearless beasts and dangerous prey forebears. Hunts not the grinning wolf or foamy boar. And trembles at the lion's hungry roar. Thee too, Adonis, with a lover's care. She warns, if warned, thou wouldst avoid the snare. To furious animals advance not nigh. Ply those that follow, follow those that fly. Tis chance alone must the survivors save. Weener brave spirits will attempt the brave. O, oh, lovely youth! In harmless sports delight. Provoke not beasts, which, armed by nature, fight. For me, if not thyself, vouchsafe to fear. Let not thy thirst of glory cost me dear. Boars know not how to spare a blooming age. No sparkling eyes can soothe the lion's rage. Nor all thy charms a savage breast can move. Which have so deeply touched the queen of love. When bristled boars from beaten thickets spring. In grinded tusks a thunderbolt they bring. The daring hunter's lions rouse devour. Vast is their fury, and as vast their power. 
Cursed be their tawny race, if thou wouldst hear. What kindled thus my hate, then lend an ear. The wondrous tale I will to thee unfold. How the fell monsters rose from crimes of old. But by long toils I faint. See! Wide displayed. A grateful poplar courts us with a shade. The grassy turf, beneath, so verdant shows. We may secure delightfully repose. Perhaps thou mayst have heard a virgin's name. Who still in swiftness swiftest youths o'ercame. Wondrous, that female weakness should outdo. A manly strength, the wonder yet is true. Twas doubtful if her triumphs in the field. Did to her form's triumphant glories yield. Whether her face could with more ease decoy. A crowd of lovers, or her feet destroy. For once Apollo she implored to show. If courteous fates a consort would allow. A consort brings thy ruin, he replied. Oh learn to want the pleasures of a bride. Nor shalt thou want them to thy wretched cost. And Atlanta living shall be lost. With such a rueful fate the affrighted maid. Sought green recesses in the woodland glade. Nor signing suitors her resolves could move. She bade them show their speed, to show their love. He only who could conquer in the race. Might hope the conquered virgin to embrace. While he whose tardy feet had lagged behind. Was doomed the sad reward of death to find. Though great the prize, yet rigid the decree. But blind with beauty, who can rigor see? Evan on these laws the fair they rashly sought. And danger in excess of love forgot. There sat Hippomenes, prepared to blame. In lovers such extravagance of flame. And must, he said, the blessings of a wife. Be dearly purchased by a risk of life? But when he saw the wonders of her face. And her limbs naked, springing to the race. Her limbs, as exquisitely turned as mine. Or, if a woman thou, might vie with thine. With lifted hands, he cried, Forgive the tongue. Which durst, ye youths. Your well-timed courage wrong. I knew not that the nymph for whom you strove. Deserved the unbounded transports of your love. He saw, admired, and thus her spotless frame. He praised, and praising, kindled his own flame. A rival now to all the youths who run. Envious, he fears they should not be undone. But why, reflects he, idly thus is shown. The fate of others, yet untried my own. The coward must not on love's aid depend. The god was ever to the bold a friend. Meantime the virgin flies, or seems to fly. Swift as a Scythian arrow cleaves the sky. Still more and more the youth her charms admires. The race itself to exalt her charms conspires. The golden pinions, which her feet adorn. In wanton flutterings by the winds are borne. Down from her head the long fair tresses flow. And sport with lovely negligence below. The waving ribbons, which her buskins tie. Her snowy skin with waving purple dye. As crimson veils in palaces displayed. To the white marble lend a blushing shade. Nor long he gazed, yet while he gazed, she gained. The goal, and the victorious wreath obtained. The vanquished sigh, and, as the law decreed. Pay the dire forfeit, and prepare to bleed. Then rose Hippomenes, not yet afraid. And fixed his eyes full on the beauteous maid. Where is, he cried, the mighty conquest won. To distance those who want the nerves to run? Here prove superior strength nor shall it be. Thy loss of glory, if excelled by me. High my descent, near Neptune I aspire. For Neptune was grand parent to my sire. From that great god the fourth myself I trace. Nor sink my virtues yet beneath my race. Thou from Hippomenes, O Ercum, mayst claim. An envied triumph, and a deathless fame. While thus the youth the virgin power defies. Silent she views him still with softer eyes. 
thoughts in her breast a doubtful strife begin. If tis not happier now to lose than win. What God, a foe to beauty, would destroy? The promised ripeness of this blooming boy? With his life's danger does he seek my bed? Scarce am I half so greatly worth, she said. Nor has his beauty moved my breast to love. And yet, I own, such beauty well might move. Tis not his charms, tis pity would engage. My soul to spare the greenness of his age. What, that heroic courage fires his breast. And shines through brave disdain of fate confessed. What, that his patronage by close degrees. Springs from the imperial ruler of the seas. Then add the love, which bids him undertake. The race, and dare to perish for my sake. Of bloody nuptials, heedless youth, beware. Fly, timely fly, from a two barbrows fair. At pleasure choose, thy love will be repaid. By a less foolish and more beauteous maid. But why this tenderness, before unknown? Why beats and pants my breast for him alone? His eyes have seen his numerous rivals yield. Let him too share the rigor of the field. Since, by their fates untaught, his own he courts. And thus with ruin insolently sports. Yet for what crime shall he his death receive? Is it a crime with me to wish to live? Shall his kind passion his destruction prove? Is this the fatal recompense of love? So fair a youth destroyed, would conquest shame. And nymphs eternally detest my fame. Still why should nymphs my guiltless fame upbraid? Did I the fond adventurer persuade? Alas! I wish thou wouldst the course decline. Or that my swiftness was excelled by thine. See what a virgin's bloom adorns the boy. Why wilt thou run, and why thyself destroy? Hippomenes! Oh that I ne'er had been! By those bright eyes unfortunately seen! Ah! Tempt not thus a swift untimely fate! Thy life is worthy of the longest date! Thus she disclosed the woman's secret heart! Young, innocent, and new to Cupid's dart! Her thoughts, her words, her actions, wildy rove! With love she burns, yet knows not that tis love. Her royal sire now with the murmuring crowd. Demands the race impatiently aloud. Hippomenes then with true fervor prayed. My bold attempt let Venus kindly aid. By her sweet power I felt this amorous fire. Still may she succor whom she did inspire. A soft, unenvious wind, with speedy care wafted to heaven the lover's tender prayer. Pity, I own, soon gained the wished consent. And all the assistance he implored I lent. The Cyprian lands, though rich, in richness yield. To that surname the Tamasenian field. That field of old was added to my shrine. And its choice products consecrated mine. A tree there stands, full glorious to behold. Gold are the leaves, the crackling branches gold. It chanced, three apples in my hands I bore. Which newly from the tree I sportive tore. Seen by the youth alone, to him I brought. The fruit, and when and how to use it taught. The signal sounding by the king's command. Both start at once, and sweep the imprinted sand. So swiftly moved their feet, they might with ease. Scarce moistened skim along the glassy seas, or, with a wondrous levity be born, o'er yellow harvests of unbending corn. Now favoring peals resound from every part. Spirit the youth, and fire his fainting heart. Hippomenes, they cried, thy life preserve. Intensely labor, and stretch every nerve. Base fear alone can baffle thy design. Shoot boldly onward, and the jail is thine. Tis doubtful whether shouts like these conveyed. More pleasures to the youth or to the maid. When a long distance off she could have gained. She checked her swiftness, and her feet restrained. She sighed, and dwelt, and languished, on his face. Then with unwilling speed pursued the race. 
erspent with heat, his breath he faintly drew. Parched was his mouth, nor yet the jail in view. And the first apple on the plain he threw. The nymph stopped sudden at the unusual sight. Struck with the fruit so beautifully bright. Aside she starts, the wonder to behold. And eager stoops to catch the rolling gold. The observant youth passed by, and scoured along. While peals of joy rung from the applauding throng. Unkindly she corrects the short delay. And to redeem the time fleets swift away. Swift as the lightning, or the northern wind. And far she leaves the panting youth behind. Again he strives the flying nymph to hold. With the temptation of the second gold. The bright temptation fruitlessly was tossed. So soon, alas. She won the distance lost. Now but a little interval of space. Remained for the decision of the race. Fair author of the precious gift, he said. Be thou, O goddess, author of my aid. Then of the shining fruit the last he drew. And with his full collected vigor threw. The virgin still the longer to detain. Threw not directly, but across the plain. She seemed a while perplexed in dubious thought. If the far distant apple should be sought. I lured her backward mind to seize the bait. And to the massy gold gave double weight. My favor to my votary was showed. Her speed I lessened, and increased her load. But lest, though long, the rapid race he run. Before my longer, tedious tale is done. The youth the jail, and so the virgin, won. Might I, Adonis, now not hope to see. His grateful thanks poured out for victory. His pious incense on my altars laid. But he nor grateful thanks, nor incense paid. Enraged, I vowed, that with the youth the fair. For his contempt, should my keen vengeance share. That future lovers might my power revere. And, from their sad examples. Learn to fear. The silent fanes, the sanctified abodes. Of Sibylle, great mother of the gods. Raised by Echion in a lonely wood. And full of brown. Religious horror stood. By a long painful journey faint, they chose. Their weary limbs here secret to repose. But soon my power inflamed the lustful boy. Careless of rest, he sought untimely joy. A hallowed gloomy cave, with moss o'ergrown. The temple joined, of native pumice stone. Where antique images by priests were kept. And wooden deities securely slept. Thither the rash Hippomenes retires. And gives a loose to all his wild desires. And the chaste cell pollutes with wanton fires. The sacred statues trembled with surprise. The towery goddess, blushing, veiled her eyes. And the vile pair to Stygian sounds had sent. But unrevengeful seemed that punishment. A heavier doom such black profaneness draws. Their taper fingers turn to crooked paws. No more their necks the smoothness can retain. Now covered sudden with a yellow mane. Arms changed to legs, each finds the hardening breast. Of rage unknown. And Wandrow strength possessed. Their altered looks with fury grim appear. And on the ground their brushing tails they bear. They haunt the woods, their voices, which before. Were musically sweet, now hoarsely roar. Hence lions, dreadful to the labyrinth swains. Are tamed by Sibylle, and curbed with reins. And humbly draw her car along the plains. But thou, Adonis, my delightful care. Of these, and beasts as fierce as these, beware. The savage, which not shuns thee, timely shun. For by rash prowess shouldst thou be undone. A double ruin is contained in one. Thus cautious Venus schooled her favorite boy. But youthful heat all cautions will destroy. His sprightly soul beyond grave counsel flies. While with yoked swans the goddess cuts the skies. His faithful hounds, led by the tainted wind. 
lodged in thick coverts, chanced a boar to find. The callow hero showed a manly heart, and pierced the savage with a sidelong dart. The flying savage, wounded, turned again, wrenched out the gory dart, and foamed with pain. The trembling boy by flight his safety sought, and now recalled the lore which Venus taught. But now, too late, to fly the boar he strove, who in the groin his tusks impetuous drove. On the discolored grass Adonis lay, the monster trampling o'er his beauteous prey. Fair Cytherea, Cyprus scarce in view, heard from afar his groans, and owned them true, and turned her snowy swans, and backward flew. But as she saw him gasp his latest breath, and quivering agonize in pangs of death, down with swift flight she plunged, nor rage forbore. At once her garments and her hair she tore. With cruel blows she beat her guiltless breast. The fates upbraided, and her love confessed. Nor shall they yet, she cried, the whole devour. With uncontrolled inexorable power. For thee, lost youth, my tears and restless pain. Shall in immortal monuments remain. With solemn pomp, in annual rites returned. Be thou for ever, my Adonis, mourned. Could Pluto's queen with jealous fury storm. And mount to a fragrant herb transform? Yet dares not Venus with a change surprise. And in a flower bid her fallen hero rise? Then on the blood sweet nectar she bestows. The scented blood in little bubbles rose. Little as rainy drops, which fluttering fly. Borne by the winds, along a lowering sky. Short time ensued, till where the blood was shed. A flower began to rear its purple head. Such as on Punic apples is revealed. Or in the filmy rind but half concealed. Still here the fate of lovely forms we see. So sudden fades the sweet anemone. The feeble stems, to stormy blasts a prey. Their sickly beauties droop. And pine away. The winds forbid the flowers to flourish long. Which, oh to winds their names in Grecian song.